The Lost Heir, The Griffin Chronicles, Book One, written by E.G. Foley, narrated and produced by Jamie Dupont McKenzie. Blood Will Tell Old English Proverb Part 1 Prologue An Urgent Message Chains clanked in the darkness as the creature paced and prowled its cell, letting out another throaty snarl. Full eleven years, the beast had been a prisoner in this dungeon, and every day its anger grew, but never before to this ferocious pitch, as it heard what its captors were scheming. Their voices echoed down the stone chute from somewhere above. The traitor and the witch. The boy must die. Don't be so impatient, Waldrick. Think of his powers. A lad like that is too useful to waste. Just capture him and we will make him serve us. No, Fanula, the risk is too great. He could destroy everything we've worked for. Don't you understand that? The beast roared in protest. Shut up down there, the hag hollered. Waldrick, did you forget to feed the monster? Of course not. I threw a goat down to it yesterday, just the way it likes its prey, alive and kicking, vicious thing. What does it want, then? Sometimes I swear that thing can understand us. Who cares? It's just a stupid animal, he said. That happens to be about a thousand years old, the witch muttered with considerably more respect. The creature's golden eyes gleamed with intelligence and futile vengeance in the shadows, but the co-conspirators in the stone-carved lair above forgot about the beast once more and returned to the topic at hand. If you bring the boy back to me alive, my lord, I might be able to transfer his powers to you. Or to yourself, he countered suspiciously. Don't be tedious. Why should I need more magic? You know who I am, while you, poor dear, were robbed. It's only fitting you should take from him what was stolen from you. Yes, tempting. The beast could hear the earl's boot heels thumping slowly across the stone floor above as he paced in thought. Very tempting indeed, uh, but still not worth it, he concluded after a moment. No matter what happens, the past must stay hidden, and you had better assist me in this after all I've done for you. Calm yourself, and don't even think about threatening me. There's no need to get yourself into a snit, she huffed. If you want him dead, then dead the boy will be. But we have one small problem. What's that? Not even my seeing bowl will show me where he is. The Kindervale is still protecting him. Is it? Well, if he is still cloaked by that old spell, at least the others won't be able to find him either. Even better, until it fully dissolves, his powers won't be at full strength yet. And I say, we'd better kill him while we still can. Before long, he may be too powerful, if he's anything like his father. Well, how are we going to find him, then? Half the magical world is already out looking for the brat. Don't worry. The only one I need to find is Guardian Derrick Stone. Poor disgraced has-been, he added with a sneer. The order is sure to send a messenger to summon the great warrior just as soon as they get a lead on where the boy is. Then Stone will rush to Jacob's side to protect him, but we'll beat him to the punch. How? Simple, he said. Intercept the message. With that, the heavy door above creaked shut as the Earl marched off to carry out his treacherous plan. The creature threw back its head and roared in useless fury, as if the boy could hear. Swift as a shooting star, a tiny shape no larger than a hummingbird zipped across the glowing face of Big Ben, then disappeared into the night sky in a trail of golden sparkles. The fairy Gladwin flew at top speed to bring the guardian his orders. Strapped across her back, the scrolled message she carried was only as big as a matchstick, but the news it bore was huge. The boy was alive. The lost heir of Griffin had finally been spotted. The sighting was confirmed. Captain Lydia Brackwater of the Thames Water Nymphs, of all people, had come face to face with him, 
which was rather ironic, Gladwin thought, considering it was Lydia and her sisters who had lost the boy in the first place. Ah, but the watery folk could be shifty, unreliable. If you wanted something done right, ask a fairy, she thought stoutly. In any case, young Jacob Everton was in more danger than he knew. He needed protection, the best the order could provide. She raced on. Far below, where Waterloo Bridge straddled a meander of the Thames, London shimmered with the lights of a spring night. Carriages with high-stepping horses rolled through the cobbled streets of the theatre district. Gentlemen in top hats escorted ladies in satin bustle gowns to operas, fancy dinners, concerts, plays. Here and there, through mansion windows, brilliant chandeliers lit up glittering ballrooms, where elegant couples waltzed and whirled, and most of them had no inkling of all the enchantment tucked into the byways and corners of their world. Humans, Gladwin thought with a snort. Shaking her head to herself, she zoomed away from the city. The air tasted sweeter over the countryside. Instead of roofs and chimneys and a maze of cramped streets, she now looked down on stone-walled meadows where cows and sheep had bedded down for the night. Frogs sang in the ponds, owls hooted in the great old trees, and the road was a pale ribbon winding through the gentle hills. She sped toward the distant hilltop where guardian Derrick Stone was believed to be encamped among the lonely ruins of an old abbey. Along the way, she noticed a thatched-roof tavern by the roadside and paused. He had better not be in there, she thought, hovering over it with a frown. It did rather seem like the sort of disreputable place where the wandering warrior might like to get into a brawl. Rumor had it the tragedies surrounding this boy's parents had made the guardian even meaner and more dangerous. Deciding to hope for the best, Gladwin flew on. A few minutes later, she descended on a cautious angle over the treetops, approaching the hollowed stone shell of the ancient cathedral. Her iridescent wings beating at half speed to slow her pace, she buzzed lower, gazing down at medieval columns tumbled to the ground and overgrown with weeds. Then she saw the place where Derrick Stone had set up camp, but the guardian was not at home. Oh, crocodile, she whispered. Scowling, she alighted on the log where his worn leather knapsack leaned across from the extinguished campfire. Hm, I knew he was in that pub. Well, he'd better get back soon. She adjusted the message across her back, then folded her arms with a feisty little huff and proceeded to keep a lookout, marching back and forth along the log. Fortunately, because fairies are not known for their patience, she did not have long to wait. About time! Hearing someone approach, she turned, expecting to see the guardian, but the man who stepped out of the shadows was not Derek Stone. She gasped, and with a flick of her wings, darted for cover inside the hollow log. She peeped out through a knotty hole in the wood. Who? What? Is that? A giant? Well, not that big, but almost. The meaty bruiser marching into Derek's camp had a boxer's flattened nose and a bald head like a cannonball. Spotting her fairy trail still fading, he sneered in her direction. Come out, little courier. You carry a message of interest to our master. Oh, no, Gladwin gulped, spotting a second man walking toward the log, and a third. Ambushed. Worse, a whiff of sulfur warned her they were servitors, magically created servants. Not good. Her heart began to pound. An experienced messenger for the Order of the Yew Tree, however, she kept her wits about her. I've got to get out of here. Gliding silently through the dark tunnel of the old hollow log, she came out on the other end and stayed low to the ground, weaving among the weeds and wildflowers. Suddenly the tall grass parted, and she nearly ran straight into a pair of giant knees looming right in front of her. She's here, the ruffian boomed, trying to use his coat like a butterfly net, swiping at her. She dodged aside in the nick of time. She found herself surrounded, flying every which way for her life. She dove to the right, close enough to feel the breeze as another tried to catch her in his hat. She flew a few inches higher on a diagonal. The next grab caught at her foot and sent her tumbling in a mid-air somersault. But she quickly righted herself and flew on, shaking her head to clear away the dizziness. Only one clear path remained open, straight ahead. She raced forward at top speed, too fast even for a guardian's supernatural reflexes to catch her, but then 
disaster. Too late, she saw the spider web ahead. She couldn't stop in time. She let out a cry, but the next thing she knew, she was trapped in a net of horrid, sticky strands. Her arms were caught. She tried to kick free, but she was hopelessly glued. Then she looked up in dread as the hulking builder of the web crept toward her. Brown and hairy with white spots, fat and bulbous in the moonlight, the huge spider fixed its many cold eyes eagerly upon her. <laughs> Fairy blood is fizzy sweet like root beer. I say, good boy now, there's a nice spider. Let's not do anything hasty, she said with a gulp. Won't you please free me from your web? I am not a fly, as you can see, and um, I, I really must be going. She shrieked when it hopped closer, much too agile on its eight long legs. Stay back. I'm in service of the queen, I'll have you know. Yummy yum, the spider twittered in its clinkety arachnid voice. But just as it opened its pincer fangs to bite her, the spider froze at the sound of a deep, cultured voice. Now, now, Malwart, we discussed this. You are not to drink her. Fairies aren't food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, master. The disappointed spider backed away to a slightly safer distance. With her cheek stuck on a strand of web, Gladwin could not turn her head to see who had spoken until the gentleman strolled into view. He wore a splendid long coat, despite the balmy temperature of the spring night. He swept off his top hat politely, revealing brown hair sculpted into waves by a shiny, crusted helmet of Macassar oil. My, my, a royal garden fairy, what an honor, he said with a bow. Ladies probably thought he was handsome, but his icy smile sent a chill all the way down to Gladwin's wingtips, and as he stared at her, his cold, grey eyes held a faraway look, as though he were distracted, listening to some mad waltz forever playing in his head. "'Tasty morsel,' the spider whined. "'Of course. Excellent work, Malwart. You really are the cleverest spider in England.' He tossed a large, stunned horsefly to the spider. <laughs> thank you, oh, thank you, master. Malwart ran off to fetch the fly, then huddled in the corner to devour it. Gladwin winced. She looked at the sinister gentleman again and found him studying her intently, the moonlight gleaming on his ivory-handled walking stick. Ah, you look surprised, my little pet there, he said. Talking spider? Arachno sapiens? Oh, they're very rare, he added with an arrogant little wave of his hand. I acquired him in my travels. He stepped closer and leaned down, inspecting her prettiest feature, her wings. She was rather vain of them in truth. Do forgive me for staring, little one, he let out a wistful sigh. It's been a long time since I've seen one of your people. Beautiful thing. I shall enjoy adding you to my collection. Collection? Gladwin looked at him in dread. Oxley, keep an eye out for the Guardian, he ordered the bald giant with a quick glance over his shoulder. We must be gone before Stone arrives. Wouldn't want things to get uh, messy now, would we? Aye, my lord. The muscle man trudged off to watch the road for the dark and dangerous Derrick Stone. Who are you? What do you want with me? Gladwin demanded, but he just shook his head at her. Oh, I'm sorry, dear heart, but I, I don't speak, Bumblebee. I have no idea what you're saying, and to be honest, I really don't care. Gladwin scowled, but kept trying to fight free. Whoever he was, if he could not understand the fairy tongue, that meant he was an ordinary human and had no magic of his own. There, there, don't fret, he chided. I'm not going to harm you. I just want to help you with this uh, heavy burden. Surely it's too much for you to carry, tiny as you are. I'll take that, if you don't mind. No, she shook her head frantically as his giant hand came toward her, encased in a fine leather glove. He reached down with thumb and forefinger and plucked the scroll away from where it was snugly secured between her wings. Give that back! Oh, this is terrible, thought Gladwin. Help! Help! Derek Stone, where are you? But there was still no sign of the once heroic knight. Guardian Derek Stone, in fact, was slumped on a bar stool in the tavern, just as she had feared, nursing his pint of ale and growling at anyone who came too close to him. The raucous music and the cheering around the farmer's arm-wrestling match nearby made it hard for him to hear the faint warning instinct beginning to sound the alarm in the back of his mind. 
He was trying so hard to sense the boy's location, though he wasn't even sure his guardian-finding instinct worked anymore. If only the rumor were true. If the kid was really alive, then maybe he wasn't an utter failure, despite how he had failed his dear friends, poor Jacob and Elizabeth. But it was no use. The Kinder Vale's powerful spell that protected all magical children from birth still clung on, cloaking their son's whereabouts. Meanwhile, his own dark, inward searching made Derek Stone oblivious to the disaster befalling the tiny fairy back at his camp. Gladwin's heart pounded as she realized she was on her own in this. She could do nothing but watch in helpless fury as the wicked stranger unrolled the message and read it. So it is true, he murmured to himself. My brother's brat survived after all. I hardly believed it myself until this moment. Well, I have to see young Jacob for myself before he dies. Time to go, he barked at his men. Without warning, he pulled a jar out of his greatcoat pocket and scooped Gladwin into it, along with the sticky strands of spiderweb still hanging off her. She flew up at once and rammed the lid furiously with her shoulder, but it was no use. She was trapped as he sealed the jar with a quick turn of the lid. At least there were air holes in it. Then she was plunged into darkness as he put the jar in the pocket of his greatcoat. The world began to swing as he strode toward the carriage. Come, men, we must get back to town. Finally, I know where to look for the brat. Tomorrow dawn, we'll start at the wharf and comb each city block north from there until we find my so-called nephew. And when we do, we'll put an end to this foolish rumor that he's still alive. His henchmen laughed at his ominous jest, but Gladwin pounded on the glass. No, leave him alone, she cried in dread. Hasn't the poor boy already been through enough? But they ignored her. Then she braced her hands on the glass to steady herself as the coach rolled into motion. She couldn't believe she had failed to deliver her message. What would become of the light rider's son? Run, Jacob, if you want to live, she thought. Run and hide. They're coming for you next. Chapter One The Pickpocket Harris the Pie Man sold the best pot pies in Covent Garden Market, famous for their flaky golden crust. His market stall was always thronged with hungry customers and surrounded by a cloud of the most delicious smells. That morning, as usual, Mr. Harris was so busy collecting coins and wrapping up the beef or chicken pot pies his customers demanded that he did not notice a very odd thing happening behind him. A mincemeat pie had levitated itself off the top shelf of his shop for no apparent reason. His customers also failed to observe this strange phenomenon, too busy jostling to be the next in line. Quite unnoticed, minding its own business, the pie began floating toward the shop's back door, which had been left open to admit the cool morning air. Bobbing along, the escaping pie glided out the back door and landed in the waiting hands of a boy. An extraordinarily hungry boy of twelve, with a tangled forelock of dirty blonde hair, sooty smudges on his cheeks, a devilish gleam in his blue eyes, and the survival instincts of a feral alley cat. His name was Jake, and he'd had nothing to eat in two days except an apple core he'd snatched away from some handsome cab driver's horse. But now, ha! With a laugh under his breath, he plucked the pie out of the air, maneuvered it under his shabby coat, and ran. Only one thought thudded in his mind, a very drumbeat from his stomach. Eat, eat, eat. Blimey, he should have done this days ago, except the carrot head had made him promise not to use his odd new powers to steal. Of course, he knew it was wrong to take what didn't belong to him, but after a while, a lad's belly tended to win out over conscience. Now, if he could just get rid of his conscience altogether, thought Jake, he could eat and wear and own whatever he liked, thanks to his unexpected new abilities. Where they came from, what it meant— he did not know and could not afford to care, so he could see ghosts, so he could move things with his mind, though not very well yet. He was still learning. The whole thing had only started about a week ago. But considering the advantages this new talent suddenly gave him as one of London's most notorious boy thieves, he was not about to ask too many questions. All he knew was that his never-ending struggle to survive as an orphan on the streets of Queen Victoria's London had suddenly grown a whole lot easier. 
With that, he dodged off into the colorful chaos of the endless market, and nobody paid him any mind. Everywhere, from stalls and shops, barrows and handcarts, the hawkers, hucksters and peddlers sought to move their wares. There were bone grubbers and lamplighters, floozies, flower girls and fortune tellers, quacks proclaiming the amazing health benefits of potions they'd invented, dilapidated gentlemen sold cast-offs from the gentry, while a lady offered a litter of baby weasels that she said would grow into excellent pest removers and help to eat the beetles in your house. There were broomstick menders and candlestick makers, dealers in bonnets, braces, and bootlaces, second-hand sellers of every kind of useless junk imaginable. More importantly, there was food, all sorts of glorious food. Vendors in open stalls were selling anything you could want to eat, if you had the money. Jake did not nor did his many acquaintances running around the place, assorted ragtag orphans, beggar children, and junior pickpockets hard at work, ducking low as they wove through the crowd, grabbing whatever edibles opportunity granted and disappearing again before anyone noticed. All the while, beneath the soaring steel beams of the market's great roof, the costermonger's familiar chants resounded. Oi, turnips! Cabbages! Cabbages and turnips! Sweet pears, eight a penny, oh, buy my pears. Cherry cherries, sound and round. Pineapples from the glass house, luxury for your table, madam. Favourite of the gentry. Get your oranges here, sweet and juicy. Walnuts, roasted walnuts, a cockney woman yelled out in a hoarse sing-song. Beside her, the dairy maids were selling milk straight from their stinky cow. Farther on, the baked potato man was doing a lively business. The butcher's stall displayed a row of little headless carcasses hung upside down. Rabbits, pigeons, chickens for the stew pot. Sheep's feet, get your trotters here, hot or cold. Jelly deals, pickled whelks. The snail shells clattered as the fishermen turned them over with a large metal scoop. These, of course, were not as popular as London fish and chips wrapped in brown paper. With a bit of vinegar squirted on top, it was a meal fit for a king, or a savvy young prince of the rookery like himself. Jake strode on, protecting the pie under his jacket. He arranged his grubby red scarf over it to help hide it. Meanwhile, curious entertainment punctuated the end of every aisle he passed. A bamboo flute player of Asian origins piped an exotic tune. Farther down, some ne'er-do-well was mesmerizing his dupes with sleight-of-hand tricks. And beyond him, a blind beggar sang soulful hymns, thanking the people when he heard the shillings drop into his hat. The acrobat family was throwing each other around beneath the rotunda, and closer by, a strolling actress past her prime was chilling her audience with a dramatic reading of the last dying speeches of notorious criminals recently gone to the gallows. But... If there was a warning for Jake in the moral of her tale, it was lost on him as he went by at top speed, trying to look natural. Cool-nerved as ever, he headed for the market's northern exit in order to avoid his mustachioed nemesis, Constable Flanagan. Spice cakes! Gingerbread here! Fresh baked crumpets! Get them while they're hot! Penny pies! Plum duff! Who'll try my puddings? Pippin's here, a familiar high-pitched voice yelled out in the crowd. Shiny apples, red or green, now's your chance, pick them out cheap. Uh, Jake! Oi, Jake! He froze. Blast it! The carrot head had seen him. He mouthed a silent curse. It was just his luck she'd spotted him now. She'd catch him red-handed. Jake, where are you going? She called. Nosy. He could never decide if Danny O'Dell was all right or the bane of his existence. He could hear her coming up closer behind him. Hesitating, he did not turn around at once, debating with himself. What to do? What to do? If he greeted her, she'd notice him acting suspicious and would realize he'd broken his promise not to steal. But if he tried to ignore her, that would only raise her Irish temper. She'd yell the louder and all the world would turn and look and Flanagan would be on him in a trice. It seemed he had no choice. Bracing himself, Jake slowly turned around and tried to look innocent, like any respectable citizen. It didn't work. Danny O'Dell was ten years old, with chestnut hair, smart green eyes, and a smattering of freckles, 
and though he would not have admitted it under torture, she was the only soul in this rotten old world that he trusted, along with maybe her stupid dog. As usual, her tiny brown Norwich terrier, Teddy, poked his head out of the old canvas sack Danny wore strapped across her back. Teddy yipped eagerly when he saw Jake, and smelled mincemeat pies somewhere close. But Danny's eyes narrowed, homing in at once on the round shape underneath his coat. She set her wheelbarrow down and folded her arms across her chest. "'What are you up to, Jake Reed?' "'Uh, what, what?' "'What are you hiding under your coat?' she demanded, as if she were his mother. Jake knew from experience it was no use lying to her. With her drunken, superstitious da and her tribe of wild, brawling elder brothers, Danny O'Dell was the only honest one in her family. Long before her ma had died and left her in charge, she had learned to smell a lie a mile away. The thought of her rowdy teenage brothers and how they were of no help to her at all, but treated her like their maid and snatched any food away she tried to bring home, well, that and the ragged sight of her, just as hungry and desperate as he, made Jake relent all of a sudden. The mincemeat pie was big enough to share, after all, and really he was so proud of his accomplishment, stealing it by magic, that he could not resist a chance to boast. Oh, uh, nothing, just this. He opened his coat quick, sly and secretive, and flashed a cocky smile. Her green eyes widened like the starboard lanterns on a ship. Her freckles turned to dark dots as her face went pale. She reached out and shut his jacket with a frightened glance around. "'You promised,' she whispered angrily. "'You can't just steal for a living, Jake Reed. The magistrate's already given you two chances.' She launched into one of her grand rants, but oddly enough, Jake didn't mind her scolding. In a strange way, it comforted him somehow. It showed that at least somebody out there cared if he lived or died. "'You think that one night in the clink was bad?' she cried. "'That was only to teach you a lesson, you daftling. They catch you thieving again, they're gonna hang you.' "'But I didn't steal it, eh?' He couldn't wipe the grin off his face. It just floated over to me like. If something comes over and puts itself in your hands, that's not the same as stealing. Mother Mary, Danny made the sign of the cross. I told you not to trifle with them powers. It could be the work of the devil, he scoffed. It's not the work of the devil, you nit. It's just a, a bit of fun. Now, you want a slice or not? Danny O'Dell fell silent, arguing with herself, Jake supposed, with her conscience. She tried to be the conscience of them both. Her little brown dog, of course, had no such scruples. Teddy leaned eagerly over her shoulder, his black nose twitching at top speed to sniff out the hidden food. Danny still hadn't given him an answer, buying time as she tried to fight temptation. No, you'll get the headache, she reproached him with a sullen look. Jake shrugged. It was true. He had learned by trial and error that each time he exercised his inexplicable new abilities, it soon left him with a splitting headache, feeling weak and wobbly, drained. He was already starting to feel that way now. All the more reason to get to a safe place fast, somewhere he could gorge himself in peace without worrying about Harris the pie man seeing him or that blasted Constable Flanagan. Right, you coming or not? She lifted her chin bravely. I'll have no truck with stolen goods. It ain't respectable. He snorted. Suit yourself, stubborn carrothead. Scowling and rather insulted that she turned up her nose at his offering, Jake turned away, but then he suddenly felt a small tug on his sleeve. Uh, Mr. Jake? He glanced down at the little orphan boy in dirty overalls who had just run over to them. Oi, what is it, Petey? He mumbled, suffering an odd twinge from his not-quite-dead conscience. He hoped the little fellow hadn't seen him stealing. Petey was only six years old and quite looked up to him. Jake didn't want to set a bad example, and he really didn't want to have to share. He eyed his young colleague in question. "'There's some people over there looking for you, Jake,' Petey informed him. "'Thought you want to know.' "'Looking for me?' he echoed in surprise. "'Who?' "'I don't know, sir, but they don't seem right. I see him over there by the flower girl. "'Probably Constable Flanagan,' Danny remarked, folding her arms across her chest like a know-it-all. "'No, miss, not the bobbies. Them blokes over there,' Petey said. "'They've been asking all the kids if anyone's seen you.' Jake and Danny both peered in the direction that Peter's grubby finger pointed. Jake furrowed his brow. He noticed the strangers at once because they looked so out of place— 
A tall, elegant gentleman in a black top hat was speaking to the children, shielding his nose from the offending smells around him with a handkerchief. The stranger wore a long, fine coat and carried a fancy walking stick in his hand. Around him were a trio of bruisers, including a bald-headed muscle man that must have been six and a half feet tall. Danny glanced at Jake in worry, then looked at Petey. What do they want with him? The small boy shrugged. Did one of them used to be your apprentice master, Jake? That, that coal factory owner or one of the others that used to beat you? Jake shook his head with an ominous feeling. He didn't like the look of this at all. I've never seen them before, he murmured, already backing away. I'd better get out of here. Tell him, tell him I went that way. He pointed to the left, but intended to go to the right. Will do, Jake, Pete said cheerfully, and then ran off to carry out his orders. Jake turned to Danny, gesturing to her to bend down with him behind her wheeled cart. She did. He angled the pot pie furtively out of his coat. Hide this for me. Bring it you know where. I'm going to find out what this toff wants, then I'll meet you there and we'll share it. Jake, she protested in a whisper. I ain't taking your contraband. I could get in trouble. Then who'll take care of Teddy? Well, I can't get caught with it, he shot back in a whisper. If they catch me with it, I'll be sent to Newgate. Ha! Huh. So you admit I was right and you were wrong. Just take it, he ordered. She huffed and fumed, but finally did him the favor, secreting the precious pie away behind the canvas drape, concealing the lower shelf of her apple cart. One of these days, Jake Reed, you're going to get me killed. Go on, get out of here, she urged, nodding toward the exit. And be careful, I don't like the looks of them people. Me neither, Jake nodded in farewell. Then he stayed low as he crept away from her cart. When it seemed safe, he stood up and continued moving stealthily toward the end of the aisle. Who the blazes was after him now, he wondered. He did not intend to stick around and find out. More worried than he had let on, he pulled the brim of his drab cap lower to shade his eyes and turned up the collar of his threadbare coat to help conceal his face. Hands in pocket, he wove nimbly through the crowd. Confident that he could get away with ease, as he had so many times, he paused to peer back around the corner at the strangers. Suddenly, the gentleman in the long coat spotted him. Quite without meaning to, Jake locked eyes with him. The stranger started forward with a look of shocked recognition. Jacob! he yelled. Jake's eyes widened. He knows me? But if twelve years of life had taught him anything, it was that any time someone called him Jacob rather than just plain Jake, it spelled trouble. There! There he is, Oxley! The gentleman pointed, nudging his bald giant. Bring that boy to me! Go! In the next moment, the mighty muscle man was charging at him like a bull, his two helpers following. Shoppers went flying out of their way as the black-clad strangers plowed through the crowd. Jake stared at them, motionless for a second, from pure shock. Blimey, he breathed. Then he ran for his life. Chapter Two A Family Resemblance Abandoning all attempt at stealth, Jake tore off through the market. He leaped a barrel, ducked behind a stack of clucking crated chickens, then sprinted past the tulip lady. Stop that boy! Stop, thief! He glared over his shoulder as Harris the pieman joined the fox hunt. Rushing out of his stall, he pointed after Jake. Constable Flanagan, it's that blasted reed boy again! The next thing he knew, the bobbies were blowing their whistles fiercely on the chase. Jake cursed, inspired by the thought of Newgate Prison to move with even greater speed. He zipped around stalls, dodged under display stands, spooked the donkey hitched to the tea cart as he vaulted over a row of hay bales and scrambled on. Racing out into the wide open square around the market, he finally found a bit of luck. Danny's wild elder brothers were loitering on the benches with their gang and their dolly mop girls, as bad grown-up troublemakers as he was the junior sort. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John O'Dell usually gave him an affectionate smack in the head when they saw him, but this was sport the Irish boyos could appreciate. Run, Jakey lad! Give him what for! Go, go! They laughed and cheered him on as he ran past, then helpfully misdirected Constable Flanagan and his bobbies. The Odell boys ignored the black-clad thugs, but surely, Jake thought, the strangers would not dare follow him into the rough rookery neighborhood. It was a treacherous place to go if you didn't belong, with many shady characters lurking about. 
Here, the tall apartment buildings crowded together, turning the narrow streets into dim, shadowed canyons. Jake's running footfalls echoed off the grimy brick walls. Only a few people were around, but when the rookery folk sensed trouble, they closed their doors and pulled their dirty curtains shut. Jacob! The gentleman's voice rang into the street behind him. It is you, isn't it? Blazes, why are they still following me? Jacob, please, I only want to talk to you. Leave me alone, he hollered back in fury. Every wily street instinct in him warned him not to believe the man's effort to sound friendly. He felt a slight temptation to find out what they wanted, but his better sense told him just to run. And so he did, bolting down the street. Get back here, you brat, the man snarled. Ha, thought Jake, his head starting to pound after using his strange talent to steal the pie. He tried to blink the throbbing pain away and barreled on, but the dizziness was getting worse. At the four-way intersection, he ducked into the alley to the right. Just around the corner, he pressed his back against the wall. Chest heaving, he glanced around, needing some kind of distraction to shake them off. He hesitated to use his powers again, knowing it would only add to his sick feeling, but what choice did he have? He brought up his hand just like he had practiced back at his hideaway. He concentrated on a distant garbage bin and summoned up all his mental focus. Pa! He suddenly flung his fingers like you might flicker water droplets off your hand. At once, the garbage bin clattered onto its side as if someone had kicked it. A dog began barking at the disturbance. The ruse worked. His pursuers raced off in the direction of the noise. At once, he pressed away from the wall and continued running down the alley to the right. Unfortunately, it didn't take long for the strangers to realize the trail had gone cold. That chilling, elegant voice echoed off the maze of brick alleyways. We're not dealing with any ordinary boy, you fools. Find him. No ordinary boy? Jake was starting to feel seriously woozy, but these words drew him up short. It sounded as if the stranger already knew of his secret abilities, but, but how? Aside from Danny, he had told no one, and though she was a girl, the carrot head could keep a secret. Fact was, she didn't want word of this getting out any more than he did, for if the local gangs found out what he could do, they'd soon be forcing him to join them. That was a fate that Jake had been doing his best to avoid. It was probably his destiny to join the criminals, but for now, he held out some small dwindling hope that life might still have something better in store for him. There he is! After him! Go! Uttering a choice curse under his breath, Jake raced on, he dashed off down another alley, past a bleak, noisy factory, belching steam and smoke into the air, but the piercing headache was growing so strong it was starting to make him downright queasy. While the pistons and machines inside the factory churned and clamored, he drew on his powers one last time to knock over a pile of barrels, creating a temporary blockade behind him. The barrels tumbled and rolled, clogging the tight alley. It would not stop the pursuers, but it should slow them down. Then he knew he had to find a place to hide. He wasn't sure how much longer he could keep running. The world began to spin, the alley walls closing in on him as he staggered on, pushing off the dirty brick buildings. He lurched along, zigzagging, his chest heaving. With his head pounding so, his vision grew blurry and distorted, and when the ghost of an old beggar appeared without warning, it startled him so much he nearly shrieked. "'Wait!' it moaned, holding up a bluish-gray transparent hand to stop him. Jake ignored the spirit, nearly running through it. "'Cheese it! He had no time for conversation with the dead right now!' His second odd new ability— Seeing ghosts didn't give him headaches like the other bit, but he could hardly say he was used to it. It was not exactly normal, after all, seeing spirits of the dead. And in London, they were everywhere. Chatty lot they were, always wanting to talk and talk and tell him everything that was none of his business. He tried to pretend that he had not seen the ghost and forced himself to keep running toward the turn ahead. The apparition materialized again a few feet ahead of him, an old, homeless beggar with icicles hanging off his nose. Poor old man must have frozen to death some cold winter's night in one of these back alleys. Not that way, boy, the spirit warned in a thin, quavering voice, but it was too late. Jake had already stumbled into the nearest turn. A dead end. 
A brick wall too high to climb blocked the garbage-strewn space. He glanced around in panic, looking for his next escape. The back doors of the tenement houses on each side of the alley were boarded up. Broken windows yawned above, out of reach. There was no way out except the way he had come in, but the strangers were right behind him. Jake whirled around. At that moment, the bald giant appeared in the opening. His face was red from the chase. We, we got him now, sir, he panted, calling back over his shoulder as his two helpers joined him. The first was a little rat-faced weasel of a man with a scrawny moustache. The other a pale white bruiser with flame-red hair that stuck straight up. They too were winded, but they lined up on either side of the big fellow, blocking the mouth of the alley so he could not get out. Trapped. Jake swallowed hard, but was puzzled by a whiff of sulfur on the air, probably coming from that factory. "'Well, well, you are a slippery one, aren't you, my lad?' The elegant gentleman was the last to arrive on the scene. Slightly out of breath, he strolled up behind his men, blotting the sweat from his face with a handkerchief. "'You've led us on a merry chase.' "'What do you want with me?' Jake demanded, holding on to his bravado even as he backed away. The lordly fellow laughed. "'Ah, well, call me sentimental, but I suppose I just wanted to have a look at my closest living kin before we kill you, my dear lad.' Jake's jaw dropped. He heard the threat against his life, but it did not hold the slightest interest for him compared to the other word the man had used. Kin? The stranger stalked closer. Impressive display back there. So, you inherited the Fernwickunk, I see. What? The Fernwickunk. The old German name for your gift, of course, but if you prefer the classical languages, you can call it telekinesis. Tele, tele what? he echoed, rather bewildered. Tele, Latin meaning at a distance, kinesis, Greek, for motion. Then he shook his head with a bit of a sneer. I should have known you'd get it. You even look like him. Like who? he exclaimed, all the more bewildered. It's whom? the toff corrected, but did not answer this question either. Tell me, do you have your mother's gifts as well, hmm? See any ghosts around, my clever boy? Jake floundered, overwhelmed. You knew my mother? he asked in amazement. Who was she, please? As a foundling, he knew nothing of his parents. The director of the orphanage where he had spent most of his childhood had no information on them, not their names, their situation in life, or, more importantly, why they hadn't kept him. Had they wanted to get rid of him because they didn't love him? Or had something terrible happened to them? Jake wasn't sure which was worse, but the question chafed like a permanent splinter stuck deep in his heart. Whoever they were, he had no clue of his origins except the baby bib embroidered with his first name, Jacob, and a necklace, a simple black cord with a small seashell on it. It had been draped around his neck when he'd been found eleven years ago. Some kindly fisherman had spotted him, a baby in a basket, floating down the mighty river Thames, happily gurgling to himself while the giant ships lumbered past. The basket had been made of willow reeds, which was why the orphanage staff had thought it hilarious to give him the last name, Reed. His real last name was anybody's guess. Did you know me? he cried, hating the plaintive sound of his own voice as the pain slipped out. Uh, please, sir, t tell me who I am. The toff smirked, but took a measure of pity on him. Only the son of the most arrogant fool I've ever known, and a thief to boot. Like father, like son, I see. Still, it's nothing personal against you, dear nephew. How could it be? I don't even know you. You seem a fine, plucky lad and all that, but I'm afraid you're much too dangerous for me to leave alive. Trust me, it's better this way. He glanced at the bald giant while Jake was still marveling. Carry on. Aye, my lord. What of his powers, sir? the rat-faced one asked nervously. Oh, he's out of steam. Look at him. Rather green about the gills, eh, Jacob? Oh, yes, I know all about it. Pity you won't live long enough to learn how to control it. Wait, please, Jake cried at a loss. Y you, you call me nephew. Is that true? Are you my uncle? Do I look like the sort of fellow who'd lie to a doomed soul? He countered in pleasant sarcasm. Anger flashed through him at the man's cruelty. Fine, then. Uh, be like that. And I'll believe you anyway. 
Oh, I don't even want to be related to you, you glocky blooming mumper. The toff furrowed his brow at the street language insult, but smiled in curious amusement. You have some spirit, lad. I'll give you that. Almost remind me of myself when I was your age, but it doesn't change my mind. Adieu. He continued strolling away. Ay, Jake yelled, growing increasingly nervous. Ay, uncle, running away, you, you Nancy, where are you going? He demanded, trying to stall and hopefully delay his doom. Where am I going? His supposed uncle laughed again in his haughty, annoying way. He turned around, his jaw clenched, a brief flash of fire in his eyes. Do you really want to know? I, I asked you, didn't I? I am going back, urchin, to enjoying my life as the sixth Earl of Griffin, actually. You didn't think I'd give up all that power and privilege just because you somehow managed to survive all those years ago, now do you? Terribly sorry, my boy, but there can only be one Lord Griffin at a time, and that distinction belongs at present to my more worthy self. Ha! Cheerio, then. Give my regards to your parents, Jacob. You will be seeing them soon. Jake stared at him. My parents? Turning to his men, the Earl of Griffin added in a lower, harder tone, Be quick about it, and quiet. I'm getting out of here. It won't do for me to be seen just in case. Report to me later after it's done. Aye, my lord, don't you worry about that, the bald one said. We'll get your job done, lickety-split. See that you do. Lord Griffin cast Jake one final glance, cold but pitying, then pivoted on his heel and marched out of the alley. When he had gone, his three henchmen drew out large, gleaming knives. Then they started closing in on Jake. Chapter 3 A Knight of the Order Jake continued backing away. Unfortunately, the Earl of Griffin was right. His powers were out of steam. Frankly, after all these years of being an orphan without any kin, he was in shock that he had an uncle at all, an earl no less. He had never dreamed he might be related to such lofty stock. Of course, it figured that his one living relative would want to kill him upon making his acquaintance. He'd had the same effect on his apprentice masters, strangely. At any rate, despite feeling weak and sick enough to puke from using his powers, the threat of impending doom rather helped to clear a person's head. Heart pounding, Jake took a quick glance around, scanning the alley for any sort of weapon. At once, he reached down and grabbed the smooth end of a broken bottle, threatening his approaching attackers with a jagged end. They just laughed. Suddenly furious, Jake hurled the bottle at the bald giant. The big man ducked and it flew past him. Jake took two, three steps backwards, then out of the corner of his eye spotted another possible weapon. He dove to retrieve it, bringing it up in both hands, a sturdy board with a big rusty nail sticking out of the end. "'Come on, Baldy, I ain't afraid of you!' he yelled. Rough laughter followed. "'I, he's a right plum-goer, ain't he? <laughs> Have at it, little master!' Ho! Oh, the flame-haired fellow cried, mocking him as Jake swung the board again like a cricket bat, trying to warn them back. The old beggar ghost materialized again behind the earl's henchmen. He shook his head, looking on in worry. You're small enough. Try to dodge past them. How am I supposed to do that? Jake retorted. Do what? the rat-faced echoed. Wh who's he talking to? I don't know. A kid's loony, said the redhead. Mind your business, Jake spat. Oh, our business is killing you, little lordling, said the big one. So come on and be a good lad. Let's get it over with, like your uncle said. Don't worry, Master Jacob, the rat face chimed in, brandishing his knife. We'll make it nice and quick for you. You won't feel a thing hardly. Gulp. They laughed. I'm going to die. Get him, the big one muttered. Jake gasped as his back suddenly came up flat against the brick wall. He had retreated as far as he could go, and there was no way out. He braced himself to meet his maker, briefly wishing that he had behaved himself just a wee bit better in his short, unlucky life. But just before he squeezed his eyes shut for the death blow, a flutter of motion overhead made him glance up. His eyes widened as a large, fierce-looking man leaped out of an open window above and came hurtling down, landing with a lion-like pounce atop the brick wall behind Jake's back. From there, he leaped again, his long hair flying free of his dark hood, his black duster coat billowing behind him. 
he slammed down squarely into the alley between Jake and his uncle's henchmen. With one smooth motion, he reached under his coat with both hands, clad in fingerless gloves, and pulled out a pair of large, murderous knives. Before the thugs could recover from their shock, he let out a roar and attacked them. They fell into chaos before this one-man army. The stranger whirled like a bladed top. He thrust, he leaped, he ran a few steps up the side of the brick wall, vaulted into a spin, and kicked the rat-faced henchman in the head. Jake watched him with his mouth hanging open. "'What are you still doing here, you fool?' The warrior sent Jake an impatient glance over his shoulder. "'Don't just stand there, run!' Jake jerked to attention, ready to obey, possibly for the first time in his life. This was not the sort of man whose orders you ignored. Unfortunately, while the fight raged, three against one, Jake couldn't manage to slip away. The space was too narrow. He glanced around for another exit from the alley. Spotting another garbage can nearby, he dragged it over to the wall, turned it upside down, and climbed on it. Clutching the top of the brick wall, he started to pull himself up, but the old beggar ghost suddenly pointed, behind him, yelling, Look out! Jake glanced over his shoulder just as the bald giant, Oxley, hurled a knife at him, but the warrior also saw. He grabbed his nearest opponent, the rat-faced man, and swung him around to block the flying blade. It shuddered to a halt on the rat man's back. He let out a gobbled squeak. The warrior threw him aside. Keep going, Everton, he ordered as he stalked toward the bald giant. Everton, Jake whispered with a tingle down his spine. Why does everyone keep calling me that? It was the same name the watery woman had called him when he had gone mudlocking a few days ago. After promising Danny that he'd try not to steal, he had hoped to find a little something he could pawn in order to buy food. Taking off his old, holy boots, he had rolled up his trouser legs and waded into the Thames at low tide, hunting for any valuables people might have dropped into the river. You never knew what might wash up in the mud. Coins, watches, brooches— jewel cravat pins. These were the holy grail. You could eat for a month if you found some such lost trinket. Just bring it into the pawn shop and collect your reward. Of course, all the starving mudlark children ever really found was trash. Hope sprang eternal, but instead of gold coins, they usually found dead fish heads, old broken bottles, and bits of rotting rope from passing ships. But that day, Jake had found more than what he had bargained for which was why he was not going anywhere near the Thames ever again. For, as he had learned from shocking first-hand experience, there were weird ladies living in the river, underneath the water. No one else seemed aware of this. He wouldn't have believed it himself if he had not come face to face with one while peering down into the lazy brown current trying to make his fortune. He had blinked, and there she was a strange lady floating underneath the waves, sort of treading water. She had looked at him, and he had looked at her, and both gasped. That was when he knew he must be truly losing his marbles, bats in the belfry, mad as a March hare. She had had long purplish hair and a fine-featured face with skin as pale as the inside of a cockle shell. She had been dressed in full battle regalia over a pale, floaty, toga sort of gown, like an ancient goddess. A strange, faraway song had echoed in his head as Jake had stood there staring at her with his mouth hanging open, while the dirty Thames water slogged around his knees. He had not known if he should try to save the creature from drowning or if she might try to bite him like an eel. Before he could decide, she had pointed at him, her dark green fingernail just breaking the surface of the waves. You, she had uttered, her voice bubbling up to him in tones of shocked recognition. Everton! What? he had burst out, astonished. Oi, Jakey, find something good! one of the other children had cried, noticing him staring down at the water in amazement. He had glanced over, still dazed by the impossible encounter. The other kids were already hopping, running, splashing through the shallows to see if he had found a treasure, but when he looked down again, she was gone. Everton. He had wandered all night long, tossing and turning in his hideaway. Why would she call him that? He had never heard that name before. But it had eventually struck him there could be no lady living in the river. That didn't make any sense. 
A person had to breathe, which meant he was either so hungry that he had been hallucinating, or he had finally gone nicky in the head and would be locked up in the horrid lunatic asylum if anyone found out. Jake could not abide being locked up anywhere. Whatever misfortunes he suffered, at least he was as free as a bird. Intent on staying that way, he had coolly backed away from that spot in the river, leaving his comrades to help themselves to whatever hidden valuables remained. Climbing back up onto the docks, he had wiped the mud off his feet as fast as he could, pulled his boots back on, and fled. And now this wild warrior, appearing out of nowhere, dropping out of the blasted sky, had just called him the same name. Everton. Jake suddenly understood. Of course! Idiots! He jumped off the garbage can with a scowl. You've got the wrong person, all of you! He shouted, gesturing angrily at them. My name's not Everton. I'm just Jake Reed. Nobody listened. They kept on fighting, two against one now, until all of a sudden the shrill, familiar notes of Constable Flanagan's police whistle pierced the air. The bald giant and the red-haired henchman exchanged a look of alarm. Hey, the bobbies are coming. Let's get out of here. They fled the alley, but when the warrior started to run after them, Jake cried out, Wait, please! The intimidating fellow turned around, his chest heaving from exertion. What are you still doing here? he growled. Who are you? Derek Stone is my name, but it doesn't matter who I am. What matters is who you are. I was sent to protect you, Jacob. That's all you need to know for now. No time. He wiped off his blade. Can you get yourself to the Strand from here? Jake scoffed at the question. Of course. Good. Go there now. Find Beacon House, beside the river. The people there will help you. Just tell them I sent you and that you're the little scoundrel everyone's looking for. Me? Who's looking for me? What are you talking about? Just do it he said in exasperation, turning to stare toward the approaching sound of the bobby's whistle. The police were on their way. W what are you going to do then? Jake demanded, though he barely knew where he got the nerve to question the tall, mean-eyed barbarian. I'm going to hunt those servitors down and finish this, he said grimly, or they'll just keep coming after you. Now go! Lord, you're as stubborn as your father. With that, Derek Stone ran out of the alley. Jake stared after him, shocked yet again. He knew my father? His mind swirled with countless questions. Then he shook his head to himself. Servitors, he wondered. He must have meant to say servants. Then Jake snapped out of his daze, hearing the policeman around the corner. Lord knew he could not afford to cross paths with the bobbies. Rushing back to the overturned garbage can, he used it to hoist himself over the wall. He had just dropped out of sight on the other side when the bobbies arrived in a flurry of pounding footsteps. From Constable Flanagan's whistle, there came a piercing shrill. You're there, the mustachioed sergeant shouted. Halt, in the name of the law! Thankfully, they weren't talking to him for once. Stop him! You there! Get that man surrounded! Blimey, he's climbing up the wall, sir! Running footsteps. Quickly, pull his feet! Oof! On the other side of the wall, Jake heard the sounds of large men diving into a heap, like in a rugby match, grunts and curses. Hold him, I say! We've got you now, you ruffian! How'd you run up the side of a bloody wall like that? One of the bobbies cried. Jake wished he could see what was happening. He listened for all he was worth. All right, all right, let him up, men. Flanagan's stern, no-nonsense voice was familiar. Let's see what he has to say for himself. Where do you think you're on about, you, climbing up the side of a wall like a blasted spider? Easy, boys, a deep baritone rumbled in response. When Jake heard Derek Stone's voice and realized the bobbies had indeed caught him, he could have kicked himself for delaying the warrior with his questions. Arm to the teeth he is, sir. So, I see, Constable Flanagan replied. Drop your weapons, you. Put your hands up, now. Sir, look, he's got blood on him. Keep him surrounded, lads. How'd you get that blood on you, eh? I, uh, cut myself, Derek answered in a bored tone. Right, mister, you better put them weapons down, nice and slow. All right, all right, take it easy, Derek soothed. Don't you take it easy me, I'm placing you under arrest. For what? Derek retorted. Disturbing the peace, don't know yet what you've done, but you're up to no good by the look of you. An innocent man don't run when he's told to halt. At that moment, thankfully, Jake discovered a chink in the mortar between two bricks. He leaned down, spying through it. 
a knot formed in his stomach as he watched the policeman encircling Derek Stone. He bent down slowly, calmly, to place his weapons on the ground as instructed. Meanwhile, closer by, one of the bobbies came poking around in the alley where they had fought. He stopped with a gasp. Constable Flanagan, sir! Come quick! There's a dead man here with a knife in his back! Flanagan pointed at Derek in fury. Arrest him now! The warrior let out a sigh as all the bobbies rushed him. Jake looked on, aghast, as the policeman piled atop the rude hero who had saved his life, while those who had attacked him were nowhere to be seen. From under the pile of policemen, Derek cursed, but Jake noticed that he did not lift a finger to fight off the bobbies the way he'd thrashed the other three. Dangerous as he was, at least he seemed to have a clear idea of who was good or bad. Jenkins, bring the handcuffs, Flanagan ordered. Shackle his ankles, too. Fletcher, comb the alley for any clues of what went on here. Yes, sir. When the officers backed away, Derek was on his stomach on the ground, his wrists bound behind him, his dark mane hanging in his angry face. Flanagan proudly dusted off his hands and gave Derek an insolent nudge with his toe. You're a murderer, aren't you? It was more of a statement than a question. Why don't you confess right now and save us the trouble? We both know you're going to hang for this. Jake paled. It's not how it looks, Derek said. If I had a penny for each time I'd heard that. Why'd you kill him, eh? Didn't. I don't see anyone else around here that could have done it. Stabbed him right in the back, didn't you? No, not my style, Derek growled. Flanagan looked appalled at this. What are you, some sort of monster? Derek laughed darkly. Something like that, he snarled back, which even Jake knew wasn't smart. Clunk, the sound of a skull getting a whack of the nightstick. The London police never did seem to appreciate sarcasm, as Jake himself had learned the hard way. A few minutes later, they drew Derek into the police wagon that had been summoned, a heavy black carriage fortified with metal bars. Through the chink in the brick wall, Jake watched, appalled, as they drove Derek Stone away. Oh, this is terrible. What am I going to do? He couldn't remember the last time an adult had actually helped him. He wasn't fond of them as a species, but this Stone fellow had just risked his neck for him and got arrested for his pains, no doubt to be charged with murder and, with Jake's luck, probably sent to the gallows. And it's all my fault. More to the point, Jake realized, whatever information Derek might have about his father would be lost unless he could figure out a way to save the warrior's neck. Jake suddenly realized he was in danger of being arrested himself as the bobbies on the other side of the wall discussed spreading out to comb the area. Besides that, his so-called uncle's henchmen were still out there somewhere looking for him. They could be lurking anywhere right now, he thought uneasily. Derek had warned him that they would just keep coming after him until they had finished him off, and Jake believed him. Better hide. Ducking back into the maze of alleys, he brushed off the thought of trying his luck at that mansion Derek had ordered him to go to, Beacon House. No boy of the streets who had lived by his wits for as long as Jake had was about to go and blindly trust himself to strangers. He had seen the place before, a, a great, hulking old mansion on the river, but he wasn't sure who owned it or what went on in there. He prowled through the back alleys until he came to the Strand and spied on the place from across the street for about ten minutes. But he didn't go in. No, he needed to think carefully about all this before deciding his next move. Recalling Danny's promise to meet him with the pot pie at his hideaway, he picked up his pace to return to the only place he thought of as home. It wasn't much, but his uncle's minions wouldn't find him there. Nobody would. It was a safe place, a hidden place, where freaks like him belonged. Chapter 4 Danny O'Dell Danny O'Dell headed home to the rookery, back to the rough, grimy world she hated. But she only stayed long enough to put her apple cart away, as she angled it into the ground-floor apartment in the tenement house where the Odells lived, squashed into two small rooms, she dreamed of a day when she might be respectable and live in a nice home, where everything was pretty and clean, orderly and quiet, where no one was drunk or crude-mannered, and a dirty word bellowed at the top of a person's lungs would have been unthinkable. 
In her neighborhood, such things passed for normal conversation. On the other hand, rookery life had made her tougher than she looked. The world saw a poor but decent girl, small for her age, but when provoked, Daniela Catherine O'Dell had all the Irish fight as her pack of brawling elder brothers. Fortunately, they weren't at home right now. Otherwise, Jake would not have seen his mincemeat pie again. Come on, Teddy. She let her dog out of the sack, secured his leash, then retrieved the pot pie off the lower shelf of her cart and concealed it under her dark woolen coat. Let's get out of here before anyone comes, she whispered to the dog. With that, she left the apartment, locked and bolted the door, then set out with a business-like stride for Jake's hideaway. Teddy trotted along by her heels. Though she was nervous about carrying Jake's stolen contraband for him, it was her self-appointed role in life to manage that stubborn blockhead. Somebody had to do it, and he didn't have a mother. They had that in common, but at least Danny had known her sainted ma before she died. She still had all the mementos and the single precious photograph of her that Da had set up on the mantel as a sort of shrine. Poor Jake knew nothing of his parents, and she knew he ached about it, though he'd never say so. From the first time she had laid eyes on him three years ago, being pushed around and bullied by her brothers, Danny had realized she had found herself an ally in the harsh rookery world. Her brothers did that sort of thing to her all the time, shoving her this way and that like a football, having fun at her expense. She had shrieked at them like a banshee the day she had found them jovially beating the poor young stranger to a pulp, just to toughen him up, they said, as if they were doing him a favor. When they had finally lost interest in their sport, she had gone over and scraped the boy called Jake Reed up off the cobblestones. Something about the way he pretended to be all right, though his eye was swollen and his chin trembled with his refusal to give way to angry tears, well, it had wrenched her heart, all the more so when he had told her he came from the orphanage. Danny had made it her business since then to look after him, as much as he would let anyone do so. Now, as the world's best expert on all things Jake, she was extremely worried about the weird things happening to him of late. These days, it was one bizarre surprise after another. It was not so much his seeing ghost that alarmed her. Her Irish granny, rest her soul, used to say the second sight was not uncommon. "'Twas a gift the good Lord gave to certain people to let them give the news to those who grieved that their loved ones were in heaven, or to deliver a message for them, like maybe some money they'd stash somewhere in a shoebox. What really worried Danny was the other bit, the way her friend could move things with his mind. It made her want to reach for her rosary. Of course, Jake laughed at her for thinking it might signify something evil, but that was why she had been so strict with him lately— making him promise not to steal or do anything bad, for if the devil had taken an interest in Jake, then her friend had better watch his step. Teddy and she pressed on. After the usual trek across the bridge, they finally arrived at the once grand, arched entrance to Elysian Springs Pleasure Gardens. The old abandoned amusement park had once been one of London's main attractions. Now the paint was peeling on the weathered white pillars, the colorful letters on the curved sign fading into oblivion. She walked through the archway into the park's green acreage and skipped up the winding drive with Teddy. She loved coming here to Jake's hideaway. Elysian Springs was decades past its glory, but it was still a place that made the regular world and all its cares seem a thousand miles away. The big pavilion with its fanciful pastel turrets had been closed for years, but once upon a time fashionable ladies and gentlemen had come here for dinners and concerts and dancing in the garden under the stars. She could just imagine them. There had been strolling musicians and all sorts of acts for entertainment. Jugglers, acrobats, a tightrope walker, a fire-eater, daring trick-horse riders, a man with a dancing monkey and clowns on giant stilts. Back in the old days, there were fireworks shows and carnival games. You could stroll the flowery walkways in the moonlight, or hire a gondola shaped like a swan and go for a boat ride with your sweetheart. The park had many interconnecting canals and small man-made lakes and ponds. The water flowed in from the river. 
Across from the main pavilion was a smaller one where you could pay a penny to go in and see the freaks, the bearded lady, Mr. Littlebit, the world's smallest man, Big Tess, the fattest woman, Lizard Boy, the Siamese twins, or the odd fellow who drove nails up his nose with a hammer. They all still lived here, quietly minding their own business, still happy to let people come and gawk at them, which, to Danny, seemed very rude, but as they said it was a living. The freaks were not ashamed of who and what they were, and so, as Jake put it, bully for them. But Danny did not stop to visit the carnival people today on account of delivering the pot pie back to Jake. With a tug on Teddy's leash, she strode down the graveled walkway toward the lily pond. The fountains no longer ran, but frogs chirruped everywhere amongst the pussy willows. Danny scooped up Teddy and carefully stepped into one of the old faded swan boats. Tail wagging, Teddy put his front paws up on the edge of the swan's wing as Danny put down the oars. Here we go, boy. She rode toward the little overgrown island in the center of the man-made lake, where Jake had taken up residence in an old white gazebo. It was very peaceful gliding through the still waters. Her hard day at the market was forgotten. Soon she spotted Jake standing on a boulder near the water's edge. His back was to her, and with three rocks flying in circles above him, she thought he was trying to juggle, but then she saw that his hands were not moving, and she scowled. Boys, why don't they ever listen? As soon as her swan boat bumped against Jake's island, Teddy bounded over the side and dashed up onto the land to go and see him. The dog's barking broke Jake's concentration, and the three fist-sized rocks he had been levitating with his mind plunked to the ground. Danny put the oars in their holders and carefully stood up. I thought you weren't going to do that any more, she said as she threw her sack over her shoulder and hopped off the boat. Huh? Jake pretended not to hear her over Teddy's happy barking. Don't complain to me when you get the headache. It's not as bad as before. He squeezed his temples with one hand. I think I'm getting stronger at it. She was not sure if that was such a good thing. The headache at least kept him from using his powers too much. She produced the pot pie from under her cloak, and his blue eyes lit up. Oi, Danny O'Dell, you were a right plum lass, you are. I know, she replied. He took it from her and went to sit on his favorite boulder. The next thing she knew, he was shoving huge bites of mincemeat pie into his mouth in a most unmannerly fashion. Give Teddy some. He's starving. Oi, dance, Jake ordered through his mouth full of food. The terrier danced, and Jake tossed him a good-sized crumb. Reluctantly, Danny went over and broke a piece of the pot pie off for herself. So much for her good intentions, she thought, with a shrug. Then she sat down with a flounce of her dreary drab skirts on the top step of the gazebo that Jake had made his temporary home. His few belongings were strewn about inside it. So what happened after you ran off? she asked. I saw those men chase you. I guess you got away. He paused in his chewing and gave her a guarded look. What? she asked, nibbling on the famous pie crust. Jake snorted like a half-wild colt and tossed his dirty blonde forelock out of his eyes. What did they want? she demanded. To, uh, kill me, he said matter-of-factly. What? Perhaps he shouldn't have told her, Jake thought. Danny's green eyes grew as round as the algae-covered pond surrounding his little island. She stared at him in dread. Once he had said that much, however, it was too late to back out from telling her the rest. The truth was, he was glad to share it, because secretly, this was one of those rare occasions where he could admit he might be in just a wee bit over his head. He told her all about it, though he skipped over the magic bits. He knew that topic gave her the willies. Instead, he simply told her about his so-called uncle, the Earl of Griffin, and Derek Stone and his unjust arrest. Jake was all too familiar with the process that Derek would undergo after the police wagon took him away. The Bobbies would haul him into the nearest police station, where he'd be thrown in a holding cell for a few hours until it was his turn to stand before the magistrate. Known in street language as a beak, the magistrate served as a sort of first-round judge who would determine if there was indeed a case to be made against the person arrested. When it was Derek's turn to be brought into the courtroom, probably this evening, the beak would ask questions of everyone involved. 
Their answers would help the court decide if there was enough evidence to formally charge Derek with the crime. If not, the case would be dismissed, and he'd be free to go. But if the Beak determined there was enough evidence to take the case to the next step, then formal charges would be filed, and Derek would be sent to London's dreadful Newgate prison to await trial. Those accused of murder were rarely allowed out on bail. In the meantime, the detectives would carry out their investigation. Finally, at the trial, if Derek Stone were found guilty, he would be sent immediately to the gallows. And I can't let that happen, Jake told Danny. This man saved my life. He didn't kill anyone. It, it wasn't even him who threw the knife. The bald man did it. He hit his fellow henchmen by accident. Derek was only trying to save me. I'm not even sure how he knew I was in that alley, but you should have seen him. He was brilliant. And now he's doomed. Well, they've got it all wrong. Constable Flanagan's already made up his mind that Derek is guilty. You know the Bobby's the only one the Beak is going to listen to? Jake shook his head, dismayed. Oh, this is all my fault. Danny searched his face in worry. So what are you going to do? Only one thing I can do, Jake said grimly. I have to go in there and speak up for him. Tell the magistrate what really happened. What, like a witness? Aye, they'll hang him if I don't. Believe me, I don't want to, but the beak needs to hear the truth of how it all played out. Then maybe they'll see they have no case against him. They'll have to throw out the charges and let him go free, and then I can make him tell me what he knows about my father, he added in a darker tone. Jake, they're not going to listen to you, Danny exclaimed. You're just a kid with a criminal record. What if they don't believe you? I have to try. He stood up for me. Now it's my turn to stand up for him, he said with a scowl. But you could go to jail. You realize what could happen if they remember you nicked this pot pie today? They could toss you into Newgate right along with him. What choice do I have, he argued. I'm not a coward. Anyway, it's the honorable thing to do. She raised her eyebrows, for few people from the rookery ever mentioned honor. He charged on. This fellow stuck his neck out for me. Whoever he is, I can't stand by and see him hanged for my sake. Danny heaved a sigh. Very well, then. Come on, Teddy. We'd better hurry. She scooped up her dog in one arm and grabbed her satchel in the other. We're coming with you. For once, Jake didn't argue. Chapter 5. Witness for the Defense Jake never thought he'd see the day that he would willingly walk into a police station. But standing outside the famous crime-fighting offices at Bow Street, he felt Danny nudge him with her elbow. She nodded in encouragement, Teddy's fuzzy head poking curiously out of the sack on her shoulder once again. Jake braced himself and walked in. They passed all the bobbies on duty and made their way into the magistrate's court. The gallery overlooking the long, narrow courtroom was already crowded with spectators who came to hear about the day's arrests and scuffles as if this was a form of entertainment, taking amusement from other people's miseries. Against the back wall of the high-ceilinged room was a raised platform where the magistrate sat on the middle chair. On both sides of him were clerks scribbling down their notes on the proceedings. The courtroom was a busy place. People came and went among the rows of benches. A few bobbies were always on hand, standing here and there with arms folded, waiting for anyone to misbehave. Some folk in the courtroom were crying, family members of victims or accused criminals who'd been caught. Lawyers trawled for clients, disheveled people still bloodied from their recent troublemaking waited for their turn to step forward and make their excuses. Jake did his best not to look suspicious as he and Danny went and took a seat. One after another, the losers of the day shuffled in, one man accused of making counterfeit coins in his basement. Next came two mean-eyed fishwives arrested for brawling over a particular cast-iron skillet. After them came a jolly fellow accused of stealing a horse, but he insisted he had only stolen the bridle. The horse had simply followed him home, being attached to it. So you see, it weren't my fault, your worship. The audience in the gallery laughed, but the beak rolled his eyes as if he'd heard this one many times before. He sent the jester on to Newgate Prison with a stroke of his quill pen. 
Finally, the clerk advised the judge that the next case on the docket involved a most serious question of murder. Hearing this, a hush fell over the courtroom. A clank of chains announced the prisoner's arrival, and everyone turned to look. Jake winced. If any man had ever walked into a courtroom looking capable of murder, it was Derek Stone. It was not just the messy, menacing size of him in that long black coat, nor the wild tangle of dark hair that hung to his cliff-like shoulders. It was the way he held his chin high and stared straight at the judge, completely unrepentant. The bobbies escorted the manacled prisoner toward the podium for the accused. Danny hugged her dog protectively. That's the man that saved you? Jake nodded, watching. My turn to save him now. Oh, he's terrifying. He looks like he could even squash me brothers, she whispered. He could, believe me, Jake assured her. Then Constable Flanagan stepped up to the opposite podium for the prosecution. Compared to Derek Stone's wild, scruffy, dangerous appearance, the arresting officer looked smart and polished in his tidy blue uniform, the brass buttons down his coat agleam. Please state your name for the court, sir, the head clerk ordered, getting the proceedings underway. Constable Arthur Flanagan, he said proudly. After a few more exchanges of official information, the magistrate looked up wearily from his papers. Mr. Flanagan, describe the circumstances around your arrest of this individual. Yes, sir, Flanagan nodded. I was on duty at Covent Garden Market, my usual post. It started out a quiet morning. Then we were summoned by the pie man, Mr. Harris. The audience murmured in approval at the mention of those famous pies, who claimed a child thief had just robbed him. Danny pushed a pointy elbow into Jake's ribs. Myself and fellow officers went in pursuit of the lad, but then about three blocks northeast of the market, we heard the sounds of a serious altercation in progress. A what? Jake whispered. A fight, Danny translated. Fletcher and Jenkins and I ran toward the sound. And what did you find? the magistrate asked. This man, your worship. Flanagan slanted Derek Stone a disapproving stare. He just emerged from a dead-end alley where we found a corpse. The audience gasped at this macabre twist in the tail. The dead man had a knife in his back, and this one, he eyed Derek fiercely, had blood splashed on his clothes. Hmm. And who is the dead man in question? We don't know his identity, your worship, but this fellow here was less than twenty feet away when we apprehended him. He was trying to escape, he added in reproach. The beak frowned and fixed a piercing gaze on the warrior. Who was this poor dead fellow, and what did you have against him that you'd resort to murder? he baited Derek. Did you kill him in a sudden fit of anger, or was it coldly done, premeditated, hmm? Didn't kill him, Derek Stone growled. Speak up, the recording clerk insisted. Derek glared. I did not stab anyone. The magistrate's frown deepened. State your full name for the court, please. Derek Stone. Your age, 33. Place of residence, he sighed. I have no permanent address, sir. The admission seemed to pain him slightly. Jake was intrigued. No home? Maybe he had something in common with this fearsome fellow after all. Let the record show that the accused is a wandering vagrant, the beak said to the clerk with distaste. No home indeed. How very uncivilized. Well, Mr. Stone, do please tell us your side of the story. Why were you in that alley, if not to do foul murder, eh? Derek Stone took a long, scanning look at the gallery, as though perhaps he feared enemies might be here even now, lurking in the audience. I heard some men harassing a child. I heard his calls for help, so I went to assist. I did not call for help, Jake muttered indignantly. When I went to see what was the matter, I found three men armed with knives, closing in on the boy, with clear intent to do him serious harm, so I jumped into the fray to even the odds. Well, well, rescuing a youngster under attack. You would have us believe you are very gallant, Mr. Stone, the beak taunted. So how did our corpse end up with a knife in his back? When I saw their leader throw his knife at the boy, I shoved that, er, unfortunate fellow into the way to block it. 
The magistrate narrowed his eyes, considering Derek's account. Well, that is a very colorful tale, but I'm afraid even if it is true, you are still looking at charges of manslaughter rather than premeditated murder. Are you sure you want to stick with this story? Derek stared at him, looking utterly insulted that anyone would dare to doubt his word. But the beak was a cynic who had seen it all and spent every day listening to people lie. Sir, it is the truth, he ground out. The reason the constable and his men found only me and the dead man in the alley was because the attackers fled the moment they heard the stupid police whistles. He glanced at the policeman in contempt. If Flanagan and his men hadn't made such a clatter, alerting the villains that they were on their way, then perhaps they would have had a chance to catch the real perpetrators. I say, Constable Flanagan uttered. Instead, he gave them plenty of time to run. But uh, you remained, the beak scrutinized him. That wasn't very intelligent of you. I had to make sure the boy was all right. And was he? Whatever happened to this alleged boy, anyway? Did he escape, Mr. Stone, thanks to your protection? A grim smile curved the warrior's lips. He did, sir. Well, it's a fine tale, but I'm afraid I don't believe you. Unless, well, I don't suppose you can produce this alleged boy as a witness to back up your story? No, your worship, he started to say. But that was the moment Jake stood up and stepped forward, his heart pounding. It was me, sir! The whole courtroom turned and looked at him in surprise. Hat, Danny whispered, nervously hugging her dog. Jake whipped off his drab cloth cap, twisting it in both hands. He took another step forward. I am that boy, your worship, and everything this man just said is true. That's exactly how it happened. The magistrate leaned forward over his high desk. Jake, uh, uh, Reed, I, your worship. Out of the corner of his eye, Jake noticed Derek Stone's look of horror at his arrival. No, he had not gone to Beacon House as ordered. The beak let out a droll sigh. Well, I can certainly imagine any number of people wanting to kill you, Mr. Reed. Come forward, you young rapscallion. Now, Constable Flanagan, you may step down. Let us hear from Mr. Reed. This is sure to be amusing. Derek glared at Jake in disbelief as he stepped up to the podium Flanagan had left, as instructed. Jake shrugged at him, then glanced around at all the people watching and began feeling slightly cold and clammy. The judge leaned back in his chair and tapped his pen on his desk. Well, Mr. Reed, it's been at least a month since you paid us a visit. I trust you've been on your best behavior since our last little chat. Oh, yes, sir, he lied. No more thieving. Oh, you know, sir, uh, I'm a street sweep now. Occasional mudlarking. Right. Let the record note that Mr. Reed has discovered a new calling in life. You'd have been better off as an apprentice, ungrateful cub, but I, I suppose it's a start. Thank you, sir, Jake replied, ignoring the sarcasm. Well, Jakey, old boy, you know the drill. Name? Uh, Jacob Reed, sir, age um, uh, twelve or so, to the best of my knowledge, he added sheepishly. The clerk stopped scribbling and looked in befuddlement at the magistrate. Mr. Reed is a foundling orphan of the parish, therefore his true birth date cannot be confirmed, the beak explained to the clerk. Ah, oh, the audience said with great sympathy. Home address, the clerk inquired. Oh, nowhere in particular, Jake admitted, even more embarrassed in front of the world. He glanced at Derek, but the warrior just stared straight ahead with a seething scowl. Very well, then. You wish to confirm that Mr. Stone's account of the morning's events is correct? Yes, sir. Jake declared in a strong voice. I was attacked today by three men in the rookery, and their leader threw a knife at me. It all happened just like he said. I don't think you should charge him with murder or manslaughter, your worship, or, or anything, because he only done it to save me. That's why I'm here. Hmm. Are you really telling the truth, Jake? He leaned forward slightly, lacing his fingers as he studied him intently. Or did somebody offer to pay you if you would come forward to try to clear this fellow's name? Jake's eyes widened. No, sir. No? A chance to make a little pocket money? I'm sure you could use it. Who put you up to this? Stone himself? No, your worship, Jake cried, appalled. I didn't want to come, but I had to. Why is that? Because it's the right thing to do. Ah, I see. And our young delinquent friend here would be the world's foremost expert on right and wrong. Jake scowled. 
I'm telling the truth on my honour. Oh, on your honour, indeed, the beak chuckled. The whole courtroom was laughing at him now. Jake was red-faced and growing furious. The honour of a pickpocket, one of the smug lawyers said. Even the stern constable Flanagan snickered at his expense. Jake wanted the earth to swallow him. He had come to tell the truth and do the right thing for once in his life, but he had not anticipated public humiliation. Danny sent him an encouraging nod to hold his ground, but he had half a mind to go storming out right now. I'm telling the truth. Stone heard them bothering me and came to help, he insisted. But Jake, honestly, even as vexing a lad as you are, why would three grown men risk hanging for the pleasure of ridding the world of you? If there's any truth to your account, maybe they merely wanted to thrash you. Perhaps you stole something from them, hmm? the judge suggested. What did you do to annoy them? Nothing, your worship. I never saw them bleeders before in me life, he said, infuriated. I was minding my own business in Covent Garden Market when they started chasing me, for no reason. I ran into the rookery, but they still followed, and, and when they cornered me in the alley, some toff called Lord Griffin showed up and ordered them to kill me. The judge abruptly stopped laughing. What? His voice dropped to a harsh whisper. What did you say? Derek Stone also looked at him with a look of dark surprise. Surely you did not just claim that the Earl of Griffin was a part of this? the magistrate said crisply. Jake nodded and swallowed hard, his heart pounding. Yes, sir, I did. He was. He did not think it prudent to tell them the Earl had claimed to be his uncle. The magistrate stared at him for a very long moment. Then he set down his pen. His face was getting redder by the second, and when he spoke, his voice trembled with barely contained wrath. Jake, Reed, you are a dangerously misguided boy. This time you go too far with your wild tales. You are under oath of perjury, and yet you would speak such slanderous lies against one of the greatest philanthropists in London. Now I know you are lying. Order in the court. He banged his gavel as the audience exclaimed in shock over Jake's accusation against the Earl. Jake turned to Danny, shrugging as he mouthed the question, What's a philanthropist? A person who gives lots of gold to charity, she enunciated back. Oh, great, Jake muttered. Lord Griffin is a fine man, practically a saint, and he happens to be the chief patron of the police pensioner's almshouse. The judge nearly stammered in his righteous fury. Why, he gives more each year to support our retired bobbies in their old age than the greatest merchant houses in the city. Well, he still tried to kill me, Jake growled. The beak was fuming, all his world-weary joking cast aside. Order in the court! Your worship? Constable Flanagan called above the noise of the scandalized murmurs from the audience. There's something else that you should know, sir. The beak settled back into his chair and gestured to the policeman to speak. The boy thief we were chasing this morning on behalf of Harris the Pieman was Jake Reed. The whole courtroom burst into cries of astonishment and whoops of hilarity. The judge turned to Jake in utter fury. I suppose that's what he meant when he said he was minding his own business, Flanagan drawled. He got away from us at the time, but the flower seller saw him sneaking past with something, and let's just say my officers know his face. The judge glared at the boy, but finally found his voice. Jake Reed, you are a Terrible boy. You have disrespected this courtroom and me, coming in here and lying to my face after I've already given you two chances to better yourself. I don't know who might have promised you what to get you to come in here and tell these brazen lies, let alone to slander a fine, upstanding pillar of society like Lord Griffin. But this time, by Jove, you will learn your lesson. He banged his gavel. Send them both to Newgate. Jake! Danny cried in horror, but Jake stood there frozen. Jake Reed, you will give us thirty days' detention for your thieving, and as for you, Derek Stone, you are hereby remanded to Newgate as well to await your trial for murder. Bang! With a whack of his gavel, the angry beak dismissed them. He was now so out of temper that he adjourned the court and marched out, taking refuge in his chambers. Teddy was barking at the chaos that erupted, and Danny was yelling supposedly helpful advice, while Jake, in a panic, tried to dart away from the officers coming to arrest him. 
Unfortunately, there were bobbies in all directions, and this time Flanagan was too fast for him. He grabbed hold of Jake's arms. Don't even try it, you young scamp. You're on a bad path, Jake. You better mend your ways. I didn't do it, he cried, merely out of habit. But I saw you bolting off this morning with me own eyes. I know you're hungry, lad, and it's too bad you ain't got a proper father to show you any discipline. But you've got to learn your lesson somehow. Jake glared, trying to hide the fact that he was terrified. He looked over his shoulder as they clapped the handcuffs on him. Don't worry, Danny, I'll be seeing you soon, he called, sending his friend a meaningful look as they began dragging him away. Danny usually understood what he meant without him having to spell things out, which was why her eyes widened. She realized he was referring to his tel whatever I'll be out before you know it, he reassured her. Then the officers brought him outside and tossed him in the big black police wagon. Derek Stone wasn't far behind. Foolhardy, thick-headed, don't you ever do as you're told? Derek demanded as soon as they slammed the heavy carriage door and locked it tightly. No, it's not my style, Jake shot back, parroting the warrior's own insolent words to the constables from this morning. Derek harumphed. Why did you let them catch you? Jake demanded. You could have at least fought back. I'm a guardian. I don't kill policemen, Derek growled. The order would have had me out in a few days. What order? Never mind. Did you really see Lord Griffin? Aye, that's what I said. Is he really my uncle? And if he is, then why does he want me dead? Derek cursed under his breath, shaking his head. You should have gone to Beacon House like I told you. How was I supposed to know if I could trust you? Derek looked at him in amazement. I saved your bloody life, you ungrateful whelp. Why wouldn't you trust me? Mister, I don't know nothing about you. I don't even know why you bothered to help me in the first place. Oi, no talking. Shut it now. The bailiff banged his truncheon on the bars. Then two policemen climbed up onto the driver's box of the police wagon, and in the next moment they were underway, soon to be delivered into the dark oblivion of Newgate. Jake looked back and through the bars saw Danny standing alone in the road, looking terrified and bewildered. She was hugging Teddy close and trying not to cry. Seeing her standing there, looking so small and defenseless, Jake was furious at himself. He hung his head. Your little girlfriend? Derek drawled. Shut up! She's not my girlfriend. Then why do you look so distraught? Uh, because it's dark out, right? And, and now she's going to have to walk home by herself in these bad streets. Jake cursed himself. Not that you give a twig. Derek studied him. I'll say one thing for you, kid. You may be a thief, but you got your father's courage. I think you actually do know the meaning of honor. Jake looked over at him uncertainly. Derek gave him a rugged nod. You really knew my father? Jake whispered as one of the policemen glanced back to check on them. Derek looked away with a faint smile on his face in the darkness. He was like a brother to me. His name was Jacob, too, he added. Hey, no talking now. Don't make me tell you again, the bobby ordered, reaching back to hit the window bars with his nightstick one more time. Derek fell silent, but he gave Jake a look that helped bolster his shaken courage. And it was a good thing, for when the police wagon rolled up to the looming fortress of Newgate a short while later, Jake saw he was going to need it. Part 2 Chapter 6 The Fairy Prisoner Gladwin had been a prisoner for approximately twenty-four hours, but at least now she had confirmed that her captor was indeed the boy's uncle, Waldrick Everton, the current Earl of Griffin. Grim news indeed. The Earl had taken the jar with Gladwin in it out of his pocket and set it on a shelf when they had arrived, and there she had remained. Peering through the glass, the room before her was some sort of underground lair. The cave-like space was dark and dank. The light of a dingy lantern played over a dusty brass microscope, a mortar and pestle, and a clockwork astrolabe. Great old books with cryptic writing were piled on a large table beside an inkpot and quill. A human skull held a burning candle. By its dim glow, she could see the other caged creatures in the Earl's collection. A pitiful cobbler's elf called Moe, a grumpy cherub who needed his diaper changed, 
and a chubby satyr wearing spectacles who introduced himself as Stanley. Beyond the row of cages, a terrarium held a giant silkworm. These creatures were as rare as his lordship's talking spider. Giant silkworm thread was so light and yet so strong that it was used to create the finest body armor in the magical world. It was Stanley who had told her that Waldrick had captured them all to do experiments on them. He was trying to figure out ways to steal their powers. I don't even have any powers, the poor satyr wailed, aside from being a highly qualified accountant. None of Gladwin's fellow prisoners had any thoughts on how to escape, nor could they tell her what was making the terrible growling sounds and deep snarls that echoed up to the cave from time to time emanating from somewhere below. Whatever it was, it sounded big and hungry, but even the presence of this unknown monster was not as frightening as their jailer. She sat in her own watery alcove on the other side of the cave. Huddled over her books and potions, muttering to herself, the bulky old hag was round and hoary, with a few walrus whiskers on her double chin. She stank like rotting kelp that had washed up on the beach. "'Who is that?' Gladwin had whispered to Mo, the cobbler's elf, when the dreadful creature disappeared from sight, lolling underwater in her dark pool. "'Don't you know?' Mo whispered. "'That's Fenula Coralbroom, the sea witch.' Gladwin gasped, looking over again in shock. Fenula Coralbroom was an infamous fugitive from justice. All of magic kind knew the story. Some fifteen years ago, the fearsome siren sorceress had been banished from the ocean after being caught plotting to overthrow the mermaid royal family. There were other crimes she had yet to answer for, but somehow she had escaped. Waldrick Everton has been hiding her? Gladwin whispered, stunned. Mo nodded. Apparently she's been living here for years. The Earl built special accommodations for her over there, he whispered. They bring in fresh barrels of seawater for her every week. She has to stay submerged, at least when she's in that form, with the tentacles and all. That's why it's so damp and moldy in here. Tentacles? Flying up a little higher in her jar, Gladwin could just make out the large pool carved into the rock. It explained why the sea witch hadn't come out of her alcove, and why she was only visible from the waist up when she worked at her stone-carved desk. Is she part of his collection, too? No, she's a special guest. From what I gather, the Earl found her on the banks of the Thames years ago. Captain Lydia Brackwater refused to give her asylum in the river after the witch was banished from the sea. The freshwater nymphs didn't want any trouble with the saltwater mermaids, so they refused to take her. Lord Griffin found her dying on the banks and took her in, saved her life. She's extremely powerful, of course, but apparently quite helpless when she's stranded on dry land. Uh, a fish out of water, he added glumly. I wonder what Lord Griffin wants with her, Gladwin whispered. Mo shrugged. Sometimes she makes potions for him, and in exchange he gives her... Shh, quiet, she's coming back up, Stanley warned, pointing fearfully at a ripple in the pool. But Gladwin had so many questions. What's making those dreadful snarls, she insisted. Shh, I don't know, and I really don't want to find out, Stanley breathed. He laid a finger over his lips to silence her as the horrid Fenula Coral Broom came up from the pool, swimming over to her stone desk to continue her strange writings. Gladwin caught a quick glimpse of a slimy, beige tentacle skimming up from the water behind the round bulk of the old hag, but then the sound of a door opening at the top of the stairs to the left reached them all. Gladwin looked over, and even Fenula turned as heavy footfalls approached. The earl and two of his henchmen marched down the many dark steps into the cave. Whatever they had been talking about, the earl did not look happy. Blasted Oxley, how could you let this happen? I should have Fenula turn you back again. How would you like that, eh? Go back to pulling a plow all day till you end up roasting on the barbecue spit? Oh no, sir, please, the big bald muscle man begged him. I like being a human so much better. 
and I like being an earl better than a nobody, which is what I will be once again if you fail to kill this boy, Lud. I am surrounded by fools. Don't you understand the brat gets it all if the world finds out about him? The title, houses, money, and the magic powers to boot. So get it through your thick skull, you bovine dullard. I will not be left with nothing. You will not fail me again, or it's the barbecue for you. No bull, Waldrick added with a cruel smirk. Oxley blanched. Yes, sir. Hurrah, Jacob, Gladwin thought, hearing that the boy had gotten away. She leaned forward eagerly, spying on them from her confinement in the jar. She had been so desperately worried about poor young Jacob. Meanwhile, the bald giant cowered away from the earl. We did our best, sir. It's just the guardian showed up right after you left. We had him cornered, but Derek Stone came at us hard. He hesitated. We lost Ratlow. Lord Griffin rolled his eyes, but brushed off this loss impatiently. Oh, never mind the rodent. Fenula can always make more of his kind. What of the boy? Escaped, sir, Oxley mumbled, head down. Stone covered his retreat. I see. So now you have no idea where he is. Waldrick folded his arms across his chest, glaring at his servitors. That is true, sir, but all's not lost, his pale, flame-haired henchman piped up. At least we know where Stone is. The Bobby sent him to jail for killing Ratlow. Well, the Earl replied, turning to him, at least you're a little brighter than this one, aren't you, Flair? Flair nodded. We've seen him from around the corner. Hmm, the Earl considered this and paced away from them, stroking his mouth in thought. He pivoted at the other end of the cave. He shivered as if he had a chill, and paused to run his fingers idly across the top of the candle's flame as he considered his next move. "'Very well. Slight change of strategy,' he announced. "'We'll pick up the hunt for the boy tomorrow. First, we've got to deal with Derek Stone. There's no point trying to kill my nephew as long as that wretch is alive to protect him.' Gladwin realized Derek's locating instincts must be working just fine after all. He'd found the boy in the nick of time, it sounded. However, Waldrick continued with a crafty glance, right now our brave guardian is locked in a jail cell unarmed. There's no way he can escape nor fight back behind those bars, and that means there's no way for you to miss. It's the perfect opportunity to get rid of the miserable lout for once and for all tonight he instructed. You will break into Newgate Prison, find Derek Stone's cell, and kill him. It'll be easy, he promised. Shooting fish in a barrel. Do not fail me again, he added, or this time I'll let Finula turn you into a pair of oysters and feed you both to her pet eel. Hello, darling, he added, suavely blowing the sea witch a kiss. Gladwin lifted her eyebrows as the hideous creature giggled like a schoolgirl. Oxley, meanwhile, cast a nervous look in Fenula's direction. E yes, sir. Uh, I have one small question. Do not fret, man. I'm half a league ahead of you, as always. My sweet Fenula will get you into the jail. Oh, darling, he called in a sing-song. As he sauntered toward her, the sea witch swam over to the edge of the pool closest to the earl. Yes, my lord. Perhaps you have a pretty lullaby to sing for all those nasty prison guards. Oxley and his men will need a bit of help breaking into Newgate. Oh, yes, I know just the tune, the hag clapped her warty, greenish hands. But if you want me to do it, I must have a feather. I must go, after all, to where the prison guards can hear me sing my tune. But of course... With a debonair smile, the earl reached into his vest pocket and pulled out a scarlet feather with a faint golden shimmer of magic dancing round the edges. Gladwin stared at it, mesmerized, but unsure what it signified. Fenula's eyes shone with an unholy gleam as Waldrick offered it to her, but he paused. Now promise, my lovely, that you'll keep your end of the bargain. Don't I always? He did not deign to answer that. And that you won't run amuck after you are through? Her eager smile turned to a huff. It's none of your business if I do. 
Fenula, he chided, I cannot always stay penned up in this cave, Waldrick. You have no idea how boring it is. I, I need life, parties, dancing. Every now and then a girl has to stretch her legs. She lifted a rubbery tentacle from the water and wiggled it playfully. Waldrick's smile was not quick enough to mask his distaste. Limbs, limbs, my dear, do try to be a lady. In the polite world we call them limbs, if we must refer to them at all. Ha! Huh, she turned her back on him. You don't approve of my manners? Well, find yourself another way into Newgate. Now, now, Finula, don't be cross. Very well. I don't wish you to be unhappy in my humble home. Of course you can have the feather. If you need to go out and have some fun afterwards, I suppose I don't mind. Just make sure you're back by dawn, and for heaven's sake, don't let my society friends see you in this form. Done, she replied. Turning around with a splash and a monstrous grin, she snatched the feather out of his hand. Oxley and Flair backed away. Gladwin pressed her nose against the glass jar, staring. The sea witch took the shimmering red feather between her palms and began to twirl it briskly back and forth, like someone trying to start a fire with two sticks. A sweet-smelling cloud of white smoke began to rise. Faster and faster, she rubbed the feather in between her hands. The cloud grew, engulfing her. All of a sudden, the feather crumbled into dust in both her hands. The sea witch cackled and lifted her fists above her head to sprinkle herself with the sparkling dust. Even the satyr stopped munching to see what was going to happen. Inside the cloud of white smoke, a transformation was taking place. Lord Griffin clasped his hands together behind his back and beamed proudly, waiting a moment. Ah, there she is, my beauty from the Irish Sea. Welcome back, my rare ocean pearl. He put out his hand with the utmost gallantry, and from out of the cloud a dainty white hand emerged, alighting atop his palm gracefully. And then the rest of a wholly changed Fenula coral broom stepped out of the cloud, no longer a sea hag, but restored to what she had once been before King Oceanus had cursed her for her treachery. A dazzling beauty in an ocean blue dress with black hair that curled in waves all the way down to her hips. Waldrick, she greeted him in a breathy sing-song. Flair stared at her in shock but Oxley just shook his head as Finula lifted the hem of her gown and admired her own legs. Hello, legs, limbs, hello, pretty feet, sweet Poseidon, I am myself again. Making happy little noises, she pranced barefoot over to a closet and yanked away the curtain. Gladwin's eyes widened again in bewilderment when she saw that the closet contained countless pairs of fancy ladies' shoes. Fenula Coralbroom's dainty hand skimmed over her shoe collection. She almost chose a fluffy pink pair of sandals, but then opted instead for a sparkly red pair of high heels. She hummed a little tune to herself as she bent down to put them on, flirting with the men as she did so. This done, she popped up again and smoothed her skirts. Now I'm ready! La, it's going to be a good night. Now, no tricks, my pretty, no singing before you get there, the earl warned. She giggled prettily and pressed her fingers to her lips. Who, me? Do I put a spell on you, my lord? She glided back to him and gave him a kiss on the cheek, fluttering her long, velvety lashes. My Lancelot, my rescuer. You enchantress, he flattered with a tense smile. Now behave yourself, my dear, and remember, for your own safety, make sure you're back by dawn. How kind you are, Waldrick, to look after me, so strong, so handsome. Oh, I cannot resist you mortal men. Back in the old days there used to be whole ships full of Royal Navy sailors. I say, oh, don't be jealous, darling. I only used to lure them to their deaths, she giggled. Right, off you go, then. He pushed her away, barely hiding a grimace, and handed her off to Oxley. Finula slipped her other hand through the crook of Flair's elbow. Oh, what big muscles you have, Mr. Oxley! 
He gulped nervously and looked, thought Gladwin, like he wanted to bolt away from her, but apparently he did not dare risk offending the sorceress's vanity. Get my men into Newgate, and then you may go off and have your fun. Yes, 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 I know. Fanula Coralbroom blew the earl a kiss as she skipped out with his henchmen, but the wicked glimmer in her eyes remained the same as when she was a hag. Gladwin suddenly felt rather sorry for the prison guards of Newgate. She had no idea what the treacherous siren might do to them. As for Derrick Stone, she hoped he would find a way to fend off this sneak attack. For if Oxley and Flair succeeded in killing the Guardian, young Jacob didn't stand a chance. Chapter 7 The Ghosts of Newgate as night descended over Newgate Prison, clammy cold and inky black, Jake made up his mind that he was going arrow straight in life. From now on, he would not so much as use a curse word, if only he could somehow get out of this. Being in a cage was intolerable to a boy so used to doing what he liked, when he liked, and answering to no one. Although he was pretending to be as nonchalant as the rest of the hard-edged boys who shared his cell, in truth he was terrified, for even a streetwise pickpocket had much to fear in the dark, dank bowels of Newgate. The rough guards, the rats that scurried along the filthy walls, the awful smells that carried fevers, and, of course, the dozen criminal lads, his cellmates. Unlike him, in Jake's view, they looked like they belonged here. By the time they fell asleep, he was weary down to his bones from hours of trying to look tough so they would stay away from him. At last, he was the only one left awake and could focus on planning his escape. Or so he thought. But his cellmates had no sooner dozed off than a whole new round of prisoners started arriving. The dead. Countless ghosts of the past prisoners of Newgate began floating through the mighty dungeon that had been their final home. Goose flesh prickled down Jake's arms. The hairs on the back of his neck stood up when he spotted the first translucent figure floating up the hallway, a mysterious orb surrounded by an eerie bluish glow. Oh! Ah! Jake bit back a shriek, his heart pounding. He backed against the wall by his cot. They were everywhere. The dead of Newgate began materializing from out of the walls, as motley a population as had ever been incarcerated. Criminals in life, they made very nasty spirits, moaning and cackling and chasing around after their enemy ghosts. A pair of gentlemen duelists from the previous century carried out a sword fight sideways on the wall, dancing upside down across the ceiling as they tried to hack each other to bits. A ghostly highwayman galloped his horse right down the main aisle of the cell block, while a crooked apothecary floated past, snickering evilly as he stirred rat poison into the medicine he was making for some customers. The night watchman on patrol in the jail obviously could neither see nor hear the ghostly prisoners running loose throughout the jail after dark, but Jake could see them everywhere, each one trailing a weird, faint, blue glow. With all the noise they were making, he was amazed that none of the other boys woke up. Each spirit that he saw made him shake his head and swear to himself he'd never steal again. Heaven forbid he should end up like them, imprisoned here for eternity. A Tudor-era traitor sauntered by, carrying his head, while a hanged pirate captain marched down the aisle barking orders at his invisible crew. Jake cowered when a ghostly burglar poked his head through the bars and then came tiptoeing into the cell, creeping stealthily among the sleeping boys. The ragged ghost thief flew from one sleeping person to another, trying to rob them of any valuables they had in their pockets. Jake watched the apparition becoming more and more frustrated when his spectral hand kept whooshing right through anything he tried to take. Angrily, the intruder flew around the cell to his next would-be victim, but when he came to him, Jake pulled away, holding onto his lucky conch shell necklace, even though he knew the ghost thief wouldn't be able to grab it. He wasn't sure why anyone would want to take it anyway. His sole token from his parents had only sentimental value. 
Don't even think about it, he warned, protecting the seashell in his hand. The ghost thief's eyebrows shot upward. What? You can see me, he exclaimed. Of course I can, you idiot, he whispered. Now get away from me. Shoo! Hey, lads, this one can see me. Can you see them too, eh? I can see all of you, Jake said impatiently, keeping his voice low to avoid waking the other boys. Easing up out of his smelly, bedbug-ridden cot, he stood and crept past the sleeping prisoners, followed by the ghost thief. I don't understand. Are you a ghost too, then? Not yet, Jake muttered. Then how come you can see us? I don't know. I just can, he whispered in annoyance. Explain yourself, lad. You got the second sight? The pirate captain demanded, clomping over to them on his peg leg. The two gentlemen duelists now noticed their conversation and stopped trying to run each other through, coming over to investigate as well. What is uh, going on here? The first demanded, elbowing his opponent aside. His opponent elbowed him back. Is it true, lad? You can see us? Jake scowled. Afraid so? Young master, the tall one said at once with a gentlemanly bow as he smoothed his fine ruffled shirt. Since you find yourself with the good fortune of being amongst the living, will you be so kind as to bring a message to my lady? She's my lady. She loves me, his enemy interrupted, drawing his sword on him again. On guard! The ghost thief shoved his way between them once more and floated back to Jake. Never mind these two. They, they've been at this for a hundred years. Uh, the important question is, how do we get out of here? How should I know, Jake retorted. I'm trying to get out myself. If you'll excuse me. He marched past them, walking through one who refused to get out of his way. He went to the metal bars and peered through them. It was the particular cruelty of the jailers to hang the keys in sight, but out of reach of the prisoners. It gave them all something to stare at so they could contemplate the error of their ways. But Jake meant to do more than contemplate. He gripped the bars of the cell and focused his full attention on those tantalizing keys. They dangled from a peg set into the opposite wall. Recalling his success with the mincemeat pie, he made sure none of the guards were coming, then glanced over his shoulder to confirm that none of the boys were awake. Satisfied that it was only himself and the curious audience of ghosts looking on, he reached his arm through the bars of his cell and extended his fingers. Come. Staring at the keys, his eyes burned with his fierce concentration, his skin grew hot, and his hand shook with the power of the tiny currents of air that vibrated forth from his fingertips. Slowly, the inexplicable force from his mind flowed down through his outstretched hand and vibrated across the other side of the corridor, finally reaching their intended target— the tips of the heavy iron keys began to swing ever so slightly. Jake did not take his attention off them. The low jangle they made when they moved might have caused the sleeping boys to stir, but he did not even look over to check. Nothing broke his attention, not even the growing crowd of curious ghosts who gathered around to see what he was doing. A bead of sweat ran down Jake's face as he concentrated on using his mind to slide the ring of keys up the peg without them making too much noise. By the tiniest degrees, the key ring slid up the peg inch by inch and suddenly slipped over the edge. Yes! The whole heavy key ring cleared it, suspended in midair, but now came the hard part. Jake brought up both hands now, redoubling his concentration. The keys floated slowly through the air as if one of the ghosts were carrying them. His heart pounded with excitement. One of the boys turned over in his sleep, startling him. The keys dropped down a few feet in the air, but did not hit the floor. They hovered at knee level. Phew, that would have been loud. Jake quickly regained his focus, giving the task his all until the keys had floated close enough so all he had to do was bend down and pluck them out of the air. His fingers closed around the solid iron of the keys in jubilation. At once, all the ghosts began applauding and cheering at his feet. Well done, bravo, good show, my boy. Aha! Uh -huh. How'd you do that? The cockney ghost thief demanded. 
Why, no prison cell can hold him, the dead highwayman commented in awe. If I had your talents, I'd have been a criminal king. Jake glanced at the ghosts uncertainly. It was the first round of applause he had ever received in his life. He gave them a curious half-smile, blushing slightly, and nodded at his cheering audience of dead criminals in thanks, but he said nothing, careful not to wake his sleeping cellmates. Wasting no time, he went over to the door, tried a few different keys, and finally found the right one. The ghost gathered around him, watching eagerly as he claimed his freedom. A young man, how did you do that? One of the duelists inquired. Was it by science or magic? What's the difference? drawled the pirate. Who are you that you should have such skills? The other duelist asked him, narrowing his eyes. Never mind all that, the ghost thief interrupted. Plucky lad got himself out of his cage, that's what matters. So uh, now, why don't you do the same for us? The ghost turned to him. If you've got uh, magic or whatnot, you must know something about how we can uh, get out of here. No, I don't. I I'm sorry. Jake stepped out of his cell and closed the door again, locking the rest of the dangerous boys in to finish out their sentences. Please! They crowded round him, making the hairs on his arms stand on end with their tingly coldness. Jake thought fast. Well, to be honest, I don't think you even need to be here, he whispered back. What do you mean? We haven't been able to find a way out of this prison in ages, the highwayman said. But how can these walls hold you? he asked. You're not solid. How rude, the gentleman duelist cried in unison, equally offended. Well, you're not. You're dead, mates. These walls can't hold you any more, or all you have to do is float away. Well, yes, but then what? asked the pirate. How should I know? Jake shrugged. Uh, go to heaven? <laughs> Us! They all laughed heartily. We're criminals, lad. The devil's own. Condemned. No, that can't be true, Jake protested in a whisper so as not to wake the rest. There must have been something good about you in life. If you were all bad, wouldn't you be already, you know, down there? He pointed meaningfully toward the floor. They thought this over. You really think there might be hope for us? Hey, why not? Look, I've nicked my share of this and that, Jake admitted, still stung by the magistrate's mockery. I'm no expert on right and wrong. For all I know, some of you might be rotten to the core, but you don't seem all that bad to me. Maybe the lot of you are still here because of, oh, I don't know, unfinished business or something? The ghosts glanced around at each other uncertainly, then began to talk amongst themselves, arguing over what to do. Dashed impertinent of him to suggest we could leave any time we liked. But what if he's right? What if there is hope? What then? There's no hope. The highwayman leaped off his ghost horse angrily and turned away. Life's not fair and death neither. Jake looked around and sincerely wished in that moment that he could not see ghosts, for these ones were as frustrating as any living people. I'm trying to tell you maybe there's something you can do about your situation, Jake informed them. Like what? the highwayman asked, glancing coldly over his shoulder. All the ghosts floated closer, eager to hear his advice. Jake thought hard. Find the people you did wrong to when you were alive, uh, the ones you went to jail for, and try to make it up to him somehow. What? Make it up? You need to try to make rest of... Uh, rest of Jake struggled to think of the word. Danny would have known it. Rest, um... Restitution, the pirate captain suggested. Aye, that's it. The ghost thief frowned. Oh, I was afraid you were going to say that. Make restitution to those we wronged, hm? The highwayman echoed. His ghost horse's ears had pricked up. An interesting notion, but where should I begin? Sounds preposterous to me, the shorter duelist grumbled. Why? Jake asked. Well, what if the people we wronged are dead, lad? Then what are we supposed to do? Oh, I don't know. Find their descendants or something. I'm sorry if you don't like it, but that's the only advice I've got, Jake said crossly. He really had no time for this and was even more annoyed by the guilty thought that perhaps he ought to take his own advice. Harris the pieman and plenty of other people he'd stolen from in his illustrious past career as the best boy thief in London. 
which he swore was behind him forever after tonight. He turned away from the ghost, grumbling under his breath. Seems like common sense to me, but hey, I'm just a kid, right? What do I know? Stay here and haunt the jail for a few more centuries for all I care. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to break somebody out of here. As he walked away, moving down the corridor to try to search out Derek Stone's cell, he could hear the ghosts debating his advice. Then he paused and whispered, Say, where do they keep the prisoners who haven't yet gone to trial? Men or women, the ghost thief clarified. Men. North, the pirate captain rumbled, checked his pocket compass, then pointed to the left. That way. Thanks, captain. Jake hurried off while the highwayman decided to try the experiment. He aimed his horse straight for the thick fortress wall, worked up to a thunderous gallop, and suddenly vanished through the stones. The others gasped and cheered, and they too began passing through the mighty walls of Newgate, apparently floating off to try to find the people to whom they owed some sort of restitution for their crimes. For his part, Jake was glad to part ways with the unruly crowd as he tiptoed down the next corridor, past cages full of sleeping prisoners, the living kind, a snoring collection of cutthroats, murderers, smugglers, arsonists, burglars, forgers, embezzlers. These were scarier than the ghosts. To complicate matters, his head began to pound from having used his powers to fetch the keys. It made him slightly dizzy. The dim corridor ahead seemed to sway as if he was walking down the narrow galley passage on that pirate ship. He shook off the seasick feeling as best he could, but when he spotted an exit door to the outside world, he was sorely tempted to make a run for it and leave Derek Stone behind. But, of course, he would do no such thing. Aside from the grudging respect he felt for Derek, more importantly, Jake wanted answers. Taking another deep breath to steady his wobbles, he pressed on, sneaking deeper into the prison with the keys in his hands. All he had to do was find the warrior's cell. Then they would leave this place together, and as soon as they got clear of it, he was going to make Derek Stone tell him everything he knew about his father. Sneaking through the dark labyrinth of Newgate, Jake hadn't gone far when the bluish orb of another ghost appeared ahead at the far end of the corridor. The moment it saw him, it zoomed toward him up the dank stone hallway, but even before it arrived, Jake noticed the specter was in the throes of a pity party. Oh, oh, woe is me! Oh, oh brother, what now? he muttered. The wide glowing blob stopped in front of him. Jake paused in his hunt for Derek, hoping it would go away. It didn't, hovering before him. Then the orb spoke, its eerie whisper stirring his hair slightly. Jacob Everton, it breathed, I know you. Chapter 8 Haunted The orb floated closer, rising a few feet higher as if it were studying him. Jake backed away. Why did you call me that? Chills tingled down his spine to hear that name again. The same wrong name Derek Stone and the underwater lady had called him. I know you, Everton. The spectral voice bounced strangely off the stone walls so that it seemed to come from all directions, unpredictably. It gave him the creeps. What d do you want with me? Jake forced out, dry-mouthed. I didn't do it, Jacob, the orb moaned. Do what? he whispered, staring at it in apprehension. I didn't kill you. Kill me? Jake swallowed hard. On my honor as a gentleman, I never would. It was just an empty threat. I intended to apologize, but I never got the chance. Show yourself. Slowly, the sad ghost materialized into the shape of a portly country squire in fine clothes, with a hangman's noose trailing from his neck. It floated out behind him. Spirit, why do you say you killed me? I'm alive, as you can see. But I didn't kill you, Jacob. That's what I'm trying to say. 
The ghost became agitated, hardly paying attention. In its own world, it began pacing in the corridor, insofar as a spirit without solid legs could pace. Back and forth it, or rather, he, floated in a state of wild distress. I didn't do it. Why will nobody listen? I had nothing to do with your death. Oh, but all society heard you insult his lady right in the middle of a crowded ballroom. The ghost answered his own remarks as though mimicking some annoying person. What choice did he have as a gentleman but to challenge you to a duel? I hate lawyers. Hate them. The ghost snarled in an aside to Jake. Then he went back to imitating whatever some lawyer must have said to him while he was still alive. You were too much of a coward to meet a noted marksman like Lord Griffin on the field at dawn, so you murdered him in cold blood, didn't you? But I didn't, I swear. Lord Griffin? That chap who claims to be my uncle? Jake wondered. But that didn't make any sense. His murderous uncle was alive and well. Still, Jake stared at the ghost with goose flesh creeping over his skin, as though someone had just walked across his grave. Explain yourself, he prompted. I don't know what you're talking about. Foul injustice! With an angry look of disbelief, the ghost ran his hands over the frayed ends of the rope wrapped around his neck. I am no murderer, hot-tempered maybe. Very well, that much is true. I do like a fine French brandy now and then, and I admit it makes me a tad ill-tempered but a killer. I? No, nay, never, not I. Kill a man and his family, wife and child and neighbor, shoot him in the heart? No, I say, most unlike me, I'm very sure I never ever could. I am sure, aren't I sure? I don't, but I would never hurt Elizabeth. Who's Elizabeth? Jake whispered fiercely. So beautiful, so kind, sweet Elizabeth, so lovely. Jake was riveted, but still confused. Who, who exactly did you kill? Nobody, man, that's what I'm trying to tell you, he roared without warning, sending a great gust of wind down the corridor. And yet they hanged me for it, a crime I didn't commit. Oh, woe, woe is me, I am an innocent man. He started floating away, moaning to himself and fingering his rope. Innocent on my honor, I am most unjustly accused, hanged for a crime I did not commit. Wait, come back. Jake strode after him. Suspicions had begun forming in his head, and he wanted them either confirmed or denied. Tell me, spirit, who were you unjustly accused of killing? Jacob Everton. It thundered, spinning and turning back into an orb, and then shooting around the stone walls like an angry, glowing tennis ball, ricocheting everywhere. When the ball stopped, it was just the squire's head, staring Jake belligerently in the face. False witnesses swore they saw me do it. Oh, yes, yes, I despised that arrogant braggart, so handsome, Lord Perfect indeed. I could not stand the sight of him. But to kill him? No, never, not if I drank all the brandy in the world. The ghost's chubby face saddened again as the rest of him appeared again. Killing him would hurt Elizabeth. Losing her stupid husband would have broken her sweet, gentle heart. Who, who is Elizabeth, please? Jake whispered, but deep down he feared he already knew. So beautiful, those kind blue eyes. Oh, woe, woe is me. The ghost was in his own world once again. Returning to his private eternal misery, he started gliding off down the corridor. Wait, ghost, what is your name? The spirit vanished then reappeared right in front of him, pondering the question. My name? My name? Oh, he, yes. What, what was it? George. I? I was George, yes, of course. The memory seemed to cheer him up a bit. It, George who? George Hobbs. Yes, Sir George Hobbs, baronet. Yes, I, I ranked just below a, a baron, didn't I? Not that it matters now. He seemed to become more sure of himself as Jake forced him to remember. 
And who am I? Jake asked him as an experiment. The ghost looked him up and down, then answered, You are Jacob Everton, of course, but why are you only a boy again, like when we were at school together? You were past thirty when you died. I am not, nor have I ever been a grown man, Jake informed him, and I certainly haven't died. I've barely even been to school. But you are his very image. The ghost suddenly gasped. Wait! The child! Yes, I remember now. The baby's son he was always bragging about. They thought I did something to the tot as well. But what are you doing in Newgate, lad? Have you been wrongly accused of murder, too? Sir George asked sympathetically. Jake was shaken to the core by the things the ghost had said, his heart pounding, but he told himself to think about all this later. For now, he still had to get out of here and find Derek Stone. No, but my friend has been falsely accused, he answered. Will you help me find him, please? He's innocent, like you. Like me? the ghost echoed wistfully. Yes, they'll hang him unfairly if you don't help us. Oh, what shall I do? Sir George crooned. Help me search for him and keep a lookout for the guards along the way. He's uh, locked in a cell somewhere around here. You float on ahead and tell me if you see any of the wardens coming. Sir George nodded. I still despise you, Jacob, but I will do as you ask, for the sake of the Lady Elizabeth. Fine, Jake muttered. He sure likes this Elizabeth. Jake was almost positive that this Jacob Everton the ghost was talking about was his father, and Elizabeth the mother he had never known. But he could not handle thinking about it at the moment. Besides, he wasn't jumping to any conclusions until Derek Stone confirmed it. The chubby ghost squire swept into the corridor ahead of him, then disappeared around the corner, checking for any guards who might be headed this way on their night rounds. Sir George reappeared and beckoned him on, indicating that the coast was clear. Jake trotted after him. The headache from using his powers to get the keys was getting worse. He'd been so engrossed in what Sir George Hobbs had to say that he hadn't noticed it, but now that they were moving again, he didn't feel so good. The dank stone corridor ahead seemed to wave as the world grew ever more distorted with the pain. A stabbing sensation had begun to throb behind his eyes. Following Sir George through the dark prison labyrinth, Jake finally found Derek Stone. He was in a group cell for the prisoners who were still awaiting trial. His cellmates were sleeping, but fortunately the warrior was awake. As soon as Derek saw Jake, he swung his legs off the top bunk by the wall and sprang down without a sound. He strode over to the bars and gripped them. What are you still doing here? I figured you'd get out, but you didn't have to come back for me. Well, I didn't do it out of the goodness of my heart, Jake warned with a hard look. We need to talk. I want answers once we're out of here. Very well. Hurry up. As Jake quickly tried a few different keys, he noticed Sir George had disappeared. At last, he found the right key and let Derek out, wincing when the rusty door creaked as it opened. Thankfully, none of the prisoners awoke at the sound. Derek slipped out of the cell and shut the door silently behind him. Jake locked the other prisoners in again and brought the keys along in case they needed them. Come on, he whispered to the warrior. The exit's this way. Chapter 9. A Treacherous Lullaby Derek Stone followed him through the dark maze, but when they came to the corner, Jake quickly put up his hand, holding his large ally back. God, he hissed in warning. The warden's office was just beside the exit to the jail. Jake had noticed it in the nick of time. Derek peered past him and stole a glance around the corner. He frowned, seeing the three guards gathered in the office. They were blocking the way out. What you think? Jake whispered. Derek shook his head. I'll go in and silence them before any of them can raise the alarm. All three of them at once, and a dozen more just a shout away? Derek shrugged. Wait, I see someone who might be able to help us. Where? He looked around in question. Hey! Jake called in a whisper to the ghost thief, who had just floated down through the ceiling. Come here! Who, me? The cockney ghost asked cheerfully. What do you mean, come here? 
Derek asked, frowning at him. I'm standing right beside you. I wasn't talking to you. Who were you talking to? Shh, never mind, Jake muttered. Derek eyed Jake suspiciously, not at all used to being shushed. Then the wire began glancing around to make sure no more guards were coming. Meanwhile, the ghost thief floated over with a grin on his translucent face. Well, you got yourself into quite the sour pickle now, ain't you, mate? Uh, can you help us? What, me? Do something to distract the guards. Uh, we'll never get out with them standing in the way. The ghost looked at the guards, then back at him. Like what? I don't know. Throw something. Scare them away with some moaning. You're a ghost. You've got to be able to do something mysterious. Distract them so we can sneak out. You think it's that easy? They can't see me like you can. Besides, you already saw I can't grab nothing. On the other hand... A thoughtful expression came over his smoky, bluish face. Maybe one thing I could try. Eh, wait here. I'll give it a go. Thank you, Jake whispered. Jacob, who are you talking to? Derek demanded in a low tone. Uh, a ghost, he admitted ruefully. I don't know his name. Oh, it's Oliver, the ghost thief informed him. But Derek still stared skeptically at Jake. Who's your grumpy friend? Oliver asked, giving Derek an insolent once over. Few living men would have dared peruse the imposing warrior so disrespectfully, but then again, even Derek Stone couldn't do much to a wiry little thief who was already dead. Don't mind him, Jake told Oliver. Is he saying something about me? Derek demanded. Jake turned to him in surprise. You believe me that I can see ghosts? Of course. Wait, did you hear that? Oh, I do, breathed Oliver pressing a hand to his heart as he hovered a bit higher in the air. Jake shook his head. I don't hear anything. What is it? Beautiful, singing, Derek murmured, like an angel. His words trailed off at the exact moment that a hideous sound assaulted Jake's ears. It stabbed like a spike through his already pounding head. He clapped his hands over his ears in pain, but that only muffled it. Beautiful? The hideous screeching was a deafening cross between a vicious midnight catfight, an avalanche of gravel, and monster claws scratching down a thousand chalkboards. Holding his ears, Jake looked at Derek in terror, wondering what on earth this horrid sound might mean. But when he saw the look on the warrior's face, he was all the more bewildered. You would have thought the man was listening to a symphony, not that horrendous racket. Derek's usual scowl had turned into a dreamy smile. He was motionless, but stood staring in the direction that the sound was coming from. His eyes glistened, glazed over with rapture, as if he had eaten a whole roly-poly pudding by himself. In confusion, Jake turned to Oliver, but the ghost thief was equally captivated, floating like a happy bubble in midair, as if he could not tear his attention away from the sound. Jake's fear gave way to intrigue before this mystery. Was this hideous song also affecting the guards? He stole a cautious glance around the corner and saw that the uniformed men were indeed in the same charmed condition as the warrior and the ghost. Even the warden of Newgate himself had frozen in the middle of writing some report. He sat enthralled. His hand remained in midair, the drop of ink on his pen dripped onto his sheet of paper. He didn't even notice. Clearly, the grown men, both the living and the dead, had become enchanted, hearing something quite different from what Jake perceived. Jake did not know if he had his youth or his own weird powers to thank for that, but whatever this harsh grating sound meant, it did not bode well. He shoved Derek, to no avail. Wake up, man! Come on, snap out of it! We've got to get out of here! Derek just kept listening. Tears of nostalgic emotion glistened in his eyes. It's beautiful. I could listen forever. Blazes, Jake muttered. He had to find some way to block Derek's ears. Then maybe the warrior would come back to reality. I can't believe I'm doing this, he thought in vexation as he slipped around the corner. He must truly be losing his marbles. First he'd gone willingly into the police station to testify, and now he was sneaking into the warden's office in the very heart of Newgate Prison. But what choice did he have?
As he crept into the warden's office with the utmost stealth, the enchanted guards didn't even look at him to his relief. There, his gaze homed in on the melting clumps of wax from the candle burning on the desk, providing the warden with light for his paperwork. As Jake sneaked over to the warden's desk, the man gave no reaction whatsoever, though he was staring straight at Jake. It was a little unnerving. Whatever that sound was, it had to be some sort of magic. Jake still wasn't sure he even believed in magic, though it was getting hard to deny. Brushing off his thoughts, he quickly gathered a clump of the still warm candle wax between his fingers and rolled it into two round blobs. First, he stopped up his own ears with the makeshift earplugs, then he made two more, ran back to Derek, and carefully tucked them into his ears as well. A second later, Derek returned to his senses. He shook his head to clear it, but his eyes were still rather glazed, as if he had just taken a good wallop in the head. "'Where am I? What's happening?' Jake poked him to get his attention. When Derek looked at him, Jake mouthed the words, "'Let's go!' Derek's face darkened as he remembered what was going on. Only a few creatures can unleash that kind of power through their song, and all of them are deadly. Creatures? Jake exclaimed. Derek nodded. Probably a siren. But what would a siren be doing here so far from the sea? Oh, well, never mind. We'll figure it out later. Agreed. I'll unlock the door. Hold on. Derek took the still-entranced warden's nightstick hefted it into his hand to test its weight, then tucked it through his belt. That's better. Expecting trouble? Always. Then he helped himself to a set of leg irons hanging on the wall in the warden's office. What are you going to do with those? Arrest someone? Jake asked. In answer, Derek twirled the chain in both hands for a few seconds. The leg irons began whirling all around him in deadly patterns, circles, figure eights. Anyone who came too close would be knocked out cold. Aha, Jake muttered, impressed. Right. Derek shot him a cold, little half-smile and made the chains go still. Now I'm ready. What about me? Jake insisted. Shouldn't I take something to fight with, too? What about that power in your hands? So you knew about that? Your father had it, too. His eyes widened. Really? But how did he... Patience, let's get through this first. Derek cast him a warning glance over his shoulder, then pushed open the door to freedom, and they both slipped out into the dark, chilly night. Meanwhile, on the other side of the building, Fenula Coralbroom, still disguised as a beauty, beckoned the black-clad servitors into the jail. She was satisfied that everyone inside would have succumbed by now to the enchantment of her song. Oxley nodded to the others, eager to get even with the guardian who had trounced them in the alley and had caused him to kill their comrade, Ratlow. His failure to succeed at his task so far had made his lordship very cross, and Oxley had no desire to anger him further. Along with a few extra henchmen, they marched toward the doors of Newgate, weapons at the ready, their wits protected from Fenula's treacherous lullaby by earplugs. A brutish smile curved Oxley's mouth as he thought of his waiting target, Stone, now safely trapped in a cell. Easy as shooting fish in a barrel. But the last thing Oxley expected as he stepped around the corner was to come face to face with the Guardian himself. Chapter 10 Bad Luck of the Irish Meanwhile, a little bit earlier that night, Danny had been unable to sleep, even though she was exhausted. In a few more hours it would be morning, and then she'd have to go to work. But sleep wouldn't come. Every time she closed her eyes, all she could see was the awful picture in her mind of the bailiffs taking poor Jake off to jail, along with that scary, scruffy fellow, Derek Stone. She kept thinking about the promise Jake had shouted to her as the policeman had dragged him away, that he would find a way to get out soon. Obviously, he was referring to his strange talents for moving things with his mind. But could he really accomplish this, even with his supernatural powers? Escape from the prison fortress that had thwarted the fiercest criminals in England? She had a terrible feeling the guards might shoot him if they saw him trying to escape. 
She tossed and turned, wondering if he was dead or alive. But one thing was certain. If he did somehow escape, Jake was going to need her help when he came out, because of how sick and weak he always felt after using his weird ability. Of course, she was not sure it was smart of her to help an escape prisoner, but the blockhead was still her best friend. If she didn't help him, nobody would. And so, unable to stand the suspense any more, she hopped out of her bed in the middle of the night and got dressed, determined to go find out what was happening. She pulled on her boots, then swept her cloak around her, fastening the clasp at the throat. Of course, it was dangerous out on the streets of London in the wee hours before dawn, so she brought Teddy along for protection. True, he was just a little dog, but he was very brave for his size. He wagged his tail at her, ready to go. She clipped on his leash and led him toward the door, tiptoeing past Dar's room and all her brothers, snoring on their various cots and hammocks around the messy apartment. None of them awoke as she and her dog sneaked out. Not that they ever cared much about her comings and goings, so long as she got her chores done like their own blasted Cinderella. Drawing her cloak nearer around her, Danny set out into the dark, foggy streets of London, Teddy's nails clicking on the pavement as he hurried along beside her. The familiar tap-tapping of his strides and his general good cheer made her feel not so scared. The city seemed so strange at this hour. She kept telling herself it would be light in a couple of hours. Nevertheless, she kept to the shadows so any of the bad people who roamed the streets at night would not notice her. She was glad of the wrought-iron street lamps. They did not burn very brightly, but they helped her keep up her courage as she and Teddy hurried from one pool of light to the next. Now and then delivery wagons rumbled by as the milkman and coalmen and all the other deliverymen brought Londoners their supplies for the next day. What a horrid old place, she thought when she finally reached the corner across the street from Newgate Prison. Spooked by the great hulking fortress, she picked up Teddy and held him in her arms, cuddling him a bit as she waited uncertainly for she knew not what, any sign of Jake. After a few minutes of nothing happening, her heart sank as she gazed at the massive outline of the jail looming against the black night sky. How could anyone escape from such a place? It was impossible, even for Jake. Danny leaned against the brick wall of the building, feeling hopeless and exhausted as she scratched Teddy, her hands clad in fingerless gloves. Her stomach grumbled, clamoring for a breakfast that would not be forthcoming. All of a sudden, a startling sound interrupted her thoughts. She heard the start of a woman's distant shout. At once, a strange wind began to blow. Her dog growled in her arms. "'What is that, Teddy?' she whispered. The distant cold voice on the wind grew louder, but the sound of it turned into a horrible, cackling screech, and the breeze rose to a mighty gale. Bits of garbage lying in the road began to blow and went tossing down the street. The unnatural wind blew the hood of her cloak back off her head. She held Teddy more tightly, protecting his eyes from the debris in the gale. The dreadful sound grew even louder, like deep beating drums, a howl, a screech, and it went on and on, a roaring whirlwind. Teddy was now barking furiously in her arms, but Danny wasn't concerned about him waking anyone. Who could stay asleep with all the noise? She squinted against the dust blowing in the weird wind that had simply come out of nowhere. Unnatural, she thought. After all the strange occurrences around Jake lately, she suddenly recalled one of her Irish granny's more disturbing tales about a creature who could make that sort of deafening scream. A banshee! Its screech could drive you mad. Don't listen to it, Teddy! Danny clapped her hands over her ears as best she could while still managing to hold her dog. Teddy was barking his head off and wriggling furiously in her arms, wanting to get down. Danny refused to let him go, but she realized if there were banshees around here, she had better run. The noise was so awful and so loud she could barely think which way to go to escape it. She started running down the street while trying to keep hold of her snarling, barking, wriggling dog, and to be sure, with the dog's excellent hearing, the sound was driving him mad, too. All of a sudden, Teddy slipped free of her grip and jumped out of her arms. Teddy! 
At once, Teddy ran off toward the jail, barking with every stride. Aghast, Danny reacted on instinct, racing after him. She couldn't let the Banshees get her dog. Banshees were like witches, and for all she knew, if they caught her dog, they might throw him in their bubbling cauldron and cook him in a stew. Teddy! Teddy! She ran after him, calling his name and holding her ears. She followed the terrier around the corner of the jail and skidded to a halt. Jake! There was a fight in progress ahead. So that was what Teddy must have been so angry about, she realized. Her dog must have heard the sounds of their battle above the clamor of the banshee. Teddy raced into the thick of the fight, rushing to Jake's aid. Her best friend had not only gotten himself out of prison, but he had freed Derek Stone as well. And it was a good thing he had, for Danny realized that the people who had tried to kill Jake yesterday had apparently come back to finish the job. She did not understand why none of them seemed to hear the horrible screeching, but they were engrossed in their brawl. She stared in shock as Derek Stone fought off three of them at once. Jake was helping, and Danny's jaw dropped when he used the invisible power from his hands to fling a large man back several feet. The man crashed against the brick wall behind him, then fell to the ground, his bald head wobbling like he must be seeing stars. Meanwhile, Teddy attacked one of the black-clad men who was trying to overcome Derek Stone. Her tiny dog jumped up and bit the red-haired henchman in the back of the knee, clamping down his teeth and hanging on to his pant leg as only a furious terrier could. Get off me, you furball! The man yelped over the clamor of that horrible noise, trying to shake Teddy off his leg to no avail. Meanwhile, Derek Stone flattened two of the villains with a swing of the nasty chain in his hands. Across the alley, the giant bald man had climbed to his feet. He dusted himself off and went after her friend again. This time, unfortunately, when Jake brought up his hand, cupping his fingers as though he were trying to throw an invisible snowball at his enemy, nothing happened. The bald man let out a brutish laugh. Jake's posture sagged, his chest heaved, and by the dim glow of the street lamp, Danny could see he already looked pale from using his abilities. The bald man stalked toward him, pulling out a knife. Jake staggered backwards, his movements clumsy with exhaustion. Mr. Stone! Danny yelled, but he could not seem to hear her either, and besides he was busy fighting the rest of them. When the red-headed fellow finally shook Teddy off his leg and kicked him away, making her dog yelp with pain, Danny's eyes narrowed to angry green slashes. That does it! You hurt me, dog! She stopped holding her ears from the noise and pushed up her sleeves. There was a time and a place for respectability, but she was a rookery lass at heart. With that, she went charging into the fray with a mighty Celtic war cry. From the corner of her eye as she ran past, she saw Teddy jump to his feet and shake himself, apparently all right. On her way, Danny picked up a rock she found lying in the road, and as the bald man closed in on Jake, she threw it as hard as she could at the man. It hit him in the shoulder, and the surprise of it made him drop his knife. It clattered to the ground. He looked over in dull-witted shock as she barreled straight at him. Danny leaped on his back at the same time Teddy's jaw latched onto his pant leg at the knee. Jake stared in astonishment as Danny pummeled the bald man with a right hook worthy of her oldest, meanest brother Patrick, who had fought in the prize fights before joining the Navy. She hung around his neck with a chokehold, her left arm across his throat, while she flailed her legs and kicked him in the rear end, and kneed him in the kidneys, aye, just like Patrick had taught her before he'd gone off to sail the seas. Teddy, meanwhile, hung on by his jaws to the bald man's knee. Get off me, you brat! The bald man suddenly recovered, throwing her off his back with a whirling motion and a hard shove. Danny lost her grip on him, as did Teddy. But while the dog jumped agilely out of the way, Danny flew like a rag doll and hit the brick wall behind her. The back of her head slammed hard, but as she crumpled to the ground, the last thing she heard was Jake's terrified shout. Danny! Then the world went black. Chapter 11 Beacon House
When Drake saw what the bald muscle man had done to Danny, a fury unlike anything he had ever known came over him. His exhaustion fell away. His hands began to burn. Oxley scoffed at Danny's crumpled form lying by the wall. Teddy was beside her, nudging her cheek with his nose and licking her hand to try to wake her up, but it was no use. She was hurt, and Jake was furious. As his enemy straightened up again and stalked toward Jake, the rage inside of him surged. In a sudden, violent motion, Jake pushed the air in Oxley's direction with both hands, but his anger infused the motion with so much invisible force that lightning fairly crackled from his fingers. Whereas last time he had merely thrown the villain backward, this time Jake was so angry that he scooped the bald man clear off his feet and tossed him skyward. Oxley shouted in terror as he flew straight up and was hurled over the building, flying through the night sky to land blocks away with a great splash in the River Thames. Jake nearly collapsed to the ground, all the energy rushing out of him. He pulled out his earplugs, glad to hear the awful noise had stopped. But when he glanced over at Danny, he saw he had a bigger problem still. The carrot head was standing there, watching him curiously. Whoa, she said. You showed him? Jake stared at her in horror. What? Danny asked. She was light bluish and transparent. No! He breathed and somehow found the strength to scramble to his feet, running past her spirit toward her body. No! Danny, no! What? What's wrong with you? I'm fine, she said. No, you're not! He pointed toward the wall. Oh! Oh, no, she uttered as she too looked down at her motionless body. Then she turned to him, wide-eyed with panic. Am I dead? I don't know. You can't be. He rushed over to her body and quickly felt her wrist. You've still got a pulse. Get back in your body now. How? I don't know. Just try. Look at that. She bent down over her own unconscious form, studying herself. My head is bleeding. That's going to hurt. It doesn't matter. You have to get back in your body. Quickly, come on, Danny. There's no time to lose. Y you've got to trust me. We'll get you to a doctor right away now. Now get back in there, he ordered. Bossy, she frowned at him, then stepped with her spirit feet onto her regular feet. She sat down carefully like a person settling into a coffin. A take. She hesitated before lying down. If I don't make it, will you take care of Teddy for me? Of course I will, but that's not going to happen, I swear to you, he vowed. He swallowed hard. All right, I'm counting on you, Jake. He nodded. Hurry up and don't come out of there again. Ow, she said in a small voice as she lay back down the rest of the way into her body. Derek! Jake bellowed. The warrior came running, done scaring away the rest of the earl's henchmen. She's hurt bad, Jake said, his throat tightening as his fear climbed to panic. Leaping lightly over the unconscious villains strewn around the street, Derek reached Jake and bent down to check on Danny. The guardian took out his earplugs, then shook his head when he saw how this small girl had attempted to come to their rescue. He felt the back of Danny's neck gingerly to make sure it wasn't broken. She's alive, he confirmed in a grim tone. Barely. Her frequent prophecy was ringing in his ears. One of these days, Jake Reed, you're going to get me killed. A world without the carrot head in it was beyond his imagination. Derek asked her name, and Jake told him. Danny, can you hear me? Derek asked her. No response. She's so white, Jake whispered. That's pale, even for her. No wonder. Derek grimly showed Jake his hand, smeared with blood. She's cracked her head. We have to get her to a doctor immediately. What about you? Are you all right? Fine, Jake assured him, hiding his exhaustion. He squared his shoulders resolutely, then glanced toward the street. The hospital isn't too far. Never mind that. Beacon House is closer. But she needs a surgeon. We've got doctors there in a class by themselves. Trust me. Derek carefully lifted Danny into his arms. Go hail a handsome cab. Jake shook off his sick feeling to sprint to the nearest corner cab stand where the carriages waited to take customers. 
Teddy ran at his heels with a worried whimper. Derek strode after them with Danny in his arms. Soon they were driving pell-mell to Beacon House on the Strand. The ride was not long, only a journey of a few blocks, but it seemed like an eternity to Jake. He helped to steady the unconscious carrot head while Derek tore off a sleeve of his own shirt for a bandage and wrapped it around her bleeding head. Jake looked on anxiously, wishing he could be as expert at everything as Derek was, but he couldn't even think of anything useful to say. He just held Danny's dog for her. Poor Teddy was shaking, as upset about all this as he was. These doctors Derek spoke of had better fix her. She had to be all right, because all of a sudden Jake realized how monstrously ungrateful he was. Nearly every day she did something nice for him, asking nothing in return, and most of the time he barely bothered to thank her. Monstrous! He was as mean as an old snake. Hating himself, Jake silently begged for another chance to act like a proper friend, the kind her loyalty deserved. He wanted her bothering him, following him around, seeing her like this, bloodied, silent, motionless, was too terrible, especially since it was pretty much his fault. The hired carriage stopped at last in front of the huge, old, creaking, rambling mansion that faced the broad avenue, with its back to the river. It had a sort of turret on top that served as a huge lantern shining in the darkness. The giant lantern's glass casing was decorated with the shape of a tree, a dark silhouette against the warm golden brightness. Jake didn't know what the tree symbol meant, but he saw now why the place was called Beacon House. Then he frowned, for he could have sworn he saw a tiny trail of silvery sparkles fly out away from the tower, glittering briefly against the night sky. But in the next heartbeat it was gone and he had more important things to worry about. The horse's hooves had barely clopped to a halt in front of the old mansion when Jake flung open the carriage door and jumped out. Derek lifted Danny again and alighted from the coach, then sped her up the front steps of the mansion. Hey, what about my fare? called the driver. Just a moment, Derek yelled back. Jake, get the door. It's locked. Get the door, the warrior repeated as he carried her up the steps. All right. Jake flung his fingers toward the locked front door of the mansion, and it went crashing open. Derek carried Danny straight inside. Sir, exclaimed the tidy old butler, who came hurrying into a stately entrance hall with dark wood paneling and a crystal chandelier. Derek was striding across the foyer toward the stairs. Mayweather, we need Dr. Celestus. Now, give the boy a shilling for the coachman. A housekeeper came sailing into their midst. "'What's all this about?' she cried. "'Good heavens, this child is hurt.' "'Afraid so, Mrs. Appleton,' Derek said grimly. "'She took a nasty blow to the head.' "'Bring her upstairs at once, at once,' the stout old woman exclaimed. "'Come, I'll show you to a bedchamber where you can put her down.' Loath to miss out on anything regarding his injured friend, Jake took the coin the butler gave him and bolted out to the street, handing it to the driver. It never even occurred to him to steal it. "'Shut the door, boy, and lock it,' Mrs. Appleton ordered when Jake came racing back inside. The housekeeper grabbed a candle branch and whisked up the grand wooden staircase a few steps ahead of Derek Stone. Teddy scampered at his heels, while Danny still lay unconscious in his arms. "'Celestas!' the old butler yelled into the air as they disappeared upstairs. "'What? He's already here?' Jake asked. "'Ding dong!' the doorbell interrupted. Mayweather rushed to open the door. Oh, Dr. Celestus, thanks heaven, that was fast even for you. Such cases are given top priority, Mr. Mayweather. No greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends, etc. Of course. Into the foyer stepped a very tall, thin gentleman, respectably dressed in black. He wore a top hat and an opera cloak with a pristine white cravat. He held a doctor's bag in his hand. Jake knitted his eyebrows, staring at him. How on earth? Not on earth, the doctor answered, sending Jake a mysterious smile. Then Jake realized the doctor had not moved his lips, had not said the words aloud. The child's upstairs, the butler said. Shall I take your hat and cloak, sir? No, thank you. 
Dr. Celestus removed his black top hat, revealing a fall of long, shiny hair that was so pale a shade of gold that it almost seemed to glow. Fear not, all will be well. His skin was very pale as well, almost white and waxy smooth. He turned to Jake. Jacob, he greeted him in a calm, melodious sing-song. Jake had no idea how the doctor knew his name or how he had arrived in the blink of an eye before anyone could even send for him. He was instantaneously suspicious of the man. At least he hadn't called him Everton. The doctor smiled strangely at Jake's suspicious stare. Then he turned to the butler. Take me to the patient. Right away, sir. Mayweather showed him up the stairs. Jake followed warily, eyeing the odd doctor. If this pale, bony fellow tried any weird magical medicine on Danny, he was going to have to get through him first. Ahead of them, Mayweather stepped into the cozy bedchamber where Mrs. Appleton was bustling about, making the still unconscious Danny more comfortable in a frilly canopy bed. Oh, Dr. Celestus, this poor child, the old woman wailed, sailing over to him. She gripped his pale, delicate hands. They were sensitive and long-fingered like a musician's. I know, it's all right, Mrs. Appleton, he soothed in his strange, soft, melodious way. Thank you for coming so quickly, Derek mumbled. Do not be troubled, Guardian Stone, it's not a time. This child has much more to do. He set his doctor bag aside. Now then, my dear Daniela Catherine. Jake was baffled, watching the doctor in eagle-eyed suspicion. How did this odd fellow already know her full name? Nobody had told him. Dr. Celestus glided over to her side, and as he brushed his cloak out of his way to sit on the edge of the bed beside her, Jake caught a brief glimpse, just for a moment, of something white peeking out under the bottom hem of his cloak. The tips of long, feathered wings. Jake's eyes widened. His stare traveled back up the visiting physician. Well, dash my wig, he thought, staring in astonishment. All the carrot heads praying and efforts to be good must have paid off. If he was not mistaken, somebody upstairs had just sent her a real, live, bloomin' angel. Jake now noticed the faint, shiny glow that emanated from all around the physician. It was growing stronger. The others in the room, butler, housekeeper, warrior, all watched in a hush as he took Danny's limp hand in his own, gazing tenderly at her face. Then he held his other hand up to her head, his long, tapered fingers not quite touching her, a few inches of empty air between his slightly cupped hand and her forehead. Jake heard him whispering, but he did not know in what language. Whatever he was saying, an almost imperceptible hum began to gather on the air, woven with music ever so faintly, like the distant echo of harp strings and soft silvery chimes. It was as if they were allowed, just for a few minutes, to listen in on the music of the spheres. To be sure, it was the reverse of the dreadful screech they'd heard before. The air in the room seemed to vibrate with healing sound and soft, indescribable light. The glow around Dr. Celestus shone brighter, especially around his hand. The healing flowed out of his palm like a miniature sunbeam. When he leaned closer to whisper his unknown words in Danny's ear, his cloak slipped off his shoulder and his mighty white wings were revealed. They were folded at first, but he flexed them only once, and yet the breeze from that simple stretch blew against all their faces like the dawn's first breath. Awake, little one. Danny flicked her eyes open. Dr. Celestus steadied her. It's all right, you are well now, child. Lie back. You mustn't strain yourself. Where am I? Jake realized he was trembling. Where's Jake? she asked weakly. I'm right here. He stepped forward, a lump in his throat, as it hit him that, even now, she was more concerned about him than she was about herself. Your friend is safe, my brave girl, Dr. Celestus soothed. How do you feel, Daniela? She considered, then smiled sweetly. I've never felt better in my whole life. The others exchanged amazed glances. That is good, but you must rest a while, my child. 
Alarm suddenly flashed across Danny's face, where the color was returning to her cheeks. Where's Teddy? Jake picked up her dog and put him on the bed. Teddy bounded over to her, wagging his tail so hard his whole body vibrated. He's been waiting his turn to see you. Oh, Teddy, Danny hugged him. Are you sure this isn't a dream? I feel so strange. I, I, I can't remember what happened. Jacob will tell you about it later. Right now you need to rest. Dr. Celestis passed his open palm in front of her face in a soothing motion, urging her to close her eyes. Even as quickly as his hand passed her chin, she was already fast asleep and resting comfortably. Then the angel stood up, turned, and stared straight at Jake with his deep, unnerving gaze. His white wings were spread wide, and he had the brightest blue eyes that Jake had ever seen. They seemed to peer into his very soul. How? Why? Jake stammered. Because you prayed in the carriage. You were heard. I was sent. Jake stared at him. But I'm a thief. Were or are? The future is up to you. He paused. I have a message for you, Jacob. You think no one cares about you, but even in your darkest hour, you were never truly alone. You see that now, don't you? Jake nodded somberly, for once all his sarcasm forgotten. Thank you for this. Don't thank me, thank the one who sent me, he murmured with a faint smile, nodding toward the ceiling. Then he disappeared. Chapter 12 The Enchanted Library No one spoke for a long moment after the angel's exit. Finally, Derek broke the silence. Come with me, Jake, he nodded toward the door. We need to talk. Still dazed by what had just happened, Jake followed Derek into the hallway and then down the grand staircase, extremely curious to hear whatever answers the warrior might give him. At the bottom of the stairs, they crossed the grand foyer, but Derek sent him into the library alone for a moment. Go sit down in there and make yourself comfortable. On second thought, don't touch anything. I'll be right there. I need to have a word with someone first. All right. Glancing into the parlor that Derek now stepped into, Jake raised an eyebrow, for he did not see anyone else in there. Talking to ourselves, are we? Before going into the library, as ordered, he lingered to eavesdrop a little on Derek's conversation. What do you mean she's missing? She should have been back by now, the warrior said in a low tone, but the other person's voice was too soft for Jake to hear. He could only make out a tiny, high-pitched, tinkling noise. It sounded like a blend of distant wind chimes and the buzz of an agitated honeybee. I agree. Gladwin would never be derelict in her duty said Derek. I hope nothing's happened. Does anyone know where she might have gone? Bzz, bzz, tinkle, tinkle. No, I never saw her. She never gave me any message. I found the boy myself by my guardian instinct. I guess it still works after all. Hold on, Tansy. Jake! Derek barked, as though he could somehow sense him through the wall. Oh, sorry! Jake winced and withdrew from his eavesdropping post. It wouldn't do to annoy the man who was finally about to reveal the answers he'd craved all his life. Stepping into the library, he closed the door behind him to give Derek and this invisible tansy person privacy. Tucking his hands in his pockets, he sauntered farther into the library. The layout of the room was unusual. First, you had to go through a short passageway lined with bookshelves before it opened into the main part, a very large, very tall, square room. He stared at the place. Thousands of books from floor to ceiling. Carrothead's going to love this, he thought. If she didn't have to work, Danny would have spent all day reading anything she could get her hands on. He was not so keen on it himself, but at least the orphanage school had made sure he was literate enough to get by. He strolled in, glancing around, taking it all in. He had never been inside a wealthy person's grand home before, but the library was just how you'd imagine it. Rich, dark wood everywhere, shelves loaded with dusty tomes, a rolling library ladder. Halfway up the wall's height, a narrow walkway or gallery wrapped all the way around the room so you could reach the higher bookshelves. 
The only way up to the gallery was by climbing the spindly set of spiral steps in the corner. Jake was intrigued, but expecting Derek at any minute, he stayed on the ground. Then he noticed that the wooden base of the walkway formed a kind of frieze carved with golden letters, some kind of Latin inscription. Pestamus amicitis defendere. He had no idea what it meant. Looking around the rest of the room, Jake thought the furniture looked inviting. Luxurious brown leather club chairs and couches. Off to the side stood a heavy desk with an assortment of quill pens and ink pots. Deep red velvet curtains shrouded window seats. Over the big elaborate fireplace hung a large portrait of Queen Elizabeth in her silver armor, staring down from the mantel in regal pride, while the famous storm wrecked the Spanish armada in the background of the painting. Even Jake knew that much about English history. Still, the famous queen's haughty, royal gaze made him feel like he should be on his best behavior. The library was very quiet and kind of spooky in the dim glow of a few oil lamps burning here and there, especially with all the bronze heads looking down on him from atop the shelves. He could just make out their name plaques as he wandered alongside the shelves. Shakespeare, Marlowe, Spencer, John Dowland, the musician, Explorers, too. Sir Walter Raleigh, Sir Francis Drake. John D., he wondered, studying the bronze head of an old man with a rather sneaky smile. Never heard of that one. He stood on his toes and squinted to read the second line. Court astrologer to Queen Elizabeth. Astrologer? What? He told good Queen Bess her horoscope? Jake snorted. He moved on, exploring. He stole a peek through a pair of French doors on the back wall and saw a back terrace overlooking the river. Next, he admired a beautiful scrolled harp set on a small table a few feet ahead of him. There must have been a draft in the room that invisibly stirred the air, for the harp released a soft chord of music before he touched it. When he ran his fingers over its strings, it let out a discordant jangle as though it were insulted that he had dared. He pulled his hand away, stared at the instrument in curiosity, then walked on. Another oddment awaited him on the long, narrow table that backed the main leather couch, a little bonsai tree. He had seen one before when all the orphanage kids had been treated to a charity tour of the Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew, with its indoor jungle inside the great steamy glasshouse. This bonsai, if Jake was not mistaken, was a tiny dwarf yew tree. You couldn't mistake a yew tree because of their particular way of growing. The evergreens did not get terribly tall, but rather they grew wide. As they spread out, any new shoot that touched the ground from the base of the trunk could take root, so the tree was always making itself new again. For that reason, yews could live to be two thousand, even up to nine thousand years old, practically immortal. One part might die, but there were always new parts taking root, and so, as a symbol of eternal life, they were often planted next to graveyards. The trunks of the really old ones grew so fat that sometimes they were hollowed out and little chapels built inside of them. Yew trees were also dear to all English hearts because, for centuries, the people of the British Isles had made their fine old longbows out of yew wood to defend their homes and ward off invaders. Jake studied the little bonsai for another moment, then straightened up and glanced around, still waiting for Derek. What's that? He furrowed his brow as another strange item caught his eye. Across the room, a globe on a waist-high stand was dotted with tiny glowing lights, a web of straight lines made of pure light connecting them. A few of the pinpoint lights here and there were blinking red or green, but all the rest were whitish-yellow. Jake approached the illuminated globe, utterly mystified. For starters, he couldn't figure out the light source. There was no candle burning inside of it to explain why it glowed. Second, the glowing dots could not have simply represented cities, because a few were placed in the middle of oceans. As he bent, staring at it, he suddenly got the sensation of someone or something watching him. Slowly, looking over his shoulder, he saw a tiger. 
or rather, a tiger-skin rug spread out before the fireplace. Some rich adventurer's hunting trophy, he thought. Rich blokes would go to the other side of the world to shoot an elephant, a lion, a giraffe. Poor animals minding their own business. Maybe the owner of this house had gone on a safari. But Jake could have sworn the thing was staring at him. Its golden green eyes looked much too lifelike to say nothing of its great white fangs. He could have sworn he heard the flattened tiger growl. He forgot about the globe and turned around, eyeing it nervously. Beginning to wonder what the deuce was keeping Derek, he glanced up at the golden Latin words again, carved along the bottom of the high, floating walkway. I wonder what it says, he mumbled to himself. As soon as he spoke, he heard a series of odd little beeps and clicks nearby. He glanced toward the stately desk as a flicker of motion caught his eye. What the— A furry little caterpillar came scurrying out of a small box on the desk, waving its antennae as it ran across an open ink pad and got ink on all its numerous feet. To his amazement, the caterpillar then raced onto the top sheet of a small notebook on the desk and began running back and forth across the page. But not all of the caterpillar's many inky feet touched the paper with every pass the creature made back and forth. It seemed to be spelling out some sort of pattern. Jake leaned closer in growing incredulity as words began to appear on the page. After one more pass, the caterpillar stopped its task complete. Marveling, Jake picked up the one-line message and read it. He glanced up at the Latin motto around the room, then looked at the insect in astonishment. Is that what this says? The caterpillar reared up on its hind legs and nodded its forward parts up and down. You speak Latin? What are you, a, a bookworm? The caterpillar shook its head no, then jumped back on the ink pad and scurried across the page to sign its name. Inkbug. Wow, Jake breathed. Pleased to meet you. The inkbug wiggled its antennae at him, then glided back into its box, its job done. What a strange place. Still mystified, Jake looked down at the message, then read the translation aloud. Perstamus... Amicitis defendere. Together we stand in friendship to defend. Pandemonium broke out in the library the second the words left his lips. The harp trilled, the tiger roared, lightning crackled and thunder rumbled, and a gust of chilly salt air blasted into the library from the stormy background of the Queen Elizabeth painting, which came to life. The inkbug's papers blew in the sudden indoor storm. Squinting against the pelting rain, Jake ran toward the painting for a closer look, careful not to step on the tiger rug, which was still flat but growling and had unsheathed its claws. The Spanish galleons in the background of the painting were pitching and rolling, fighting to stay afloat. He could hear the sea roar and the doomed men aboard the vessel screaming. He could feel the spray on his face, could hear the masts splintering in the gale. In the foreground, good Queen Bess was perfectly still, rather gloating, her victory assured. But in the background, a tiny figure strode into view. The man in the background of the painting marched out to stand on the edge of a cliff overlooking the invading Spanish fleet. Then he held out his hands toward the storm. Above the clash of wind and storm that filled the library, Jake could just barely hear a deep male voice shouting out some furious chant. As the words were flung out into the channel, the largest of the Spanish ships was swallowed by the waves. And it all stopped abruptly when Derek stepped into the room. Chapter 13 Secrets of the Past Jake whirled around to face him. What is this place? he cried, his heart pounding. Beacon House? Derek smiled in casual amusement as he shut the door behind him and strolled in. Why, it is the London headquarters of the ancient order of the yew tree. But I thought we were going to talk about your parents. Jake stared at him, still speechless. Of course, it's hard to talk about one without mentioning the other, Derek continued. Your parents were indispensable to the order, and for Jacob and Elizabeth, their secret work with us was one of the passions of their lives. Jacob and, and Elizabeth? 
he echoed faintly. Those were the names the ghost of Sir George had mentioned to him in Newgate Prison. That's right, lad, your parents. Derek laid a hand on his shoulder. Two of my dearest friends, Jacob and Elizabeth Everton, the Earl and Countess of Griffin. Jake sat down abruptly. He could barely find his voice. M my parents were aristocrats? Indeed, and you were their only child. Now that you've been found well legally, the title and all that goes with it now belongs to you, not your uncle. Derek eyed him hesitantly. Waldrick is your father's younger brother. When you disappeared and the world thought you were dead, he inherited everything. But now that we found you alive, you see, it's rightfully yours. The title, the houses, the gold mine. A, go <coughs> a gold mine? He choked out. And the responsibility that goes with it, Derek cautioned with a pointed look. He crossed to a cabinet by the wall, uncapped a crystal decanter, and poured himself a drink of something strong. Well, don't look so surprised. Your family title, Griffin, is named after the Griffin, a beast that is said to be capable of locating veins of gold in the earth. For centuries, the Griffin lords have owned a gold mine in Wales that their Griffin originally showed them. So the legend goes. Of course, I've never seen a Griffin at your gold mine, but uh, the dwarves who work there are all extremely capable. Dwarves? Jake squeaked, his voice breaking in his shock. Derek put the cap back on the decanter. They'll be eager to meet you as their new employer. A gold mine, he echoed in a daze. So that's why my uncle tried to kill me. Derek? he asked after a long pause, still unsure if he quite dared to believe this. Are you very sure you haven't got the wrong Jake? He smiled. I've seen what you can do. There aren't any other Jakes out there who've somehow inherited both your parents' powers. You're their son, all right. The proof is in the pudding, my young friend. Jake leaned forward in his seat, his heart beating faster. They had powers, too. Your mother was the one who could communicate with the spirit world. The dead always knew they could rely on her, but in truth Lady Griffin was an excellent diplomat for the living as well. She represented the crown in dealing with all sorts of magical beings, not just ghosts. She had a way with people, you see, both human and magical. She was very kind and good-natured. She even managed to tame your dad. What about him? Jake breathed. You get your telekinesis from him. That sort of thing has long run in your lineage on his side, from what I'm told. Brave man. Very smart. A little cocky. But they made a splendid team, the two of them, both in the human world, as one of high society's golden couples, and in their secret missions for the Order. The Order? Jake echoed in awe. What's that, then? It sounded important. The most ancient noble order of the yew tree, founded 1596 under the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Derek nodded toward the painting. It's an alliance of humans and magical folk, dedicated to keeping the peace between our two worlds. We protect the balance. Jake held him in a blank stare, astonished. Derek sat down nearby, studying him. Perhaps I should uh, start at the beginning? Jake nodded vigorously. Very well. The founding of the Order came about as a result of a terrible time in our country's history, Jake. I don't know how much you've learned about that, but before the reign of Queen Elizabeth, Catholics and Protestants were burning each other at the stake, and both sides ganging up on those of us with unusual abilities. They were particularly hard on witches, good and bad alike. It didn't matter. They were out to burn them all. Most people believed that all magic folk were evil, until the great wizard Christopher Marlowe proved them wrong. Derek snorted. And they thought he was just a playwright. Words are magical, all right. Anyway, England was on high alert, knowing the mighty Spanish armada was sailing toward us, ready to invade. Marlowe went out and used a speaking spell to summon up that storm in the channel, and the armada was destroyed, just like you see in the painting. Christopher Marlowe did that? You'll bar me. That's impossible. Really? You should hear what his colleague, Mr. Shakespeare, was capable of conjuring with his pen. Oh, come on! Derek grinned. The Marlowe part is true. He was one of our agents. Unfortunately, he wound up murdered, but he conjured that storm. What, did you think it just coincidentally came out of nowhere like the history books would have you believe? Derek sighed. Well, I suppose it's better if the rest of the world believes that. Only a few people, then or now, knew the truth about that storm. One of them was Queen Elizabeth. Finally, we had a monarch who got the point. 
that magical folk could be as loyal subjects as any Englishman, and that certainly it was better to have us with her than against her. So Her Majesty put a stop to the persecution of magic kind and founded the Order of the Yew Tree, and we've been working together in secret ever since. They named it after the Yew Tree, he added, because it's always been a sacred symbol of protection. For humans, it provided English longbows, and for wizards, it provides the choicest wands. Jake blinked in surprise. There were twenty-four members to start, twelve humans and twelve representatives from the world of magic, fey folk of various sorts. Queen Elizabeth herself became the nominal head and patroness of the order, just like Queen Victoria is today. Queen Victoria knows about all this, he exclaimed. She seems so stuffy, the stout, unsmiling, old queen, always dressed in widow's black, even though her royal mate, Prince Albert, had died ages ago. Of course, Derek replied. The royal garden fairies do an excellent job of keeping Her Majesty informed on all important news concerning her magical subjects throughout the empire. She'll want to meet you, by the way, he added, and Jake nearly fell off his chair. Queen Victoria knows who I am, he yelped. I should think so. You are her godson, after all. Jake stared at him, open-mouthed. Don't worry, lad. It's a formality more than anything. Whenever a child is born to two magical parents, like yourself, he or she is always made the godchild of the sovereign. It's safest that way for you and for England. Makes it easier for us to keep an eye on you. We can't have children of your considerable talents going off on, uh, how did that constable put it, a bad path? Jake remembered Flanagan's warning in the courtroom. He smiled ruefully at Derek. One never knows how two people's powers are going to mingle. Your parents had to get special permission from the Order to marry for just that reason. We were all very curious when you were born to see which one you'd take after. But getting both their talents? That's as rare as a spotted marsh dragon, but perhaps it was because you were born on Beltane. What? You just had your twelfth birthday, Jake, one of the most sacred days in the magical calendar, May 1st. Jake just stared, hearing this. A breeze could have knocked him over. It was not just the fact of learning the date of his real birthday, but all those years of thinking not a soul in the world cared if he lived or died. Meanwhile, Queen Victoria herself had been concerned about him, even knew his name. Oh, this could not be true. This, this had to be a dream. Now your parents played a very special role in the order, Derek continued. They were light riders, an elite class of agents who assisted magical beings in distress. They have jurisdiction anywhere within the British Empire. These days, their missions can take them as far away as Egypt, India, Australia. All the unique magical creatures of those regions of the empire are entitled to our help if they request it. Light riders, Jake murmured. Derek nodded. So named for their mode of transportation. They use the Earth's ley lines to take them by instantaneous travel to wherever they must go. He pointed at the globe with all the points of light glowing on it. Have you ever heard of ley lines, Jake? He shook his head. All the great ancient cultures had a name for them. The Chinese called them dragon lines. In the Dark Ages, throughout Europe, they were known as fairy paths. The native tribes in America referred to them as spirit trails. Even in America? Of course. Nobody really knows exactly what they are, but they seem to be a naturally occurring phenomenon of our planet. Lines of electromagnetic energy crisscross the Earth in set, constant geometric patterns. Where two of these lines intersect, an energy vortex is created in the Earth's magnetic field. Our scientists today refer to it as ether. It's very subtle, but you can feel it. A strangeness in the air, especially people like us can feel it. Like us? The gifted. These points of intersection, crossings we call them, are distributed all over the earth. Stonehenge has one, the pyramids in Egypt, the Cathedral of Notre Dame, just to name a few. Ancient peoples sensed their power and built their sacred sites where these ley lines joined. In any case, at some point long ago, people began to realize that these vortexes in the ether could be used as portals. Much more recently, we have learned not only how to open a portal whenever we wish, but to enter the grid and ride the energy stream to any other crossing and come out moments later on the other side of the world. Our light riders, and only they, 
are authorized to do this when they are sent off on their missions. There are risks to entering the grid, and the ley lines are one of our most closely guarded secrets. I am only telling you because your parents, Jake, were two of the best. Jake was staring into space, rather entranced. He wasn't too keen on being an earl, but this light rider business sounded all the kick. What sort of things do light riders do? Anything from diplomatic missions like settling disputes to helping solve local crimes involving magic folk. When do I start? he asked eagerly. Derek looked at him. Jake, you're twelve. So you're a light rider too? No, I'm just a guardian, Derek said with a smile. We're warriors, obviously. Born this way. Enhanced senses, faster reflexes, that sort of thing. Glorified bodyguards, really, he said modestly. I sometimes went with your parents on their more dangerous missions to protect them. A fleeting look of pain, or guilt, passed over Derek's rugged face. But I couldn't protect them from everything. Jake took a moment to prepare himself before asking the obvious question. So, what happened to them? The Guardian looked away. When he spoke again, his gravelly voice was taut with buried anger. You're too young to have to hear about such things, but if you really want me to tell you, he took a deep breath, you're entitled to know. Jake nodded grimly. I'm ready to hear it. Your parents were murdered, Jake. I'm so sorry, I, I wasn't there. Jake bowed his head for a minute. Of course, when you grew up in an orphanage, you sort of knew your parents were dead, but there was a small part of you that hoped, somehow, maybe, there had been a mistake. He swallowed hard. How did it happen? Were they on a mission? No, that's the worst part. Derek shook his head. They were at home. You have no memory of it? No. Well, perhaps that is a blessing, he shrugged. You were just a baby, after all. Your parents had just returned from another successful mission. Some in the Order objected to your mother taking risky missions with a baby at home, but people with her gifts don't grow on trees. She knew that she was needed. As far as we can piece together what happened, when they got home, they wanted to celebrate another job well done, and so the three of you were having a little family picnic together out in the gardens behind Griffin Castle when the killer arrived. I'm from a castle? This was a man who had argued with your father at a ball a few nights prior. The drunk fool shot his mouth off, insulting your father in front of society. This was very stupid of him, since he was no match for Jacob. To defend his honor, your father had no choice but to challenge him to a duel to answer for the insult. A duel? Yes, but none of us were worried. Well, your mother wasn't happy about it, but your dad and I were sure the idiot would sleep it off, then come to his senses and realize he was going to die if he didn't apologize. That's all he had to do to cancel the duel. Apologize to your father and it would be forgotten. No doubt that's what your father thought the man had come to do when he walked into the garden the next day. But he was wrong. The coward hadn't come to apologize. Derek lowered his head. That was the one mistake your father made, assuming his enemy would be as fair and honorable as himself. Instead, the man pulled out a gun and shot your father in cold blood. Jacob didn't even have time to use his powers. Your mother witnessed the whole thing, he said grimly. She put you in a basket and ran into the woods. Derek paused while Jake's mind whirled. No one could have predicted that the madman would go after her, too. He was half in love with Elizabeth. Maybe that was the problem. Jealousy. He couldn't have her, so he shot her in the back. With her last breath, she summoned the water nymphs and put the basket in the brook. When they came, she begged them to protect you. And then she died, as the water nymphs floated you off to safety. The room was silent. The brook that wraps around the grounds of Griffin Castle flows into the River Lee, and the Lee flows into the Thames. They watched over you all that way, which is very rare, you must understand. Water nymphs can be dangerous. They are not to be trifled with. They will drown a human who chances to see them bathing in their streams or lakes. But they had cause to admire your mother. So they took you away as she requested and sang to keep you calm. He saw, I remember those songs. 
That's all I can remember now. I've heard them lately in my head, Jake said, then frowned. But how did I end up at the orphanage? As the nymphs brought you closer to London, the Thames became too polluted near the city. They couldn't breathe. They would have died, to say nothing of the danger from all the fishing nets and hooks and steamships and paddle wheels. The river has grown dangerous for them in these modern times. There was nothing they could do. Besides, you weren't too far from Beacon House. So they abandoned me? he exclaimed. They had no choice. They let the current take you. They expected you to be quickly retrieved by someone from the Order. Half of Parliament saw you float by, you know. It must have been quite a sight, a little baby drifting down the river in a picnic basket. I could have been run over by a ship. But you weren't. The water nymphs watched from a safe distance, and everything would have been fine if only it weren't for a stranger's act of kindness. Jake furrowed his brow in confusion. The water nymphs saw a fisherman rescue you. That wasn't in the plan. He should have let you go, and then we'd have easily found you, but he plucked you out of the water, and as best we can tell, took you to a doctor to make sure you were not hurt, and then home to his wife so she could feed you. At some point, he must have handed you over to his parish priest, who gave you to the orphanage in turn, and that's how we lost track of you. Jake stared at him. You lost me? You know how many fishermen's boats ply the river every day, Jake? Hundreds, Derek exclaimed, his rugged face coloring with embarrassment. To say nothing of how many orphanages there are these days in London, you were a needle in a haystack, Jake. Believe me, we did our best to find you. We tried. You tried? With all the magic powers and what not, how was it that none of you could find me? Jake, believe me, this has been a major embarrassment to the Order, Derek said in chagrin, but our search was further complicated by the Kinder Vale. What's that? He strove for patience. All magical children are protected from birth by a naturally occurring spell called the Kinder Vale. It cloaks their location from those who would do them harm. Unfortunately, as we found out, it also hides them from their friends. Jake threw up his hands with a huff. Derek continued trying to explain. The gifted have many enemies, and we are at our most vulnerable as children before we get our powers. It's like that Darwin fellow said. Those who have some sort of useful adaptation can survive, and those who don't, don't tend to live long enough to have children. Well, the gifted humans who survived were those born with the Kinder Veil. By now all of us have it. There's nothing we can do about it. No magic is more powerful than that which comes directly out of nature. He let out a frustrated sigh. <sighs> from the moment that well-meaning fisherman plucked you out of the water, from our standpoint, it was as if you'd vanished. I was right here in London. We tried to find you by human means as well. Derek was clearly getting flustered. I personally combed this city for two years. Do you know how many babies are left at foundling hospitals and on church doorsteps every day? Scores of them. I examined every one of them, and God forgive me, but if I came across you, I would not have known it. After a few dozen, they all looked the same to me, more or less. I didn't want to save the wrong kid and give him your father's title. Look, your parents' death left me in a daze. I still don't understand why I didn't sense the danger in the first place. He shut up abruptly and looked away. What? Jake demanded. Never mind. We tried, Jake. We failed. I can't do anything about the past any more except tell you how sorry I am, and we all are, for how we let you down. But at least we have you now. I will do all in my power to ensure you have the best future possible. Jake sat down again, disgruntled. But Derek was right. What was done was done. If nothing else, orphanage life had made him a survivor. He wasn't going to sit here and blubber about it. So how did you finally manage to find me? Derek looked relieved at his business-like tone. The Kindervale wears off around the age of twelve or so, when magical youngsters begin to get their powers. Then I was able to sense you and home in on your location. You can do that? It's called the Guardian Instinct. Derek turned his back to him and went to pour himself a second drink. Jake watched him skeptically. If a Guardian could sense when someone was in danger, then why hadn't Derek been there to protect his parents, if they were such great friends? I can promise you one thing, Jake. The warrior turned around and faced him with a brooding look. The man who killed your parents got what he deserved. Hanging was too good for him, if you ask me. 
Derek stalked over and pulled a file out of a drawer, tossing it onto the desk. This contains the details from the investigation. Jake braced himself, then opened it. The first thing he saw was a newspaper clipping with a grainy black-and-white photograph. Derek tapped it angrily. Here, if you want to see his face, this is your parents' killer, Sir George Hobbs. Jake stared in stunned recognition at the chubby, confused face of the sorrowful ghost he had seen in Newgate. Derek straightened up and folded his arms across his chest. A dark scowl stamped across his face. Your father wasn't afraid of this man in the least. Maybe that was his mistake. He shook his head. Never underestimate a coward. Sneakiest kind of enemy you can have. Jake kept staring at the picture, eerie tingles running through him. He had heard quite a different version of this story from the ghost in question. What is it? Derek asked, keenly watching him. I'm, I met this ghost in Newgate. What? Derek took a step toward him, his stare sharpening with anger. Hobbs is haunting Newgate? Apparently so. That's where they do the hangings, isn't it? In the prison yard? That's right. They moved the gallows behind the walls there when they stopped having the public executions. You're sure it was Hobbs? Aye, he told me his name. He said he's a baronet. I can't believe he dared speak to you. It was the first time Jake had seen real, full anger flood the warrior's face. The look in his eyes was rather terrifying. Did he attack you, threaten you in any way? No, he helped me find you. He showed me to your cell, Jake hesitated. He kept saying he didn't do it, that he was wrongly accused. Derek narrowed his eyes. Every criminal says that. Well, I didn't know what he was talking about at the time, but he seemed awfully sincere. Are you sure it was really Hobbs who killed my parents? There were witnesses. The servants saw Hobbs come onto the property, and in the little village near the castle Griffindale, the locals saw him too. He had the motive. He had already made the threat, and witnesses placed him at the scene. But what about my uncle? Waldrick? Derek echoed skeptically. He's capable of it. He was nowhere near the castle. He was seen driving his carriage through Hyde Park at the fashionable hour. But this doesn't make any sense. After all, he did try to kill me. Yes, I recall that's what you told the magistrate, Derek answered in a noncommittal tone, folding his arms across his chest. Jake was taken aback. You don't believe me. It's not that I don't believe you. Look, perhaps I'm not the one to give an opinion. Your Uncle Waldrick and I never really saw eye to eye. I, I can't be objective. So you know him? Of course. He was my best friend's annoying little brother. I could hardly avoid him, as much as I would have liked to, he muttered. Didn't anyone suspect him when my parents were killed? I, if he inherited everything, he had the most to gain. No, nobody took Jacob's murder harder than Waldrick. He was distraught when your parents died. It could have been an act. He has half the city convinced that he's some sort of saint. But he cooperated fully with the police. He allowed them to interrogate him all they liked. They were satisfied he had nothing to do with it. Then he vowed to help bring their killers to justice and to find you, Jake, and bring you home. He gave a very touching eulogy at their funerals, had society in tears. I've been to puppet shows that can make some idiots cry, Jake replied. Derek shook his head. Jake, your parents had a lot of enemies in their line of work. I admit, sometimes I have wondered if someone other than Sir George Hobbs might have been involved, but never Waldrick. Why? He's a show pony. No disrespect intended, but he's a pampered, helpless priss. And besides, Jacob and he had a strong brotherly bond. I mean, all brothers fight, don't they? They were not always on friendly terms, but everyone knew you wouldn't mess with little Wally or you'd have to deal with Jacob. He shrugged. It was an open and shut case complete with witnesses. The only missing part was you. Jake puzzled over this. Could Waldrick have done something to Hobbs by magic? Put a spell on him to force him to do this crime? Derek shook his head. Waldrick is no magic of his own. Not every member of a family inherits the gift. He doesn't even like magic. He's scared of it. Thinks it's unnatural. He's always kept away from magical affairs. Waldrick prefers the human world of fashionable society. Derek rolled his eyes. But if he owns a gold mine, he could pay someone with magical powers to put a spell on Hobbs to make him confess. Jake, give it a rest, Derek said impatiently. My friend did not get murdered by his own brother. 
Now, if you really saw Waldrick in that alley, if, Jake cried, you think I'm lying? If you saw Waldrick, you probably just misunderstood. He was probably trying to help you before those men closed in. He had always vowed one day he'd find you and bring you home. We all daft. That toff wants me dead. You saw them try to cut me into pieces in that alley? Well, I didn't see Waldrick, he said. You fought his henchmen. I fought somebody's henchmen. Well, whose henchmen did you think you were fighting? Jake cried. Then he suddenly paled. You mean there's someone else out there who also wants to kill me? Derek just looked at him grim-faced. Oh, that's just perfect, Jake spat, and with that he stormed out through the French doors. Derek gave him a moment alone to try to absorb all he had learned. At length, Derek sauntered out onto the terrace and leaned on the stone railing beside Jake, who was staring down into the water. Derek heaved a sigh, saying nothing while they both watched the river flowing by like liquid onyx in the moonlight. The lights of Beacon House shimmered on the surface of the Thames. Jake finally turned to Derek. Who else wants me dead besides my saintly uncle? You might as well tell me now. Not all magical beings joined the Alliance when the Order was first founded. Some refused the notion of trying to live in harmony with humans. They'd rather use our magical advantage to rule as tyrants over mankind. We call them dark druids. But don't worry, the Order keeps them in check. I hope you do a better job of that than keeping track of me, he muttered. Jake, and why do they want to kill me? I never did anything to them, he added under his breath. Well, when you're older, you'll be able to do them serious damage. For now, their first choice would be to recruit you, control you. You see, with your gifts, Jake, you could grow up to become a terrible weapon in the wrong hands. If they got a hold of you, they'd try everything they could to turn you evil. They'd only kill you if you refused to join them. Derek paused. They're the real reason you've got the queen for a godmother. And who's me godfather, you? No, I'm not important enough. If memory serves, that would be King Oberon. King Oberon? Jake echoed, and all of a sudden he could take no more. He stood up and started laughing. It was not the happy kind of laughter. Maybe he was having some sort of mental breakdown. What's the matter with you? Derek asked with a frown. You almost had me going, Stone. You should have quit while you were ahead, but then you went too far. What are you talking about? Oh, come on, Jake yelled, turning to him so angry, fed up, and confused that he was shaking. King Oberon of Fairyland? You take me for a fool? He had once seen a street puppet show version of the famous Shakespeare play A Midsummer Night's Dream, with the moody fairy king Oberon and his jester Puck causing mischief amongst humans and fairy folk alike. You're going to have to do better than that if you want to gull a lad from the rookery, mate. I'm not some country bumpkin that just fell off the turnip truck. Jake, every word I've said is true. Right, gov, he shouted, purposely making himself sound extra cockney. I'm the son of aristocrats, to be sure. Rich and titled, eh? Queen of England and the King of Fairyland are my godparents. How could I ever doubt you? Stop that, you're being annoying. I have to be a glockwit to believe a word of this. He went back to his regular voice, but he was furious. Ghosts, dwarves, water nymphs, gold mine. This all might be one big joke to you, but for me, this is my life, savvy? Jake, I know it's a lot to take in, but you've seen these things with your own eyes. You talk to ghosts. You threw a man over a building without touching him. Cruel, that's what. You're worse than Danny's brothers. Enough! Derek interrupted sharply. He pointed at him. That seashell hanging around your neck. Take it and blow into it. Now! What? Startled by the odd command, Jake clutched the little conch shell on his black cord necklace. Why? Just do it. No! Derek rolled his eyes. Humor me, he ordered. Jake stared at him. You want proof? Then blow into the conch shell and see what happens. What have you got to lose? Unless you're too scared. Fine, of course I'm not scared. Wrong end, Derek said as Jake lifted the conch shell to his lips and stand a little closer to the water. Why? Derek looked at him like he was considering wringing his neck, like going back to Newgate might be worth it. Seeing that glower, Jake growled a little, but did as he was told, 
taking a step closer to the river's edge. He turned the shell and puffed a breath of air into the swirled end. Nothing happened. He scoffed and looked askance at Derek. Happy now? It didn't even make a sound. Not that human ears can hear, the guardian agreed. What you mean? Be patient and you'll see. Just wait. Chapter 14 The Seashell Summons Danny was sleeping peacefully with Teddy curled up beside her, tiny snores rising from his snout. But when the little dog jumped awake all of a sudden, his ears perked up, the motion woke her. Teddy went flying off the bed and scampered across the room to the door, where he began scratching and whining to get out. What's wrong, Teddy? Did you hear something? Danny rubbed her eyes and sat up slowly, relieved to find she had no pain at all. Indeed, she felt rather wonderful. You need to go out, boy. As the fog of sleep lifted, she looked around at the gilded bedchamber and felt like she must have stepped into somebody else's life. Who was this person, lounging like a slugger-bed princess in a canopy bed with plump pillows, a cozy pink nightgown wrapped around her? She smiled, remembering the lovely dream she'd had about the angel. Then she vaguely recalled the kindly old housekeeper who had helped her to wash up and change clothes into the borrowed nightgown she now wore. Where were her dirty old clothes anyway? Must be around here somewhere. But as Teddy scratched at the closed door, she realized it would be dawn soon, and that meant she had to go to work. She let out a long, wistful exhalation. But she saw she'd better get her dog outside before he had an accident on the floor. Teddy was still pawing on the door insistently as she slid out of bed. She crossed the room and picked him up. Come on, boy, I'll carry you outside, she murmured. She didn't want him running off by himself and waking up whoever lived here with his barking. Barefooted, she stepped out into the hallway, glancing this way and that. The big, strange house was so quiet. Where had everybody gone? She barely remembered being brought here, but the place had a spooky atmosphere. She could swear that several pairs of eyes in the portraits on the walls followed her as she tiptoed past carrying her dog. Hurrying down the grand staircase, she crossed the foyer. "'Mrs. Appleton?' she called nervously, hoping to ask permission if she could let Teddy outside in the back garden. "'Jake!' Silence. "'Anybody?' Then, faintly, she heard voices. She followed the sound to a closed door across the foyer. She summoned up her courage and opened it. Her eyes widened. A magnificent library! Heaven! She sucked in her breath in delight at the sight of all the books. One second, Teddy, she whispered. I've got to see this. No one was inside, so she crept in. The voices grew louder. Was that Jake? Yes, she could hear him talking to Derek Stone. Their muffled exchange floated in through the pair of French doors standing open on the far end of the Grand Library. Through the open doors, with their light curtains billowing on the breeze, she could see a pleasant terrace that overlooked the River Thames. She ventured closer, but the serious tone of their conversation made her hold back instead of barging in. Jake would call her a pest, and she always hated that. I can't bring back your parents, Mr. Stone was saying, but at least I can introduce you to the last person who ever saw them alive. Edging closer, Danny leaned to eavesdrop in the doorway, until she saw Jake standing with one foot propped on the stone railing of the terrace. He was scanning the water. I don't see anything, he said. She'll be here shortly, and when she comes you must be very careful. Her kind can be dangerous, as I said. You have to show respect. Trust me, you don't want to offend a water nymph. Danny furrowed her brow and Teddy gave a low, nervous growl as the water in front of Jake began to bubble in the most peculiar fashion. Jake pointed at it in sudden excitement. Look, there! Something's rising! Not something, someone, Derek corrected. They can travel this part of the river now, thanks to a breathing apparatus that one of the Order's geniuses invented, and I dare say you'll meet him. Then Jake let out a sound of utter amazement, backing away from the river. Danny did the same, edging back in fear. 
She continued to watch, unnoticed, behind the doorframe, but she could hardly believe her eyes. A dripping figure rose up from the water, a beautiful woman in light armor, like a Roman goddess. She was standing in a chariot made of a great nautilus shell, pulled by a pair of giant carp. Danny stared in slack-jawed wonder at this vision. I must have bumped my head harder than I thought. The woman's armor gleamed in the moonlight, the pale metal inlaid with mother-of-pearl from the inside of cockle shells. Her dark purple hair flowed out from beneath her helmet. Her pale skin had a faintly greenish tinge. She had large, mysterious eyes that reflected the changing color of the Thames. Her necklace was a starfish, her belt a green twine of aquatic plants. In one hand, she carried a slim, silvery trident as tall as herself, with a large green stone set in the center. In the other, the stately woman held the reins of her chariot. Each fish was as long as Derek was tall, weighing hundreds of pounds. The giant river carp pursed their rubbery lips as they bobbed at the surface, their big, oddly human-like eyes rolling about, taking in the scene. Danny noticed silvery eels making figure eights in the water around the chariot. Then she realized there were more water nymphs swimming nearby, attending their leader in the chariot. She, in turn, looped the reins over a hook on the front of her vehicle, then removed the elaborate breathing apparatus that covered her nose and mouth like a mask. "'Who summons me?' she demanded. "'I do, Jake Reed. I mean, um,' he glanced warily at Derek. "'Jacob Everton. Ah, oh, yes, so they finally found you, the lost heir of Lord and Lady Griffin. So we meet again, my young lordling.' There was a fierceness in her smile. She greeted Derek with a nod. Got in stone. I am pleased to see you track the boy down at last. The big man nodded. He's come into his powers. Lordling, Danny thought. Derek stepped closer with a polite gesture. My lord, allow me to present the person who saved your life, Captain Lydia Brackwater, keeper of the Thames. Danny blinked. And was she hearing things, or had Derek Stone just addressed Jake the blockhead as my lord? Her pickpocket friend stood there motionless until Derek elbowed him. Bow, he muttered. Abruptly, Jake snapped out of his reverie and managed a slight, awkward bend at the waist. The water nymph looked amused. Well, boy, where have you been hiding all these years? What do you have to say for yourself? Jake glanced at Derek, then back at her. I should ask you the same, ma'am. I beg your pardon? Jake, Derek warned. Stone said you're the one who abandoned me in the river. Abandoned you? Anger flashed across the water nymph's face. You left me to die. Jake, was that the best you could do? He demanded, sending me off down the river alone, a baby. I could have been run over by a ship. I could have drowned. Bad enough I was lost for eleven years and had to grow up in an orphanage all because of you. Show some respect. Derek barked, but the shocked keeper of the Thames drew herself up, grandly enraged. Why, you ungrateful tadpole! Lydia Brackwater thundered. It is true, your mother saved a colony of water nymphs from being poisoned by a factory dumping filth into their stream, but we are not in the habit of helping humans. You are lucky the water nymph queen gave your mother that summons shell as a token of our people's thanks, or we would not have come at all. But whoever wears that shell has the authority to command us, and so we did as Lady Griffin asked and took you. For all the thanks we get— how dare you speak to me thus? I'm surprised at you, Guardian Stone, allowing this brat to summon me so I could be insulted. I have two hundred miles of river to tend tonight. I'm sorry, Lydia, I was telling him about the order and who he really is, but he didn't seem to believe me. He wanted proof. Oh, did he indeed? She asked with a sharp gleam in her eyes. Before pulling down her mask, she added, Well, let's give it to him then. With that, she jumped up like a dolphin from the water, grabbed Jake's arm, and yanked him off the terrace, plunging with him under the river's surface. Danny screamed when the creature grabbed Jake. She came running out of her hiding place, put Teddy down, and crossed the terrace, peering over the railing in a panic. Jake! Jake! Teddy was standing at the water's edge, barking at the river. Even Derek Stone was rattled. 
Brackwater, he roared, bring him back now. But the water nymph captain was long gone. She had even left her chariot and her giant cop behind. Where has she taken him? Danny cried. Probably to Griffin Castle. Blast it, I told him not to insult her. Derek spun away from the stone railing and marched back across the terrace toward the house. Doesn't he ever do as he's told? Not really, Danny ran after him. Is she going to eat him? Don't be silly, he clipped out. Water nymphs don't eat people. Drown them occasionally. What are you doing out of bed? You need to rest like Dr. Celestis said. She stopped. How do you know about my dream? I have to go. Well, I'm coming with you, she informed him, striding at his heels. No, you're not. You just had a terrible blow to the head, young lady. I feel fine. Jake needs me. You know he does. Please. She grabbed his arm and made him turn to her. I'm the only one he trusts, she insisted. He looked at her in exasperation, then shook his head. She could tell he was not accustomed to dealing with children, especially girls. Oh, very well, he said impatiently. From what I've seen, if you actually got that lad to trust you, that is a major accomplishment, Miss O'Dell. You better come along, go get your cloak and shoes on, and hurry. Danny dashed off to obey. Chapter 15 Below the Surface The River Thames was deep and dark and cold, and Jake was terrified. He could see nothing, for it was not yet sunrise, and the murky water was brownish even in the daytime. Lydia cut through the current with powerful, waving strokes, pulling him after her, bits of mud and slime sliding over his skin. He could not believe he'd been abducted by a water nymph. Such creatures were not even supposed to exist, but they obviously did. They were swimming at top speed against the current, which meant she was taking him not toward the sea, Jake realized, but deeper into the heart of England. Lydia paused and did something to her trident so that its green jewel glowed, providing them with light. She held it out in front of them like a lantern, then forged on. Where they were going or what she meant to do with him once they got there, Jake had no idea, but in the meanwhile he was running out of air. He had managed to take a deep breath before she had pulled him under, but it was escaping him bit by bit in a trail of bubbles from his mouth and nose. In another thirty seconds he'd run out of air. He was beginning to panic. Though Lydia Brackwater was pulling him along at wild speeds, he tugged her arm frantically until she turned and glared at him. What? she demanded in a gurgly underwater voice. He pointed toward the surface. She narrowed her eyes at him, in impatience, but then sped upward. Jake's head shot above the waterline. He came up coughing and gasping for air. Wiping the water out of his eyes, he caught a glimpse of lights far off in the distance. London? They had already come so far. Lydia Brackwater pulled off her pollution-filtering mask, while Jake coughed up river water and gulped fresh air. He'd be happy to survive the next half hour. Lydia reached over and none too gently put her mask on him. It sucked onto his face like a starfish. She turned a dial on it from filter to air mask, and he suddenly found that he could breathe. Where are we going? he demanded, his voice coming out nasal and strange through the mask. She didn't bother answering the question, but grabbed him by the wrist again and dove. Jake decided that if she meant to kill him, she would have done so by now, and she probably wouldn't have given him her mask. Perhaps they were far enough away from the city now that the water was clean enough for her to breathe unaided. With air in his lungs and the green glowing light to show the way, Jake found his abduction to be quite a different experience. He looked all around him in wonder at the strange, eerie world beneath the river. Above, he saw the underside of ships the long wooden hulls of old sailing vessels, a mighty ironclad merchant ship, and a few paddle-wheel boats stilled for the night, duck feet padded lazily by the banks. All around him a forest of countless chains as thick as his leg secured the boats with the giant anchors that held them in place for the night. He looked down and saw an ancient wreck that had probably sat there rotting away for centuries, a simple fishing boat covered in barnacles and moss. 
He saw many nets and the schools of fish doing their best to avoid them. Crab traps bobbed at the bottom of the river amidst vast colonies of cockle shells. Elegant silvery dace darted about in a school, while catfish rested on the bottom. Slimy bits of algae drifted past his mask, but then, suddenly, a long, mean pike appeared in front of him, its sharp teeth bristling. It eyed him like it thought he might be something good to eat. Lydia Brackwater ordered the dangerous fish away. The pike fled at her command and left Jake alone. They raced on, his ears filled with the gurgling whoosh of rushing water as they swam. Soon he heard a strange sound up ahead, a deep, rhythmic pounding. Lydia's green light revealed the underside of a water wheel churning silvery bubbles in the river. He wondered what sort of factory it powered, maybe an old grist mill where they ground corn and rye into flour. Jake was fascinated by the steady turning of the mill wheel, but Lydia had no intention of letting him linger. They pressed on. Some snails attached to a nearby rock peeked out of their shells and watched them go zipping by. Jake wasn't sure how much time had passed when Lydia headed once more for the surface. When they cleared the waterline, she pulled her mask off Jake's head and sent him flying out of the water. Next time somebody tells you something, maybe you should leave them. He landed with a squish on the muddy bank and rolled to a halt amongst the pussy willows. Hey, where are you going? he yelled after her. You can't just leave me here, abandoning me again. But she was already gone. He fell back onto the riverbank in delayed astonishment, trying to catch his breath. For a second, he just lay there, freezing cold, his chest heaving. Well, that was the closest thing to a bath I've had in ages, he thought. Then he sat up. Where am I? As he wiped the stinging water out of his eyes, he saw the castle. It loomed a few hundred yards ahead against the fading stars. Jake stood up, dripping wet and shivering, but fascinated. Oi! he suddenly yelped as something wriggled in his pocket. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a slippery minnow. It looked at him in alarm. He threw it into the river. Then he shook himself. What a strange night I'm having! Fortunately, dawn was beginning to light the eastern horizon. He set his sights on the castle. There had to be a reason why the water nymph had brought him here. He walked through overgrown formal gardens with graveled paths laid out in geometric patterns. Weeds were slowly overrunning the once grand gardens. Topiary bushes that once had been clipped into interesting shapes had grown into large, misshapen bulges. The neglected flower beds were in chaos, the trellised archway sagging under heavy vines. The garden seemed to be asleep. Jake eyed the stone garden statues posing here and there with suspicion. After the things he'd seen lately, he would not be surprised if they came to life and started up a conversation. Fortunately, they did not. At the other end of the garden, he stopped before a stately back entrance to the castle. The smooth grey stone tapered up into an arch above thick double doors of oak, reinforced with iron. There were no signs of life anywhere around the place. For that matter, there wasn't even a ghost on hand he could have asked a question, starting with... Where am I? His heart pounding, Jake walked slowly to the door. Deep in his heart, a knowing whisper stirred. Somehow he sensed that he had been here before. He listened hard, still hearing nothing but the wind rustling the gardens. He felt uneasy, but years of brazen misbehavior as a London street kid helped him find the nerve to grasp the massive iron door latch and lift it. It opened, unlocked. Pushing the door inward, he peered into the dark, silent home. A glance confirmed that, indeed, the castle was deserted. All the furniture was draped in ghostly white cloth. It smelled musty, cobwebs waving in a draught. Cautiously, Jake stepped in and closed the door behind him. He took another step into the hallway when something moved by his feet. He shot backwards as a large frog leaped out of his path with a throaty ribbit. It sounded vaguely reproachful. With a weak laugh, Jay clutched his chest, mocking himself for how his heart was banging after that scare. Sorry, mate, 
he muttered, recovering his usual cheeky sarcasm. Didn't mean to step on you. He took care to step over the frog and then proceeded warily, soon arriving in a classic castle great hall. He looked around in every direction, marveling at the place. It was huge, with a soaring vaulted ceiling and a fireplace as tall as he. By the wall stood a dusty suit of armor on display. But then he frowned as another hopping motion in the half-light drew his gaze toward the floor. Frogs! Everywhere! There must have been thirty of them sitting around the great hall, croaking up a storm. They must have come up from the river and had somehow gotten in. They had taken over the abandoned castle. The place was infested with them. Although a boy of twelve usually found gross things fairly amusing, even Jake was a little disgusted by all the frogs. He would have thought the creatures preferred to live down on the river. He picked his way into the great hall, minding his footing, but still determined to have a look around. At any rate, the frogs seemed to enjoy the puddles he left behind, for they followed him eagerly, croaking louder, as he squished across the room in his sodden shoes and wet clothes. Cold from his dunking, he pulled one of the cloth covers off a nearby wing chair and used it for a towel, drying his face and then wrapping it around himself to try to get warm. Just then, the portrait hanging above the fireplace caught his eye. He stood stock still, staring up at it. The first golden ray of daylight beamed in through the high window on the other end of the great hall and lit the painting of a handsome blonde man and a dark-haired lady with a baby on her lap. Jake quietly drew in his breath, riveted. The man seemed to stare back at him from the canvas with a lordly look of pride, and the smiling lady wore a seashell on a ribbon around her neck. As for the baby in the picture, Jake understood now why he had been brought here. The truth finally sank in. Everything Derek had said clicked into place inside his mind. These had been his parents. This once had been his home. Part 3 Chapter 16 Grounded. Bickering was not a very pleasant sound to wake up to, but that's what Gladwin heard coming from the top of the stairs early the next morning. Oh, please, dear Waldrick, let me have another feather. Oh, I think you've had quite enough. Malediction, woman, I told you not to stay out so late. The sun is already rising. Hurry, we've got to get you back into your tank. Ow! Careful with my tentacles, you oaf! Rubbing the sleep out of her eyes, Gladwin pushed up onto her knees from where she had been balled up on the floor of the jar that was her prison. She rested her hands on the glass wall and stared at the spectacle of the Earl of Griffin helping Fenula Coralbroom down the stairs. The sea witch was already in the middle of changing back into her true ugly form. Gladwin winced at the sea hag's hobbling gait over the dry ground. The transformation from beautiful opera singer back into squiddy hag looked awfully painful. Fenula shrieked and gnashed her sharp teeth as her shapely human legs morphed back into a mass of thick, writhing tentacles. A dainty red shoe clattered down the steps. Oh, please, Warder, quickly! I must have another feather! You need to get back in your tank and do your blasted work. Did anyone see you like this? No! Oh, I'm so ugly. I hate those mermaids. Look what they've done to me. I'll fix them one day. I'll curse them all. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, I hear you, he muttered. She leaned her hefty bulk against Waldrick as he helped her down the dark stone stairs toward her pool. Quickly, Waldrick, I'm drying out! Finula Coralbroom swore like the luckless sailors she had once devoured as the Earl helped her squish her way back to her alcove, scolding her all the while. I told you not to dawdle. You do this every time. They reached the waist-high edge of her stone pool, and he struggled to give her a boost. Where have you been? he demanded, grunting with exertion, as he helped her get her large girth over the stone edge of her pool. Gladwin covered a laugh with her hand. At last, Finula plunged into the water with a splash. She came up with a sigh. Oh, Waldrick, <laughs> you should have seen me. I went to Drury Lane Theatre and nearly caused a riot with one little tune. 
Well, your fun is over, he snapped, wiping drops of water off his face in disgust. We've got work to do. Too tired. Fenula floated on her back and closed her eyes. He splashed her in annoyance. Don't you dare go to sleep. I want my questions answered. What happened at Newgate? Where are my men? They haven't returned. Haven't they? She opened her eyes and looked at him curiously. Look into your seeing bowl and tell me where they are. You don't have to be so pushy about it. What happened at the jail? he repeated. How should I know? I did what you told me. I sang my tune and put them in a trance. Your men went off around the building and I left to go amuse myself. That's the last I saw them. Well, find them. Finula huffed, but obliged him, peering once again into the magic waters in her divining bowl, made from the shell of a sea turtle. Oh, dear. What? You're not going to like it. Tell me. Finula frowned. Your men have run away. They're afraid to come back for fear of what you might do to them. Waldrick's cold gray eyes glinted. As well they should be if they failed. Dedekstone? Alive. What of the boy? She waved her hand over the water's surface with a murmured chant, then said, I see him escaping with a guardian to Beacon House. Waldrick slammed his fist down on the table, but Gladwin received this news with joy. The boy was still safe. A roar came from the beast below, but Waldrick bellowed, Silence! like he might explode. Gladwin grinned at her fellow prisoners, but they were cowering as usual. The creature in the dark cell below the workshop grew quiet. The earl leaned his hands against the table and stared into the candle flame, collecting his thoughts. Its flickering dance seemed to soothe him. I'll never reach him there he said at last. Beacon House is nearly impregnable, guarded by many spells and fearsome animal spirits. They've already left Beacon House, Fenula reported hesitantly, as though afraid to anger him once again. She waved her warty hands over her divining bowl once more. They've moved on. The boy is now at— Don't even say it, the witch looked over at him. Waldrick's eyes shot sparks as he glanced over at her. Griffin Castle! Yes, my lord, but the boy is there alone. You should go at once and finish him off tonight. I cannot do that, Fenula. Surely you have not forgotten my charming brother's parting words, how he cursed me right before he died, so that never again would I be able to set foot on the grounds of our home. Griffin Castle is the one place in this world where I cannot reach the brat. He's even safer there than at Beacon House. Gladwin absorbed this while Waldrick paced. Unless, he suddenly turned to Fenula, you have some notion of how I could lure him away from the castle, make him come to me, then I could finish him off once and for all. Hmm. Fenula looked impressed at the suggestion and opened her thick, leather-bound grimoire. She began thumbing through the ancient yellowed pages, considering different spells. Hmm. Well, this might work. The Obadire spell. Very old, very powerful. If we use this spell, the boy will be forced to obey your every command. Really? Some sort of mind control? How perfectly delightful. He let out a low, diabolical chuckle and straightened up from leaning on the table. He turned to her, his fists propped on his waist. But there are drawbacks, as with every spell. Like what? With this spell creates a sort of link between two people's minds, the controller and the slave. Just as you'll be able to see inside of his mind, he'll be able to see inside yours. Waldrick frowned. I'm not sure I like that. But then it only has to work long enough to lure him away from the castle. Then I'll kill him. There is another drawback. What's that? An essential ingredient in this potion is a hair from the boy's head, she said, scanning over the recipe. Seems a bit of a problem. If we could get close to him to pluck one of his hairs, we'd be close enough to kill him. How are we going to steal one? You and I can't, perhaps, but I know someone who can. Waldrick sent her a cunning smile and strolled over to the cage that rested on the table. He opened it and the dreadful spider crawled out onto his hand. Malwart can do it easily. Gladwin ducked instinctively when she saw the spider. He is extremely stealthy, aren't you, boy? 
Waldrick smiled as the spider crawled up his arm. Malwart can get close to the brat without anyone even noticing. You're willing to help, aren't you, my friend? There's an excellent juicy horsefly in it for you. Or a few. Oh, yes, master. Yes. Tasty morsels. Malwart will help. Capital spider. You shall come along with us on our little holiday out into the countryside. He put the Arachno sapiens gently back into its cage and closed the door. Very well, Finula said uneasily, lifting a tentacle and wriggling it at him. But I cannot go with you in this form. Oh, yes, don't worry about that. Don't worry, she retorted. If those horrid water nymphs catch me near one of their inland rivers or streams, they'll tear me limb from limb. Oh, barbarians. Waldrick smiled broadly. Oh, my sweet Finula, nobody's going to tear you limb from limb. I'll bring plenty of extra feathers, so don't fret. You can maintain your lovely disguise for as long as it takes. Now, then, make sure you assemble all the other ingredients you'll need in order to brew this potion while we're there. We shall leave later this morning. When we get there, we'll take lodgings in the village of Gryffindale near Griffin Castle. Any questions? Finula shook her head. Then, if you'll pardon me, I must go and pack my things for our little holiday. Yes, and I need my beauty sleep. That you do, he mumbled. What did you say? Oh, nothing. Goodbye for now, my dear. He hurried out of the dark underground lair, and before long the horrid Fenula coral broom was reclining in her stone pool, snoring. Gladwin was brimming with excitement over the information she had overheard. If only she could get out of here, she could warn Guardian Stone to keep Jacob at the castle, where he'd be safe until the Order had dealt with Waldrick and Finula. Gladwin was perfectly willing to testify against the odious man for kidnapping her and the other magical creatures, and for harboring the Sea Witch, a dangerous wanted criminal and fugitive from justice. These crimes alone were enough to get Waldrick locked up for a very long time, never mind his attempts to kill his innocent young nephew. Gladwin's immediate problem, though, was how to escape. She had bruised her arms and worn out her muscles yesterday, trying to pry the lid off the jar, holding onto its air holes. She tried again now, but the thing wouldn't budge. Crocodile! She banged her head against the glass in frustration so hard that the jar rocked. Ow! As she rubbed her head, the answer came to her all of a sudden. Oh, Gladwin, you dolt! Why didn't you think of that before? The solution was suddenly obvious. It might be a little dangerous, but... Backing up, she ran the two or three steps across the jar, ramming the opposite side with her shoulder. Again she did it. Again and again. The jar skipped closer toward the edge of the shelf. She kept running back and forth, rocking the jar with all her tiny weight, until suddenly it tipped off the shelf and fell, plunging toward the floor. She lifted her wings, poised to fly, and brought up her arms to shield her face from broken glass. Smash! The jar hit the floor and shattered into pieces, but Gladwin's feet didn't even touch the ground. She flew up from the broken jar, clearing the jagged edges of glass by a hair's breadth. She zoomed toward the ceiling. Free! Unfortunately, the crash of the jar hitting the floor had awakened Finula. The witch sat up with a walrus snuffle, then cursed when she saw the trail of golden sparkles revealing Gladwin's path. As Gladwin flew wildly toward the exit, the witch grabbed her petrified starfish wand and began hurling bolts of magic at her, shouting some spell meant to stop her in her tracks. Gladwin dodged this way and that, ducking the jaggedy currents of blue energy that flew out of the wand like little bolts of lightning. She bumped her head on the ceiling and nearly bruised one of her wings. Meanwhile, the other captive creatures had awakened and were yelling at her. Higher! Lower! Watch out! Behind you! Let us out, too! But it was too late. All of a sudden, a current of energy engulfed Gladwin. She found herself suspended, unable to move, floating inside a blue bubble. Waldrick! The sea witch bellowed at the top of her lungs. Come down here, you useless human bumbler! He came running. What's all the commotion? he shouted, charging down the steps. Do something with that thing! That stupid fairy woke me up! He gasped when he saw Gladwin hanging motionless in midair. 
Gladwin gulped as he narrowed his eyes at her. She couldn't move her arms or legs, couldn't flap her wings. She couldn't do anything as he sauntered over to her and looked her in the eyes. The bubble hovered at about his eye level. Well, well, thought you could get away, did you? That wasn't very smart. You take care of her, Fenula complained. I'm going back to sleep. Oh, believe me, I will. He reached into the blue bubble and popped it as his giant hand closed around her. Gladwin's head and shoulders were free above the base of his thumb, while her toes fluttered out by the heel of his hand. Fighting and cursing against him in her fairy language, she pushed against his grasp to no avail. Maybe I'll feed you to Malwalt after all, he said. M -m 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 master the satyr spoke up, bleating like a sheep in his fright. What is it? Waldrick snapped. Respectfully, sir, fairy blood is poisonous to spiders. The cherub nodded earnestly. I've heard that too, my lord. Is it really? Waldrick looked surprised. He eyed each of his prisoners skeptically. Hmm, I will look into that. You had better not be lying. In the meanwhile, I suppose we can't take any chances of anything happening to our dear little Malwart. He has an important job to do. Thanks to her fellow captive's quick thinking, Gladwin was spared the fate of being fed to the spider. Instead, Waldrick took a small wooden box down off the shelf. It had wire mesh for a lid. Ha! You won't be able to break this. Gladwin panicked when he started to put her in the box. She had to get out of here. Unable to wriggle free of his grasp, she had one last means of trying to make him release his giant hand from around her. She bit him. Ow! Why, you miserable little gnat! How dare you! Her attempt didn't work. He only gripped her harder. He lifted her up to glare in her face, his cold gray eyes shooting sparks of rage, like a blade being sharpened on a spinning stone. Foolish little fairy, you should not have done that. Now you've made me angry. Thought you'd fly away. Well, I'm sorry to say your flying days are over. The blood drained from Gladwin's face as he picked up the pair of scissors lying on the work table. Then he brought them toward her, opening the blades and eyeing up her delicate gossamer wings. No, please, not my wings. Anything but that, I beg you. But he couldn't understand her pleading, nor would he have cared. He snickered as he brought the giant scissors up behind her. Gladwin squeezed her eyes shut and screamed. Chapter 17 of Parting Ways and Flying Machines Derek Stone told Danny all about Jake's shocking background as they rode to Griffin Castle astride the warrior's towering black stallion. Teddy poked his head out of the satchel on Danny's back and sniffed the air when they arrived before two tall, wrought-iron gates. The giant gates were flanked by pillars topped with stone griffin statues. The fierce beasts seemed to stare at them as they rode through the gates and continued up the long, tree-lined drive. Holding on to Derek's waist, Danny peeked around the warrior for a look at Griffin Castle's towers and turrets. She could not believe Jake had been born in such splendor. At last, Derek brought his tired stallion to a halt and jumped down from the saddle. He lifted Danny down and set her on her feet, and Danny, in turn, put Teddy on the ground. Stretching from nearly four uncomfortable hours on the horse, Danny glanced at the boarded-up, abandoned castle. Derek walked to the front door and reached for the door handle. Isn't it locked? She did not know why she whispered, but there was an eerie stillness about this place, as if it slept under some enchanted spell. Derek gave her an odd look over his shoulder as she followed him. People don't lock their doors in the country, Miss Odell. I think perhaps you've been in London too long. He opened the door and stepped inside with a cautious glance around. Jacob! He hates being called that. Oh, Jake! He tried again. Teddy raced in past them and immediately began barking and running around. He's found something, she said. Teddy, stop that. What's that you're after? She ran farther into the castle to catch the little rascal. Teddy, no! Leave that frog alone. Mr. Stone, there's a frog in here. There's a bunch of them. Teddy was barking merrily at the frogs, whirling this way and that. He dashed off and chased another, while Danny hurried after him with a grimace. 
What are frogs doing in a castle? It's like a Bible plague. The panicked frogs were in retreat, trying to escape, but the wee terrier was having a marvellous time, his front half down, his haunches high, his tail wagging madly. He seemed to enjoy making them hop by menacing them with his bark. Teddy, that's not nice. Drop him now. Teddy looked up with a frog dangling from his mouth. Danny put her hands on her hips. Teddy! The terrier dropped the frog with a disappointed whine. She bent down and reached to pick Teddy up to keep him out of trouble, but the terrier suddenly caught a familiar scent and dashed off, following his nose. The dog led them straight to Jake. They found his lordship in the great hall, sleeping on a couch across from the fireplace. Her dog, helpful as ever, was already busy waking him up, standing on Jake's chest, licking his nose. Danny ran over to them. Jake, are you all right? I've been scared to death. When that thing grabbed you, I'm fine, he mumbled, pushing Teddy aside. Then he sat up with a yawn. He had wrapped himself in the dust cover cloth from the sofa and was using it for a blanket. I see you found your way home, Derek said as he joined them. It appears so, Jake replied in a low, cautious tone. They both looked at the painting above the mantel, then exchanged a somber glance. Danny realized in shock it was a picture of Jake's parents. The resemblance was unmistakable. Abruptly, she fell silent, not knowing what to say. If Jake really was an aristocrat, he probably couldn't be friends with her for much longer. She was just a commoner and would soon be headed back to the rookery without him. And then what? She thought in dread. No more magic in her life. No more adventures. I walked around the grounds and found their tombs, Jake said. There's a marble mausoleum in the woods with a reflecting pond in front of it. Derek nodded sadly. Are you all right? I, hungry, the bedraggled boy Earl let out a yawn, but as usual refused to admit how he really felt. Uh, I don't suppose either of you brought something to eat. I'm starving. Hearing this, Danny smiled ruefully at Derek. I guess he is all right. I only brought a few supplies, the warrior said, but if we go up across the fields to the neighboring estate, Bradford Park, I'm sure you can have a proper breakfast there. Really? Why should the people there want to feed us? Because they're your relatives, Derek replied. Jake's jaw dropped. More relatives? <sighs> well, I hope these ones at least won't try to kill me. They won't. Come on. Jake threw off the sheet and jumped to his feet. Well, if they've got food, just point the way. Uh, watch out for all those frogs, he cautioned as they headed for the door. Jake scooped Teddy up in his arms and scratched him under the chin as he carried him out. Don't know how they got in, but they seem to think they own the place. Derek pulled the door shut behind them. They went out into the morning sunshine. Jake set Teddy down again. Derek went to untie his horse while Danny walked beside her friend. She was so relieved to find him all right. Congratulations, Jake, she offered. You finally found your parents. I can't believe you're an earl. Jake shook his head in amazement. I can't believe it either. Uh, how's your head this morning? All better. Uh, Jake, I hope... Keep up, you two, Derek ordered, leading his horse ahead of them through the tall grass, while Teddy frolicked through the meadow, forgetting the frogs, in favour of the butterflies. Uh, you hope uh, what? he asked. But before Danny could answer, she was interrupted again, this time by a long, loud, wobbly shout erupting over the field ahead. For a second, Danny didn't see anyone. Then a streak of motion overhead drew her attention. She furrowed her brow as a boy wearing brass-rimmed goggles and a long white coat went flying over the field in front of them, riding on a marvelous machine, an odd bat-wing contraption that looked like giant kites or canvas sails attached to a small canoe with wheels on the bottom and two small propellers on the back. He shouted as he flew, catapulting in a great arc over the field above them. Danny, Jake, and Derek all turned their heads in unison, following his flight as the boy sailed through the afternoon sky. Woohoo! He whooped, 
passing overhead to disappear behind a nearby grove of trees. Splash! What the deuce was that? Jake cried, turning to Derek. That, the warrior said dryly, was your cousin Archie. And shrugging like he could not quite believe it himself, he added, The boy genius. Chapter 18 Bradford Park They ran to see if the boy on the flying machine had broken his head, but found him climbing out of the shallow pond. It works! It works! he shouted jubilantly. Mr. Stone, hello! Did you see that? He pushed his goggles up onto his head and didn't seem to care in the least that he was soaked to the skin. Did you see my pigeon go? I did, Master Archie, Derek called back in amusement. Well done, as always. Brilliant, Jake breathed, staring rapturously at the contraption. I want a turn. Danny frowned at him. Recklessness obviously ran in the family. Master Archie, or rather, the Honorable Archimedes, James Bradford, as Derek formally introduced him, was eleven, with dark hair that stuck out in all directions, a splash of freckles across his face, and black twinkly eyes full of mischief and extraordinary notions. Danny rather hated him on sight, though she couldn't say why. First of all, he was much too happy. Hello! he greeted them with great amiable cheer. Peeling off his gloves, he shook hands with Jake and bowed to Danny like a proper young gentleman. Ugh, perfect manners, too. She stared at him, bemused by this odd being who seemed to be made of equal parts enthusiasm and eccentricity. But Archie soon returned to marveling over his long-lost cousin. Indeed, each boy seemed quite pleased to find himself with an agreeable male cousin about his own age. Danny despaired, fearing she was already forgotten. Just then, a frantic voice reached them from the distance. Archimedes! They all turned. An elegant black-haired lady was rushing out of the grand white house toward them, holding up her long, dark skirts to avoid tripping on them in her haste. Oh, dash, Archie said under his breath. Master Archie, are you hurt? she demanded as she hurried toward them, using her hand to shade her milky complexion from the sun. You know you are not supposed to work on the glider without Henry's supervision. You could have been killed. I'm fine, Miss Helena, really, the young inventor called back in a long, suffering tone. Who's that? Jake whispered. That's our governess. Well, more my sister's now, he said glumly. She's half French and a termagant when she's cross. A what? Jake said. Termagant, an overbearing shrew, Danny informed him. Archie turned to Danny, pleased that she understood him. But Derek watched Miss Helena approach with an odd glow in his eyes. I'm sure she's nothing of the kind, he murmured, taking a step toward the dark-eyed beauty who now joined them. Fear not, the boy is unharmed, Mademoiselle Duval. When the guardian greeted the governess with a small, chivalrous bow, Danny and Jake looked at him and then at each other in shock. Miss Helena smiled at him, pressing her hand to her heart as she strove to catch her breath. Ah, Guardian Stone, if I had known you were on hand, I should not have feared for the boy's safety in the least. She smoothed a stray hair back toward the neat bun she wore at her nape. Then she straightened the cameo brooch that adorned the high lace neck of her gown. As it is, I was sitting in the drawing room with Miss Isabel and her ladyship when I saw him go flying through the sky, mon Dieu! Miss Helena turned and scolded Archie in a rapid stream of French, then pointed toward the house. Archie apparently understood every word. Danny was impressed in spite of herself. Looking mortified, the young scientist went to collect his pigeon, while Jake eyed the governess like she'd better not even think about telling him what to do in any language. While Jake went to help his cousin drag the invention out of the pond, Derek told Miss Helena who Jake and Danny were. The governess declared that Lady Bradford would want to see her long-lost great-great-nephew right away. Danny called Teddy back to take him inside, but when she picked him up, to her surprise, he growled at Miss Helena. The Frenchwoman frowned, but seemed unsurprised. The governess narrowed her yellowish-green eyes at Teddy and fairly hissed. Danny looked at Derek Stone in confusion as the mysterious woman walked ahead of them. 
he merely grinned and gave her a wink. Well, there is some sort of secret here, Danny thought. Whatever it was, she instantly wanted to know it. She kept her eyes open and her wits sharp while the boys pulled Archie's flying machine back up onto the grass. Together, they all went up to the gleaming white mansion on the hill. Bradford House was modeled on a classical Greek temple. It had a small dome on top, a front portico held up by stately columns, and symmetrical wings off the main block, with rows of sparkling windows. In the sculpted gardens, not a blade of grass appeared out of place. When they stepped inside, the house was bright and airy. Miniature lemon trees grew in pots in the entrance hall. The rooms they passed were painted in pastels. It was the most elegant house Danny had ever seen, and it made her all the more self-conscious about the fact that she was from the rookery, not to mention still wearing a borrowed nightgown and her grubby old cloak. Derek Stone and the boys did not pay attention to such things, but she had noticed the second glance that Miss Helena had cast her. She wished she would have had at least a moment to comb her hair. On second thought, she supposed she should just be happy to be alive after all that had happened to her last night. Her ladyship is in the morning room, the governess informed them as she led the way, her head high, her shoulders back, her step confident and graceful. Danny was in awe of Miss Helena's sublime respectability. Do you smell that? Jake whispered as they went down the main corridor. She nodded eagerly. Food! Then Miss Helena stepped into the morning room ahead of them. It had light yellow walls, white trim, and a pretty floral rug over the hardwood floor. Your ladyship, Guardian Stone is here. He has brought the boy. The second Danny saw the stern-looking old woman, she understood her at once to be a formidable personage, the sort commonly known as a dragon lady. Her grey hair was arranged in an elegant bun atop her head. She had high cheekbones and the most intensely piercing eyes as she took the small reading spectacles off the bony bridge of her nose and let them dangle from the ribbon around her neck. Quickly, she ordered, beckoning, let me see him. Derek grasped Jake's shoulder and steered him firmly into the room. Danny hid behind Archie. They exchanged a glance. She underdressed, he soaking wet. They both knew they were in for it. Even Jake seemed a little less cocky as he was presented to this intimidating grand dame. Uh, Ma'am? Lady Bradford, Derek said, allow me to present Jacob Everton, the seventh Earl of Griffin. Jake, this is your great-great-aunt Ramona, the Dowager Baroness Bradford. Danny peeked around Archie to see how her friend would fare. She winced as Jake attempted an awkward bow. But then her eyes widened when she noticed that Lady Bradford's sewing needle, which she had set aside, was still working on the embroidery by itself. The embroidery hoop floated in midair while the enchanted needle, pulling colored thread, darted back and forth through the white fabric working on the pattern. Pursing her lips, her ladyship set her spectacles on her nose again as if to hide the tears that the missing boy had been returned to their family. Instead, without a whit of sentiment, she inspected Jake, frowning. Yes, you are an Everton, all right, she confirmed with a nod. But you've got our Bradford nose. Indeed, the family likeness is all there, beneath the grime. Gracious boy, but you are bedraggled. What is the meaning of this? Helena, call Henry in at once to see to him. I cannot interview the lad in this uncivilized condition. Aunt Ramona? A soft voice spoke up from over by the window nook. Only then did Danny see the lovely blonde girl standing in the sunlight with a book on her head, as if she had just paused in her practice of ladylike walking. She was slightly older, perhaps fourteen, with golden blonde ringlets and sky-blue eyes that matched the satin sash around her waist. The old woman turned to her, her sternness melting almost to indulgence for a heartbeat. It was instantly clear this gentle-voiced creature was a great favorite with her. "'Yes, Isabel, what is it, my dear?' "'They are hungry,' the girl replied. All of a sudden, Teddy jumped out of Danny's arms and ran to the stranger with the golden ringlets. Isabel took the book off her head and bent down gracefully, picking Teddy up. "'Hello to you as well, little one.' Teddy was wagging his tail as if he had known her all his life. 
Danny was nonplussed. Her dog began making odd little noises, playful growls, half yips, almost warbling, as if he were talking to Isabel. My, my, did she really? she murmured, shaking her head. Danny looked on, staring at her dog in dismay. She knew it was silly of her, but she felt a bit betrayed, if not abandoned. If she had been jealous before, when Jake had made instant best friends with his cousin Archie, now she was bereft. Even her dog preferred these rich, fancy people over her. It wasn't fair. Teddy! Danny clapped her hands to her terrier. Teddy, come back here. Don't bother the young lady. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, he is not bothering me at all, Miss Isabel turned with an angelic smile. He could never bother anyone, could you, Teddy? I can tell he's a very good dog. Isabel put Teddy down, and he ran back to Danny, and it was then, as she scooped her dog back up in her arms, that the dragon lady noticed her. "'Pray tell, Guardian Stone, what is this you have brought me? A second dishevelled urchin?' Lady Bradford's piercing stare homed in on Danny as Archie stepped aside. "'She saved Jacob's life last night,' Isabel informed her great-great-aunt. "'She is his closest friend.' "'How did you know that?' Danny exclaimed. Teddy told me, of course. She did, it's true, Jake spoke up. Her name is Danny O'Dell. O'Dell, Lady Bradford grimaced. Teddy is right, Derek spoke up with a fond nod of greeting to Miss Isabel. Miss O'Dell did save your nephew's life last night, your ladyship. We had a spot of bother in town, but I'll tell you about it in a bit, if you don't mind, my lady. In the meanwhile, these children have not yet eaten today. "'Well, they cannot come to my table looking like that,' the Baroness said with a sniff. "'Helena, make Miss O'Dell as presentable as you can. Henry can see to the boys, both of them,' she added, sending Archie a stern arch of her silvery-gray eyebrow from across the room. "'Sorry, Aunt Ramona,' the young inventor mumbled. The Baroness lifted her chin as though trying not to smile. "'Did the glider work this time?' Archie burst out with a grin from ear to ear. It did! Looks like I'm ahead of schedule for the science conference in Norway. Hm, <laughs> prodigies, she said with a snort. Run along, then. Do sit down, Guardian Stone. We have much to discuss. I wish to hear all about how and where you found the boy. As Derek sat down with the old baroness, a young man in a brown tweed coat and polka-dotted bow tie bobbed into the doorway with an easy-going smile. "'Did you call for me, sis?' he asked Miss Helena. "'Ah, Henry, there you are.' Miss Helena went over to him and quietly explained their assignment. Henry's eyes widened as he saw the task he had ahead of him with Jake. A lifetime of grime would somehow have to be removed before the notorious pickpocket could begin to be turned into anything resembling a young gentleman about to inherit his father's title and fortune. Danny soon learned that Henry and Helena Duval were twins. Helena served as governess to Miss Isabel, while Henry was in charge of Master Archie as his tutor and valet. Tutor and governess exchanged a look of private dread at the challenge before them with Danny and Jake. Then the boys were marched up one set of stairs, and the girls were led up another, and they all got to work. Chapter 19 Gentlemen and Lady Somehow Jake survived the next hour, though Henry's battle to make him resemble something like a gentleman was more alarming than any attack by Uncle Waldrick's minions. At first, Jake had been impressed with the mansion's hot running water. Cousin Archie hastened to explain how it worked and had not stopped talking since. Fidgeting in the next room, Archie prattled on through the open door while Jake was dunked again in the torture device they called a bathtub, half drowned under mounds of bubbles. He came up sputtering once more and heard Henry barking orders at the footman. We're going to need stronger soap than this. Bring scissors for his hair. And cologne, please. Oh, throw out this wash rag. We're going to have to change the water again. It's as brown as the Thames. Blazes, lad, have you never cut your toenails in your life? They're as thick as a goat's hoof. Then the heartless scoundrel dunked him again. But an hour later, Jake stared at his reflection with an odd mix of shock, vanity, and embarrassment. Very handsome, my lord, Henry congratulated him, exhausted but pleased with his work. 
That well-dressed kid in the mirror couldn't possibly be him, Jake thought, but the reflection moved as he did, swiveling his head to the side to inspect his hair. To his surprise, it turned out to be a shade lighter once it was clean, more of a sandy gold like his father's in the portrait. The front part that usually fell in his eyes had been trimmed, then slicked back and smoothed into place with some pleasant-smelling cream. And his clothes! He'd long since grown accustomed to wearing rags. Lucky for him, Henry said. Master Archie grew so fast these days that he already ordered larger clothes for him from his tailor in London. Jake could not believe his eleven-year-old cousin had a Bond Street tailor. With a few quick adjustments, the fine clothes were made to fit Jake, a crisp white shirt and a neat black neckcloth, a pinstriped vest and a short, dark blue jacket that Henry said was de rigueur, whatever that meant, for boys his age. On the bottom, he wore tan-colored trousers and a pair of black ankle boots. Staring into the mirror at the finished product, Jake thought he looked like a different person. Only the rascally glint in his eyes remained the same. He couldn't help wondering what grand sort of heist he could get away with in these clothes. But no, he thought, remembering Newgate. That sort of mischief was behind him. Besides, there was no need to steal any more. He owned a bloody gold mine with dwarves and a castle, or he soon would, once everything that was rightfully his had been pried out of Uncle Waldrick's clutches provided Uncle Waldrick didn't kill him first. Well, he felt quite safe here, especially with Derek Stone in the house. His only real fear at the moment was how hard Danny was going to laugh at him when she saw him dressed like this. Standing behind him before the full-length mirror, Henry flicked a piece of lint off Jake's shoulder. There, he said proudly, now you may go down to breakfast, my lord. Thank God, Jake muttered though he gave Henry a grateful smile, secretly rather pleased with his transformation. Henry folded his hands behind his back and bowed to the boys as they left Archie's dressing room and headed down the corridor. Jake's stomach growled. Archie chattered on. I don't actually have any magical powers, at least not yet. I don't think I will, though. I hope not. Being a genius is hard enough. You should see what Isabel goes through. She's an empath. Huh? She can communicate telepathically with animals. What about people? Sort of. She can't read other people's thoughts. Who'd want to? But she can sense their feelings. That's why she stays away from crowds. Too many people. All their emotions swirling around it overwhelms her. Aunt Ramona took her to London once. Big mistake, Archie confided. Poor Izzy was in agony. Nearly went mad. She's been a total recluse ever since. Thank gosh she's got her animals, for she hardly ever sees anyone else. No, you all can keep your magical powers, thank you very much. I'm happy with my brains. So, how how exactly are we related? First cousins, he replied. Your mum was the big sister of my dad. Bradford Park was their house when they were kids. This is where they grew up. It's been in our family for generations, of course. My dad owns it now. He's Baron Bradford. Your mum was Lady Elizabeth Bradford, but she became the Countess of Griffin when she married your father and moved down to the castle. So, uh, are your parents alive? Jake asked, awkwardly. Oh, sure, Archie exclaimed. Of course, they're very busy. We don't see them much. They travel a lot for the order. Are they light riders? Jake whispered. No, they just do boring stuff. They're not the adventurous type. We mostly stay here with Aunt Ramona and the twins to look after us. I expect that's what you'll do, too, now. Really? Jake glanced at him uncertainly as they walked down the wide marble steps. Well, you can't stay at Griffin Castle all by yourself. You're a kid, Jake snorted. I've been looking after myself for a long time, he informed him. Well, who cooks for you? Uh, who makes your bed? I don't have a bed, he drawled. Archie scrunched up his nose and for all his genius appeared unable to comprehend this. But Jake was bothered by something his cousin had said. Why would you think I'd be at the castle by myself? Didn't the order send Derek to protect me? Well, he can't stay forever, Archie said with a shrug. He's a guardian. They're always on the move, like the old knight's errant. He'll stay with you as long as he's allowed, until he's sent off on his next mission. Oh, said Jake, 
unsure why this news struck him like a punch in the gut. Don't worry, he can still come visit you. And besides, you've got us now. We're your family. With a cheerful grin, Archie slung an arm around his shoulder. Jake was taken off guard by his cousin's show of affection. It was altogether unrookery-like to be so trusting and so genuine. Right, he murmured. How am I related to her ladyship anyway? Archie stopped and frowned. You know, I don't think I know the answer to that. She's always been Aunt Ramona to everyone. Even my parents call her that, and their parents did too. She's very old, he confided, lowering his voice. I mean old, like two, three hundred years old. What? She's an elder of the order, a great witch. Thing is, she doesn't like using magic any more. Don't know what happened, some sort of tragedy. She had a husband ages ago, but something happened. Don't know what. Nobody ever talks about it. Family secret. You'll find we have a lot of those. Well, not me. I hate secrets. Have a dashed hard time keeping them, actually. So they try not to tell me anything because they know I'll blab. Can't help it. <laughs> if I think something, I say it. Jake looked at him curiously, taking it all in. Bradford family secrets, eh? No doubt the Evertons have them, too. Then, all of a sudden, the young inventor stopped in his tracks and gasped. Eureka! What? What's the matter? The angle of the wings! It's off! <gasps> Excuse me. He spun around and dashed back up the steps. Hey, where are you going? Idea! Must write it down before I forget! Hm, <laughs> Jake arched a brow, staring after him from the bottom of the steps. Have at it! Go on without me, I'll be back soon! He is so strange! Shrugging off his cousin's eccentricity with a chuckle, Jake went to find the dining room where the food that was his promised reward for all this morning's torments should be waiting. As he searched for it, he tried not to think too much about what Archie had said, that Derek would be leaving him soon, just like every other adult he had ever let himself count on. Oh, well. Instead, he marveled over the revelation that this was the house where his mother had grown up. He peeked into every elegant room along the way, but as he approached the door to the morning room, he heard hushed voices. But this is all very disturbing, Guardian Stone, Great Aunt Ramona was saying. The door was open a crack, so naturally Jake spied. Derek and the Baroness Witch were sitting where he had left them. Two hundred years old? Jake thought. She didn't look a day over seventy. First the fairy courier disappears, then these servitors attack Jacob in the alley, sent by Waldrick if the boy is to be believed. She shook her head uneasily. Is there a chance he made it up? Children do tell tales. I suspected that myself at first, but then in Newgate I fell under that strange spell as I told you. Whatever it was, that singing enchanted the guards and the prisoners alike. Waldrick doesn't have that kind of power, but he could have help. Derek hesitated. Lady Bradford, do you think there's any chance Waldrick could be working with our enemies? I don't see how. He has no magic. That would make him a nobody in the eyes of the Dark Druids. For that reason, I should think they'd want nothing to do with him. She shook her head. Of course, nothing is impossible. Whoever's behind this, we must take immediate steps to ensure my nephew's safety. I won't let him out of my sight, your ladyship. Also, I'll make arrangements with Captain Brackwater to station her warrior maidens in the surrounding waters. She and her water nymphs can protect the borders of Griffin Castle and Bradford Park from their stream. They are fully capable of dealing with any more of Waldrick's servitors. We also have Henry and Helena, and I can provide some additional enchantments of my own. Are you sure you don't mind, ma'am? There is a time and a place for magic, I suppose. Derek nodded. Very well. I will also begin training the boy right away to defend himself. He's going to have many enemies. I wish it were not so, but if he can get better control over his powers, he can bring them to bear the next time trouble arises. Excellent, yes. Aunt Ramona tapped her bony chin. Listening from outside the doorway, Jake was both excited about the prospect of training with the warrior and touched by their concern for him. He was not used to people caring one way or the other what happened to him. In the meanwhile, the Baroness continued, I think I know of a way we can counter any possible threat from Waldrick. I'm listening. 
The one thing Waldrick fears above all else is losing his popularity in fashionable society. If we announce that the missing heir of Griffin has been found, Waldrick won't dare make a move against the boy. If he knows the world is watching, he'll be on his best behavior. So what shall we do? I'll write to the newspapers and let them break the story about Jacob's safe return. It'll make the front page headlines, no doubt. It'll certainly cause a sensation, Derek agreed, raising his eyebrows. But are we sure Jake's ready to become famous overnight? Well, I'm afraid we haven't got much choice. It is safest for the boy this way. Once the world knows he is alive, Waldrick won't be able to touch him. I suppose you're right. Jake is going to end up famous whether he likes it or not. We might as well use that fame to help protect him. Precisely. Still, I would rather delay exposing him to interviews and such for a while. He's not ready. Oh, I agree. There is no need to rush him. We'll keep him here under the care of his family. Once he's more accustomed to his true role in life, then we will see about presenting him to the world and to Her Majesty. Should we consult Queen Victoria first before we make the announcement? I don't want Her Majesty to feel she is the last to know. Aunt Ramona waved off this concern. Leave Victoria to me. I'll send her a personal note explaining why it was necessary and what we know so far, but don't worry. She will trust my judgment. Don't forget I used to chaperone her when she was young. Very well then, ma'am. Whatever you think best. Good. Then it is decided. The old baroness took out a quill pen. I will write the notices to the newspapers at once, along with my note to the Queen. Henry can take them to town on the afternoon train. I'll have him hand-deliver them to the editors, with my personal assurance that every word is true. With any luck, the announcement should run in the papers as early as tomorrow or the day after. I do rather wish I could see the look on Waldrick's face when he reads the news. Derek snorted, as do I. Hey, you shouldn't spy on people. A familiar voice suddenly piped up from behind him. Jake nearly jumped out of his skin. He whirled around, whereupon Danny O'Dell pointed at him and began laughing uproariously. Look at you! At least he was fairly sure it was Danny O'Dell. The carrot head had undergone a transformation of her own. Jake began laughing and pointing right back at her. It was better than admitting she looked kind of pretty, in a bluish-green dress with fluffy skirts and white lace, probably a play dress that Isabel had outgrown. She wore perfectly clean white stockings with black ankle boots neatly laced. The biggest change was her hair, the red of autumn leaves. Miss Helena had made her look doll-like, arranging Danny's hair in bouncy ringlets like Isabel's, pushing back from her face with a headband tied in a bow behind her ear. Still laughing and pointing at each other, the two rookery kids moved away from the morning room to avoid being overheard. We look ridiculous, Danny laughed. Speak for yourself. I look good, Jake shot back, posing like a London dandy. Where's Teddy? He's getting a bath. Suddenly, grateful from the depths of his soul that his old carrot head was with him in this strange new aristocratic world, Jake grabbed her in a headlock. Come along, Miss Odell. Time for breakfast. He mimicked the fine accent of the baroness. Let me go, you jack and apes. You're messing up me hairdo, Danny protested, punching him in the ribs. Grinning as she struggled, Jake proceeded to walk her down the hallway toward the dining room, still in the headlock. I don't care if you're an earl, you're still horrid, she informed him, her voice muffled against his excellent new coat. If I'm an earl, then I can do whatever I want. No, you can't. Derek must have heard their bickering, for just then he poked his head out of the morning room, saw them tussling, and caused Jake to release his prisoner with a warning stare. Danny's face was red from being in the headlock, but she came up laughing and smoothed her girly dress. Then they traipsed off together to find the food. Look, Danny whispered, pointing. They discovered the dining room at the end of the hallway. Spying together, they both peered in. Jake's head just above Danny's. Longingly, they inhaled all the lovely odors as uniformed servants whisked about, laying out a magnificent English breakfast. The mahogany sideboard stretched for miles, an expanse of serving dishes piled with sausages, scrambled eggs, baked beans, and stacks of golden buttered toast and numerous flavors of jam. 
There were flaky cinnamon rolls and breakfast pastries and a colorful bowl of fresh berries, melon slices, things he had never tried in his life. Jumping Jupiter, I've died and gone to heaven, Jake breathed. Two kinds of juice, Danny exclaimed in an awed whisper. Apple and orange. I don't believe it. Do we get to eat all that? She nodded dazedly. I think so. They could barely hold themselves back, but at last the others came and they all went in to eat. A while later, Jake and Danny exchanged a private glance, sitting across the table from each other. They did not need to speak the words aloud to agree, both marveling, that if this was a dream or some wonderful enchantment, they did not want to wake up and break the spell. Somehow they forced themselves to stay on their best behavior, wanting all the while to gorge themselves like two starved beasts. Instead, they used every ounce of what little manners they had been taught, knowing the worst thing that could happen would be for them to be sent back to the rookery, back to the streets. Over breakfast, the children were given instructions to stay away from the river, the moat at Griffin Castle, and the stream, for Captain Lydia Brackwater and her fierce water nymphs would soon be on duty. Then Derek announced he'd begin Jake's training this afternoon. Just one problem, Jake replied, slumping in his chair. His plate was cleaned down to the last crumb after the third helping of scrambled eggs and Belgian waffles. Indeed, he was tempted to undo the top button of his nice new trousers, but he could easily guess how horrified Aunt Ramona would be at such behavior. What's the matter? Derek asked. I can't move, he groaned. I'm, I'm too full. The others laughed. The warrior cracked a smile. Very well, her ladyship spoke up. You children may take the day to amuse yourselves. Let Archie and Isabel off from their studies for today, she instructed the twins. We adults have plenty to do to prepare the way for Jacob's return to the land of the living. These children should get to know each other better, she declared. And so they did. And by the end of that first day, they were all fast friends. Chapter 20 the Mission of Malwort Waldrick and Finula had arrived by train earlier that day in the Earl's posh private rail car. They took lodgings at the village inn as planned, but all of Waldrick's thoughts centered on stealing one of his nephew's hairs. Then Finula could make the potion for the Obadire spell. He would use it to lure Jacob to his death and voila! Problem solved. He waited patiently for nightfall. Sunset faded in the west, and at last, a glance out his hotel window confirmed a black, moonless sky. Waldrick put Malwart in his pocket and left the inn, marching down the main street of the tiny village of Griffindale, his black coat billowing out behind him. He pulled the brim of his hat lower to shield his face from the lamplighter's friendly hail. Staring straight ahead, he did not answer the old man's greeting. First of all, he did not speak to peasants. Secondly, he wished to avoid being recognized by any of the irritating locals. If they realized who he was, they would gossip about why the Earl of Griffin should be staying at the inn instead of at his own castle. But if anyone dared ask him about it, Waldrick would simply say it was too painful to stay there after the family tragedy, and besides, the castle was in no shape for a gentleman of his quality to sleep there, among the dust and the mice and, <laughs> he snickered to himself, the frogs. Fortunately, the lamplighter left him alone, nor did he cross paths with any more of the nosy locals as he left the village behind, stalking out into the fields. Malwart peeked out of his pocket, watching to see where they were going. As Waldrick approached the small river, he noticed a glimmer of movement in the water, a starlit ripple of a wake, as if from a very large fish. He then gasped and dodged for cover behind a huge lilac bush as a river nymph glided past, her wet silver trident gleaming in the starlight. The water nymph on patrol looked this way and that. Waldrick pursed his mouth in taut anger. He would have to stay out of sight, but he supposed the spider could take it from here. The water nymph disappeared under the river's glossy surface once again, with a few stray bubbles trailing behind her. When she had gone, Waldrick took Malwart out of his pocket. You know what to do, he murmured. I'll wait for you here. Yes, yes, master. Go. 
The spider hopped off his hand. Sailing to earth, Malwart sped toward the river, swerving through the grass. He came to a great old tree and climbed straight up its trunk without slowing his pace. When he reached the fork in the road where the tree trunk split, he took the bough that stretched out over the river. It lay before him as broad and smooth as a highway. The large bough tapered upward into ever thinner branches. The leaves fluttered all around him in the night breeze. He passed a bird sleeping in its nest as he sprang from twig to twig, making his way higher and always farther out above the water. At last he tiptoed out onto a precarious twig that marked the farthest point at which the old tree overhung the water. Having chosen this as his launch point, he descended on a string of web and began to swing. Whoosh! Whoosh! Back and forth, farther and farther he sailed out above the river. The current babbled past in quiet serenity, but Malwart was nervous. As he swung, gathering speed and momentum, his many eyes peered ahead to search for a place where he could throw his line and land safely. A similar tree waited on the opposite bank. He must be careful in his timing and aim his jump well, for if he fell into the water he would surely drown. He doubted he could swim. He had never tried and did not care to learn. Whoosh! Whoosh! A puff of breeze gave him an extra lift. Leap! And then he was flying, soaring through the air, and at just the precise moment he cast out his thin rope of web. It hooked over a high twig on the other tree across the river. The stream passed below him. The next thing he knew, Malwart was pulling himself up by his sticky thread until, finally, Whew. He let out a small sigh of relief, all eight feet securely planted on solid tree. He paused to collect his thoughts for the next leg of his journey. Then he was distracted, hungrily watching a moth flutter by, but he grumbled to himself. Master, not disappoint, master. Master would give him good horseflies when his task was done. With that, Malwart repeated the tree climb in reverse. Down and down he hopped from twig to branch to bough, and then he was marching straight down the trunk with a most determined air. At last he landed on the ground and pressed on, his eight long legs pattering speedily over the cool grass. As he neared the stately mansion ahead, he reminded himself not to let any human see him, for then would surely come the dreaded broom. All humans seemed to have them. Oh, he had fled the horrid broom from human hands so many times. Only Master had been kind to him, had never tried to squash him, but was his friend and gave him juicy flyers. Not that Malwart could not catch them for himself, but it was such a thoughtful gesture, like when somebody gave you a box of chocolates. In any case, now that he was on the property, this had become a full-fledged covert operation. Malwart zigged and zagged across the lawn to avoid detection. Movement in the shadows sent him zooming into the nearest flower bed with a small shriek. He trembled as two large animals padded gracefully out of the darkness. God, dogs? Malwart wondered. But no, as they trotted past, sniffing the air, he saw that one was a sleek black panther with glowing greenish-yellow eyes. Its companion was a huge grayish-brown wolf. Then the guardian animals moved on, circling the house. When they had gone, Malwart jumped nimbly out of the flower bed and landed on the graveled garden path. He forged up the gently rolling hill on which the mansion sat. It took but a moment for him to reach it, and then he was running up the side of a smooth white wall. He climbed past the cozy orange windows of the ground floor, glimpsing the old witch Master had told him about, playing the harmonium. Malwart saw the old woman standing alone before a table arrayed with crystal goblets filled with different amounts of water. She brushed the rims of the cups with her fingertips, making them sing. Malwart could feel the tingling vibrations of the music, but he did not pause to listen to the delicate, haunting strains of the harmonium. He had a job to do. Continuing up the wall, he came to the third story, where Master said he'd find the children's bedrooms. He crept over to the nearest window. Candlelight glowed through the glass. Someone was awake. 
Ever so cautiously, he peeked up over the edge of the window frame with all of his ten eyes and looked in. A girl with golden ringlets was reading a book in bed. When he saw the yellow hair, which Master had told him to look for, Malwart wondered if this was the Jake. But no, the Jake was a boy. The girl cast an uncertain glance toward the window as if she could sense him staring at her. Malwart ducked out of sight with a gasp. Definitely not the Jake, he scolded himself. Then he skittered sideways to the next window and again peered in. A smaller girl with cinnamon hair was asleep with a little dog in her arms like a toy. The terrier lifted his head and perked up his ears, noticing him. <gasps> Trouble! Yeeks! Malwart darted out of view, his heart pounding. Dogs did not have brooms, but they thought it was great fun to chase any small thing that crawled, though they were not as bad as cats in that regard. A cat could keep after you all day. Hate cats, thought Malwart, trundling on. The next window, again, had warm light shining through the panes. Malwart approached, peeked in. That's a boy. This one was pacing back and forth before a blackboard in his pajamas, stroking his chin in thought, then rushing to jot down strange notations. But this boy was not the Jake either because of his dark hair. There had to be a Jake around here somewhere. At last he found his target. Peering over the edge of the next window, his many eyes widened to find a boy with straw-colored hair sprawled on the bed. The Jake! He was lying on his stomach, his face half buried in his pillow. Undignified snores escaped his open mouth at regular intervals. Malwart was extremely relieved to find his target fast asleep. It made his mission so much easier. Even better, the Jake's window was open a crack to let in the fresh night air. Malwart ducked under the casement and tiptoed across the sill. He glanced nervously around the room. No broom, no dog, no cat. Whew, all clear. He hopped onto the wall and immediately climbed up onto the ceiling, where he was least likely to be noticed. Feeling very clever indeed for his success so far, he lowered himself straight down from the ceiling, approaching the back of the Jake's head. All I have to do is grab one of those hairs. Hovering on his thread just above the Jake, Malwart stretched his front leg down and carefully lifted one of the yellow strands. He brought it up to his jaws and took it in his mouth so he could hold on to it properly. He then began to pull the hair, retracting his line of web to help him yank it out of the boy's head. The hair stayed planted. Malwart narrowed his multiple eyes in determination. Again and again he tried to pull the stubborn hair out, but he could not get any traction like this, hanging from the ceiling. He cursed to himself in his native spider language, but finally saw this was not going to work. He spat the hair out and landed on the boy's pillow behind the Jake's big head. <laughs> Malwart rubbed his two front feet together as he considered his approach. Get a good long hair from the front, Master had instructed. We need a good sample. One of those short clipped hairs in the back won't be enough for ugly stinkwitch to make the potion. Yes, Master, Malwart thought. He was frightened of waking the Jake and ending up with the broom, but somehow he would have to be brave. He took a deep breath, then hopped onto the Jake's shoulder. Once more, he reached out and caught a strand over his front foot and lifted it to his mouth. He began to pull. Planting his feet on the boy's shoulder, he pulled and pulled at the hair for all he was worth. Almost have it. <sighs> Suddenly, a giant hand came out of nowhere as the Jake swatted at the tickle on his shoulder, clumsy with sleep. Malwart jumped, keeping hold of the hair, and hurrah! The thing yanked free. The Jake muttered, ow, in his sleep, and moved his hand vaguely toward his forehead, where the hair had been extracted. Thankfully, he did not get up to investigate, but brushed his blond forelock back from his brow and buried his face in his pillow once more. Malwart was already running for his life with the single blond hair trailing out behind him. Down the outside wall of the mansion he fled, clutching the hair in his jaws, back across the lawn to the tree that stood by the river. 
Again he performed the gymnastics needed to launch himself back to the other side of the stream, racing back to the lilac bush where Master was still hiding. All his jeopardy and dread were worth it to hear his beloved master say, Oh, Malwart, you are a prince among spiders. Well done, my noble arachnid. Master patted him on the back and then lifted him safely back into his pocket, where Malwart flopped onto his belly, worn out, all eight knees weak with relief. Chapter 21 How to Be an Earl Jake had much to learn, and his training over the next few days covered more than simply how to use his powers. There were also constant corrections on his speech and grammar, and lessons in how to be civil, how to bow properly, eat, dress, walk, and what to say to new people he might meet. There were lessons in family history, a long line of noble ancestors whose portraits hung in Griffin Castle and Bradford Park. There were explanations about his future duties as an earl, and, aside from anything having to do with the order of the yew tree, he could already see his responsibilities would be vast. Aunt Ramona declared he would need a good education to fulfill his role in life. On her orders, Henry spent an afternoon giving Jake little quizzes in different subjects to determine how much he had already learned at the orphanage school. When this ordeal was finished, the boy's tutor looked a bit daunted by the challenge of having one student who was a genius and one who was basically a blockhead. Archie already held two degrees from Oxford, while Jake was years behind. Obviously, he had no foreign languages, no knowledge of literature, art or music, and very little history. Oh, he could read and do simple arithmetic, of course, but school ended for most poor kids at age ten. Then it was off to get a job. What Jake had was a lot of street smarts and a familiarity with a darker side of how to survive. Aunt Ramona noted this and decided that the most important aspect of his training would have to do with his moral development. She was a hard one, the old bird. She made him give a tally of how much money's worth of goods he'd stolen from various merchants so that he could pay it back, with a face-to-face -face apology. He was not looking forward to that. Derek's part of the training was the most fun. Each day the warrior took him down to Griffin Castle and worked with him on how to control his telekinesis so he would not get so nauseous afterwards. Sometimes Archie came along and Derek made the boys run races, jump hurdles, and carry heavy objects up and down the driveway. He had them climb trees while he timed them and run along the top rail of pasture fences, telling them to get up and do it again every time one of them fell off. It was exhausting, but fun. Often, by the end of such days, both boys were so worn out that they just sat in Archie's laboratory, laughing idly at the little mechanical robot the young engineer had welded out of brass. Sprocket ran on clockwork machinery and steam power, as did most of the other mad devices that Archie had invented. Meanwhile, Danny was off having fun with Isabel. The girls had become inseparable, despite the fact that they came from different worlds. Aunt Ramona still seemed unsure if an Odell could ever be a suitable companion for her delicate niece. Jake had noticed that Danny was terrified of the stern old dragon lady— she put her head down and became meek and silent whenever Lady Bradford was around. Otherwise, she was happier and freer than Jake had ever seen her, thriving without her constant toil and the harassment of angry, drunken family members. She had written to her da to say she was all right, though for safety's sake she was not allowed to say where she was. Jake wondered if the wild Odell tribe had worried, or even noticed, when their little carrot head had failed to come home. At any rate, she was content so long as Teddy was with her. The terrier spent most of his time lying in a sun patch on the carpet near the girls, relaxing with his paws sprawled. That didn't sound half bad to Jake as his training sessions with Derek dragged on. He panted like a shaggy dog on an August afternoon, as Derek sparred with him all around the shady terrace behind Griffin Castle. You see, Jake, you can't always use your magic in every situation. Sometimes it comes down to defending yourself in a practical way. Block, boy! I could have taken your head off if this was real. 
Jake punched and jabbed at Derek's open hands and threw in a few kicks at the sides of Derek's legs for good measure. That's it. Good. Better, he encouraged him, though he smacked him lightly on the head to show him that he still wasn't blocking the hits fast enough. Don't quit yet. Derek liked to goad him to keep him in the game. Practice that left hook some more, and soon you'll be as good at that as Danny O'Dell. Jake snorted and took a swing at him. Derek laughed and blocked it easily. Before long, Jake could barely lift his arms any more, but the Guardian kept coming. The massive warrior did not seem to realize that even when he was only practicing, he was still a bit scary. As fatigue overtook him, Jake suddenly saw something green and slimy from the corner of his eye and tripped, avoiding it. Oh, enough, he gasped out as he fell onto the cool gray flagstones and stayed there exhausted. He glanced over to see what he had tripped on, then scowled. Blast it, these stupid frogs, why do they keep coming back? He and Archie had already caught all the frogs and carried them down to the river's edge twice. Derek wiped the sweat off his brow with a pass of his arm. Maybe they like you? It's not me. It's the house. They seem to think they belong here. Jake sat up, his chest still heaving. I don't have the energy to gather them all up again. Ah, leave them for now. We've got to go wash up for lunch anyway. He reached a hand down to him. Jake clasped it, and Derek pulled him up. When he jumped to his feet, Derek tousled his sweaty hair. Good work today, lad. Uh, thanks. I'm starving. What a surprise. Wonder what's for lunch, Jake mused aloud as they left the castle grounds and headed back to Bradford Park. Couldn't tell you. Just try to remember all your lessons on table manners for Miss Helena. Ooh la la, Miss Helena. Derek looked askance at him as they walked through the fields. Hey, so you think she's pretty, do you? No, but you do. Jake shot back as he plucked a piece of tall grass and put it in his teeth. You should tell her you like her. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, come on, man. It's obvious. You should find out if she likes you, too. D do you want me to ask her for you? Don't you dare, Derek scowled, but his cheeks flushed. Enough of your mischief, you rascal, he growled. You should take her out to a play or something. I do not need advice on women from a twelve-year-old, he said. Jake laughed. Oh, yes, you do. You're hopeless. Oh, really? Derek grasped him in a headlock, much as Jake had done to Danny earlier, and walked him onward through the field. You were saying? Go on, keep it up. See what you get. Jake, still laughing, tried to trip him, to no avail. A little while later, they were all sitting around the dining table over lunch. Archie babbled about his progress on the glider contraption, Isabel reported that she and Danny had found some baby rabbits in the garden. Derek got caught three times gazing at Miss Helena. The governess merely lifted an eyebrow at him, but her twin brother seemed to find it amusing. Henry talked about helping Archie prepare for some scientific conference in Norway coming up in June, where the boy genius would be presenting a paper on aerodynamics. Aunt Ramona took it all in with her usual stern serenity. And how did Jacob fare in his training today, Guardian Stone? Derek smiled, setting down his lemonade. Not half bad, ma'am. His progress is impressive. He can make that knight's suit of armor walk across the Great Hall using his telekinesis without getting a headache afterwards. Excellent, Jacob. Jake bowed his head with shocking politeness. Today we did a bit of sparring, Derek added. Aye, and I would have beat him too if I hadn't tripped over one of those stupid frogs. "'Good heavens! You didn't hurt the poor thing, did you?' Aunt Ramona asked at once. "'No,' Jake answered, puzzled by her startled reaction. "'Maybe we need a, a cat to scare them away.' "'Gracious, no! You don't know what you're saying!' Aunt Ramona put her spoon down with a clatter. "'Well, we've got to get rid of them somehow,' Jake replied. "'It's my castle. I don't want it full of frogs.' "'Jacob,' her ladyship said, "'those are no ordinary frogs.' He frowned. What do you mean? The others exchanged puzzled glances while her ladyship heaved a vexed sigh and looked away, as if she did not want to tell them. Those frogs, she finally admitted, were once your family servants. Chapter 22 The Frog Problem What? They're people? Jake cried. 
I'm afraid so, Aunt Ramona said. We found them like that shortly after your parents died. No wonder I could never read them, Isabel said. I've tried to talk to them, but it's always been garbled and confusing. It's a good thing Teddy didn't eat one, Danny mumbled. Who would do such a thing to those poor souls? Archie demanded, all lordly indignation. Someone who wanted to shut them up? Jake suggested. Criminy, Danny muttered, but she nodded in agreement. Silence the witnesses. Everyone looked at her in surprise, but when you came from the rookery, you knew about such things. Aunt Ramona shook her head. You children may be right. That could be one possible motive of whoever did this to them, but since I haven't found a way to change them back, we may never know. You can think of another reason, my lady? Henry asked. Revenge, she answered. Lord and Lady Griffin were loved by most of magic kind. They helped countless magical beings, some of whom can be quite vengeful, like the wanted nymphs, for example. It was thought perhaps some witch or wizard friend of the couple took matters into their own hands and punished the servants in this manner for not going to their aid that day. The servants cowered inside the house, and so inside the house they must remain. A curse, Henry murmured. She nodded. I've tried to break it and turn them back. The grand old lady witch faltered, to Jake's surprise. She shook her head, lowering her eyes. But all my efforts could not restore those poor souls to their proper form. They've been like that for eleven years. Archie harumphed. You magical types are a menace. There must be something we can do to help them. Derek said in concern. I have tried every transformation spell I could find in our libraries. Nothing's worked. Some very powerful ingredient has been used on those poor people. There's no telling what it might be. Maybe Jake should try, Archie suggested. The frogs are tied to the castle, and he's its rightful master, not Uncle Waldrick. They served his family, so maybe one of those spells would work for him, even if they failed for you, Aunt Ramona. The boy genius bit off the end of a carrot. Seems logical to me. Well, I'm happy to try, Jake said, but I've never done a magical spell in my life. While his great-great-aunt considered it, his thoughts churned. If the frogs could be turned back into people, they might be able to provide a few clues about what they had seen that day. Even though the courts considered the murders of the last lord and Lady Griffin an open-and-shut case, as Derek had said, he still couldn't bring himself to believe that Sir George Hobbs was the only one to blame. Uncle Waldrick had to be involved somehow, he knew it. Her ladyship was studying him intently. If you are willing, Jacob, I suppose there is no harm in letting you try. He pushed his chair back from the table and stood. Right, then let's have at it. They all hurried down to Griffin Castle, where Isabel used her particular gifts to summon all the frogs together into the great hall. Soon the vast space resounded with the throaty chorus of their croaking. Meanwhile, Danny took Jake aside. "'Are you sure you want to do this?' she whispered. "'No harm in trying. You don't know that, actually,' she retorted. "'Aunt Ramona said so. What if she's wrong? You don't know what you're doing.' What if it only works halfway and they end up, you know, half frog and half human? Wouldn't that be worse? Jake stared at her, the blood draining from his face. Hadn't thought of that. She gave him an I told you so look. Jake suddenly felt queasy about the task he had agreed to. Good grief. What if he ended up turning these people into half frog monsters? Even being a frog, a whole one, had to be better than that. His palms began to sweat. Jacob, are you ready to begin? Aunt Ramona called. He looked at Danny, his heart pounding, but he couldn't back out now. She frowned. Good luck. He nodded to her, dry-mouthed. Then he took a deep breath and went to hear his aunt's instructions. This was the most responsibility he had ever undertaken. It was a dreadful feeling. His stomach churned. He listened to every word the old woman said about how to hold the wand, how to clear his mind and concentrate, and how to enunciate each strange phrase of the handwritten spell in her thick, mysterious book. When she had filled his ears with her advice, she stepped back to let him try his best. The moment was at hand. Jake cast Derek a rather desperate glance. The guardian nodded back at him in reassurance. Isabel laid a comforting hand on his shoulder. 
You can do it, Jacob. They want you to at least try to help them. That's why they've been coming around you. They know who you are by your smell. They trust you. I could understand that much from them just now. Right, he swallowed hard. Stand back, children, Miss Helena ordered, pulling the other three back. Isabel and Danny clung to each other with Teddy between them, while Archie held his notepad, waiting to scribble down his observations. Just read it as it's written, Aunt Ramona instructed. Repeat the words as many times as needed for the change to be complete. Yes, ma'am, he nodded and raised the wand in his right hand, while holding the book of spells in his left. Then he began, slowly and carefully. No more in mud to hop and crawl, misdeeds removed, forgiven all. No more the form of frogs to ape, return each one to his true shape. Sanitis. A wind ruffled his hair, gusted through the great hall, though none of the windows were open. Keep going, Jacob, it's working, his great-great-aunt exclaimed. Jake spoke the rhyme again, flicking the wand with the final word of the spell, as she had showed him. The wind blew harder, increasing in strength, each time he said the words. It rippled through the ragged white pennant of his ancestor's ancient battle flag hanging high in the room, a red griffin on a field of white. Jake repeated the spell as a distant echo of a horrid screeching filled the room. The sound was all too familiar, though it was quieter than he had heard it before. It was the same nails-on-blackboard shrieking that he had heard that night in Newgate when the adults, the dead, and the living alike had gone into a trance. "'Cover your ears!' Derek yelled to the others, over the noise. They did, except for Teddy, who began barking madly. Jake yelled the words of the spell louder again to be heard over the angry noise. "'Sanitis!' This time, when he flicked the wand, a bolt of bluish-white lightning burst out of the tip and went crackling into the room, zapping the nearest group of frogs. Jake gasped. A cloud of smoke exploded where the frogs had sat. He looked at Aunt Ramona in a panic, afraid he had just incinerated them. "'Keep going!' she shouted. "'That's supposed to happen. Probably!' she added with a faint look of worry. "'Probably!' he yelled back over the gale. You can't quit now, she cried, the wind making a mess of her neat gray bun. Believe me, she warned. Remembering Danny's warning of horrible half-frog, half-human results, he saw he had no choice but to forge on. He would not turn them into grotesque monsters. He kept on saying the words, and slender lines of lightning kept flying out of the wand, finding each poor frog in the room. Poof! Poof! Another one. Poof! Each frog in turn was obscured inside a thick cloud of yellowish smoke until the whole hall was filled with fog. Jake could not see his hand in front of his face. Suddenly, the wind and shrieking stopped cold. In the silence, he didn't hear any more croaking. Oh no, he thought, his heart pounding, his whole body shaking. I've killed them. Derek felt his way along the wall until he found the door. He flung it open, and the smoke began to clear. The others slowly uncovered their ears. Danny calmed Teddy down. Derek strode toward him through the thick fog. Are you all right, Jake? I think so. Did it work? They all stared toward the dissipating smoke. As the drifting clouds parted, human shapes became visible. All of a sudden, Archie's burst of laughter filled the great hall. Good heavens, her ladyship uttered. Children, cover your eyes. Derek automatically raised both hands to cover the boy's eyes. For the servants were indeed whole people again, scattered around on the floor where they had been sitting around moments ago as frogs. They looked groggy and confused, and they were all stark naked. Henry, Helena, quickly. Yes, ma'am. Jake laughed heartily, letting go of his tension after that ordeal, while the adults rushed into motion, trying to cover up all the ex-frog people with the dust cloths on the furniture. Run and play, children, Aunt Ramona ordered anxiously. Off you go, we'll take it from here. Out, out. Well done, Jacob. Um, run along now. Chapter 23 A Visit to Gryffindale 
Hey, gross! Naked people! All too happy to escape, the four children ran outside laughing their heads off, except for Isabel, who was too much of a lady to poke fun at somebody else's misfortune. That man had hair all over his back. Disgusting! Then why were you looking at it? Jake cried, still laughing as he flung himself down onto the soft grass. I couldn't help it. He was right there. Blah! Danny gagged. Fortunately, they regained their composure at last, after that disturbing image. With all four reclining on the grass in the shade of the old trees, they wondered how best to spend such a beautiful spring day. I know. Let's go down to the village and visit the candy store, Archie suggested. Candy? Jake sat up straight at that word. Archie pulled some coins out of his pocket. My treat. Well, I do deserve a reward for those heroics, if I dare say so myself, Jake declared. Come on! Archie jumped to his feet. The Confectioner's Emporium is the best candy shop in the whole county. I've tried them all. Wait, you two, Isabel spoke up. They turned to her in question. Aunt Ramona said we are not supposed to go outside the bounds of where the water nymphs are on patrol. Oh, come on! She's right, Jake, Danny agreed. We can't leave their protection, not when there are people out there trying to kill you. Oh, pshaw, worry, Walt. That was back in London. They don't even know where I am. Besides, I'm tired of all the rules. You don't know the half of what I've been through these past few days while you and Teddy were having your holiday. I need a break. It's too dangerous. Then don't come if you're a scaredy cat. Let's go, Arch. We'll keep all the candy for ourselves. As the boys marched down the drive, the girls exchanged a worried but irritated frown. I'm sorry, Isabel. I have to go after Jake, Danny said. Somebody's got to keep him out of trouble. Isabel gazed thoughtfully at her. You're awfully brave, Danny. I also like candy, she admitted with a grin. Well, I'm not going to be the only one left behind. The girls hurried after the boys, catching up to them at the edge of the footbridge over the stream. Jake was scanning the water to make sure none of the water nymphs were close by. Keep your dog quiet. Danny picked up Teddy so he would not bark and alert Lydia's warrior maidens that they were sneaking off. Then all four children crept across the bridge together, holding on to each other nervously as they tiptoed over its gentle arch. Jake led the way at the front, as the eldest, Isabel, brought up the rear. Hurry, Danny whispered as a ripple in the water warned of a water nymph approaching. The green-haired beauty suddenly broke above the surface with an angry splash. Where are you children going? she demanded, her trident in her hand. They screamed and ran. Pounding off the other end of the bridge, they raced a good distance down the country road until they were all winded and had to stop for air. Jake, of course, started laughing the second they were out of danger. First he bent to catch his breath, then he straightened up, throwing up his hands. Free! We showed her! Archie cried, red-faced with running and with the rare taste of rebellion. Come on, you lot! Jake ordered. To the candy store! Archie hollered in agreement. Whooping like wild savages, the boys tore off down the road. They were like a pair of fireworks someone had just set off, shooting about all over the place, swinging from trees, walking on top of fence rails, throwing rocks into the sky for no particular reason. Secretly, Danny wanted to join them, but even more than that, she wanted with all her heart to be ever so nice and respectable like Isabel. So she held herself back in the same way she kept Teddy on his leash, strolling by the older girl at a more civilized pace. By the time they reached the quiet country village ahead, she was wondering if being a demure lady like Isabel was really for her after all. She longed to explore the village, but Isabel seemed determined to stick to the single task they had come for and get back to Bradford Park before her aunt grew angry. Danny supposed she did not want to see Lady Bradford angry ever. She put the Baroness out of her mind, enjoying her surroundings. Griffindale was the picture of a quaint English village, its shops facing the cobbled lane with a row of bow windows. Its white church steeple gleamed against the blue sky, and its little train depot sat under a fine clock tower. The boys slowed their pace because Archie had to say hello to everyone, as if he were the mayor. His friendly greetings to all the villagers allowed the girls to catch up. Hello, Mr. Magnus, he called when they passed the blacksmith's forge. Why, hello there, Master Archie. 
The brawny blacksmith in his leather apron came out to greet them, his metal tongs in one hand, hammer in the other. "'Mr. Magnus, this is my cousin Jake. Magnus helps me weld some of my larger designs,' Archie explained. Jake tried out one of his new bows as he greeted the smiling giant. "'Pleased to meet you, sir.' "'Likewise, young master.' Just then, they all caught a whiff of the sweet smells blowing down the country lane. Their eyes lit up. "'Cheerio, Magnus! We're off to the candy shop!' Archie exclaimed. Magnus grinned under his moustache. "'Now don't you children go and get yourselves a bellyache!' But they barely heard, already dashing off around the corner, following their noses. Fanula heard the ruckus of noisy brats in the street. She looked out the window of the inn and saw the four children. Waldrick! A moment later, she and her cohort were both rushing to the blacksmith's forge, for as it happened, the sea witch had decided to make a practice batch of the Obadire potion last night, using the village blacksmith as a test subject. After all, if the potion was strong enough to work on a big brawny man like Magnus, it would surely be strong enough to control one vexing magical boy. Having chosen Magnus for her experiment, Fenula had snatched one of his hairs while flirting with him in the village pub. Now it was time to put her experiment to the test. Hurry, Waldrick, there's more than one way to skin a cat, she hissed, pressing the earl behind her as she peered around the corner from the blacksmith's forge. Fortunately, the four little dreadfuls had gone stampeding off to the candy store. She handed Waldrick the Obadire potion she had made the night before. Then they hurried on. Just outside the blacksmith's forge, Finula pulled Waldrick aside. Remember, eye contact is best when you speak the chant, but at the very least, you have to be looking at him when you drink it. Here's the incantation. I wrote it down in case you forget. She handed him a small slip of paper. Forget? Do you think I'm stupid? She just looked at him. What command will you give him? She whispered. Waldrick smiled coldly. Do you really need to ask? She cackled, sounding very witchy in spite of her disguise as a beauty, thanks to her continued use of the magical red feathers. Then they walked into the blacksmith's shop to carry out their experiment. Finula batted her lashes as she called to him. Oh, Mr. Magnus! Chapter 24 Sweet Goes Sour the confectioner's emporium was a wonder to behold. The irresistible sweet smells of chocolate, vanilla, roasting nuts, and sugar being transformed into a hundred different treats enveloped them as they approached the shop's double doors with frosted glass and shiny brass handles. When they pulled the doors open and stepped inside, Jake thought he must have died and gone to heaven. It was the loveliest place in the world. Under the shop's fancy glass cupola, frothy wrought-iron shelves were painted pale turquoise. The walls were pastel pink, blue, green, and yellow, all allowing the brighter rainbow hues of the candy to dazzle their eyes. Jake and Danny stood enraptured, staring all around them with their mouths hanging open. Rows upon rows of candy of every variety surrounded them, displayed with gorgeous toys also for sale. Beautiful toy hot-air balloons hung from the ceiling, with dolls and toy animals looking out of them. A carousel was turning right in the middle of the shop to the music of a steam whistle calliope. A toy steam train ran on a track that encircled the whole store, taking its passengers on a tour of a candy world. The candy was displayed on shelves and tables, round racks and giant jars. Clumps of colorful spun sugar, airy and light an army of sparkling gumdrops like soldiers standing in formation, striped candy sticks of every combination of flavors, Turkish taffy, and countless varieties of drops, chocolate drops, butterscotch drops, licorice drops, and sugared almonds, caramel apples sprinkled with crunchy nuts, there was peanut brittle, candied popcorn balls on sticks tied up with ribbons, chocolate caramels, caramel chocolates, sugar plums, pink peppermint pigs, and marshmallow hedgehogs. Long ropes of licorice, spicy fireballs made with hot sauce, crystal beaded sugared fruits, candy dip pretzels, acres of fudge in neatly packaged boxes, and edible figurines of every imaginable sort. 
A whole corner was dedicated to a gingerbread village, not to be eaten, but strictly for display. Jake's eyes nearly misted at the beauty of it all, especially when he thought back to the children in the orphanage he'd left behind. How he wished they were here with him. They'd eat the whole store. Then he and Danny and his cousins were in motion, running like lunatics all around the place. Danny and he dashed off in all directions, peering this way and that, pointing out each new surprise. Archie strutted like the man of the hour for having thought of it, explaining all the candies to Danny, who wasn't listening. A clerk in a candy-striped shirt and neat white apron left off shining the brass rim of his counter and came over to them. "'What would you children like today, eh?' Danny's grin was giddy and Jake felt dizzy, as if his head was spinning like the paddle fans above. His cousins watched them in amusement. They seemed to get more enjoyment from the newcomer's awe than they did from the confectioner's emporium itself, for they had been there many times. The clerk was very patient while Danny agonized over her choices, until Archie brushed off her protests and bought the lot for her with something called allowance money. Jake had never heard of it. "'Isabel, what's wrong?' Danny asked abruptly. "'You look pale.' She moved closer, dropping her voice to a whisper. "'Is being in town near more people starting to affect you?' "'I don't know. Uh, something's wrong.' She looked a bit green about the gills, like Jake used to after calling on his powers. "'I... I don't feel so well.' "'Here, let me help you sit down,' Danny said. "'I sense anger. Somebody with... Hatred. Isabel shook her head, faltering slightly. Danny caught her by the elbow and helped to steady her. Jake stepped closer in concern. Who? I don't know, Jake. I think you have to get out of here right now. Something ugly, coming closer. No, she whispered. It's here. Ah, Magnus! Still pleased with his own largesse and not too worried about his sister, Archie had stuck a candy pipe in his mouth like an old professor and hooked his thumb in his vest pocket. Put the notion of candy in your head, did we? I highly recommend the strawberry gum drops. Magnus threw Archie out of his way. The boy genius went crashing into a tower of candy and landed in a shower of gum drops. What the? Jake stepped forward in fury. Hey, what did you do that for? he shouted at the towering man. I thought you were his friend. Then Jake stared at the scythe the giant blacksmith was holding, like the grim reaper. Magnus growled and attacked him. The girls screamed. The fight exploded while the calliope music played on. Magnus swung the scythe at him, but Jake whipped himself back a step. What do you think you're doing? he cried. The blacksmith's answer was another chop. Jake leaped over the blade. Magnus, have you lost your mind? Leave that boy alone, the clerk shouted, then ran out yelling for the constable. Jake had never been one to wait around for the proper authorities. When the blacksmith swung the scythe like he meant to take his head off, Jake dove to escape the blade and knocked over a pyramid of candied popcorn tins. They clattered as they fell. He tripped on one and landed on the floor. He looked up and saw Magnus raising the blade over his head. This time, the deranged blacksmith intended to cut him in half. All the training with Derek flooded his mind. Magic-wise, he was still a bit worn out from changing the frogs back into humans, but he flung up his hand, throwing his energy full out at the weapon. The scythe flew straight up out of Magnus's grasp and bit deep into the ceiling. Ha! Jake said. Magnus glanced up in confusion at his weapon, now many feet out of reach overhead stuck by its blade in the plaster. Jake jumped to his feet, but Magnus looked at him again and glowered, then advanced, quite happy to kill him with his bare hands, it seemed. Leave him alone, Danny yelled, throwing a jar of taffy at the blacksmith's head. The big man ignored her, wholly focused on Jake. Get my cousins out of here and go, he ordered her. I can't leave you alone. I'll be fine, go. With another sweeping motion of his hand, Jake magically hurled all the scattered popcorn tins at once at the blacksmith, even as he continued walking backwards. Danny frowned, but must have realized Jake had a point. The sheltered young aristocrats were practically helpless compared to the rookery kids. She ran off to pull Archie out from under the pile of candy, then went and helped the whimpering Isabel limp out of the store. The older girl kept clutching her head. 
Meanwhile, Jake brought one of the hot air balloon toys crashing down on Magnus's skull. The blacksmith ripped the colorful fabric away from his face, kicked the smiley stuffed animals aside, and charged him like a steam train. Jake's eyes widened. The next thing he knew, the blacksmith had grabbed him by the throat and proceeded to squeeze, lifting him off his feet. Jake swung out at Magnus with a punch, but his arms weren't long enough. What do you want with me? Kill, Magnus ground out. Why, he demanded, running out of air. What did I ever do to you? Kill, blazes. Jake summoned the nearest object to fly into his grasp, a mechanical monkey with cymbals and a hat. He clobbered the blacksmith with it. Magnus dropped him. Jake ducked the giant arm that grabbed for him and ran out of the shop. Magnus kept chasing him. Blimey! He had no idea what he had done to annoy this homicidal stranger. He seemed to have quite a talent for making enemies. Either Magnus was one of his horrid uncle's henchmen, or there was more bad magic involved, like the sort that had turned the castle servants into frogs. There was no time to ponder the dire possibilities. While Danny got Archie and Isabel to safety outside the candy shop, Jake ran in the other direction, the blacksmith pounding after him. Fortunately, his long experience in fleeing the bobbies came in handy. He dodged around a corner, knowing he had only seconds to come up with something. Jake peeked around the brick wall he was hiding behind and spotted the shoemaker's sign hanging over the shop on the corner. Perfect. He stepped out from behind the corner and waved his arms. Hey, ugly! Magnus turned, saw him, and charged. Jake held his ground as the murderous blacksmith raced toward him. At just the precise moment, he brought up both hands and sent forth a burst of magic, ripping the heavy wooden sign right out of the wall. It crashed down on top of the blacksmith, knocking him out cold. The constable came running, wildly blowing his whistle, but Jake was long gone by the time he arrived to arrest the unconscious blacksmith. Force of habit made it unthinkable for Jake even to consider waiting around to answer questions from the policeman. He raced around the block, rejoining the others. He didn't stop to chat. Let's get out of here! Thankfully, his cousins were recovered enough to run and followed. With Teddy at their heels, the children fled, barreling out of the village and all the way back to Bradford Park. The water nymph jeered at them as they pounded across the bridge to the safe side of the water. Got into trouble, didn't you? Told you so. As soon as they reached safety, the water nymph gave a high-pitched whistle sound like a dolphin, signaling to her sisters to come and get into formation in case the kids were followed. Breathing hard, Jake glanced around to see if everyone was all right. Isabel was leaning against a tree, pale and panting. Archie was rubbing his noggin, a bruise already rising on his forehead. Teddy whined, watching Danny pace back and forth. What just happened? she shouted. I can't believe that man tried to kill you. Who was he? Magnus the blacksmith, Jake said dully, for the carrot head already knew that. She was merely going into hysterics now that it was safe to do so. She got like this occasionally, so he knew from experience it would pass. Better just to let her vent and blow off steam. She'd be fine within the hour. Of course, it would have been nice if someone had asked him how he was, considering he'd nearly been turned into a Jake fricassee. I knew we shouldn't have gone there, Danny ranted. Me and Isabel told you it was a bad idea. Why don't you ever listen? Derek said to stay inside the property. For once, Jake had no sarcastic comeback. She was right. You know what's going to happen now, she cried, stricken. We're going to be sent back. No, we're not. No, maybe you're not, but I am. All you ever think about is yourself. It's not fair. Why can't you ever obey? Why do you always have to go around causing trouble? Calm down, he barked. The Irish fury filled her face. Don't you ever tell me that, Jake Reed, Everton, whatever your name is, Mr. Fancy Lord. I can say whatever I want. Don't you tell me what to do. Her fists clenched. Danny, Isabel said softly, but was ignored, for the carrot head was staring at Jake. Her eyes suddenly welled up with tears. Why did you make us go? Why do I ever listen to you? One time in my life I get to be happy and you go and ruin it for me. They're going to send me back. Danny, Jake tried. I hate you. She burst into tears and ran into the house. Jake was more bewildered by her sudden change of mood than he was by the blacksmith's attack. 
Females. What is it with you lot? Girls, he scoffed, turning to Isabel. Shut up, Jake, she said weakly. Archie, he demanded, looking for an ally. Um, said his gentlemanly cousin, staying out of it. I can't imagine what got into Magnus. Obviously, he was enchanted, Jake started, but his words were cut off by a deep, furious roar that rolled across the green and nearly shook the earth. Jacob Everton! His heart skipped a beat. The blood drained from his face as he turned toward the house with a knot in the pit of his stomach. Derek stood in the front door, his massive frame bristling. Jake could practically feel the Guardian's wrath engulfing him from an acre away. Get in here, now! Well, this was a first. He braced himself. He couldn't believe it. She told on me. Meanwhile, back in the village, Finula marched ahead of Waldrick, her high heels clattering furiously over the cobblestones. Change of plans. What do you mean? Waldrick asked, hurrying to catch up to her. We are not murdering that boy. Of course we are. What are you talking about? Why do I ever listen to you? You are such a fool, Waldrick. I beg your pardon? You did not tell me the full extent of his talents. I've never seen him in action before. Do you know how rare that kind of power is? And you want to just go and kill him? Blockhead! She smacked him in the forehead. Well, I never. Waldrick eyed her suspiciously as he opened the door to the inn for her. She flounced queen-like into the lobby ahead of him while he paused, glancing up and down the street to make sure no one had noticed them. The two of them, of course, had seen the whole show. "'What's got into you I don't understand,' he said after crossing the lobby and joining her on the way up the staircase. "'Of course you don't, nincompoop. He's much more valuable alive, as I said from the beginning. I should never have listened to you. But how can we keep him alive with his powers? We'll control him with the Obadire spell, and then just think of all the magnificent things he will help us do. Why, I could use him to get revenge on the House of Oceanus and all those who dared to banish me from my beloved seas,' she said with a nasty glint in her eyes. Waldrick propped his fist on his hip and lifted his nose in the air. Yes. Well, I'm the Earl, I'm the man here, and I still want the little vermin dead. Finula laughed in his face. Oh, you're the man, are you? Well, get in my way and I'll turn you into a sea cucumber. You will do as you are told. How dare you, he uttered. After all I've done for you, oh, sit down and shut up. She hurled a bolt of blue light at him from her petrified starfish wand, and Waldrick suddenly flew backwards, landing in his armchair. Tentacles slithered up instantly from underneath the chair and wrapped around his wrists, waist, and ankles, holding him in place. When he opened his mouth to protest in the strongest possible terms, he was startled to find that his voice was gone. He coughed and stuck out his tongue, straining for any sound, but could not manage a single vowel or consonant. The sea witch smiled sweetly. You just sit there and be a good little earl. How blissful to be rid of your jabber. Now maybe a person can think around here, she added in a scornful mutter. She kicked off her fluffy high-heeled shoes. I've got work to do. Waldra could do nothing but sit and scowl at her back, wondering how on earth he was ever going to get rid of her. He'd been stuck with the hag for twelve long years. He passed his time plotting murder, hers this time, while Finula sat down at the table, picked up the Jake hair, and began pouring this and that odd ingredient into her mixing bowl. After a few moments, though he was still sulking, he began to see her point. Maybe his nephew would be more useful alive. So long as the boy stayed hidden, and he still got to be the Earl of Griffin, enjoying all the privileges he'd gotten used to, what did he care if the brat lived or died? Waldrick took a moment to contemplate it, since he couldn't do much of anything else, chained to his chair by his fair lady. The more he thought about it, the more he liked the idea. Yes, what a miserable existence his nephew would have, spending the rest of his life in a cage. The thought brought a smile to Waldrick's face. Chapter 25 Jake Gets Consequences 
Danny ducked out of sight when Jake came tromping in through the front door. Derek was waiting for him, a tall silhouette looming in the entrance hall, his bulky arms folded over his chest. The Guardian didn't even speak. He just pointed to the parlor. Spying around the corner, Danny saw that Jake wasn't moving with his usual swagger, but slinked past the warrior into the room. Derek pulled the door shut behind him. She winced slightly and wished she was holding Teddy when the yelling started. But Jake deserved it. She wasn't sorry for telling on him. Not one bit. Jake endured Derek's wrath, though it was rather like sitting through a loud, blustery whirlwind. You deliberately disobeyed me. You could have been killed, Jake, and you endangered the others in the process. What were you thinking? He ranted on. You're not the boss of me, Jake thought, but since it was Derek Stone, he forced out a begrudging, Yes, sir. How am I supposed to protect you if you won't cooperate with the simplest instructions? The order only just found you, and off you go, nearly getting yourself killed. But I wasn't killed, he ventured. I used my powers, like you taught me. I thought you would be proud. Proud? You only thought about yourself. You put the others in danger. They can't defend themselves as you can. What if something had happened to them? Remember how you felt after Danny got hurt in the fight outside of Newgate? This could have been so much worse. Finally, however, the Guardian huffed and moved on. I'll be going down to the village shortly to question this Magnus, but I want to hear it from you first. What exactly happened? Did you do anything to provoke him? No. He looked like you did at Newgate when you were enchanted. That's what I was afraid of. Folding his arms across his chest, Derek nodded after a moment. Very well, then. Empty your pockets. Leave the candy on the table. You're not having it. You'll spend the rest of the day in your room thinking about all this. You're going to lock me up? Jake exclaimed. Derek looked at him serenely. You brought this on yourself. Fine. Confinement of any kind went against his free-roaming nature, but he supposed it could have been worse. Grumping under his breath, he did as he was told, depositing his candy on the table. Derek nodded toward the door. Straight up to your room, no tricks, go. Jake cast a scowling glance over his shoulder at him, but was prepared to be compliant. Then he slouched out into the foyer and saw Danny cowering slightly on the stairs. He gave her a dirty look. Traitor, he muttered. She rose and took a solemn step toward him. I'm sorry, Jake, but it was for your own good. I told you we shouldn't have gone. You should have listened to me. You should have listened to me, he mimicked her. You tattletale, baby. I'm sick of you following me everywhere. Why don't you go home and leave me alone for once? Just go away. Danny gasped as if someone had slapped her. Then she burst into tears and bolted up the stairs. Unfortunately for Jake, Derek had heard every word. That does it! The Guardian came stomping toward him. How dare you talk to her like that? Lash out at someone smaller and weaker than you? Badly done, Jacob. Danny O'Dell has risked her life for you. Derek was so angry he was sputtering. Forget going to your room. You're not getting off that easily. Come on, you're coming with me. When Derek reached for his shoulder to steer him toward some new punishment, Jake raised his arm to flick away the warrior's hand. Don't touch me, I can walk myself, he started to mutter, but to Jake's horrified surprise, his telekinesis went off accidentally with his gesture. A nearby oil lamp flew off the table, hurling toward Derek's head. Jake's eyes widened. Derek caught the lamp in midair. Then he turned at him in shock. You think you can take me on, you thankless brat? It was an accident, Jake cried, paling. I didn't mean to do it, I swear. Derek scowled at him, but must have seen the dread on Jake's face and believed him. He set the lamp down, but the warrior was clearly not amused. You obviously need more training in how to control yourself, but don't worry, the punishment I've got in store for you should be just the thing to help you with that. Grasping him by the scruff of the neck, Derek headed him down the main hallway off the first floor. Walk! Ow! Where are we going? Jake struggled like a fish on a line, but Derek was relentless, marching him out the back door to the vegetable garden. You're worse than Constable Flanagan, 
Say whatever you want. You can't hurt my feelings. Of course, I suppose you prefer to pick on little girls. Why am I the only one in trouble? We all went, Jake protested as Derek escorted him down the center path of the kitchen garden in this undignified fashion. Because you are the ringleader. I didn't force anyone to follow me. Danny wanted to go to the candy shop as much as I did. Here's your candy shop, Jakey, old boy. Derek stopped before a giant pile of stinky, rotting compost. What? The mound loomed taller than Jake, steaming in the sun. Flies buzzed around it. The smell was horrible, rather like manure. Disgusting! What is that? Grimacing, Jake tried to bury his nose in his sleeve. This, my lord, Derek said sarcastically, is your punishment. Jake gagged. Derek picked up a pitchfork and thrust the wooden handle into Jake's hands. You will spend the rest of the day at a task affectionately known as turning the compost heap. Move this pile from here to there, Derek pointed, one pitchfork at a time to let it air out. Still holding his nose, Jake looked at him in disbelief. You must be joking. Not at all, he drawled. It was good enough for me when I disobeyed my father as a lad. The task should give you plenty of time to think about your attitude. I'm not going to do this. Yes, you are. Oh, I'm an earl. You're a stubborn little mule, and you brought this on yourself, lashing out at Danny like that. Badly done, Jacob. Very badly done indeed. He shook his head. Confused. You're more upset about what I said to Danny than us going to the village. I, Derek said. Jake blinked. Why? he demanded. Think about that while you work, and when you figure it out, come and tell me. Now, get going, and don't come back until the task is done and you're ready to apologize. Derek pivoted and marched back into the house, leaving him alone. Jake stared after him in bewildered resentment. When the door banged shut, Jake let out a loud huff, the pitchfork dangling from his hands. He turned back to face the compost heap and gave it another gagging grimace. Disgusting! It's not fair. But after another moment's sulk, he thrust the pitchfork into the pile. A city boy didn't know the first thing about country labors, but he was not about to let Derek think he couldn't do it. Fine, he thought with a cocky shrug. What do I care? I'll show him. But I am still not apologizing. He never said he was perfect, and if they didn't like it, they could all go hang. For the life of him, he could not figure out how he had ended up as the villain, when he was the one who had been attacked by a homicidal blacksmith. He snorted and stabbed the compost heap with the pitchfork, venting his frustrations. The hideous mound wasn't going to move itself, and the movement was too complex to accomplish by using his powers. His only choice was to muscle through it, stench and all. Muttering words like stupid and ridiculous, he picked up another pitchfork full of the smelly rot and, scowling, carried it over to the other pile. Earl or not, it was going to be a very long, unpleasant afternoon. Chapter 26 The Oba Di Re Spell Danny was still crying into her pillow when Isabel came in to check on her. With a tender smile, the older girl went into the room and sat down on the edge of the bed. Oh, Danny, Jake really hurt your feelings, didn't he? He, he hates me now, she said with a teary sniffle. I, I didn't mean for Derek to yell at him. You did the right thing, for all the good it did me. Isabel was silent for a moment, watching her. You're scared about going back to London, aren't you? Danny lifted her head and glanced at her in surprise. The older girl waited patiently for her to speak. Sometimes I think Teddy is the only one who cares about me, she finally admitted in a choked whisper. I know I only bother Jake, but I don't have anyone else, not really. Not since Ma died. Isabel's sky-blue eyes filled with tears. She pulled Danny into a hug like a caring big sister, then kissed her on the head. Come along, on your feet now. I know something that will cheer you up. When Isabel released her, Danny quickly dried her eyes. 
Isabel went to the door of Danny's chamber, beckoning to her. Follow me. Best to leave Teddy here. Where are we going? Out into the woods. Whatever for? she asked curiously. Isabel gave her a mysterious smile. It's a secret. Curiosity overcame her sorrow. Danny climbed off the bed and followed Isabel out of her chamber. They went down the upstairs hallway, then Isabel glided down the stairs ahead of her. They slipped out a side door into the sunshine. Danny had a bit of a headache from crying, and her eyes burned. This way, Isabel hurried through the formal gardens. You have to promise that you'll never tell anyone what you're about to see. Secrecy is of the utmost importance, Daniela. If the wrong people found out about them, lives could be at stake. I am their keeper, after all. It's my job to take care of them. Take care of who? I promise, she hastily added, crossing her heart with a wide-eyed nod. You'll see, Isabel hurried on. In the distance, toward the back of the house, the girls spotted Jake laboring over the compost heap. They exchanged a look, then hurried on through a row of trees at the far end of the formal gardens. Isabel led her through a meadow, over an old fallen log, and finally into the woods, tall and dark, shady green with whispering wind. Come on! Isabel pushed aside a soft-needled yew-tree bough, revealing a deer path. This way! Our family's property spans several thousand acres, but they shouldn't be far off at this time of day. They? Who? Danny pleaded, unable to take the suspense. Who, who are we going to see? Isabel giggled. Patience. Danny cast about for any small clue. Does Archie know them? Yes, but they don't like boys very much. They don't trust them, and sometimes... Isabel shook her head with a sigh. Who can blame them? Who? Please. Oh, I'm going to pop if you don't tell me, Danny begged her. Shh, listen. They're coming. The girls held perfectly still. I don't hear anything, Danny whispered. Exactly, Isabel scanned the woods. When they arrive, all the other animals must be still and pay their respects, especially to Bellarex. Bellarex? Danny echoed in a whisper. Why? He's their king. An animal king? The king of all the animals, Isabel whispered. Not a lion? Danny asked, gripping her friend's arm in alarm. Goodness, no, don't worry. You and I have nothing to fear from them. Danny believed her, but stayed close to Isabel just to be sure. Heart pounding, she glanced all around at the forest, trying to search past the leafy shadows. The woods had gone so still. No birds called. No frogs croaked, no squirrels chattered. A reverent hush had fallen over all the forest. Then Isabel smiled jubilantly. Here they come! Danny held her breath. The ground began to pound with a drumming of hoofs. Meanwhile, Jake was still venting his frustrations on the compost heap. He stabbed the pitchfork into the great pile of slops and kitchen garbage for the hundredth time, his arms and shoulders burning from his toil. How his carefree rookery friends would have howled with hilarity to see him like this. He tried not to think about it. Bloody insulting. He was never going to get this horrid smell out of his nose. Offended and rather nauseous, he carried the next scoop of compost over to the second smaller pile, turning it over as he dropped it. Again and again he repeated the motion interminably, until blisters started forming on his hands. Taking a pause in his foul, sweaty work, Jake brushed the perspiration off his brow with a pass of his forearm. Then suddenly, from the corner of his eye, he noticed the figure of a man in a long coat and black hat standing on the other side of the nearby stream, watching him. Jake squinted. No, it can't be. He wouldn't dare come this close with Derek here. Uncle Waldrick? The man lifted some sort of small glass vial in his hand, mumbled a few words Jake could not make out from this distance, then drank from the little glass as though he had just made a fancy dinner toast in Jake's honor. What the deuce? He stared uneasily at the man. This is not good. Derek had gone down to Gryffindale. Better go tell Aunt Ramona. But as he backed away, a strange feeling began tingling in his veins. His arms and legs suddenly started feeling heavy. 
a pleasant fog began to cloud his mind. Uh Uh-oh. He tried to shake it off, but the sluggish feeling rapidly grew stronger. If I turn into a frog, I'm going to scream. He felt so glazed and drowsy all of a sudden that he couldn't even hold the pitchfork up. He dropped it and just stood there, staring into space. Wake up, man! Shake it off! You know what this is! It's bad magic! He yelled at himself in his mind, to no avail. An unnatural sluggishness was taking over. Then he was startled when he heard a voice inside his head. Come, Jacob, it ordered, deep in the recesses of his mind. Join me. Slowly, he turned to face the distant dark figure. Cross the river, quickly, come. The dim protest of his usually strong will was fading with each heartbeat. He was glazing over, surrendering to the authority of that unknown command. Use your seashell to keep the water nymphs at bay. Cross the river to me. Hurry, before the old witch comes. Jake began walking away from the house like a person in a dream, leaving the garden, marching slowly toward the stream. That's right, very good. Come along now, the voice in his head urged him. I don't want to, he thought, but it was no use. He stepped right into the cool, babbling stream, leaving Bradford Park and the compost heap behind. His pulse pounded in his ears. Stop! What are you doing? he mentally yelled at himself. But the only thing that mattered was doing as the deep voice commanded. The water nymphs spotted him crossing the stream and charged at him like sharks streaking through the water. Stop, Jacob! Where are you going? Stay back! He held up the seashell strung around his neck. I must go and you are not to stop me. We're trying to protect you, the water nymphs wailed. Send them away. Stand aside, he ordered. Jacob, come back, Lydia yelled. He held up the shell. I command you, leave this place. You are dismissed. You are not wanted here any more. But the guardian said, you don't answer to him, you answer to me. I'm the one who bears the summons shell. Now be gone, all of you. You served your duty here. Jake could hear his own voice, but the words coming out of his mouth barely sounded like him. Those were not the sort of words he'd ever use. That was because his uncle was feeding him his lines, slipping them straight into his mind somehow. They were Uncle Waldrick's words, coming out of his mouth. The water nymphs exchanged looks of angry confusion, but they had no choice but to obey whoever carried the shell. Angrily, they retreated to let Jake pass. "'What is he doing?' they whispered. Not even Jake could have answered that question. He was simply following the orders in his head. He was aware of everything, but had suddenly become no more than a puppet." He climbed up onto the opposite bank of the stream and walked, dripping, through the tall grass, going to stand before his uncle. Waldrick smiled at him, his cold gray eyes gleaming with victory. Hello, nephew, how nice to see you again. Jake longed to call the water nymphs back to help him, but his voice was no longer his own. He felt powerless. It was as if his legs and arms had those shackles around them once more, like when he had been arrested. He rallied all his strength, but could find only a drop of his usual rebellion. "'What do you want with me?' he dully intoned. His uncle's smile widened. "'You'll see. Come along, boy. This way my carriage is waiting,' his sinister uncle said with a suave gesture. "'No!' A distant portion of Jake's mind screamed, but whatever his uncle had done to him, the spell was deepening. His body lurched into motion, obeying the command. The fog rolling over his mind was getting thicker. His personality was receding, going numb. The boy who had always hated being told what to do now simply obeyed. He stepped up into Uncle Waldrick's carriage and found a beautiful lady with long black hair already waiting inside it. She studied him keenly. "'Hello, Jacob. What a talented boy you are. You and I are going to be very great friends.' He sat down across from her. "'To the train depot!' Waldrick called to his driver as he took his seat. Then he pulled the carriage door shut. The coach sprang into motion. 
With the spell growing stronger, Jake didn't even bother to ask where his kidnappers were taking him. It was easier just to sit quietly and do as he was told. Chapter 27 A Secret in the Forest Meanwhile, Danny glanced at Isabel as the dull thunder of hoofbeats on the soft forest floor grew louder. Large shapes began moving behind the leafy screen of the underbrush. Then Danny held her breath as a silvery sword emerged slowly from behind the boughs. No, it was not a sword, she saw, though she could scarcely believe her eyes. It was a horn, as bright as diamonds, and then the graceful head of the unicorn appeared, its ivory forelock cascading down the center of its snow-white face. It wickered softly to Isabel, its tapered ears flicking forward as the rest of the animal stepped gracefully into view, its pearly sides parting the greenery. Longer, feathery hairs, the same cream color as its mane, adorned its lower legs. Danny could not believe her eyes as more of the otherworldly animals came silently into view. This is King Bellorex, and over there is his chief wife, Queen Clairdwyn. Their herd originated in the mountains of Snowdonia in Wales, but they scattered centuries ago when King Edward and his knights tried to hunt them. My ancestors gave them refuge in our woodlands long ago to keep them safe. There are those who would still attempt to hunt them today, Isabel added grimly. That's why they're a secret. The only humans they trust are young girls. Danny could not even find her voice to answer, nor could she tear her gaze off the otherworldly animals. Only the unicorn stallion was pure white. The mares had white bodies with manes and tails, dappled haunches and flowing fetlocks, faintly tinged with soft blues and lavenders, shades of silver and grey-green. These wintry tones must have helped them to blend into the shadows of their original snowy habitat in the Welsh mountains. Their horns glistened like February icicles. Because it was spring, there were babies. The mares nudged half a dozen little foals along, their horns mere buds on their foreheads. The babies frisked about over the mossy ground, their short tails wagging. Danny turned, speechless, as the unicorn stallion Bellorex walked over to Isabel. He was as tall as a draft horse, but far more elegant of line. He had a noble bearing and soulful, brown-black eyes as he lowered his head to accept the offering of sweet grass that she held out to him. Isabel murmured something, and his ears twitched. Then she turned to Danny. He's ready to meet you now. She gulped as the unicorn stepped over toward her. What do I do? Just stand there. He'll smell you to see if you are trustworthy. Danny stood motionless, afraid of being skewered if the unicorn king should find her unworthy. He arched his regal neck and lowered his muzzle to her cheek, where he sniffed her for a moment. Danny held perfectly still, staring at the glistening horn that angled over her head, delighting in the velvety caress of the horse's nose snuffling at her cheek. Then Bellorex pawed the ground with his forehoof. Isabel smiled. He likes you. You may pet him now if you wish. I can. Probably just for a moment. He doesn't stay still for very long. Danny reached up her hand tentatively and touched the massive animal's neck. Though he was flecked with mud from running through the woods and even had a couple of burrs in his wild mane, his hide was like satin under her palm. She stroked the unicorn in utter amazement. But the magic of this noblest of animals ran deep. His presence cast an enchantment quite the opposite of the dark and violent spell that had caused the blacksmith to attack. The quiet, shining presence of a unicorn had the power to soothe the hurt and melt the anger in a person's heart. Indeed, Danny thought, if Bellorex had stepped out into a raging battlefield, both armies would have surely put down their weapons and decided to make peace on the spot. The noble creature's nearness flooded her heart with so many emotions. She could not explain why tears rose in her eyes. She leaned her head against the unicorn's shoulder with a fleeting thought of Ma. Not since her mother had died had she felt so loved. Pure, gentle love seemed to flow out of all the unicorns. 
Perhaps that was what made them so powerful. As she leaned her head against the unicorn's shoulder, she remembered Jake's mean words. She remembered, too, that he had never had a family or a home. No one had ever taught him how to love. Perhaps it was just the unicorn's soothing presence influencing her, but she was suddenly inspired to forgive the blockhead, even if he didn't apologize. Knowing Jake, he probably was sorry, but was just too full of stubborn pride to admit it. Standing so near the unicorn, Danny saw no reason to hold on to petty grudges. Just let it go, the unicorn seemed to say as he turned and gave her another snuffling kiss on the top of her head, as if she were one of his foals. Then Bellarex moved on, returning to his herd. Danny stepped back out of his way, and Isabel came over to stand beside her. The girls were silent, watching in awe as the unicorns faded back into the forest. At length, they looked at each other in wonder. Isabel smiled. What do you think? They're the most wonderful secret in all the world, Danny said earnestly. Oh, thank you, Isabel, from the bottom of my heart. You're welcome, Danny. Come on. Isabel took her by the hand and affectionately tugged her away from the spot. We should be getting back now. Do we have to? I want to stay here. Maybe they'll come back? Tomorrow. Come on. It's almost time for dinner, and Great Aunt Ramona does not approve of tardiness. All right. Danny felt like she was floating on air as the girls returned to the mansion. When they arrived, Isabel went to her room to wash up for supper, but with the unicorn's influence of kindness still strong in her heart, Danny decided to go and bring Jake something to drink as a peace offering. She went to the kitchens and asked for a glass of lemonade. One of the kitchen maids obliged her. But when Danny brought the cup outside, she stopped at the bottom of the garden. Uh-oh. Jake was nowhere to be seen. Shirking his punishment, she thought. I hope Derek doesn't find out. But she knew only one thing for certain. There was no way she was telling on him this time. If he wanted to skip out on his consequences, that was Jake's own business. She was keeping her mouth shut. This was between him and Derek. Then Jake would see she was not a traitor or a tattletale. She went over and set the glass of lemonade on the old tree stump nearby, where he could easily find it when he came back from wherever he'd gone. He was probably just taking a break somewhere, and no doubt she would see him at supper. Determined to stay out of it and prove she'd learned her lesson, she went back into the house to wash up for the evening meal. But Jake did not appear at the supper table, and neither did Archie. The young inventor had also been sent to his room. Both boys were being punished for breaking the rules and instigating their visit to Gryffindale today. In truth, the dining room seemed rather lifeless without their boisterous company. The mood at the table was somber, and everyone was quiet. Lady Bradford sat at the head of the table, sipping her soup from her spoon, all formidable dignity. Derek sat to her right, Miss Helena on her left. Next, Danny and Isabel sat across from each other. The girls exchanged a secretive look of amusement when they both noticed Derek and Helena gazing at each other. Lady Bradford put down her spoon. Shall we expect your brother on the morning train, Helena? I believe so, my lady. Henry wanted to wait until the morning editions of the newspapers were available so he could bring some copies back for us. The story about Master Jacob's safe return should run tomorrow. Very good. A guardian stone, she turned to Derek. What did you manage to learn in the village? Were you permitted to interview this deranged blacksmith? Yes, ma'am. The constable is keeping Magnus under lock and key, but I'm afraid it didn't go well. He was very disoriented after that blow to the head. I will have to go back tomorrow. What are they saying about all this down in the village? Miss Helena asked in concern. Derek looked at her ruefully. Ah, oh, the rumors are already flying, but most people seem to think that he merely went insane. They've sent for a mad doctor from the lunatic asylum to examine him. We can't let poor Mr. Magnus be locked up in an asylum, Isabel spoke up. He was under a spell. It's not his fault. Don't worry, dearest. We won't let that happen, Lady Bradford assured her with a doting look. It really was remarkable, thought Danny, how different the stern old lady was toward Isabel than she was toward anyone else. 
If Isabel were a bad sort of girl, she could have gotten away with murder, or at least had been very spoiled. But then she would not have been worthy to serve as the keeper of the unicorns, Danny mused, just as Derek spoke up again. Were you ladies able to interview the rest of the, er, servants down at Griffin Castle? he asked the Baroness and Miss Helena. Danny glanced over curiously, eager to hear what the former frog people might have had to say. Did they even remember how to talk? It took a while, but they finally stopped saying Ribit and started speaking English, Miss Helena answered her with a fond smile. Did they tell you how on earth they wound up in that condition? Derek asked. Helena glanced around as though uncertain how much she should say. Lady Bradford gave her a nod, signaling her permission to share what they had learned. Actually, the butler shared a rather disturbing piece of information. Most of their time as frogs was a blur. Probably a blessing, her ladyship remarked. The last thing the butler said he remembered before he turned into a frog was a beautiful lady with black hair and bright blue eyes. She came and knocked on the door a few days after Sir George Hobbs had gone to the gallows. She told some sort of story about her carriage breaking down on the road nearby, so he let her in. Then she began to sing. Sing? Derek exclaimed. Helena nodded. The butler described a strange song like nothing he had ever heard. He said the whole staff gathered round and everything came to a halt. And the next thing he knew, he was an amphibian. Isabel winced, but Danny looked at Derek. She had been there herself the night of the singing at Newgate Prison, although to her and Jake it had sounded like a maelstrom of thunder and fingernails on a blackboard. It had sounded evil. This isn't good, Derek responded at last. No, Helena met his gaze meaningfully with a nod toward the girls that seemed to say, Don't upset the children. Fortunately, all of those poor people seem to be getting back to their old selves. I'm sure they'll stop hopping about in a few days. Danny pressed her lips together to stifle a giggle. It didn't seem wise to laugh in front of Lady Bradford, but Miss Helena sent her a twinkling glance. Where are all our frog people now? Isabel asked. They're down at Griffin Castle, my dear, her governess answered. They're comfortable there. Besides, once they came back to their senses, most of them were appalled at the condition of the rooms they were once responsible for. Eleven years' worth of dust and cobwebs. They decided to get back to work right where they left off on the day they were changed. My, how industrious, Derek said in amusement. I dare say they are eager for any return to normality after what they've been through, her ladyship said. Cousin Jake did very well with that spell today, Isabel spoke up on the punished boy's behalf. I suppose, Lady Bradford admitted, and Miss Helena agreed, but Derek lowered his head. Danny studied him with a sideways glance. She thought she detected a trace of regret on the warrior's face. He cleared his throat. He pushed back from the table. Her ladyship nodded. Helena smiled at him. Derek sketched a polite bow and retreated from the dining room. Uh-oh. Wide-eyed, Danny watched him go, hoping Jake had returned to the compost heap by now, or he was going to be in even worse trouble than before. Chapter 28 Where's Jake? So, what did you girls do today? Miss Helena asked after Derek had gone. They began chatting, but it wasn't long before they heard the Guardian's voice booming from outside. Jacob! Jake! Danny drew in her breath. Lady Bradford raised an eyebrow and cast her a curious glance. Conversation at the table stopped. The others turned toward the muffled sound of the Guardian's bellow coming from the garden. Jake! Derek was sounding increasingly angry. Blast it, Jake! Where are you? Come back here now! Miss O'Dell, the dragon lady inquired, arching an eyebrow. Her tone of voice was mild, but her stare was piercing. Is there something you wish to share with us? Danny feared her guilty foreknowledge about the blockhead shirking his duty was written all over her face. Hmm? Her ladyship prodded. Um, she faltered. How could she tell on Jake again? Before she could speak, Derek came stomping back to the threshold of the dining room. Gone, Helena exclaimed. Derek nodded. We've got to find him. I'd wager he's off on the ground somewhere having a good long sulk. 
Miss Helena pushed back from the table at once. I'll help you look for him. Lady Bradford rested her head in her hands briefly with a vexed sigh. Maybe he's with Archie, Isabel chimed in. The old baroness looked at her as though she wished all her grandchildren were well-behaved young ladies. You're probably right, dear. Let's hope they haven't both sneaked off again to cause more mischief, she said in disapproval. Go check to see if your brother's in his room. Isabel shook her head. Don't worry, Aunt Ramona. Archie was so terrified after what happened in the village, I doubt he's daft enough to wander off again. Danny, why are you looking so nervous? Derek asked, eyeing her in suspicion. Do you know something about this? With everyone staring at her, Danny gave up on her vow not to tell on Jake again. I went to bring him some lemonade about an hour ago, she admitted. He wasn't there. Derek nodded. I saw the glass. It was still full. You should have told us, child, Lady Bradford chided fretfully. I can understand why she'd hesitate, my lady, Derek spoke up in her defense. Jake nearly bit her head off this afternoon for informing us about their trip to the village. Please don't be too angry at him. Danny pleaded. Jake's not used to being punished or told what to do. Well, we'd better find him. It'll be dark soon, and with all that's happened, I want him back inside before the sun goes down. The others nodded. Then everyone split up to find the again missing heir of Griffin. Derek went to see if Jake had gone to the castle. When the girls checked to see if he was with Archie, they found the young inventor in his room, as ordered, working on some experiment. He shook his head when they asked if he'd seen Jake. Danny was looking out the window in Archie's room when suddenly a large black animal went streaking across the lawn below. She gasped. It's a, it's a, a, what's got into you? Archie asked. I just, I saw a, a panther. Oh, that's just Helena, probably trying to track Jake down by scent. What? Danny cried, her mouth hanging open. The Bradford children laughed. Didn't anyone tell you? The twins aren't just half French. They're full-blooded shapeshifters. Shapeshifters, she echoed, staring out the window in the direction the sleek black panther had gone. Henry can turn into a wolf, Archie boasted. That's why our parents hired them, Isabel said. It's true. Besides being a highly qualified governess and tutor, the two make frightfully good bodyguards in case we need protection against, you know, dark druids or what not, Archie said. Anyone who'd ever try to harm my sister and me would get ripped to shreds. Isn't that right, Is? Am I the only person around here without any magical powers? Danny cried when she finally found her voice. I don't, Archie answered cheerfully, pushing his goggles up higher onto his nose. Come on, Isabel said to Archie. Help us look for Jake. They and all the former frog servants spread out over the grounds of Bradford Park and Griffin Castle, calling for the missing heir. A fiery pink sunset was already setting the western sky ablaze as they all came back empty-handed. He's not here, Derek shook his head, his demeanor grim. Helena had turned herself back into a person and rejoined them, smoothing her skirts. I followed his tracks to the edge of the stream, but I lost his scent on the other side of the water. Did the water nymphs report anything useful? Actually, now that you mention it, I didn't see them. Helena answered with a frown. Derek turned to the others. Did anyone else speak to the water nymphs? They shook their heads. Isabel ran to the edge of the stream, using her telepathy to search for them. There's no sign of them. The water nymphs are gone. Derek cursed under his breath. He must have used the conch shell to order them away, Lady Bradford said. But why? This is my fault. Derek clipped out in a taut voice. I was too hard on him. I didn't think he'd run away. <sighs> Don't worry, I'll get him back here safely. But Guardian Stone, we saw him earlier. He was doing as you said, Isabel protested. Maybe he got fed up with it, Archie said. He's run away before, Danny spoke up cautiously. He ran away from the orphanage and his apprentice masters. If you ask me, he's probably gone back to London. It's daft of him, I know, but he's always hated being told what to do. He prefers to be free. Lady Bradford shook her head. I'll fetch my crystal. She picked up the hem of her skirts and marched briskly back into the house. The others followed her into the parlor, where she took out a quartz crystal hung from a thread. She held it over a map and used some mysterious incantation to try to locate Jake. The crystal swung a few tiny degrees, 
though Lady Bradford was not visibly moving it. Danny looked on in trepidation, holding Teddy. Even though her ladyship was a good witch, dabbling in magic gave her the creepies. It seems Miss O'Dell is correct, the Baroness announced at length. Jacob's gone to London. Derek let out a growl. How can he be there already? The train, Archie exclaimed. Next one doesn't come until tomorrow morning. Then I'll ride, Derek marched off. Helena hurried after him. Guardian Stone, shall we come with you? I can have the carriage readied. No, without me or Henry here and the water nymphs gone, the others will need your protection. Your ladyship, girls. Derek nodded farewell and pivoted to go, but Danny ran after him. Wait, I'm coming with you. You stay here. No, you need my help. I know where Jake's hideaway is, she interrupted. I know all the places he goes. Do not worry, ma petite, Miss Helena soothed her. His guardian instinct will lead him to Jake. Derek glanced over sharply at her, a look of pain passing behind his eyes. No, it's failed me before, he forced out with a grim look. She's right. She'd better come along. Dress warm, he ordered Danny. We'll be on the road all night, and no dog. Her face fell. Leave Teddy behind? What if once they got to London, she wasn't invited back? She might never see her dog again. Please, Mr. Stone. No, we have to hurry. I'm not stopping every twenty miles for Teddy's little pea breaks. Hurry up if you're coming, he ordered. Then he left to saddle his horse. Still holding Teddy in her arms, Danny turned to Isabel. Would, would you watch Teddy for me? Of course. Danny gave Teddy a kiss on his head, then reluctantly placed her dog in the older girl's arms. I'll take good care of him, Isabel promised. Don't worry. Of course you'll see him again. Danny swallowed hard. I, I hope so. She gave Teddy another scratch under his ear, but a lump rose in her throat as she realized that if the worst happened and she was not allowed to come back, her dog would be better off here in the country. Don't worry, Isabel whispered. Everything's going to be fine. Danny dropped her gaze. Easy for you to say. Then she ran to fetch her cloak. Part 4 Chapter 29 the talk of the town. For the past three hours, Jake had been whizzing down the train tracks in the Earl of Griffin's fancy private boxcar. Uncle Waldrick and his lady friend, Finula, had been entertaining themselves throughout the long, boring train ride with uproarious laughter at Jake's expense. Now, jump around and act like a monkey. Hop on one foot, <laughs> while holding your nose. Cluck like a chicken. They collapsed against the velvet seats of the booth in gales of laughter while Jake tried to keep up with their constant commands. Unfortunately, he did not know enough about magic to understand what they had done to him, or, more importantly, how to free himself from his uncle's control. At last, the pair grew bored of their game. Waldrick wiped away a tear of laughter. Oh, I would say the Obadire spell has definitely worked, my dear. Indeed. How much longer before we reach London, Waldrick? Finula whined. My, uh, medicine will soon be wearing off. Don't fret, dear, he said, giving her hand a gallant pat. We shall be home shortly. He was right. Half an hour later, the train, brake screeching, chugged slowly into the grand station and halted in a mighty puff of steam. Uncle Waldrick hurried them down the few narrow stairs of the boxcar, then out into the chilly night, where he bundled them into a handsome cab and gave the driver his address. Shivering as if it were January instead of May, Jake did not understand why he felt so cold as he stared vacantly out the carriage window. Dark streets passed as the horses trotted along, taking them to an elegant garden square in a wealthy suburb of London called Richmond-upon-Thames. Waldrick told him they were going to Everton House. Driving down a tree-lined street by the river, they approached a town mansion that took up one whole side of an elegant garden square. The hired carriage drove through the tall, wrought-iron gates, then rolled to a halt under the shelter of a half-moon portico. Moths swarmed around the massive iron chandelier that lit up the welcoming space. He found himself staring at the lantern's flames, mesmerized by the tiny pinpricks of dancing light. The driver brought the horses to a halt, then came and got the carriage door for them. There you are, sir. Uncle Waldrick ignored the coachman, but turned to help Finula down. 
She winced like someone suffering a bad case of gas. Come along, Jacob, he ordered. Jake, of course, in his magical trance, had no choice but to follow. But as soon as the Earl paid the cab driver and began escorting the now limping Fenula toward the side door of the house, a shout from beyond the gates took them by surprise. Other voices joined in. Quickly! There he is! Sir! Lord Griffin! Hurry! He's back! My lord! A word with you, please! Waldrick turned, blanching to find a small stampede of newspaper men rushing toward them, reporters in tweed caps with their scribble pads at the ready. They had even brought along two fellows with large, clunky cameras to take pictures. Egads! He usually loved the attention, but this was rather a bad time. "'Gentlemen, I can't imagine why you would bother me at this hour,' he exclaimed, pushing Fenula and Jake nervously behind him and shoving them toward the side door that led from under the portico into the house. "'Begging your pardon, sir. It's just that we've been waiting all day for you to come home.' "'Why?' "'Waldrick!' Finula called frantically. "'Jake, take the lady inside,' he clipped out. "'Jove's beard! He could not have the sea hag turning into her true hideous form in front of these photographers.' At once, obediently, his spellbound nephew took Finula's elbow and steered her toward the door. "'Is that the boy there?' A man with a large camera pushed his way from the back and nearly blinded Waldrick, snapping a picture, quite without permission. "'What is the meaning of this?' Waldrick exclaimed, offended. "'I'm from the Times, sir!' "'Well, I'm from the Post,' his rival said. "'We'd love to have a comment from you, if we might, on today's amazing headlines. "'It doesn't go on sale till dawn, but we've all heard the news. "'It's sure to cause a sensation. "'Talk of the town,' the other agreed, nodding. "'So, any comment from you, sir?' "'Jake finally got Fenula inside, "'while Waldrick struggled to keep his mask of calm control in place. "'In truth, he was bewildered.' Ha, 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 forgive me, gentlemen, but you have the advantage of me. I don't know what news you are referring to. I have been out of town for the past few days. I have not seen the papers. He lifted his eyebrows politely in question. One of the men held up an advance copy of the morning paper, soon to go on sale. Here it is, my lord, hot off the presses. Waldrick's gaze homed in on the giant black letters across the front page. Long Lost Griffin Air Found Alive. He read the headline three times swiftly and felt the blood drain from his face. Their questions hammered his ears, but for Waldrick the world began to spin. Dizzying rage coursed through his veins, so strong it threatened to come pouring out of his ears in the form of steam. How could this be? The old woman, of course, Lady Bradford. Curses on that sly old witch! He'd get her for this. Somehow, Waldrick managed to mask his fury. Was that boy you had with you just now, your long-lost nephew, sir? Can we snap his picture, sir? You must be so relieved to have him back. How is his condition? When do you plan to introduce him to society? Will you be giving a welcome home ball in his honor, perhaps? What? Well, yes, of course, Waldrick stammered, cursing his reputation for hosting lavish parties. With all the excitement of finding my dear, dear nephew at last, I had forgotten. Ha! Now then, if you gentlemen will excuse me, I must go and see to my nephew. As you can imagine, poor little Jacob has been through a great ordeal, I'm sure you understand. The boy's been through so much. It's been a, a very long and trying day. We understand, my lord, said the chap from the Times. The post-writer elbowed his rival. It's not me lord any more, if you'll pardon, the man added giving Waldrick a respectful nod. The boy is the rightful Earl of Griffin now, which means we should address you as Mr. Everton from now on. Isn't that right, sir? Mr. Everton? Waldrick stared at the reporter, aghast. Why, he had half a mind to club the impertinent fellow over the head with the nearest heavy camera. But he stopped himself in the nick of time. It would not do to ruin his image now. That is correct, isn't it, sir? Another waiting journalist prompted. You'll have to give up the title now that your older brother's heir has been found. Waldrick glanced around at them, dry-mouthed. His heart was pounding. So much for putting Jacob in a cage. Now that the world had found out about him, the game had just grown a lot more difficult. This was a terrible setback, but perhaps not a total disaster if he could find some way to turn it to his advantage.
With all the newspaper parasites hanging on his every word, he knew he must answer very carefully. He must not let his fury show. He had spent years building up his reputation in society as a great philanthropist and humanitarian. Of course, it was easy to give away gold when you had an endless supply. The gift was basically meaningless, but the world admired him for it, and, he realized, they would admire him even more if he played his hand right. He could be the picture of noble gallantry, the devoted uncle and legal guardian of the poor orphaned boy. Waldrick Everton, unselfish hero. Now there was a headline. After all, the brat could always meet with an unfortunate accident later in a year or so, after the fuss died down. Fortunately, the Obadire spell gave him total control over the kid, so at least he could rest assured that Jake wouldn't cause any trouble. Yes, Waldrick thought. He wasn't amused by this turn of events, but he could make it work. Will you give us a comment, sir? Of course. He drew on all his theatrical talents to summon up a benevolent smile for the sake of the reporters. We haven't had a chance yet to work out all the details pertaining to my nephew's miraculous return. Right now we are just focused on taking care of Jacob. We are so glad to have our precious lad back in the bosom of his family where he belongs. Can we come back and interview him soon, sir? Of course you can, dear fellow, as soon as he's had some time to settle into his new home. I'm sure you understand. He's been through so much, brave child. If you'll pardon, my nephew needs me. Good night, gentlemen. Good night. God bless you, sir, one called in fervent admiration. We hope the boy will be all right. I'm sure he will. Good evening, gentlemen. Waldrick waved graciously and walked away, seething. Although he had saved the situation, this was still a sickening turn of events. He'd fix that old Bradford witch some day for this. But when he stepped inside his house, he saw Fenula was having even worse problems than he was. Egads! She was on the floor, returned to her true horrid self. Stuck on dry land, as she was fated to be, her many squiddy legs flailed wildly from under her petticoats. Her fine satin gown had torn, as well, the seams burst by her blubbery bulk. Jake was standing a few feet away, staring down at her in horror. The sea hag was trying to drag herself across the marble entrance hall. Waldrick, help me! That useless boy is just standing there. I should have put him under the Obadire spell with one of my hairs, not yours. The brat won't listen to me. Don't worry, dear, we'll have you back down in your pool directly. Water! I need salt water! Yes, yes, dear, don't fret. Waldrick was merely relieved that Jake had got her inside before the reporters saw her like this. If society knew what his opera diva mistress really looked like, he would never be able to show his face in London again. Ah, oh, well, a man had to do what a man had to do. He bellowed for his magical servitors as he hurried over and helped Finula up. They popped back to life. The butler, who spent most of his time as a candlestick, came running to assist. Jake, stay, Waldrick ordered as the two of them carried Finula away. Yes, uncle, his nephew echoed faintly. At last, Waldrick deposited Finula back into her large stone pool filled with tepid seawater. She flopped into it with a splash lolling about in relief. As much as she loved the beautifying effects of the red feather's magic, it took a toll on her to assume that lovely form. Her true, ugly shape was more comfortable. Ah! She sank into her pool and closed her eyes. Waldrick took Malwort out of his pocket, and the spider went scuttling back into his box to his home web. Waldrick sauntered over to the row of cages to check on the others. And how are the rest of you? The giant silkworm rolled away in disdain. The satyr bared his teeth at him. The cherub merely sucked his thumb with a sullen look. Lastly, Waldrick peeked in on the captured fairy. She was curled up on the floor of her box and didn't even acknowledge him. He tapped the box rudely. Still alive in there? No answer. But he saw that she was breathing by the rise and fall of her shoulders, more visible now since he had cut off her wings. Well then, he said, straightening his cravat, good night to you all. He heard a muffled roar from the stone pit well below his secret lair, but he ignored it. 
Walking back up the dark stone staircase that led to his elegant house above, Waldrick paused as a strange image flashed across his mind. It momentarily disoriented him. He saw a little red-haired girl laughing as a scrubby brown terrier danced on its hind legs, and it came with the happiest feeling, as if he could feel the emotions Jake felt around this girl. What on earth? He touched his chest, unfamiliar with the odd warmth that lingered there. I don't even know that person, let alone that dog. But wait, he suddenly remembered. He had seen that little redhead before. She was one of the children who had been tagging along with Jake back in the village of Gryffindale. Egads! He suddenly realized what this meant. This was not one of his own memories, but one of Jake's. Just like Fenula had warned him, the obad Ray spell had one drawback, that Jake and he were going to be able to see into each other's minds every now and then, recall each other's memories. Oh, dear, Waldrick thought uncomfortably. Well, it was a bit late to worry about that now. Jake was already under the obad Ray spell and had to stay that way, especially now that the public was about to hear his story. Somehow, Waldrick would have to be extra careful to block the boy from seeing particular memories he wanted to keep hidden. Not that Jake could do anything about it, he mused with a slight shiver as he returned upstairs. When he found Jake still standing in the entrance hall, exactly as he'd left him, Waldrick felt his worries relax. "'Turn a somersault, Jake,' he ordered, just to reassure himself. Jake dutifully got down and turned a somersault over the hard marble floor. Good. Then Waldrick turned to his candlestick butler. Flickers, show young Master Jacob to his room. Indeed, the finest guest room for our little long-lost Earl. Follow Flickers, Jacob. You will go to sleep, and when you wake up in the morning, I'll tell you all about the new life you will have here with me, your devoted uncle. The old Bradford which had no right to take you from me, I am your closest living kin, and if anyone ever asks, you are to say you are incredibly happy to be here, and thankful to your wonderful uncle for finding you and rescuing you, and that you want to stay here with me forever. Yes, uncle, he intoned dully. Now go. Jake went, marching slowly after the butler, and headed up the opulent staircase. Waldrick watched him go with a shrewd smile, clasping his hands behind his back. He lifted his chin, satisfied that he had the situation well in hand. Chapter 30 Say Uncle Danny was tired from riding through the night, but worry kept her awake. When they reached London at sunrise, she directed Derek to all the places Jake might have gone. Alas, the circus freaks at the abandoned pleasure grounds had not seen him. The garden folly on the island in the pond was empty too, the swan-shaped boats untouched. From there they tried Covent Garden Market, but none of the orphans dodging about had seen him either. Danny turned to Derek at a loss. I can't think where else to look. Should we try the rookery? Might as well. But they had only gone two blocks into the rough-and-tumble neighborhood when Derek stopped scanning with an intense expression on his face. Then he shook his head. I don't sense him anywhere around here. So where does that leave us? The guardian glanced at her with an ominous frown. If Jake's not at any of his favorite haunts, maybe he didn't simply run away. He may be in some sort of trouble. What do we do? Not we. You are going to stay out of this, he murmured. I think it's time I went and had a little talk with Waldrick Everton. Danny looked at him anxiously, but they got back on the horse. A short while later, Derek reined in before the stately Everton house in Richmond-upon-Thames. It sat on the river bank, but across the street from one of those fenced-in garden squares, like a private park for the wealthy residents of the square. The park gate was open, so Danny agreed to hide in there among trees and shrubs. Derek tied up his horse nearby. "'Be careful,' Danny warned. Don't worry about me, he said with a smile. Just stay out of sight. This won't take long. She nodded and watched him march across the street to where Jake's uncle lived in solitary splendor. The man, Jake swore, had tried to kill him. As Danny watched the house, she was puzzled by the busy goings-on outside the mansion. The place swarmed with activity. 
Half a dozen men had stationed themselves just outside the wrought iron gates of Waldrick's property, including one with a bulky camera on a tripod. Reporters? Well, that made sense considering Henry had brought the announcement to the newspapers on Lady Bradford's orders. The story was to run today, Danny remembered. Maybe the thought of sudden fame was part of what had made Jake run away. If he had run away. The reporters tried to talk to Derek, but he waved them off, walking through the gates when they were opened for one of the delivery wagons coming and going. Danny saw the wagon dropping off loads of flowers. The servants carried the bouquets in through the side door. Another cart brought in cases of champagne. A third arrived at the portico side door, delivering an endless stream of bakery boxes, including one towering white box that surely contained a tall fancy cake. It seemed like they were getting ready for some sort of party. Meanwhile, Derek marched up to the front door and banged on it, his rugged fist encased in his usual black, fingerless gloves. He squared his shoulders while another carriage drove under the portico. Musicians climbed out carrying their odd-shaped instrument cases. Then the front door opened. Danny had a good view into the house. The butler welcomed him in, and Derek warily stepped inside. Just before the skinny butler closed the door, Danny glimpsed a familiar figure in the entrance hall. Jake! She would know the shape of his wavy forelock anywhere, and when he flipped his hair out of his eyes with that familiar toss of his head, she just ran. She couldn't hold herself back. She was stunned to find him here of all places, but she was so relieved to see him. Dashing across the street, she didn't stop and think or heed Derek's orders. Jake was in there. She had to see him up close for herself and make sure he was all right. The reporters called to her, but she ignored them, barreling through the open gates, dodging around the wagons that were leaving after dropping off their goods. She pounded up the dainty path to the front door and didn't even knock. Without asking anyone's permission, indeed quite like Jake would do, she grasped the handle of the front door and burst into the mansion. Jake! To her dismay, no one paid her any attention, not even to protest. Uniformed servants were dashing about, cleaning every visible surface with the utmost efficiency. Others rearranged the furniture and decorated the fireplace mantel with candles and flowers. Neither Jake nor Derek were now in sight. I "'Excuse me,' she started, but the servants rushed right past her. They seemed awfully funny, and on second glance she noticed they looked remarkably alike, as if there was one set mold for the maids and one for the footmen. Remembering the role that magic had played in changing the servants at Griffin Castle, she instantly suspected some sort of mischief here. All that mattered was that they showed no interest in trying to stop her. She pressed on, checking each room she passed for Jake. Where had he gone? Then she heard Derek's voice, relieved but exasperated, echoing from a room ahead at the end of the gleaming marble hallway. How could you scare me like this? You have no right to run off like that. Do you have any idea how worried we've been? We've been looking for you everywhere. Following the sound, Danny stepped into Waldrick's morning room. Sunshine streamed in through the high, arched windows. Straight ahead, Derek's back was to her. He stood before the table by the window, where Jake sat across from the sinister gentleman that Danny instantly recognized from that day at Covent Garden Market when all this had begun. He and his nephew were both casually sitting there like old chums, sipping their cups of morning tea. Jake appeared in fine health, a plate of breakfast food before him. He was neat and clean and dressed like a miniature version of Waldrick. But something about his eyes looked weird. Mr. Stone, if you care about my nephew as much as you claim, perhaps you shouldn't have forced a young peer of the realm to shovel compost like some sort of peasant, Waldrick Everton was saying. Oh, yes, the poor lad told me all about it when he arrived here last night. Jake, we talked about your punishment, Derek said with frustration in his voice. It was for your own good. Danny approached, still unnoticed. Waldrick was shaking his head. You always were a barbarian, Stone. You nearly let some brute called Magnus murder him yesterday. Oh, yes, he told me all about that, too. But instead of showing compassion, you burden him with punishments. Shoveling compost? An unthinkable indignity for a young gentleman of his station. No wonder he decided he'd be better off with me. Danny, Jake blurted out. 
glancing over at her. The two men also turned, and Derek glowered. I told you to wait. Well, well, if it isn't Jake's little friend. Bravely, Danny advanced into the room. She kept staring at Jake. Deep in his blue eyes, she could have sworn she saw panic and a plea for help. But this did not at all match his calm, outward expression. Tell me her name, Jake. Daniela Catherine Odell, he replied in a monotone. Odell? Waldrick wrinkled his nose. This won't do at all. Waldrick, Derek warned quietly. I will not have my nephew tainted by such low associations. He knows he has to make a clean break from his unfortunate former life. Henceforth, he must reserve his friendship for children on his own level. Danny looked at Waldrick, aghast. He's my best friend. Was, my dear, so sorry. Run along now. My butler will give you a coin for your pains. Flickers, goodbye, you young bedraggled creature. Waldrick, Derek repeated, leaning closer. Jacob, tell this gutter snipe to go away. You will meet more suitable boys and girls of your class at the ball tonight. Danny, go, Jake intoned, not looking at her. She stared at him in shock, barely able to draw a breath as she realized why he was doing this. He was still angry at her for telling on him yesterday. But holding a grudge this long was unlike him. Jake, I said I was sorry. Derek turned and also tried to reason with him. Jake, however angry you may be at Danny for telling on you, or at me for doling out consequences, you must know we only did those things because we care about you. Oh, really? Waldrick interjected with a cool smile. The way you cared about his parents, Stone? Derek's face went ashen as he stared at Waldrick. If you cared so much about your dear friends Jacob and Elizabeth, you would not have arrived too late when that deranged Hobbs came to murder them. I shall never understand it. Were you at a pub, too busy with one of your vulgar female admirers to heed your guardian instincts? Waldrick looked away, idly stirring his tea. Whatever your excuses, you completely failed in your duty to save my brother and his wife, and now you want me to entrust you with their son's safety as well? I think not. You've helped this family quite enough, Derek Stone. Leave us and go crawl back under the rock where you've been hiding these eleven years. I'll be taking care of Jacob myself. Derek wore a sickened look of shock, like a man who had just been run through with a sword. He dropped his head. His voice was barely audible. I'm so sorry, Jake. He's right. It's my fault. They counted on me. I should have been there. Danny stepped up beside the warrior and took his hand. How can you say it's your fault? I'm sure it's not. Are you still here? Waldrick asked in irritation. That does it, Danny thought, with her iris rising up in her. She'd had enough insults about her lower birth. And as for Derek, well, it was time somebody stood up to defend the Guardian, she thought. She released his hand and leaned toward Waldrick, thrusting her finger right in his haughty face. I don't know what you're up to, mister, but you don't fool me. Jake told me you tried to kill him that first day you came to the market looking for him. Don't try to deny it. I saw you there myself. He rolled his eyes. I didn't go there to harm him, you silly chit. I only went to try to bring him home. The boy misunderstood my intentions. Goodness me, if I had any ill intentions toward the lad, why would we be sitting here enjoying a nice breakfast together, let alone my spending a fortune on a welcome home ball tonight to celebrate his safe return? Sorry, uh, but neither of you were invited, he added with a bland smile. Danny brushed off the hurt of this. I heard you tell your men to hunt him down. What are you talking about? This child is lying, he said to Derek. You're the one who's lying. Danny glared at Waldrick in suspicion, while Jake just sat there like a lump. How dare you speak to your betters that way, you impertinent flea? I am Jacob's legal guardian. He's staying here with me, of his own free will. Tell them, Jacob. Jake stared at Derek almost sorrowfully. I said tell him, Waldrick snapped. I am incredibly happy to be here and grateful to my uncle for rescuing me, Jake intoned in a flat voice, his blank stare fixed straight ahead. I wish to remain here forever with my wonderful uncle who cares about me. Danny gasped while Derek looked at Waldrick. What have you done to him? I beg your pardon. That's the most un-Jake-like sentence that ever came out of his mouth. 
Danny grabbed Jake's shoulder and shook him. Wake up! What's wrong with you? she demanded. Jake said nothing. Snap out of it, Jake! Can you hear me? He shrugged her off. Of course. Let go of me, he mumbled, sounding at least a little like himself. You put a spell on him, she cried. Young lady, honestly, said Waldrick, rubbing his brow, unlike Jake, I do not have any magic, as all the world knows. Now it's time for you to go. Waldrick, so help me, if you put this boy under some kind of spell. Stone, that is a foolish and unkind accusation. You know I don't have the power. His eyes are all glazed, Danny yelled. Lack of sleep, said Waldrick. Plus a few tears shed after all the trials he suffered. Poor thing. Tears? Jake doesn't cry. He's a rookery kid. I already told you, Missy. Why don't you let the boy speak for himself? Derek growled. That's just it, Waldrick said, tossing his napkin aside and rising from his chair. He doesn't wish to talk to either of you. He's through with you both, and I can't say I blame him. This conversation has grown tedious. Please leave. My nephew and I have much to do to prepare for tonight's festivities. Neither Derek nor Danny moved an inch, holding their ground. She folded her arms across her chest. We're not leaving without him. Waldrick sighed and sat down again with an air of boredom. Jacob, show your visitors to the door. I've tried to ask politely, but they insist on making a nuisance of themselves. Yes, uncle. Jake stood slowly and walked past them toward the doorway. Danny followed, her heart pounding. I don't know what he's done to you, but you belong with us. It's time for you to leave, Jake repeated his uncle's words. He lifted his hand, palm up, his fingers outstretched. Suddenly, Danny and Derek found themselves levitated off the floor, floating toward the exit. Jake! Danny cried. Put us down this instant! Jake ignored the warrior's orders, which just made Derek angrier. Let me down, you insolent pup! Derek tried to fight it, but there was nothing to shove against but thin air. Don't worry, Jake. Whatever he's done to you, we'll save you, Danny cried. But Jake's stare was as cold as Waldrick's as he walked slowly toward the entrance hall. With his hand extended, he floated them toward the front door like two hot air balloons. He opened the front door with a magical wave of his other hand, then sent them whooshing through it and dropped them in a heap out on the lawn. Goodbye, he uttered in a deadened monotone, and then slammed the door by magic. Danny and Derek picked themselves up off the ground and dusted themselves off. He's enchanted. I noticed. But how? If Waldrick has no powers, what are we going to do now? Derek shook his head, then pushed his hand through his hair. Normally, I'd go in there and grab him, but he's got that blasted telekinesis, so how can I get near him? He's totally under his uncle's control. We can't just leave him like that. At least we know where he is now. He seems safe for the moment, and with that party tonight, Waldrick can't do anything to him in front of a house full of guests. Come on, Danny girl, we've got to get to Beacon House and find a cure. Or would you rather I take you home to your family now? He offered. Crikey, no! I mean, you're sure to need my help, she informed him. Aye, Derek answered, and he very nearly smiled. You did well, Waldrick congratulated his nephew. Jake sauntered back into the morning room, lightly dusting off his hands as though he had just taken out the trash, which he had, in Waldrick's view. Now then, I want you to go up to your room and study our guest list until you have memorized all the names. You must make a good impression on society tonight. I'm a very important man, and I won't have you embarrassing me. Yes, sir. Jake bowed to him and walked out of the room. Waldrick smiled and took a sip of tea. Why, if he had known about the Obadire spell, he might even have married and had children of his own long ago. Too bad he couldn't bottle the potion and sell it to the parents of the world. A man could make a fortune. Chapter 31 A Familiar Apparition That night, Jake sat on his bed waiting for his cue to go down to the ballroom. The guests were already arriving. He could hear the music thumping through the floor. Uncle Waldrick wanted him to stay out of sight until everyone was there, 
Then Jake was to make a grand entrance, parading down the red-carpeted staircase into the ballroom, so all the fancy folk of high society could ogle him like he was some creature in the zoo. He looked presentable enough, dressed in a tuxedo, except he thought his hair looked stupid, his forelock flattened back against his head with the same sticky macassar oil Uncle Waldrick used on his hair. Well, thought Jake, giving himself a sullen stare in the mirror, he might look good, but he felt terrible, just terrible, trapped inside the Obadire spell. He was furious at how his uncle had forced him to treat Danny and Derek this morning. They were the two people he cared about most in the world, and now they probably thought he was the worst sort of turncoat varlet. At least he had a small break from Uncle Waldrick and Fenula. They were downstairs in the ballroom, greeting their arriving guests. The Obadire spell wasn't as strong when his uncle wasn't present in the room with him. Jake let out a huge sigh. How in the world am I ever going to get out of this? All of a sudden, a glimmer of light behind him in the mirror caught his eye. He jumped to his feet and whirled around. An orb! Everton! came a whisper. You! Jake stared in shock as the ghost of Sir George Hobbs materialized in front of him. Fury rose up in him. Murderer! I'll kill you! But I'm already a ghost, said the portly baronet. Jake stalked toward the apparition. How dare you appear to me again? I know now what you did. You killed my mother and father. That's why you were locked up in Newgate. No, not I, boy. The ghost disappeared and reappeared behind him. Falsely accused. Lies, all lies. You're the liar. Jake accused, whirling around to face him again. Why did you do it? Just because you were so jealous? You ruined my life! He grabbed at the ghost in an angry tackle, but his arms swept through thin air. Left hugging himself, Jake narrowed his eyes. Sir George floated up toward the ceiling where Jake could not reach him, though he kept swiping at him, jumping up onto his bed to try to get to him. Come down here and face me like a man when I get my hands on you! Follow, the ghost whispered, then he turned back into an orb and vanished through the door. Hey, I'm not done with you yet. Jake leaped off his bed, ran after the orb, threw open the door, and stepped out into the hallway. The portly apparition was gliding toward the far end. Jake tried to use his telekinesis on him, shooting a bolt of energy from his fingertips that only succeeded in knocking a picture off the wall. The ghost laughed and zoomed away. Jake chased. Sir George ducked into another room ahead, and Jake was hot on his trail. When Jake stepped into the stately bedchamber, he realized by its magnificence and by its lived-in look that it was his uncle's room. Uncle Waldrick was below, of course, greeting his guests in the receiving line with Fenula, who was acting as hostess in her human guise as a glamorous opera diva. They'd be calling for him soon, but for now... He advanced on the ghost, prowling toward him, bent on revenge, though he wasn't exactly sure how to take revenge on someone who was already dead. Whether Sir George was really the murderer or not, Jake didn't know. The world thought so. Even Derek thought so. And Jake was in a mood to take his wrath out on someone. How did you get out of Newgate? he demanded. You urged the other spirits to try to leave the prison, remember? They took your advice and discovered they could, and so could I. Backing away from him, Sir George disappeared into the wall, but kept talking to him. Remember the singing that night, Jacob? Yes, what about it? After you escaped the jail and the singing stopped, I ventured out of the prison to find out where it was coming from. Ah, and as I started finding answers, I grew less confused. Ghostly eyes suddenly appeared, superimposed on the eyes of the painting on the wall. A life-size portrait of Waldrick, looking very debonair in his fox-hunt clothes, complete with the shiny riding boots and smart red coat. He had his nose in the air, as usual, and a smug smile on his face, one fist propped on his hip, his elbow bent at a cocky angle. "'Blimey, that man's an egomaniac,' thought Jake.' 
Who kept a life-size portrait of himself right at eye level? What, so he could kiss his own image? The painted Waldrick stood between the closet and a full-length oval mirror on a stand. The rest of Sir George's face now materialized like a ghostly mask over his uncle's painted face on the canvas. Don't you want to know what I saw that night? Sir George pursued. Of course, Jake said impatiently. I floated up out of the jail and I saw her. Ha who? The siren hag, the singing witch, the ugly beauty. I followed her here to Waldrick's. Jake furrowed his brow. Fenula? Yes, she's behind it all, Jacob. Fenula Coralbroom. Do you know anything about her? Only that she's a sea monster or something in her true form, with tentacles. On the train I saw her use some sort of magical red feather to transform herself from that beast into a pretty woman. She rubs it into her hands and it turns into a poof of sparkly dust. What sort of feather? Don't know. They do their best to keep me in the dark about everything. That's why I've come, to help you, Jacob. I've seen many strange things since I've been dead. Things I'd have never believed when I was alive. Things you're going to have to see for yourself to believe. Go on, punch me, Sir George suddenly taunted. His face vanished, then instantly reappeared on the right side of the painting. He poked his head out of the portrait near Uncle Waldrick's elbow. The ghost tapped himself on the chin. Come on, boy, right here. Take a swing. You know you want to. You're right about that, Jake muttered. He clenched his fist and socked the apparition in the face. Sir George let out a playful, ow, since he surely felt nothing. But Jake gasped, for the blow he had landed had popped the right side of the painting forward. He stared. What the? Cautiously, he touched the edge of the portrait. It creaked inward. A hidden door. He opened it, inch by inch, and found a secret passageway behind it. Narrow wooden stairs headed straight down into the darkness. There, was that so hard? Sir George asked, floating over the staircase with his arms folded across his chest and a told-you-so smirk on his face. Then he turned around and started gliding down them. Come! Jake's heart pounded. Hesitating, he glanced over his shoulder. Any moment now, they'd be calling him to make his grand entrance into the ballroom. But he wouldn't likely get a chance again to find out what exactly his uncle was hiding. His mind made up, he stepped through the secret doorway and pulled the Waldrick painting shut behind him. Chapter 32 Hidden Memories Dim light shone from the bottom of the stairs. Jake trailed his hand along the cool, clammy wall, steadying himself on the steep descent. When he came to the end of the stairs, he stepped into a strange, cave-like room. He glanced around at everything while Sir George floated on ahead. "'What is this place?' he murmured. "'What does it look like?' Jake shrugged. "'I don't know. Some sort of wizard's workshop. We're underground?' "'Indeed.' The ghost flew into the rounded alcove over a large, dark pool of water on the left. Jake stared at the work table in the center of the room. It was heaped with dusty old books and scientific instruments that Archie would have loved. The distant wall was lined with wooden shelves, but he couldn't see much in that area. It was cloaked in shadow. The only light came from the single lantern hanging on a peg behind him by the doorway. Sir George floated toward him, lowering his voice. What if I told you I had made some inquiries about Madame Coral Broom on the other side? Don't ask how. More important is what I learned, he advised when Jake started to interrupt. Fenula is a sea witch, a fugitive from justice, and your uncle has been hiding her here for years, right under the Order's nose. Why? Jake asked. Why, indeed? the spirit whispered. You know by now your uncle doesn't help anyone unless he's getting something out of it in return. He hides her from justice, and she uses her magic to help him reach his goals, like stealing the title from his elder brother and from you. Do you have proof? Jake breathed. Show me. Sir George flew into Fenula's alcove, 
hovered over her stone-carved desk and made the pages of her thick book of spells flutter open. Look, what your uncle doesn't know is that there are rumors on the other side that Finula has been in contact with the dark druids. Jake's eyes widened. He glanced at the ghost, but wasted no time, climbing around the pool for a closer look. Steadying himself on the slippery stone edge around the dripping pool, he nervously eyed the razor-toothed eel swishing around in the black water. If he fell in, he was quite sure the thing would eat him, leaving nothing but his bones. Fortunately, he reached her writing desk safely. He leaned closer to read the page Sir George was showing him in the witch's grimoire. Across the top of the page was written, Dissembler's Spell for assuming the appearance of another. You see, Waldrick set me up. Sir George grew as agitated as he had been in Newgate. He began to pace, a legless half-orb, half-apparition. He was at the ball that night. He heard me make those stupid threats to your father, but I didn't mean a word of it. I was just being a jealous fool. Haven't you ever said something you didn't mean, simply out of anger? Jake thought instantly of Danny and nodded in regret. He laid his fingertips on the page to scan the list of ingredients. But the moment he touched the book, a strange thing happened. A rush of images flooded his mind. He suddenly felt like he was falling at breakneck speed, sliding feet first down some dark, weird tunnel full of twists and turns, coils and crevices, taking him into the darkest depths of Uncle Waldrick's brain. He did not realize that was where he was at first. Understanding dawned a few seconds later, as Jake found himself inside his uncle's point of view, jarringly, at some moment in the past. A moment when Waldrick and Finula had been standing here in this very chamber, conspiring together. Waldrick was looking at himself in the rusty mirror, only it wasn't his own face he saw, but the chubbier face of Sir George, well, an alive version, not the ghostly bluish one that Jake had gotten used to. This spell had better last long enough for me to get the job done, Finula. The squiddy sea hag stood behind Waldrick in the memory. It will. Just make sure you don't lose your nerve, she said in a hard tone. There's no fear of that. As long as you take care of Derek Stone, I trust you have prepared the spell to scramble his guardian instincts? Of course. We've already sent it to him in a bottle of wine from your brother and wife, with a note of congratulations on his latest successful mission. Oh, the irony, Waldrick drawled. That's not all. I have a surprise for you. Special bullets I made just for your task. Strong enough even for a pair of light riders. Here you are, dear. She emptied a handful of round silver bullets into Waldrick's hand. Why, that's very kind of you. Hobbs smiled at her and loaded the magic-dipped bullets into his pistol. I'll go through the village in my disguise to make sure some of the locals see Hobbs. The castle servants as well. That drunken idiot will be doomed. Don't forget to send the servitor to drive my carriage through High Park this afternoon, he added, so that everyone will see me far from the scene of the crime. Child's play, she replied. Then I believe we are all set. Finula nodded. I've done my part, now you do yours. She turned him around and stuck a warty finger in his face. Satisfy your revenge on your brother and his family, if it pleases you? Indeed it does. When Hobbs shot off his mouth in front of everyone in that ballroom, he gave me the perfect opportunity. I don't intend to pass it up. As you wish, but whatever happens, bring me that creature. I mean it. Do not fail me, Waldrick. Elemental magic of an immortal beast like that is extremely rare. I need its feathers to override the mermaid's curse. I must be beautiful again. If you fail me, you will pay, do you understand? No need for ugly threats, my dear, he chided. Soon we'll both have what we want. He pushed her hand away with a frown. Then Waldrick, as Hobbs, turned to his servitors arrayed by the wall. Ready the cage. The creature will come flying out to attack the moment it smells griffin blood. We'll have to work quickly. If we're not careful, that monster will tear us all limb from limb and eat what's ever left. Aye, sir, his henchman said. 
Suddenly, a low, menacing growl coming from somewhere below jolted Jake out of the memory and pulled him back into the present. He yanked his hand away from the book while the deep snarl rumbled through the chamber. What was that? he exclaimed, shaking off his daze. No one answered. He looked around. Sir George had disappeared. Jake shook himself again, still foggy-headed from the brief but appalling scene he had just witnessed inside Uncle Waldrick's memories. He was not exactly sure how this vision had occurred, but he suspected it had something to do with the link between their minds created by the Obadire spell. At least he knew for certain now that it was Waldrick who had killed his parents, and he knew how it had been done, too. But still, not why. What had made him want revenge on his elder brother? More to the point, Jake realized he had no way to prove what he had witnessed in his uncle's memories. It was his word against Waldrick's, and he'd already seen which of them the world believed when he had faced the magistrate. Everyone thought that Waldrick was some sort of saint. Well, he knew the truth, and it seemed his only option was to confront his uncle head-on. There was only one problem. The Obadire spell. If he got within a few feet of Waldrick, Jake became his slave. His voice, his own will, even his telekinesis were of no use. The Obadire spell made him virtually powerless around that rat. All Waldrick had to do was give an order and Jake was magically forced to obey it like some mindless servitor. He was really starting to understand why great Aunt Ramona had come to dislike magic. As he stood there, trying to work out his next move, he suddenly felt someone, or something, staring at him. He hoped it wasn't the thing that had growled, for it had sounded big and hungry. Then he noticed ten shiny little eyes that all blinked at once inside a box atop the work table. Jake walked over to it cautiously. Uh-oh, said a little clinkety voice. Jake recoiled. Inside the box was the largest spider he had ever seen, brown and hairy with white spots and large fangs. But the monstrous spider looked more scared of him than he was of it. It let out a small whimper and ducked down behind a clump of grass in its cage, trembling. The Jake! No broom, please! You can talk? How? Jake furrowed his brow and backed away. This place just kept getting weirder. I'd better get back upstairs before they miss me. Never mind, I don't want to know. As he turned to go, another voice suddenly called to him out of the shadows. Excuse me, young master, wait, if you please. If you wouldn't mind a little help. He whirled around, startled. Who's there? Don't be alarmed. It's just us. I I'm Stanley. I'm an accountant from Tidwell. Oh, please don't go, sir. We desperately need your help the polite, halting voice said in distress. I'm afraid you are our only hope. On his guard, ready to zap any threat with his telekinesis, Jake walked over and saw a little goat man in a cage. He stared at him. Was that you talking? Yes, sir, if you please. You're the one called Jacob, aren't you? The Earl's nephew? I'm the Earl, Jake retorted. Then he squinted at the creature. You say you're an, uh, an accountant? He's a satyr, kid, came a grumpy, sarcastic retort from the next cage. Jake glanced over and gasped at what he saw, a winged baby in a cage. He stared in amazement at the baby's stubby gold wings. They looked too small to support its chubby body. What are you staring at? the baby demanded in a very annoyed adult voice, like a grown man who smoked too many cigars. Are you just going to sit there gawking or give us a hand? Jake nearly fell over. What are you two doing in there? We're on a holiday, can't you tell? Really? Now, you idiot, the winged baby retorted. Waldrick locked us up in here to try to steal our powers. Who've you been talking to all this time, anyway? You some sort of loon bat? I, I may be, he answered, shaking his head in shock. I'm sure he's nothing of the kind, Stanley nervously assured him. Don't mind, Charlie, sir. That's just his way— he doesn't mean any harm. Uh, he's not uh, like the other cherubs. Hearts and flowers aren't quite his idiom. Charlie the cherub? Jake echoed. The sarcastic flying baby glared at him. 
Not a word, kid. I'm warning you. Charlie, don't be so rude to the young gentleman. He's our only hope of escape. If you wouldn't mind, sir, please let us out of these cages before she comes back. All we want is a chance to go home to our families. Well, of course. Jake got to work at once, unlocking their cages. My uncle did this to you? Yeah, Stanley bleated. I'm so sorry. What's that thing? He nodded toward the next cage. Giant silk glowworm, he'll want out too. Jake nodded, then hurried to pry open the dirt-filled terrarium. The enormous worm rolled out, then began wriggling across the chamber. Avoid the ballroom, Jake warned them as he freed another little fellow introduced to him as Mo, the cobbler's elf. Waldrick and Fenula have got guests. Oh, thank you, sir. Not sir, just Jake, he said. The Tidwell satyrs will write poems in your honor, vowed Stanley. I wouldn't expect much thanks from him, though. He nodded at Charlie in discreet disapproval. Oh, I'll catch up with you one day, kid. Pay you back. Don't you worry about that. Laughing, Charlie flew up from his cage with the clumsy, lurching path of a bumblebee. He flapped his wings harder, rising to grab his golden bow and arrows from a shelf above. I'll make sure you meet a real nice girl one day. Then, direct hit, boom, bullseye, and she's yours. No hurry on that, Jake fairly yelped. Last thing he needed right now was a girlfriend to add to his headaches. Charlie winked and tossed him a cheeky salute. Right, kid, some other day, then. The cherub flew ahead, scouting out the territory for the satyr, who followed, bounding up the steps. Oh, and don't forget about her, Stanley called over his shoulder. Her who? Jake asked as they hurried away. Over there, in the little box, if she's still alive. I honestly don't know, poor thing, the satyr said sadly. Then they both disappeared up the dark stairs. Jake knew he shouldn't waste time dawdling. Any minute now, Waldrick and Finula would be summoning him to the ballroom. He looked around, unsure of what final prisoner the satyr had been referring to. The spider, perhaps? Not eager to get closer, he forced himself to help it, cautiously opening the spider's cage. The talking spider hunkered down inside. Malwart, stay with master. Jake shrugged. Suit yourself. But then he noticed the small pasteboard box on the shelf by the wall. A faint golden glow emanated from it. It entranced him. He went toward it. Slowly, carefully, he took the little box down from the shelf. He noticed tiny air holes in the lid as he set it on the work table before him. He lifted one corner of the lid, unsure of what might happen if he removed it. It could be anything in there. Between talking spiders, sarcastic cherubs, satyr accountants, cobblers, elves, squiddy old sea hags and crime-solving ghosts, not to mention belligerent water nymphs and shape-shifting teachers, there was no telling what might be lurking in this box. Whatever it was, it was small. As he eased the lid upward, Jake was relieved that nothing exploded, nothing zoomed out, nothing growled or tried to bite him. Still cautious, he pulled the lid away. His eyes widened as he gazed down at a tiny person lying with her back to him, curled up in a ball. Oh no, he thought. Stanley was right. Whatever she is, I think she's dead. Hello, he asked in gentle concern. Are you all right in there? The tiny person didn't move. Chapter 33 Lost Fairy Found Jake wasn't sure what to do, but when the tiny person began to stir, relief flooded through him. She's alive! As she sat up, Jake gazed at her in wonder. Her lowered head and drooping shoulders communicated miniature despair. She wore a pale, tattered gown with little ballerina slippers and had a shiny circlet around her head like a delicate metal wreath. As small as she was, she had the saddest face he had ever seen. His heart clenched with concern for the tiny thing. Trapped inside the pasteboard box, there was nothing in there for her comfort but a thimble of water and a shred of muslin for a blanket. Hello, do you want to come out of there? he offered, gently lowering his hand into the box. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm Jake. At once, she stood up, only about five inches tall. 
She stared at him for a moment with beautiful, soulful eyes. Come on, then, he urged, and then she climbed carefully onto his palm. She began talking to him, moving her hands expressively. At first, Jake could not understand the silvery, tinkling sounds that came out of her mouth. But he listened harder as he lifted her out of the box, and he began to make out her words. I know who you are. You're the true Lord Griffin, she was saying. I'm so relieved you're safe. But you shouldn't have let the others go. Waldrick's going to know it was you who freed them. You're already in enough danger as it is. They are planning to kill you as soon as the fuss dies down, you know. I figured that. Jake lifted her higher so he could look at her more closely. Hey, Gads, you're a fairy, aren't you? He exclaimed. What happened to your wings? The fairy stared at him for a second, fighting back tears. Waldrick, cut them off. What? He breathed. The ruined fairy burst into tears, hiding her face in her hands. My uncle did this to you, he echoed with a whole new wave of outrage sweeping through him. She dropped to her knees on his palm and wept. I tried to escape so I could warn you to stay at the castle, but they caught me. I heard Waldrick say he's cursed. He can't go on to the castle grounds. <laughs> Tough rookery kid that he was, Jake's heart quite broke as he beheld the tiny thing's inconsolable distress. It felt awful to realize that Waldrick had done this to her all because of him. He felt a few molecules of water fall on his hand, her minuscule tears as fine as droplets of fog. Don't worry, I will help you, he promised shocked that even Uncle Waldra could do something so vicious and cruel to such a small, defenseless, and beautiful being. But then, unexpectedly, just when his cause seemed hopeless, something remarkable happened. As the fairy's tears fell on his skin, he felt a tingling sensation go running up his arm. A faint, golden glow began spreading up to his shoulder, and from there, all throughout his body, seeping into him. An enormous sudden cramp in his belly made him nearly double over in pain, even as the tingling sensation grew stronger. He felt pressure in his eyeballs, tickling in his brain. I don't feel so... Oh! He leaned forward, trying not to drop the fairy as pain and dizziness racked him. All of a sudden, the biggest burp of his life came traveling up from his stomach and exploded from his lips. The mighty burp ripped forth in a green, stinking bubble of a cloud and popped. Blimey, he cried, waving the green mist away. Excuse me, what the deuce was that? The poor fairy was also coughing from the stink. That evil spell they put on you. I think it just came out. How do you feel now? She asked uncertainly. Jake pressed his hand to his stomach. Better. I've heard our tears have magic in them, but nothing like that's ever happened to me before. I think it worked. Indeed, he suddenly felt like his old self again. Well, now, if he was no longer under the Obadire spell, he could begin to turn the tables on his uncle. What about you? She lowered her head and shrugged. I'll be all right, she said bravely. Jake frowned. He was glad she had stopped crying, but he knew he had to help her. Come on, let's get you out of here. Carrying her carefully in his cupped hands, Jake marched toward the dark stone stairs. What's your name? Gladwin Lightwing. I'm a royal garden fairy and a courier for the Order of the Yew Tree. How? You're the missing messenger. I heard about you, he said. The Order's been looking for you. If I carry you out to the garden, do you think you could find your way to Beacon House? Derek should be there. I'm sure he can find some way to help you. I'd take you there myself, but I'm supposed to show up in the ballroom any minute now. My lord, you must escape with me. Oh, I'm not going anywhere, he said in a hard tone as he carried her up the secret stairs. Those two killed my parents. This is a perfect opportunity to confront that rat. I'm going to make him pay for what he did to them and to you, and to everyone else he's hurt he added with a dangerous gleam in his eyes. But you're just a boy. I'm not afraid of them. Besides, my uncle can't do anything to me in front of all his guests. Jake opened the hidden door behind the Waldrick painting just a crack, peeked out, and saw the coast was clear. He stepped through it and closed it silently behind him. 
Then he strode out of his uncle's chamber and hurried down the upstairs hallway, sneaking down the servant stairs to set Gladwin free outside. You're squishing me, she warned. Sorry. In his anger at his uncle, he hadn't noticed his grip on the ferry tightening. Here, he slipped her into the breast pocket of his tuxedo coat near his scarlet boutonniere. The slit pocket was not deep, but held her snugly up to her waist. Gladwin stood facing forward, able to see where they were going as he strode through a dark, quiet section of the house away from the party. At last, he found a side door to the garden and stepped out into the moonlight. Tell Derek everything you saw, all right? And would you give him a message for me? Certainly. I'm still a messenger fairy, even without my wings. Her shoulders drooped again with a crestfallen air. Jake glanced down at her in sympathy. Tell him I'm sorry about throwing him a Danny out before. He'll know what you mean. I didn't want to do it. I had no choice because of the Obad D Ray spell. Tell him the spell is broken now, but it showed me inside Waldrick's mind and revealed that he and Fanula were the ones who killed my parents, not Sir George Hobbs. Most of all, he continued, just in case anything happens to me, make sure you tell Derek they put a spell on him too, the day my parents died. They scrambled his guardian instincts with magic somehow, so that he couldn't sense the danger to my parents and come to protect them. He's been blaming himself for years, but he needs to know it's not his fault. Will you tell him all that for me? I will, but I still think you should run away with me now and tell him yourself she chided. It would mean more to him coming from you. I'm sorry, but I can't do that. I've got to make this right. I owe it to my parents to confront those murderers, and with all the guests here, this is as safe a chance as I'm likely to get. Do be careful, Jacob. Your uncle will stop at nothing to hold on to everything he's stolen from you, and he's still got Fanula to protect him. She's extremely dangerous. I know. Don't worry, he said as he helped her out of his breast pocket. They still think I'm under the Obadire spell and ready to do whatever Waldrick commands. They've got quite a surprise in store. Jake crouched down to set her gently on the ground. When he opened his hand, she stepped off his palm onto the garden path. Thank you for freeing me. Just then, he heard the butler calling for him from inside the house. Master Jacob, they're ready for you, sir. Oh, Master Jacob, where are you? Jake glanced over his shoulder, then looked down at Gladwin once more. Off you go, then. Don't do anything foolish, Jacob, please, he snorted. You don't know me very well yet, do you? He replied with a wink. Foolish is my forte. Be careful out there, she waved. You too. He nodded to her, then rose and turned back toward the house. Opening the door to go back inside, he glanced over his shoulder to make sure Gladwin was all right he saw a faint trail of golden sparkles going down the garden path, at ground level instead of in the air where she should have been. Poor little thing. Then Fenula's sing-song voice penetrated the house. Oh, Jacob, it's time for you to join us. He looked forward, squaring his shoulders. Then he narrowed his eyes in angry determination. Time to go to the ball. Chapter 34 Jake Goes to the Ball Waldrick had the strangest feeling in his head, as if some intruder had gone poking around in his brain. He had no time to fret about it, though. Everything was going according to plan. The house looked perfect, even the flower bouquets everywhere seemed to sparkle. His army of uniformed footmen worked with inhuman precision, bringing out the endless banquet of delicacies to eat. Fenula was looking particularly radiant, thanks to the magic of an extra-large feather. She had on a scarlet gown with a bustle in the back. A white feather boa hung around her neck, her raven hair pinned up with curling tendrils hanging down her back. He could almost trick himself into forgetting about her true squiddy form. As his hostess for the evening, she stood by his side, greeting the last of their guests to arrive. Waldrick fixed his suave smile in place and shook hands with royal dukes, ambassadors, captains of industry, famous artists, top dandies, and celebrated wits famous for their sarcastic humor. Everyone who was anyone was there, including a flock of dainty young girls in pastel candy-colored ball gowns, all eager to meet Jake. 
The jeweled ladies, their mamas, were in competition already, determined to get a look at the young Earl of Griffin as a possible future husband for their high-born daughters. Any girl would like to grow up to become a countess one day. Of course, the brat would not live long enough to grow up and marry one of these ninnies, Waldrick thought smugly. Nevertheless, the moment had come to present his nephew to the world. Flickers the butler came and whispered in his ear that the boy was standing by, ready to make his entrance on cue. Jake was waiting at the top of the grand stairs, just as they had choreographed it earlier. Waldrick nodded. Then he signaled to the orchestra to stop playing, and tapped politely on his champagne glass to get the crowd's attention. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, thank you all so much for coming tonight to celebrate this most memorable occasion with our family. As you know, my brother and his beautiful wife were taken from us eleven years ago, but an even greater wound than their death was the fact that their small son was nowhere to be found. Well, as you all know by now, he continued with his most gallant smile, this precious boy has been restored to us. He pretended to fight back emotion, and Fenula patted his arm, pretending to comfort him. A hush fell over the entire ballroom. Waldrick pursed his lips, cast his gaze toward the ceiling, and took a deep breath, as though finding the strength to go on. <sighs> My friends, it gives me such joy to introduce you all to my fine young nephew, who has miraculously returned to us. I hope you will welcome him with all the warmth that he deserves. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to present Jacob Xavier Montague Charles Everton, the seventh Earl of Griffin. There was a collective gasp from the crowd as Jake stepped into view at the top of the red-carpeted marble staircase. The boy stood very straight his chin high. Everyone stared at him. Waldrick eyed him sharply, pleased with the fashionable cut of his tuxedo, but frowning at a few of his blonde hairs that were out of place. Thankfully, society did not seem to notice. Jake bent slightly at the waist, presenting himself with a small bow to the entire ballroom, just like Waldrick had taught him. Then a roar of applause broke out as the lad started walking down the stairs. Waldrick stole a furtive glance around, pleased, though he felt a twist of jealousy at all the cheers and simpering smiles the guests were now showering on his nephew. He listened to their comments. He is handsome, Mama. Hush, child. Good gracious, he looks just like his father. The poor boy. How brave he is after all he's been through. The older women shook their heads, making sympathetic noises. I say, a gentleman here and there lifted a monocle to his eye. You can see the lad's got spirit. The young girl stood on tiptoe to get a better look at him. Waldrick waited patiently for his nephew to make his way through the crowd of guests, congratulating him. He overheard a few remarks in the crowd that he found especially gratifying. How noble Waldrick is! A lesser man would have been angry to lose an earldom to a mere boy, but not Waldrick so magnanimous. He always was such a charitable soul, such a great philanthropist. The praise cheered him up considerably. Fenula overheard it too, and slipped her hand possessively into the crook of his elbow, as if to warn off any other ladies who might have admired him too much. She needn't have worried, though, if she was feeling jealous. Every woman in London knew that strange and terrible fates tended to befall any lady who tried to steal his affections away from the opera diva. At last, Jake reached Waldrick and Fenula, after being loaded up with well-wishes and compliments from the adults and other high-born lads, and smitten gazes from the girls. Waldrick nodded to him in guarded approval. So far, so good. But now came the hard part. It was the boy's turn to give his little thank-you speech and then make a toast. Waldrick had written it for him, of course, but Jake had memorized the words. It was all carefully calculated, just like the rest of Waldrick's life. Speech! Speech! He encouraged the lad with a broad smile, applauding his nephew politely. Jake stepped up onto a chair so everyone could see him. Waldrick handed him a goblet of fruit punch and gave him a warning look. You had better make me look good. Finula sent him a smug nod that told him not to worry. The Obadire spell would ensure the brat did exactly as he had been told. Ladies and gentlemen, Jake began, holding up his glass a bit. <coughs> Louder, 
Waldrick instructed under his breath, disguising the command as a cough. Ladies and gentlemen, Jake repeated, projecting his voice so all could hear. I thank you all for your kind welcome, and I look forward to getting to know each and every one of you. Before the dancing begins, I would just like to say a brief word of thanks to my dear uncle. Waldrick's eyebrows shot upward in mock surprise, since it was he who had written the script. Jake turned to him with all the guests looking on. Truly, Uncle Waldrick, I must acknowledge the tremendous impact you've had on my life, he shouted, loud enough for all of London to hear. Waldrick had gone motionless. Those were not the exact words, close but slightly different. A faint prickle of alarm ran down his spine, but the guests seemed to approve. What a thoughtful boy, the older ladies clucked, smiling in approval. You don't have to thank me, Jacob. Waldrick knew his lines, but something told him to cut Jake's speech short. It's quite all right. Now, then, to the dancing. No, indeed, Uncle, I must express my gratitude. If only these good people knew how much time and effort you put into finding me. Nothing would stop you from searching for me once you realized I was alive. Waldrick was glancing around at his guests, smiling and nodding modestly, but a bead of sweat ran down the side of his face. He glanced at Jake with daggers in his eyes. Be quiet. But who could blame you? Jake challenged him. I was a loose thread you could hardly leave untied after you went to all that trouble to murder my parents. He thundered at the top of his lungs, then threw his drink in Waldrick's face. A horrified gasp arose from the crowd. A few of the fair young ladies duly fainted. Waldrick turned white, trembling with shocked rage as fruit punch dripped down his forehead. The hint of pineapple stung his eyes. It's true, Jake cried. Just ask him. He tried to kill me, too. He sent men after me with knives. Look at his face. See the guilt? The ballroom was suddenly abuzz. Half the guest was stunned. The others were in shock, and none could believe their ears. What? What is he talking about? Did he just really say? The people asked each other. From his taller position standing on the chair, Jake glared at Waldrick, ignoring everyone else. Don't bother lying, uncle. I already know the truth. Sir George's ghost appeared to me and told me everything. I know how you stole his appearance with the dissembler's spell. You let him take the blame when it was you all along, you murderer. You killed your own brother and my mum as well. You'd have killed me too that day if my mother hadn't handed me over to the water nymphs. Oh, dear, <laughs> said Waldrick, whipping out his monogrammed handkerchief and dabbing at his face as he turned to his guests in chagrin. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so embarrassed. I really must apologize for trying to deceive you. I, I thought it might be possible to hide my nephew's uh, nervous condition, but as you can see, he's gone quite mad from everything he's been through. Murmurs coursed through the crowd. Waldrick shook his head in regret. The poor boy's wits are addled. Oh, I should have listened to his doctors. They said it was too soon to subject him to all this excitement. I should have let him rest longer. But I was so overjoyed to have him back and wanted to share that joy with all my friends. Jacob, uh, step down from there. You've made quite enough of a scene in front of your friends. You, you need to rest. Now say good night and retire to your room. I don't have to do what you say any more, he shot back, laughing in his face and clearly enjoying this little stunt. The spell is broken, Gov. The game's up. Jake turned back to the guests, his cockney accent coming back out as his emotions rose and he forgot about his training as a gentleman. He's the one who's mad, believe you me, he told the crowd. He turned me into a slave for a while, thanks to a spell from that witch of his. Look at the two of them. They ain't normal. Waldrick? Finula cried in alarm when Jake pointed at her. She's not even a person, he informed them, but a horrible, wriggly thing. Jacob, that is quite enough, Waldrick said calmly. Shout whatever things you like about me, but do not speak that way about my lady friend. Lady? Beast is more like it. But whatever she is, you're worse. You're a monster. Jake flung at him. What kind of sinister bloke cuts the wings off an helpless fairy? Oh, dear, 
Waldrick made a show of rubbing his forehead with a weary air of compassion. Fairies, ghosts, here we go again. My friends, I beg your pardon for my nephew's wild ravings. The poor boy has been through so much suffering in his young life. We think he must have seen his parents murder, and the trauma of it all has taken a serious toll on his mind. As you can see, his doctors have assured me that all this should pass once he's begun to feel safe in his new home. If not... He may need to go into an institution, Waldrick said through gritted teeth. In fact, I'm very sure he will. Bollocks! The society mamas gasped in horror at his free use of a curse word. Another girl fainted. Jake's cheeks were flushed with fury, but at least he had the sense not to use his powers in front of everyone. I ain't mad, right? He's the liar. Every word I said just now is true, and he knows it. Come along, Jacob, that will do. You're upsetting all the ladies. You need to go lie down. He seized Jake's arm and yanked him off the chair. You're obviously not feeling quite yourself at the moment, he snarled while smiling like a saint. I hoped you'd be able to meet my friends, but I see it's still too soon to put so much pressure on you. Everyone, I apologize from the bottom of my heart. This is such an embarrassment. He waved to the orchestra to begin to play again. Come, Jacob, let's not spoil the party for all our guests after they've been kind enough to come. Perhaps Fenula would grace us with a song. Happily, my dear. As Waldrick pulled the struggling boy forcibly from the room, the sea witch took it upon herself to smooth things over with one of her enchanted ditties to calm the guests after what had just happened. Waldrick pulled Jake out of the ballroom by his arm, dragged him through a few more stately chambers, and threw him into the morning room near the kitchens. He stepped in after him, then pulled the door shut and locked it. How dare you! he hissed when they were alone. Chapter 35 Family Secrets You're a killer! Jake backed away from him, but he knew the time had come to use everything that he had learned from Derek. I know what you did to my parents. You have no proof. Proof enough for me. I saw the memories in your mind through that spell you tried to enslave me with. But guess what, Uncle? Spell's broken. How? Waldrick demanded, warily strolling closer. None of your business, Jake retorted. What were you doing out in the garden? Flickers saw you come in, and I didn't give you permission to leave the house. It's my house, Jake snarled. I'm the rightful Earl of Griffin. You're a fraud and a murderer, and now you're going to pay. With a wave of his hand, he sent a vase flying off the distant mantle, hurling straight at Waldrick's head. Waldrick ducked just in time. But in the next heartbeat, his own possessions began attacking him from all around the room. Stop that, you brat! His umbrella whacked him in the back of the knees. His cozy throw blanket glided up from where it was draped over the wing chair and began choking him, wrapping itself around his neck like a python, spinning him around. Waldrick tore it away and gasped for air, only to be clobbered over the head with a small flying end table. Jake laughed angrily, taunting him as he continued hurling things at him. Lamps, statues, pictures off the wall, a footstool. That's for my mother! That's for my father! He cried with each new object he sent hurling through the air. That's for the servants you let Fenula turn into frogs just so the two of you could cover your tracks! And that's for Gladwin! And this is for Derek! And Danny! You made me throw my best friends out in the street! Oh, commoners! At least they're not squids. Jacob, stop for a second and listen to me. Listen carefully. I have something to say. You think an apology's going to be good enough after all you took from me? It's not an apology. It's a plan. Don't you see? Then he lowered his voice to a whisper. With you, I don't need Fenula anymore. We could be a team, you and I. We could be unstoppable. Quit that, he ordered, ducking with a curse as Jake responded by sending a Wedgwood China doggy flying at him from the curio in the corner. You're only making it worse for yourself. How could it be worse? Jake asked bitterly. Waldrick grabbed a fire poker just in time to parry the umbrella that now thrust at him like the blade of an invisible swordsman. On guard! Jake made the umbrella engage his wicked uncle in a fencing match. Fortunately for Waldrick, he was a well-trained swordsman, blocking another stab of the umbrella with a skilled parry. 
Bored already of this game, Jake made the fire poker fly out of Waldrick's hand and come to him. Jake grabbed the fire poker out of the air and lifted it in his grasp like a spear, drawing back his arm. Goodbye, uncle. With that, he hurled the fireplace poker at him like a spear. He gods! Waldrick dove out of the way, then looked at his nephew in astonishment. You just tried to kill me! How do you like it? Jake retorted. Waldrick couldn't believe a mere boy had actually tried to impale him. Enough of this, you rabid little cur! You remind me why I never wanted children. On the other hand, maybe you're more like me than I thought. With a cold smile, he reached down and picked up the fire poker from where it had landed by his feet. Think you can skewer me, eh? Sweat running down his face, he advanced towards his nephew in fury. Put out your hands, Jake, and let me break them. He gripped the weapon like a club. We'll see if you can still do your magic tricks when I've turned your hands into mangled bloody stumps. Jake looked a little unnerved by his ruthless advance. He took a backward step. I'm not afraid of you, Waldrick laughed softly, sensing real fear for the first time in the boy. Finally, it pleased him. Aren't you indeed? What are you going to do now? Kill me the way you killed my parents? Why? Why did you hate them so much? What did they ever do to you? The question touched a nerve in him. Oh, don't give me those sad puppy eyes. You think you're the only one who's ever suffered in this world? For your information, your father ruined my life. He stole what was mine. He got what he deserved. What are you talking about? What did he steal? Waldrick glared at him, fighting the urge to tell. He could not hold back. Your father robbed me of my magic. That's right, Jake. I had a gift once too, but your father couldn't let me keep it. He had to be the only one, the center of the world. So full of himself, him and Derek Stone, two great pals. He fairly spat. Jake eyed him warily. Did you have telekinesis too? No, I had something better. Waldrick gave him a chilly smile. You can move things without touching them. Well, I could burn them. Jake's eyes widened. Yours is called telekinesis. Mine was called pyrokinesis. And one day, when my power first arrived, just as the Kindervale began dissolving, well, I admit I had difficulty controlling it. I was only a boy. I barely had my gift for 48 hours. Hadn't even told my family yet. Except my big brother found out. He saw what happened, but it was an accident. I never meant to hurt anyone. Waldrick shook his head, lost in his memories. No one would have found out it was I who caused that fire anyway. Who'd have believed it? It merely looked like a cooking fire got out of control and burned down those peasants' cottages. No one would have known. But Jacob couldn't let it go. Some brother. He said the order would punish me or hand me over to the human authorities for arson. But even that was nothing compared to what our father would do. Waldrick's eyes glazed over as he stared into space, remembering. Father already disliked me enough. Jacob was always his favorite. I was nothing to him, he said with a sneer. So I begged my brother not to tell what I had done. Finally, Jacob agreed to help me, but in exchange for my brother's silence, I had to pay a terrible price. He said if I wanted him to keep the secret, I had to submit to the extraction. What's that? Jake breathed. You don't want to know. Tell me. The extraction is a very dangerous spell to remove a person's magic, a dreadful and agonizing ordeal. But Jacob said my gift was too powerful for me, that we couldn't risk my accidentally hurting anyone else, so he sneaked into Bradford House next door and borrowed an ancient grimoire from the old witch Lady Bradford. We used the incantation in her book to transfer my pyrokinesis into an enchanted holding vial. The extraction nearly killed me, Waldrick continued. Or rather, your father nearly killed me, doing the spell. I dare say I've never been the same, but he barely knew what he was doing. He was just a boy himself, only fourteen. He must have gone overboard with it, just like he did with everything, because once he took away my fire, I have not been able to get warm since. Jake stared at him. Waldrick sighed. (sighs) Even so, I was glad to be rid of what seemed to be a curse at the time. Young as I was, I knew he was right. Pyrokinesis was too much for me. It's a very rare gift. Far as I've heard, only one or two of the dark druids has it. 
In any case, my brother promised he'd help transfer my gift back into me when I was ready. Till then, we hid the enchanted vial in the vault beneath Griffin Castle. From that day on, we two brothers kept the secret from all the world, even our parents. Even his best friend, Derek Stone. We had to protect our family's good name, and Jacob knew that Stone would have gone straight to the order with the truth about what happened. Not that anyone died in that fire, but a few of the peasants were injured. We were frightened. We did not know what the world might do to me. So we covered up my involvement in the fire and let everyone assume I had not inherited any magic. Jake shook his head. Waldrick smirked. To be honest, for a long time afterward, I was glad to be rid of my gift. I wanted nothing to do with magic. Unlike most Evertons, I got the chance to be normal, and for about a decade that was good enough for me. He paused. So now you know our little family secret, Jake, and you're the only one who does, besides Fenula. If my father helped you cover up your crime, then why did you murder him? Jake demanded. Because he lied to me. Waldrick's eyes glittered in the darkness. Betrayed me. He promised me that one day, when I was ready, he'd help restore my gift. The extraction doesn't have to be permanent. But when I grew older, and that day came when I wanted my magic back, he refused. Jake lifted his eyebrows at this revelation. I was twenty-three years old by that time, Waldrick ground out, but my brother had the nerve to say that I still wasn't mature enough and probably never would be. The arrogance! He said I could never have my power back, that I'd only misuse it. And when I pressed him, he admitted he had already destroyed the vial and my power with it long ago. Jake drew in his breath. Waldrick's anger snapped. What right did he have to do that, I ask you? How dare he destroy what was mine, what was once a part of me? Who was he to make that decision? But that's just how he was, arrogant to the core, always knew better than everyone else. Well, I showed him. So you murdered him? Jake breathed, shaking his head as he stared at him in shock. That just proves he was right. You're a monster. Waldrick's grasp on the fire poker tightened at the insult, but he forced a cold smile. I don't care if you call me names, boy. All I care about is keeping what I've rightfully earned. You are not going to take it away from me. Rightfully earned? You stole it all. Turnabout's fair play. He stole my gift. I stole his earldom. I gave you the chance to cooperate, Jake, but you refused to go along with the program. Dashed right, I refused. I want nothing to do with you or your plans. You're twisted. Look at what you did to Gladwin. My father was right to strip you of your talent. That's a terrible power, and you're the last person in the world who ought to have it. At that moment, a light knock sounded on the parlor door. Jake glanced over, probably hoping for help. My lord, the butler called through the door. Lady Fenula is asking for you. But Waldrick didn't answer. Instead, he lifted the fire poker and used that fleeting chance to take his best shot while Jake's head was turned. Whack! The boy instantly crumpled to the floor, knocked out cold by the blow to the side of his head. Go away! Waldrick bellowed at his butler, his chest heaving. He tossed the fire poker aside and quickly untied the cravat from around his neck. It's too bad you had to be so stubborn, Jake, he said under his breath. But what else did I expect? You are your father's son. He coiled his cravat into a rope and used it to tie Jake's dangerous hands behind his back, still muttering under his breath. Call me a monster, you insufferable brat. I'll show you a monster, if you really want to see one, and it's due for its next feeding. He grabbed one of Jake's ankles and began dragging his unconscious nephew across the floor. While the party went on in another region of the house, Waldrick dragged Jake to an unused scullery room off the kitchens. Beside the giant dishwashing sinks was a small, locked door at about waist level. It opened to the chute where they threw down the creature's food. Waldrick was still so infuriated by the memories of his brother that his hands were shaking as he slid the bolt open and tilted back the door. He told himself it would be easy enough to make excuses later as to why the brat had disappeared again. All of society had just seen his dear, precious nephew behave like a raving lunatic. He would simply tell the world that the demented lad had run away, never to be seen again. 
Then he would be the Earl for good, with no more bother from pesky, magical twelve-year-olds who should have done the world a favor and died long ago. In you go! Waldrick lifted the still unconscious Jake off the floor and shoved him feet first into the chute. Still stunned from the blow to his head, Jake was only just beginning to stir as Waldrick let go of his arms. Bon appétit, Jakey old boy! With that, he dropped him into the darkness. No! Jake's voice trailed away with an echo. Good riddance, Waldrick muttered as he let the little door bang shut. Sliding the bolt home with a narrow smile of satisfaction, he cast an evil look behind him at the kitchen door, eager to get back to his party. Well, that's handled. Dusting off his hands, Waldrick lifted his chin, smoothed his waistcoat and his hair, then strolled back to his guests a happy man. Now he actually had something to celebrate. Sing loud, Fenula, he thought with a smile. Her tune would help to cover up the screams. <laughs> Jake regained consciousness in the middle of falling endlessly down a long, smooth slide through pitch darkness. Thud! Ow! He landed on his rear end in a dark dungeon somewhere far beneath his uncle's house. His hands were still tied behind his back, leaving him defenseless. It was not the most comfortable position either. Where am I? Uneasily, he scanned the black space around him. His eyes were slow to adjust to the darkness. Indeed, he could barely think straight after that blow to the side of his head. Finally, heart pounding, Jake saw he was in some sort of underground cell, an old limestone cave reinforced with iron bars. Three torches burned far above, but they did not provide much light. As he struggled to get his bearings and collect his thoughts, he suddenly became aware of a presence nearby. He went very still as he realized he was not alone. Something was down here with him. Something big. He held very still, suddenly afraid to move or get up or to draw attention to himself. All the while, his head throbbed with pain. He could feel a trickle of blood oozing from his left temple where his uncle had clobbered him with the fire poker. Great, he thought. If there was some sort of animal down here waiting to eat him, the scent of blood was only going to whet its appetite. Just as he was trying to think of some sarcastic comment to help convince himself this was no big deal and he could easily get out of it, his eyes widened and his blood ran cold. A low, angry growl rose from the shadows. Part 5 Chapter 36 The Fairy Courier Danny and Derek were doing surveillance on Waldrick's mansion from the leafy shadows of the park across the street. Trying to see what was going on inside, all they could do at this point was watch and wait for a chance to rescue Jake. Though it did seem odd to have to rescue someone from a big, glamorous party where he was the guest of honor. There had to be worse fates. Half of London had gone into Everton House to celebrate Jake's return. The snooty half, thought Danny. The square was lined with parked carriages that all the fancy guests had arrived in. The elegant music from inside the house reverberated through the walls. Danny sighed, wondering what it was like to be a fine lady and go to a ball. She supposed she'd never know. Derek had apparently seen enough. He turned away with a scowl and a harumph and leaned against the tree. She could tell by the look on his face that he would have rather burst into the mansion and dragged Jake out by the scruff of the neck. But of course they had already tried that earlier today. It had not worked out so well. After Jake had ejected them this morning, they had spent the whole day in the library at Beacon House trying to research some solution for how to break the spell he was under to no avail. As Danny stared at the mansion, she still couldn't believe her best friend had used his powers against her. A part of her wondered if maybe she deserved it after telling on him, but she felt especially sorry for Derek, who had been subjected to the same indignity. The warrior had been quiet and gruff all day long, mentally beating himself up about Jake falling into Waldrick's hands. 
Danny had tried to tell him not to worry, that Jake had been in worse scrapes than this, but at the moment neither of them was sure of their next move. The last they had seen Jake, he had been completely under Waldrick's spell. How could you help someone who didn't want to be helped? Suddenly, Danny noticed a faint twinkle of lights across the street, like tiny sparks of fire, traveling low to the ground along the base of Waldrick's house. Moving rapidly through the darkness, the glittering trail of sparks hugged the mansion's outer wall, moving toward the cobbled street. What is that? she inquired, pointing it out to Derek. He drew in his breath, his sharp, supernatural senses homing in on the target. It's Gladwin! Huh? He turned to Danny, firmly grasping her arm. Stay here, he whispered. I'll be right back. What is it? she exclaimed. Don't you know? he drawled, leaning closer and lowering his voice. That's a fairy trail. A fairy trail? she echoed, but the warrior was already in motion. In the next heartbeat, he had pushed away from the tree and was striding toward the wrought iron gates of the park. Derek, I want to come too! Danny called in an insistent whisper, which was ignored. She snorted. No wonder he and Jake got along so well, she thought. They were both impossible. She watched uncertainly as the guardian dashed off, leaving the tree's shadows cloaking the garden square. At the risk of being seen, he walked out into the dim glow of the street lamps and crossed the street, slipping between the parked carriages. When he ducked out of sight, Danny could only wonder what was happening. A few minutes later, he returned, holding something carefully in his cupped hands. Something that glowed. Danny barely dared breathe as he joined her once more behind the cover of a wide tree trunk. What is that? she asked in amazement, staring at the faint golden light emanating from between his cupped fingers. Not what? Who? You have a fairy in there? she blurted out. Let me see. Careful, she's hurt, he murmured as he slowly opened his hands and let her look upon the small, delicate being. Danny gazed in wonder at the beautiful fairy with moonlight-colored hair kneeling right in the center of the warrior's rugged palm. But something was missing the most important part. Danny looked at Derek. How can she be a fairy without any wings? He shook his head grimly. Waldrick did this to her. Danny gasped. Oh no, he pulled off her wings? Cut them off. Don't worry, Gladwin. He reassured her softly. We'll get you to Beacon House soon. Perhaps there's something Dr. Celestus can do. Oh yes, Dr. Celestus. He's terribly clever. He helped me when I got bashed in the head. Danny assured the tiny thing, heartbroken for her. When the fairy glanced at her, she hesitated. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have mentioned it. I, I didn't mean to be rude. If there's anything I can do... The fairy tilted her head, gazing back at Danny. Then she turned to Derek with a curious gesture. Of course. Where are my manners? He mumbled. Gladwin, this is Miss Odell, a friend of Jake's. Call me Danny she said with a little wave, though she was still privately horrified about the wings. She heard a silvery, tinkling answer. It was the most adorable sound she had ever heard. If flowers could talk, that's what they would sound like, she thought. But unfortunately, she could not make out the words. What does she say? She's pleased to meet you. Uh, likewise. Would you please tell her I didn't mean to be rude about her wings? She can hear you. You should be able to understand her, too, since you're a child. Listen a little bit harder. Derek glanced at the fairy. Gladwin, would you mind repeating yourself? Danny leaned down and concentrated, listening for all she was worth. Don't worry, Miss Odell, the fairy said in her tiny, charming voice. I know you didn't mean any harm. You have a kind face. Danny's eyes lit up when she heard and finally understood Gladwin's words. A smile from ear to ear broke across her face. She gazed warmly at the tiny being, but all the fairy lore she knew warned her to be respectful. A wise person never risked angering a fairy. Thank you, Gladwin. I'm so pleased to meet you. I've never had the honor of meeting one of the fae folk before. Granny told me all about the ones she saw when she was young in Ireland. You're still a beautiful fairy, wings or no. Standing on Derek's palm, Gladwin curtsied in thanks. This is Gladwin Lightwing, one of Queen Victoria's royal garden fairies, Derek hastily explained. She's been missing for weeks. Now I know why. 
She was supposed to bring me a message about Jake, but Waldrick captured her. He's been holding her captive all this time. How awful! Fortunately, Jake got her out of there, and now she's brought us a message from him. He's free of the spell, but it showed him some things Gladwin was just telling me. Waldrick is working with the sea witch Fenula Coralbroom, and Jake is now convinced that it was the two of them who killed his parents, Gladwin informed them. He also wanted you to know, Guardian Stone, that Fenula put a spell on you the day of the attack, some potion to dull your guardian instincts. That's why you couldn't sense the danger to your friends. You see? Gladwin said. It wasn't your fault. A stunned look settled on Derek's hard face. It wasn't my fault? He echoed barely audibly. He turned away, deeply shocked by this revelation. All these years, Waldrick's made me feel so guilty every time our paths have crossed. He never lets me forget my failure that day, as if I could ever forget it myself. But it wasn't your fault, Danny repeated. Yes, Derek whispered. Then he looked at the mansion again with flames in his eyes. There's something else, Gladwin hurried to tell them. When I last saw Jake, he was heading off to confront his uncle in the ballroom. Really? Danny's eyes widened. I'm not sure that's such a good idea. Of course not, Derek agreed. It's foolhardy, reckless, typical Jake. How are we going to get in there and stop him? Danny prompted, but Gladwin shook her head in worry. I'm afraid you're already too late. Chapter 37 Big Red Hanging, maybe, dying of starvation, being murdered by his uncle's henchman, skewered by Magnus the blacksmith, or drowned in the Thames by an angry water nymph. Jake had imagined several unpleasant ways he might have died, but being eaten alive by a large, hungry monster wasn't one of them. He was not looking forward to this. The growl from the darkness grew louder. Cursing himself for taking on Waldrick alone, Jake scrambled to his feet from where the chute had dropped him onto the cold stone floor. To make matters worse, his blasted hands were tied behind his back. He was defenseless. Heart thumping, he retreated from the snarling sound. By now, he had more or less figured out what this stone dungeon really was. Faded, rusty watermarks on the walls suggested he was at the bottom of an old rainwater cistern, no longer in use. Once it must have held a water supply for the mansion. But Waldrick had long since turned the empty, cave-like reservoir into a secure stone cell for his pet monster. Chains clanked and scraped across the stone as a black silhouette began moving in the darkness. It was big. Jay cowered, his whole body shaking. He had never been so scared in his life. He felt utterly alone, a scream trapped in his throat. He didn't want to die this way. Not even a ghost appeared to face this horror with him. Then he gasped and ducked as a large shape whooshed above him. Something with a wide wingspan pounced across the cell and landed on a rocky outcropping a few yards above his head. Still chained, the creature crouched on the ledge, studying him. He could feel its stare, but he could not make out what the monster looked like. Jake struggled not to panic, hunkering down behind the bottom of the chute, wondering if he could crawl back up that steep, narrow slide. Otherwise... Chains rattled again as the creature launched itself off the ledge and flew across the dark space, ricocheting angrily off the walls that confined it. Jake let out a yelp of terror and ducked as the creature buzzed him, as if trying to figure out what he was before it moved in for the kill. A bead of sweat ran down his face. He hid behind the chute, whispering over and over again, Please don't eat me! Please don't eat me! Whoosh! The beast landed on all fours in the center of its lair. With his heart in his throat, Jake forced himself to look and see what he was up against. Slowly, he lifted his head, peeking over the metal edge of the chute slide. Stalking closer, the creature stepped into the shaft of moonlight streaming in from high above and was fully revealed. Jake stared in amazement. He could not believe his eyes. The creature was magnificent and terrible and not supposed to exist. I know what you are, he breathed in shock, as if the animal could understand him. You're you're a griffin. 
At the sound of its name, the creature let out the piercing scream of an eagle and reared up on its hind paws, flexing its red-feathered wings and slashing at the air with razor-sharp lion's claws. A very angry griffin. Jake stifled a shout and ducked, his hair ruffled by the wind from the creature's wings. As its screech reverberated off the walls of the stone cell, the beast's image was burned into Jake's mind, standing on its hind legs, a griffin rampant, just like on the ancient battle flag back at Griffin Castle. As soon as Jake steadied himself, he looked over the edge of the chute again, his pulse pounding. The griffin had dropped back down on all four legs again, arching its neck, tossing its head, its golden eyes flashing in the darkness. Blimey! Jake whispered, staring. It had the body of a lion, with muscles rippling all down its flanks. Its long, tufted tail whipped angrily from side to side as it approached him, setting each massive paw silently on the stone floor, claws gleaming. It folded its powerful wings against its body. They were covered in scarlet feathers, with a vague shimmer of gold at the tips. So that's where Fenula was getting those magic red feathers! Jake thought, fascinated by the creature that was about to devour him. The griffin had the head of an eagle, but the sleek feathers on its head were also red, like its wings. It had a sharp, gold beak, hooked for tearing flesh from bone. Its large, intelligent eyes were golden as well, fierce and piercing in expression, as it stalked nearer, its stare fixed on him. Jake did not like the way it was eyeing him. "'Easy, big fellow. I'm friendly, right?' "'What are you doing down here? I, I saw your picture all over Griffin Castle. I get the feeling that's home for both of us, isn't it?' The griffin let out a mournful caw, though fury still burned in its eyes. It stepped closer with the prowling grace of a big cat, while its head cocked and tilted with jerky, bird-like movements. Jake was encouraged. "'Easy now. You don't want to eat me. Trust me on that. I, I wouldn't taste very good. Nothing sweet about me.' He gulped as the creature advanced, then he tried to reason with it. Blimey, how long has Waldrick kept you locked in here? He's my enemy too, you know. You and I should get along. After all, you're a griffin, and it's me, not Waldrick, who's the rightful Earl of Griffin. Are you the one that found my family's gold mine? I'm guessing my ancestors named our title after you, so that would make us, what, what practically cousins. Easy now, good birdie. Jake took another slow, terrified step backward, praying the chain would keep it from reaching him. No such luck. It leaned forward and sniffed him with the holes at the top of its beak, and then let out a scream right in his face. Jake screamed back. The griffin reared up and knocked him down with a shove of its front paw, spinning him so he fell onto his stomach. He looked over his shoulder in horror as the griffin unsheathed the claws of its front paw with a moonlight glint. He squeezed his eyes shut for the death blow as the claws sliced through the air, slashing toward his back. Huh? Instead of his spine being torn out, he felt his hands jerk apart and realized the griffin had just cut away the rope binding his hands. Before he could react, the griffin bent its head and with its huge beak, picked him up gently by the back of his tuxedo coat and set him on his feet. Jake turned around, astonished. Then his jaw dropped as the griffin pushed its head against him and began to purr, like some huge, cuddly lion. In complete shock, Jake reached down and cautiously touched the creature's sleek, feathered head. Another realization suddenly dawned on him. You're here because of your feathers, aren't you? Jake recalled Fenula's words in the memory he had witnessed inside Uncle Waldrick's mind. Bring me that creature. I mean it, Waldrick. Elemental magic of an immortal beast like that is extremely rare. They've been stealing your magic feathers just like they stole my parents away from me, haven't they? Caw! the griffin said indignantly. Poor fellow! Jake ran his fingertip along one individual feather, marveling at it. I just can't believe it, he murmured, half to himself. Well, you must have very powerful magic if one of your feathers can turn that ugly squid into a lady. The griffin growled at the mention of Fenula, but was apparently so happy to have a companion in his lonely cell that he sat down on his lion haunches and just looked at Jake. His eagle eyes glowed golden in the darkness, as if to say, 
entertain me? Jake's heart was filled with pity that such a noble beast had suffered such injustice, kept in this dungeon, used for the magic in its feathers, and scornfully referred to as a monster. Those wings of his were made for flying. This strange, beautiful creature should be free. Jake set his jaw suddenly, full of determination. Right. Don't worry, Red. I'm going to get both of us out of here. Rubbing his wrists, he took a confident stride past the large animal to have a look round at the cell. There had to be a way out. If he had managed to rescue Gladwin and the satyr and the others, he would jolly well get the griffin out of here too, just like a light rider, like his parents. These rock walls look pretty solid, and you're too big to fit up the chute. He dropped his head back, staring up the long, narrow ventilation shaft. Up at ground level, it was covered with a metal grill. But maybe... Jake loosened up his hands, then drew up all his concentration, summoning up his telekinesis. Pa! Pa! He flicked his fingers, aiming straight up the long, dark ventilation shaft. The griffin squawked, spooked by the crackling energy that flew like lightning from his fingertips. To Jake's dismay, however, the metal grate at the top of the air shaft did not budge. Blast! Either that thing's too heavy or I'm too far away. Unless you could fly me up there. With a low, sad caw, the griffin showed him the rusty iron shackle chained to its back leg. Jake frowned, but he was abruptly reminded of the bobbies putting the handcuffs on Derek. It seemed like a lifetime ago. Here in the dark cell, the thick chain ran from the solid cuff around the griffin's leg to an iron bolt in the floor. The rock ledge above was as high as the winged beast could go, tethered like this to the ground. You know, Jake mused, resting one hand on his hip as he stroked his chin in thought, I could try to zap that for you. Don't know if it'd work, but it's worth a try. You broke my bonds. Maybe I can break yours too, but you have to promise not to have a conniption, right? Don't uh, bite me or anything. I'm not going to hurt you, so try not to go mad when I zap you. It stared at him warily, as if to say, maybe I will, and maybe I won't. But if I get that shackle off your paw, you have to let me climb on your back and fly us up to that opening. Then I think I can try again to blast that metal grate aside. Between the two of us, we might just be able to get out of here tonight. The griffin tilted its head with a curious, Caw! We'll have to work on that collar later. For now, just hold still. Brace yourself. I'll do my best not to singe your feathers or your fur. The griffin shook itself, then held motionless, waiting with a slightly worried look while Jake rubbed his hands together. He didn't want to hurt the creature, not the least because he wasn't sure how the griffin might react. If the beast got scared or thought Jake was trying to hurt it, it could take his head off with one quick bite of that razor-sharp beak. All of his training with Derek to control his powers had better pay off now. Jake focused on the cuff around the griffin's back leg. His hands grew warm with the waves of magic tingling down his arms. Please work. As he concentrated, summoning up all his powers, he recalled what Derek had once told him, how his parents were light riders and helped magical creatures in distress. Surely this was his moment to prove he deserved to be their son. Finally, this was his chance to shine. Now! He flung his fingers at the iron manacle with a low cry of effort. It burst apart. The griffin screamed, but not in pain. In victory! As the metal cuff and chain fell off the creature's leg and clattered to the ground, the griffin leaped into the air, free to fly. It soared up and up in a spiral. Jake tilted his head back, watching the animal in awe. Now that the griffin was unleashed, he could truly sense its magic and see the golden shimmer that danced across its wings. But the mighty beast could only fly so high before the metal grate at the top of the shaft blocked its way and reminded them both that they were still jailed in this stone cage. The next step in their escape was now upon them. The griffin seemed as ready as Jake was to try, landing gracefully in front of him. Its golden eyes gleamed with pleasure. Jake smiled as he walked toward it. Feeling better, I see. It let out an enormous caw and stretched its wings, showing off. Jake grinned. See, that wasn't so bad. 
Now comes the hard part. You ready to go for a fly, boy? The griffin snorted and leaned down a bit to help him climb onto its back. Jake grasped the iron collar around its neck. He was going to have to hold on to something when they were airborne. Easy, steady now. He wasn't sure how the beast would react when he climbed aboard. He moved with extreme caution, pulling himself up onto the griffin's back. He straddled it, hooking his knees under the front of the creature's muscular wing joint. He hugged his legs around its flanks like riding a horse, though he had only just started learning how to do that at Bradford Park. As the griffin took a few prancing steps, Jake was amazed at the power of the mythical animal beneath him. "'All right, boy. I'm ready if you are.' Gripping the iron collar with both hands, Jake gave the creature a slight squeeze with his legs. At once, the griffin flapped its wings and launched into the air. It climbed on a sharp angle. Jake clutched the collar for all he was worth, dizzied as the ground dropped away beneath him. With each whooshing wingbeat, the griffin bounded upward, pushing off from one rock wall to the other, propelling itself higher on a zigzag path, like a great jungle cat climbing a tree. Jake held on for dear life. In seconds, the metal bars across the air shaft were before them, thick and heavy. They looked rusted shut. Can you get me any closer? he cried. The griffin concentrated too, almost hovering mid-air and slowly rising toward the bars so Jake could get a good shot to zap the blasted thing. As they came into position, he closed his eyes, calling forth all the magic in his veins. Big Red, as he'd already dubbed the griffin, was doing his part. Now it was Jake's turn to do his. Drawing on every ounce of magic in his bloodlines and trusting his new friend not to drop him, he let go of the collar and threw both of his hands up with a shout. The metal grate crashed open, nearly ripped right off its hinges. Jake reached frantically for the collar to catch himself from falling, already sliding down the griffin's back. Red flung his wings open wide to catch the air, then tucked them close to his body and soared through the opening. Clear! Jake let out a wild cheer as the griffin's wings began to pump. He felt the mighty rush of air as they rose on the breeze. He let out another wild whoop as they climbed into the night sky, heading straight for the stars. After a moment, he looked down in wonder as the lights of London twinkled beneath them, far below. His heart swelled with pride in his home city when he saw the moonlight gleam on the famous dome of St. Paul's Cathedral. Maybe he'd had a home all along. All he needed was to open his eyes and see it all around him. This place, with its bustling crowds, its cheeky orphans, its handsome cab drivers, its courtiers and clowns, nobles and beggars and businessmen, its scientists inventing wonders that made life better for people around the world, its pickpockets and pie-makers, and, of course, its bobbies like Constable Flanagan. In this moment, Jake felt connected to them all. It was like Dr. Celestis said. Maybe he had never really been as alone as he had felt. Meanwhile, Big Ben glowed like a wide, watchful eye. There was Parliament, and farther up the river, the Tower of London, which probably had more ghosts than he wanted to think about. His hair blowing wildly, Jake gazed down in wonder on garden squares, roofs and rookeries, mansions and museums. It went on in all directions for so many miles. Parks, markets, theatres. And like a friend's arm thrown around the city's shoulders, the River Thames winding by, its endless water gleaming in the starlight. The griffin circled, soaring higher, its lion paws taking long running strides as if it were racing over solid ground instead of wispy clouds. He could sense the animal's joy, relishing its freedom at last with another glorious lion roar. Jake peered down at the faraway ground in wonder, his hair flying, the tails of his tuxedo flapping in the breeze. With the air rushing against his cheeks, an exhilarating chill, he looked at the moon that seemed so close, and laughed as if he were sharing a joke with the man who supposedly lived there. But after a dizzying moment or two, he leaned lower over the griffin's neck like a jockey murmuring to his racehorse. What do you say we go and have a little talk with Uncle Waldrick and Fanula? The griffin screeched. Its piercing war cry filled the night. 
Jake held on tight to the collar as the griffin dove toward his uncle's house. Chapter 38 Revenge of the Griffin No one else understood why Waldrick and Finula were laughing as they waltzed gaily to the loud, bouncing music, round and round, while the rest of society stood back and admired them. One, two, three, one, two, three. All their cares had gone. They had triumphed. Jake was dead. The irksome brat was gone. There was nothing left to stand in their way. Finula's dainty hand rested on Waldrick's shoulder. He lightly cupped her waist, enjoying the envy of the world, and the fact that his powerful lady was finally letting him lead the dance. He had proved his mettle to her for once and for all when he had told her what he had done with Jake. She had clapped her hands and hugged him. Waldrick smiled smugly. She seemed to like knowing she was with such a strong man. They whirled on. Finula threw her head back and laughed again at their secret triumph, her ebony curls flying, her scarlet skirts whooshing over the floor. One, two, three, one, two, three, turning and turning. Then Waldrick's gaze chanced to skim past the high arched windows over the ballroom. A flash of motion out in the dark sky drew his attention. Dancing on, his brow suddenly furrowed, he stepped into the turn and looked over his shoulder. His eyes shot open wide. A shocking wingspan. The outline of a huge beak. And his nephew on the creature's back? He gasped. Yelp! The griffin's deafening screech shattered the glass in the tall arched windows, clearing the creature's path as it attacked. The guests' screams drowned out the waltz as they ducked, shielding their heads from the glass that rained down from the exploding window. In the middle of the dance floor, Fenula rushed behind Waldrick, but he pushed her aside and dove behind her. Do something! he yelled. Fenula glared at him. He didn't care, more afraid of the griffin than of her. He knew that beast wanted his blood after all those years of captivity, all those stolen feathers. Pandemonium broke out in the ballroom. Peering over his lady's shoulder, Waldrick trembled at the sight of Jake astride the griffin. It was supposed to have eaten the boy, not joined forces with him. The winged beast was circling the chandeliers, terrorizing the guests, who began stampeding by the hundreds for the doors. Even the musicians were running for their lives, using flutes as clubs and violin bows as prods to shove lords and ladies out of their way. And the debutantes, society's little princesses, lost their dancing slippers in the mad scramble for the exits. Some of the fine gentlemen forgot their chivalry altogether. It's a monster! Run for your life! Amid the deafening screams, Waldrick chanced another cowering glance up at the griffin, while Finula turned to him. Lincoln Poop! I thought you said you disposed of him! She shook bits of broken glass out of her ebony tresses. I... I don't understand how this could... You can't do anything right, can you? She snapped, and reaching down the center of her bodice, she pulled out her wand. Useless human male, only good for one thing, dinner. She hissed at him, bearing pearly white teeth at him. Waldrick scrambled back from her, suddenly reminded in vivid detail of what she really was. In a fleeting moment of clarity, he wondered what the deuce he was doing, conspiring with such a deadly female all these years. He was no saint, to be sure, but Fenula Coralbroom. Why, the sea witch had killed more people than he ever had thought about harming, drowning and gobbling up scores of sailors in the sea. Furious as she was with him at this debacle, she might be as much a threat to his life and limb as that flying monster. Panicking, Waldrick skittered, malwart fashion, on all fours, sliding underneath the nearest dessert table. Behind the drape of the long white tablecloth, he hunkered down, trembling beneath a spread of lavish cakes and lemon biscuits, praying that no one had seen him and that the red-feathered beast would not be able to sniff him out. Then he stole a peek to see what was happening. In the center of the ballroom, Finula was making a stand, trying again and again to zap the griffin and its rider with the blue crackling energy from her wand. Good idea, he said under his breath. He saw she was trying to trap and immobilize them in the same sort of blue bubble in which she had stopped the fairy when it had tried to escape. 
But the griffin was too quick and agile for her. With Jake riding low on its neck like a jockey, it dove and climbed and veered from side to side unpredictably. Fenula let out a shout of frustration, but then she was inspired to turn her wand toward the crush of guests all trying to squeeze out the exits at once. "'Surrender, Jacob!' she thundered at him. "'If you and your beast don't land here before me and give yourselves up, I will turn all these people into sea anemones. They can't live without salt water. Do you want them all to die?' The bewildered guests screamed anew, hearing this odd and horrifying threat. With an even more insistent panic, they shoved for the doors, each trying to get ahead of the others, with the result that no one could get out. When Fenula sent a bolt of magic at a shrieking, crying knot of girls, Jake flung an invisible bolt of his telekinesis power to counter the jagged blue line of energy from Fenula's wand. The two currents crossed, Jake's telekinesis pushing Fenula's lightning bolt away from the girls. Unfortunately, when it careened off course, it hit the startled butler, Mr. Flickers. The whop of energy instantly turned him back into a shiny brass candlestick that thumped to the floor. When Fenula tried a second time to turn the guests into sea anemones, Jake blocked her again, flying past on the griffin. This made her even angrier, so Fenula took a deep breath and began to sing. And it was not a pleasant song, but a weird, reverberating music from the coldest depths of the sea. Her power caused dark, swirling storm clouds to gather in the ballroom, revolving around the ceiling and blocking the griffin's view of where it was flying. The wind inside the ballroom grew. The crystal chandeliers began to tinkle and sway like a hurricane was coming. But as her song grew, trying to cast a spell over the griffin, the creature threw back its head and let out a long, fiery roar, drowning out the sea witch's voice. A terrible song broke off. Fenula flung her hands up to cover her ears and dropped to her knees with a howl of pain. The griffin circled like it wanted to tear her apart, with good reason. But Waldrick didn't wait to find out what would happen to his lady, darting back under the table where he held as still as a rat hiding from a falcon. His heart pounded in dread. I've got to get out of here. I've got to get in there, Derek said, glaring at Everton House. They had no idea what was going on inside the mansion, but it sounded terrible. For the past few minutes, they could hear screams and roars from across the street, but it was the crackle of lightning and rumble of thunder coming from inside that Danny found most bizarre. The warrior turned to her. Quickly, put out your hands, Danny. I need you to take care of Gladwin for me. Here, careful. Protect her. You keep an eye on the little girl for me too, Gladwin. But you might need my help, the fairy protested as she hopped from Derek's calloused palm into Danny's waiting cupped hands. And mine too, Danny agreed, amazed that she was holding a fairy, but there were more pressing issues at the moment. Let us come with you. Too dangerous. Stay put, he ordered. Then he ran. Humph, said Gladwin. Humph, Danny agreed. And I'm not little, she declared with a slight pout. No, indeed, you're enormous, said Gladwin. To me, you're a giantess. Thank you. I think he is so stubborn. It's his guardian nature. They can't stay away from a fight. But he didn't even give me a chance to tell him about the side door. How does he mean to get in? That question was promptly answered when they saw Derek across the street, jumping up onto the front window sill and kicking the glass in. He leaped in through the curtains and disappeared. The fairy folded her arms across her chest. Subtle. Danny eyed her askance. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Gladwin nodded eagerly. Let's go. Danny cupped her hands more securely over Gladwin and started out of the park. I hope we don't get into trouble for disobeying. Nonsense. I outrank a guardian. Being a royal garden fairy has its privileges, you know. Go round to the side, Danny. Lord Griffin found a door there. It took Danny a second to realize by Lord Griffin, Gladwin actually meant Jake. Blimey, she'd never get used to thinking of that blockhead as an earl. Hurrying across the cobbled street, she found the wrought iron gate into Waldrick's garden and opened it. Slipping through it, she closed the gate behind her and followed the path along the side of the house. There, Gladwin pointed to the door. I hope he left it unlocked. They were in luck. 
The side door opened easily. Nervously, Danny stepped inside. Breaking into houses was more of her brother's territory, but she shrugged it off and went to find the ballroom. Carrying Gladwin, she tiptoed down the hallway. When she stepped around the corner, she saw some guests in fancy clothes barreling straight toward her in a panic. Run! Run for your life! We're all going to die! She leaped out of the way into a stairwell. More terrorized guests were coming, so she dashed up the stairs instead of trying to squeeze past them. Well, she soon found the ballroom all right. Somehow, she came out at the top of a red-carpeted grand staircase with a gilded railing that overlooked the whole ballroom like a balcony. Danny and Gladwin both stared in open-mouthed shock at the wild scene spread out before them. Jake was flying around on a fierce winged beast, while a very angry but beautiful black-haired lady was casting blue lightning bolts at him from her wand. A witch? That must be the same woman that turned the servants at Griffin Castle into frogs, Danny thought, remembering what Lady Bradford had reported at their last meal together. The frog people had seen a woman fitting her description. Meanwhile, hordes of guests were all piling into the exits at the same time, trampling each other, some trying to bribe their way through with their gold, others insisting on being allowed to go first by their rightful rank. Danny laughed at all of them. Then Derek suddenly appeared in the doorway, lightly running over the heaving mountain of people, stepping on quaffed heads and tuxedoed shoulders until he reached the top. He hooked his hands under the front of the ornate door lintel and swung from it, vaulting past the crowd into the ballroom, to land in a menacing pose on one knee. The guests parted, throwing themselves out of his way as he whipped out his knife. Then he charged straight at the witch. He's good, Gladwin admitted, but Danny held her breath as the witch turned and spotted the guardian barreling toward her with his blade. She raised her wand to hurl a blue bolt at Derek, who did not slow his pace, prepared to self-destruct in his duty, it seemed. But Jake saw too, and with a shout, zapped the wand right out of the witch's hand with his telekinesis. Her wand flew clear across the ballroom, end over end. And this did not make her happy. The beautiful witch stared at Jake. Lifting her arms out to her sides, she began to chant. And grow. Danny cupped her hands close to her chest, protecting Gladwin. They both watched in horror as the witch transformed herself into a sea monster, some sort of hideous, gigantic squid or octopus, except that it still had a vaguely human female face with painted lips. Giant tentacles and thick muscled arms covered in suction cups filled the ballroom, thrashing, coiling, and flailing like a mad carousel, trying to knock Jake and his flying mount out of the air. One arm blocked the broken window to stop them from escaping. Another grabbed for Derek's waist, but he leaped out of the way, then ran to protect the guests, exchanging his bowie knife for his sword. He slashed at any giant slimy arm that came reaching for the guests. But the sea monster's main target was Jake and his flying lion thing. What is that? Danny cried to Gladwin over the uproar. It's Fanula Coralbroom, the sea witch. She's turned herself into a kraken. I met the thing Jake's riding on. You don't know a griffin when you see one, child? Before Danny could answer, she yelped and had to hit the deck as one of the giant arms swept by overhead. Then, to her surprise, when she landed on the floor, she found herself face to face with the largest spider she had ever seen. Ha <laughs> ha! It shrieked when it saw her, more afraid of her than she was of it. It scuttled away from her toward the wall. Master! Where is Master? Malwort is coming, Master! Malwort will save you! The spider jumped sideways onto the wall. Danny stared in shock. Did that thing just talk? But before it could get away, Gladwin leaned out and blew a handful of sparkling gold dust at the spider. Malwort fell unconscious to the floor. Thump. Ha! the fairy said in satisfaction. Step on it, won't you? I'm not touching that thing, Danny exclaimed. Kill it, quickly. What? It's bigger than my foot. The spider recovered from the fairy dust with a cough, then shot out a line of web and pulled itself straight up. It swung to the wall to avoid the flailing arms of the terrible kraken. 
Coming, master, be brave. Malwort will save you. Danny could not believe she had just heard a spider talk. She wouldn't admit it to Gladwin, but she wouldn't have killed it even if she could. It was sort of cute. She could still hear the spider yelling its head off for Master as it bounded, swung, and jumped from chandelier to chandelier, bravely whizzing to the right and the left to avoid colliding with the kraken's arms or the griffin soaring past. She realized who Master was when the spider took a last great hurling leap off the fourth chandelier and landed on Waldrick Everton's shoulder. He had just crawled out from underneath the dessert table and was trying to get away. Derek spotted him and charged. Waldrick spun around to yell to his servants, Stop him! To Danny's dismay, a dozen footmen and maids all began circling Derek. He brought up his sword, warning them off, but Danny knew he was bluffing. He was a guardian. He wouldn't, couldn't hurt them. They were unarmed working people after all. Meanwhile, Waldrick ran, his loyal spider perched on his shoulder. Where is he going? Danny murmured, watching Jake's wicked uncle running the perimeter of the room like it was an obstacle course, hopping over side chairs, scaling refreshment tables, swinging from the heavy velvet curtains, and ducking the kraken's giant octopus arms, rolling away. The sea monster barely noticed him, determined to grab Jake and the griffin out of the air. Then Gladwin and Danny realized where Waldrick Everton was going. The wild-eyed former earl reached the bottom of the red-carpeted stairs and began taking them two at a time, heading straight for them, his perfect hair rumpled, his fine clothes must. He's insane, Gladwin warned. Danny, run! But Danny O'Dell felt all her Irish fight rising up inside her. Not hardly. He's not getting away. You got more of that dust? He's too tall. It only works if you get it in the face. Well, then, it's up to me. She slipped Gladwin safely into the pocket of her pinafore, then rolled up her sleeves and took a stance to kick the lout back down the steps for what he'd done to Jake and Gladwin, and to her with all his hurtful insults about commoners. Hold on, Gladwin! Eyes blazing with rookery spirit, Danny put up her fists and waited for the madman to charge, and would have made her brawling brothers proud to see her in that moment, for she didn't budge an inch. Chapter 39 A Shocking Claim Red was tiring. Jake could understand why. After being chained to the ground for years down in that dark cell, the griffin's wings, though strong, were out of practice for such intense flying. Jake urged him on the best he could and held on for dear life to the iron collar. Red was using all his speed, strength, and agility to keep them both clear of the kraken's grabbing tentacles. The thick, slimy arms were everywhere, another muscled arm cartwheeling at them at top speed as soon as they cleared the last. Jake sent a few shots of his telekinesis at the center of the kraken finula, but his efforts glanced off the monster's huge, bulbous head. After using his powers so many times already tonight, he noticed that he was feeling some of the after-effects that he used to get from exerting his supernatural talents. It seemed ages since he'd had one of those throbbing, woozy headaches, but he could feel another one coming on. The whack in the head from Uncle Waldrick's fire poker hadn't helped matters, nor did Red's crazy weaving patterns to escape the Kraken's clutches. Jake felt queasy, but forced himself to hold on tight to the collar as Red darted and swooped more like a swallow than an eagle, banking one way than the other on an unpredictable path. Another mighty arm whipped toward them. Red plunged, pounced off the ballroom floor, and leaped into the air again. But Jake wondered how much longer the griffin could keep up these heroics. He wasn't sure himself how much longer he could stay astride the animal. His arms were burning from clinging to the griffin's collar with all his strength. He wished they could get out of the building, but every time Red zoomed toward the broken window to escape, Fenula covered it up with one of her arms. They were trapped in here with her. Finally, disaster struck. Fenula got her lucky break. Neither Jake nor the griffin saw the tentacle quietly sneaking up from straight below them, rising to ensnare them. 
The next thing he knew, it coiled around them both like a giant, slimy, implacable snake as thick as a tree. It wrapped around Red's lion middle and squashed Jake into place. The griffin screamed, pulled off course. The sudden whip to the side, mid-flight, made Jake bite the inside of his mouth so hard he tasted blood. Red began clawing furiously at the suctioned tentacle pulling them toward the kraken's mouth. They fought for all they were worth, Jake punching the octopus arm, Red tearing it with his beak. Jake was pinned on the struggling griffin's back, but when he looked down and saw the Fenula kraken smiling cruelly at them, he started screaming for Derek. The monstrous Fenula giggled like a flirt, dangling him and the griffin over her painted lips. Her eyes were still recognizable in the hideous, giant face, and they shone with glazed mad hunger. Now I will eat all of the griffin feathers at once and be beautiful forever. She opened her mouth, revealing a huge, round, horrible maw with rows of churning teeth. An overwhelming stink of dead fish poured out on her breath. Red beat his wings as hard as he could, roaring in the kraken's face. In the last possible second, the griffin lashed out in fury with the curved sabers of his lion claws and slashed Fenula's cheek open. Four deep cuts caught the corner of her eye. My face! She shrieked and hurled them away in a rage. She sent them both crashing against the ballroom wall. Jake and the griffin separated as they hurtled helplessly through the air. Jake planted his face in the wall some yards above the ballroom, The griffin beside him made a considerably louder bang as he hit. Then Jake saw the floor rushing up to meet him, and when he smashed to earth, his scattered wits said good night for a second and went off to dance a little minuet. The cobwebs cleared, and he shook himself awake a couple of minutes later, his groggy senses returning to the chaos of the ballroom. Screaming guests rumpled griffin. No kraken. Where was she? Still seeing stars, his chest heaving, Jake looked over as Red slowly rolled over and started picking himself up. Are you all right? Caw! One very unhappy mythical beast. Scanning, Jake spotted Derek across the ballroom. All his uncle's servitor servants, maids, and footmen had piled on top of the guardian and were pounding him with kicks and punches. But all of a sudden, they turned back into forks and spoons and rained down over Derek, clattering harmlessly to the floor. That's odd. Looking puzzled but relieved, Derek brushed them off and jumped to his feet, running toward the grand staircase in pursuit of Waldrick. But a woozy grin spread over Jake's face when he saw his uncle at the top of the red-carpeted stairs. It appeared the carrot head had matters well in hand. Danny kicked Waldrick in the knee, and when he lurched forward with an oof, Gladwin blew fairy dust in his face. Waldrick went silly from the fairy dust, staggering into the banister. Derek ran to take him into custody. But what about Fenula? Jake scanned the ballroom and spotted her, getting away. But now she was making slow progress, changed back into her true form. So that's why the servants had turned into utensils, he thought. They were servitors, and she was the one who had made them. But she was losing power fast after the slash of the griffin's claws. It seemed what the griffin's magic could give, it could also take away. The sea witch had used red stolen feathers to restore her beauty, but apparently the cut from his claws had drained his magic out of her, or maybe had taken it back. All Jake knew was that she wasn't getting away. She was as guilty as Waldrick was in the murder of his parents, and she had to pay. He climbed to his feet and jogged after her. Hurt, Fenula wasn't moving very fast. She was on the ground in all her hideous, squiggly glory, half squid, half warty old hag. Propped on her flabby old woman arms, she was trying to drag herself out of the ballroom while the horrified guests looked on. What's wrong with her? Somebody do something! "'Curses on you all!' she spat at them in her charming way. "'Waldrick! Useless man! Nincompoop! Help me! Waldrick! Help me!' "'There's no one to help you now!' Jake declared as he stepped in front of her, blocking her way. Her face was bleeding with an odd-coloured, slimy blood from the cut on her face where Red had got her. 
wicked boy, atrocious, ungrateful little fiend, get out of my way, or I'll— Or you'll what? Jake stood tall before her, resting his hands on his hips. Try to eat us again? Bracing herself weakly on one hand, she lifted her wand in the other, having retrieved it, and started an incantation. But Jake reached down, snatched the wand out of her grasp, and this time broke it over his knee. You're finished, he informed her, and threw the pieces on the ground. I'm putting you under arrest in the name of the Order of the Yew Tree, he tossed out a rather bold experiment. She let out a weary cackle. <laughs> Is that so, my lord? I know what you did. You're a co-conspirator in all of Waldrick's crimes. You provided the magic that helped him murder my parents. He wanted the title, but you wanted to get your hands on our griffin, knowing his magic feathers could break your curse and, at least temporarily, give you back your beauty. But you know what, Madam Coralbroom? There's not enough magic in the world to hide your true ugliness. You were always ugly on the inside. You think you know what's going on, you stupid boy? Finula mocked, glaring at him. The Order of the Yew Tree, he says. How quaint! You have no idea what you're up against, lordling. Now stand aside, unless you want to end up like your parents. The Light Riders are doomed, all of them. What do you mean by that? he demanded. Wouldn't you like to know? she said with a sneer. Jake stepped to the side to block her when she tried to crawl around him. Out of my way! Explain what you meant by that. Is somebody plotting against the Light Riders? The Dark Druids? He tested her. I've heard a rumor that you're working with them. She laughed at him. <laughs> Little fool! But then she eyed him with cunning. I can answer all your questions if you'll help me reach the river. That is, if you want to know what really happened to your parents. I know what happened to them. I saw it in Waldrick's memories through the obad ray spell you cast on me. You think I let that fool know what's really going on? Stupid boy. A smart girl lets her man think he knows what's what, while in truth she's carrying out her own designs. What are you saying? Those bullets I gave him. Yes, he prompted, going down on one knee to stare into her face. Tell me, what about them? Haven't you ever wondered why I went to the trouble of turning your family servants into frogs? To cover your tracks. Don't be a simpleton like your uncle. More than that. You better start talking, you hag. Help me into the river, she said, and all will be revealed. No, now. Jake held his breath and warned himself not to believe too much of anything she might say. She was cruel, she was desperate, and she had already proven herself a liar. Very well. Finula smiled coldly. Maybe they're not quite as dead as you think. What are you talking about? He breathed. Before she could answer, Danny's frantic, high-pitched scream drew his attention. Jake! He cast a fierce glance over his shoulder, annoyed at the interruption. Then he froze. Jake, help! Help me! Please! At the top of the grand staircase, Uncle Waldrick was dangling Danny off the high balcony by her arm. Stay back, the madman shouted at Derek, who was trying to arrest him. Take one step closer and she dies. She'll break her neck, splatter her brains all over the floor, and it will be all your fault, guardian, again. Not hardly. Jake rose to his feet, his eyes narrowed. Red! The griffin was by his side in a pounce. Whatever Finula knew about his parents would have to wait. He did not want to interrupt this conversation, but Danny's life was at stake. Gladwin's, too. As he jumped onto the griffin's back, he saw the fairy hanging onto the edge of Danny's pocket for dear life. Since Gladwin couldn't fly anymore, she would fall off the balcony and die, just like Danny, if Jake didn't save them. Meanwhile, Derek was trying to reason with Waldrick. Don't harm the child, man! Get out of my way, then. Move. Easy. I'm moving, all right? Set them down safely, and you can go. I won't stop you. You see? You win. Jake knew it didn't matter if Derek gave in. Waldrick was too cruel to care, and with his plans and tatters around him, he had nothing left to lose. Jake knew his uncle well enough by now to know that Danny and Gladwin were doomed either way. Hurry, boy, Jake whispered to the griffin. 
Red unfurled his wings with a whoosh, and they were airborne, soaring straight for the balcony. You've ruined me, Waldrick yelled wildly at Derek, while the spider on his shoulder reared up, hissing at Derek, throwing string at him. As Derek ripped it off his face, Danny saw Jake coming. Hold on, Gladwin, she yelled, reaching out with her other hand as Jake and Red swooped near. Holding onto Red's collar with one hand, Jake reached down with the other and grasped Danny's wrist as the griffin sailed by. He yanked her free of Waldrick's hold and pulled her onto the griffin's back behind him. Gladwin! Got her! Danny confirmed, clamping her arms around Jake's waist as they swept over the ballroom. Criminy, we're up high! Ha! This is nothing! Jake boasted. Finula's gone! Gladwin yelled in her tinkling voice, pointing at the floor from the safety of Danny's pocket. Blimey! Meanwhile, on the balcony, Derek knocked Waldrick out with an expert punch in the face. Jake, get the witch, he yelled as he stooped to arrest the unconscious aristocrat. Stop her before she reaches the river or we'll never catch her. Jake sent him a salute and guided Red out the high, arched window through which they had first blasted into the ballroom. Oh, brother, Danny mumbled, her arms tightening around his waist in a vice-like grip like the Kraken's. Can I get down, please? Little busy. Uh, don't worry, Red won't let you fall. Promise. They flew over the roof of Everton House. I see her, Gladwin called. Jake spotted the sea witch, too. He was amazed at the progress the old squid hag had made by sheer determination. She had cleared the house and was dragging herself across the back terrace at top speed. Blast it! Hold on! Jake warned his passengers. The griffin sped downward on a steep angle, but whooshed right over Fenula a heartbeat too late. They all got a face full of river water as the sea witch sent up a great splash, flopping into her element. Red roared indignantly as she disappeared beneath the dark water. Gladwin shook her tiny fist at her from Danny's pocket. Red sailed over the surface of the river, his eagle eyes searching for Fenula. She'll probably head for the sea, Danny remarked. Jake nodded, but he wasn't sure what to do now. The headache and his anger at himself for failing Derek clouded his thinking. But then the answer came to him. Hadn't he learned by now that he didn't always have to do everything alone? Glide a little lower over the water, Red. Holding onto the collar with one hand, Jake quickly untied his cravat with the other and pulled out his seashell necklace, the last gift his mother had given him. They buzzed an anchored merchant ship, then Red brought them low enough to skim the current with his paws. Jake took a deep breath and lifted the conch shell to his lips, summoning the water nymphs. Captain Lydia Brackwater shot out of the water almost at once, her trident emerald glowing. Water nymphs! Danny cried, spotting her attendants in the water. Lydia! Jake yelled down to the bold warrior maiden and her sisters. It's Fenula Coral Broom! Stop her! She went that way! Danny cried. Sisters, toward the sea! Lydia shouted. The sound of their dolphin-like cries filled the night. Instantly, her squadron of water nymphs went racing after the octopus lady. Follow them, Red! The griffin flew. Lydia and her water nymphs sped through the water, leaping along like porpoises, each leaving a foamy wake in her path. They split up to veer around boats, raced under the low arches of Westminster Bridge, and suddenly caught up to their quarry just beside Parliament. The children had an excellent aerial view of the battle as the water nymphs surrounded Fenula and struggled to take the fugitive into custody. Oh my, Danny uttered, watching below as the water churned and frothed and splashed to a great height. Big Ben's glow gave them glimpses of dark fins and fishtails, wildly flailing tentacles. They heard angry shouts and cries, then a howl of rage, unmistakably Fenula. Then, at last, Lydia shot a beam of green energy out of her trident that subdued the sea witch. The children cheered as the water nymphs took her into custody. The griffin hovered in place as Lydia turned and waved to Jake. Tell Guardian Stone we'll take her to the water cell under Beacon House. He waved back. We will. Thank you. Be careful. Thanks, Captain Brackwater, Danny yelled. Sorry about ordering you away before. Jake said, remembering how rude he had been to the proud warrior nymph earlier. It wasn't entirely my fault, though. She put me under a spell. Did she indeed? Misuse of magic. 
Lydia hissed at Finula, then prodded her with the trident. She won't be putting spells on anyone any more. Lydia's fellow nymphs bound Finula's hands and tentacles with strong kelp rope. Well done, ladies! Jake congratulated them as a farewell. Ladies? Lydia scoffed. One of the other river nymphs splashed them with her fishtail for this apparent insult. I was only being polite! Jake exclaimed. But before the griffin flew higher, Fenula Coralbrum gave Jake a piercing look, like the evil eye. Her glare reminded him of the information she claimed to have about his parents' fate, another reason why he was glad they were taking her into custody. When the order of the yew tree was done with Fenula, he wanted a chance to question her too. He'd get to the bottom of this. Had she done something to those bullets Waldrick had used to shoot his parents? Since the water nymphs had the situation well in hand, it seemed their work tonight was done. Jake leaned down and patted Red on the neck. Well done, boy! Let's give our friends a quick look from above, eh? Though tired, the griffin arched his neck in a nod and sailed heavenward. That's not really necessary, Danny said with a gulp as they climbed higher into the starry skies. You have to see this. Trust me, I want to show you London. I've seen it every day of my life. Not like this, he promised with a smile. Chapter 40 Born to Fly Oh, look at it all! Jake was pleased as Danny gazed down in wonder at London stretched out in all directions below them. It was especially impressive from this height, but he didn't intend to stay away too long. Derek was waiting for them back at Everton House. There was still a lot to sort out, but after all the chaos in the ballroom and spending half of this mad night thinking he was going to die, Jake welcomed the peaceful quiet of the dark skies. Soaring over London, they flew through the wisps of some low-hanging clouds. They marveled at the topside view of Westminster Abbey's towers and flying buttresses, all silvered by moonlight. They saw the clusters of sleeping doves and pigeons huddled in its ancient roofs. Heading west, the gas lamps blazed down Pall Mall and Piccadilly like golden buttons shining in the dark. Carriages rolled through the royal parks, millions of people just living out their lives, Jake thought. But when they passed over the West End and the fine neighborhoods where the guests from tonight lived, he shook his head. I can't imagine what all those people must be thinking after what they saw. Who cares? Danny answered. Higher! He grinned and urged Red toward the moon. Danny laughed in delight. He was glad she wasn't scared anymore. They soared aloft for a couple more minutes, then Jake brought Red lower and began turning him to circle back. There's Covent Garden Market, Danny exclaimed, pointing as they headed east. Lower, Red! I could go for one of Mr. Harris's mincemeat pies. Jake, you can't land this animal on top of Covent Garden Market. Watch me, he retorted, landing the griffin on the market's sprawling roof, just because he could. If my old apprentice masters could see me now. Criminy, is that Constable Flanagan? Jake looked in the direction she pointed and saw the mustachioed Bobby driving an open wagon, but it seemed he wasn't on duty. Without his helmet and uniform, he was dressed like a regular bloke, with a sturdy wife beside him on the carriage seat and a passel of kids in the back. You better not let him see you. Why not? Jake replied with a sly smile. Urging Red back into motion, he flew as casually as you please over the constable's wagon, waving as he went by. The Flanagan children yelled in amazement and jumped to their feet, waving back while their mustachioed father nearly fell off the driver's seat in shock. What the? They laughed, but as they climbed back higher into the sky, Danny holding on to Jake's waist, glanced back grimly over her shoulder. The rookery looks so dark. Because it is, Jake thought. We should be getting back. Derek's waiting for us. Are you all right anyway? I swore you broke your neck when the kraken threw you. Nah, I'm fine. You? Fine. Danny paused for a long moment, reflecting on it all. I saw a talking spider tonight, she remarked as though she still couldn't believe it. Jake snorted. Malwart, we've met. Does your griffin talk? She asked suddenly. No, but he understands. I'll bet Isabel would know whatever he has to say. I miss Teddy. 
I'm sure you'll see him again soon. I don't know. Maybe he's better off with them. Don't be daft, she sighed. Thanks for saving me, anyway. I thought you were still mad at me for telling on you. Only girls hold grudges, Jake paused. Sorry about throwing you out of my uncle's house. It wasn't your fault. You were under a spell, I guess. But I don't have that excuse for the rotten things I said to you at Bradford Park. I am sorry, he forced out awkwardly. I didn't really mean it. I know, he could hear the smile in her voice. I'm used to you by now, you blockhead. He laughed, relieved. Well, I'm big enough to admit it. You were right. I should have listened to you and not dragged everyone off to the village. Then I would never have been put under that spell, and all this could have been avoided. But then you wouldn't have had the chance to rescue Gladwin. Isn't that right, Gladwin? Gladwin! She suddenly exclaimed. What's wrong? Jake glanced over his shoulder, but couldn't see what was troubling his passengers. Jake, we'd better land! Gladwin's crying! He frowned and murmured to his winged mount to get them back to Everton House quickly. A couple minutes later, the griffin came fluttering down out of the night sky, landing on the garden path. They dismounted, and Danny gently took Gladwin out of her pocket. What is it, Gladwin? The fairy held her face in her hands. Her tiny shoulders shook with each sob. Please, Gladwin, you can tell us we're your friends, Danny cajoled her. Oh, it's, it's nothing, the fairy choked out, trying to brush away her tears. It's just being up in the sky like that and knowing I will never fly again. Danny's eyes watered, too. Oh, Gladwin, please don't cry. We'll get Dr. Celestis to help you, I promise. I will figure out something for you. Jake stood there awkwardly, trying to be of help. The griffin nudged him with his head. Not now, Red, he mumbled. But when the griffin reached his tough, leathery beak toward his wing and plucked out one of his own red feathers, Jake's eyes suddenly widened. The mythical beast waited patiently, offering him the feather. Jake accepted it in wonder as understanding dawned. What is it, Jake? Danny asked. What does he want? I think he's got an idea. Here, hold Gladwin up. Danny raised her hands with the teary-eyed fairy sitting on her cupped palms. With your permission, Jake mumbled, I think I know a way to help, but you've got to trust me. The ruined fairy shrugged. I've got nothing left to lose. Jake gave Danny a hope-this-works look, then he took the feather between his palms and began to rub it back and forth, fast as he had seen Fanula do. Please work! It had to. He could feel it growing warmer in his hands. Red seemed unconcerned. He tucked his lion haunches under him and sat, wrapping his tufted tail around him in contentment. Danny watched in confusion. Jake concentrated with all his might, rolling the feather faster between his palms. He willed himself to believe. If the griffin's magic was powerful enough to restore the squiddy sea hag to her original beauty, then surely it could also help the injured fairy somehow. The feather began to turn into sparkling gold-red dust in his hands. Whoa! Danny uttered. Jake sprinkled the cloud of shining dust all over Gladwin as she sat in Danny's hands. The wounded fairy was obscured in the sparkling cloud of dust. The children watched, holding their breath. A moment passed. Two, three. All of a sudden, Gladwin shot up out of the sparkling cloud, zooming at top speed with a new and even more beautiful set of wings. Danny gasped as the fairy spun skyward above them, leaving a trail of magic in her wake. They could hear her little buzzy, tinkling voice yipping with glee. It worked! Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you! She darted around in figure eights while Jake and Danny cheered. Even the griffin looked pleased. Elated, Gladwin zipped over to Red as fast as a hummingbird and kissed him on the top of his beak. Red snuffled, and Gladwin flew away over the treetops, but she was back again in a heartbeat. Her fairy trail of golden sparkles blazing brightly, she floated down to hover in front of Danny and Jake. "'Well, don't just stand there, you marvellous giant children,' she said. "'Hurry, we must go and see the Queen!' Chapter 41 Her Majesty the Queen
Derek dragged the groaning, whining Waldrick into the carriage with them and handed him over to the royal guards when they reached Buckingham Palace. The soldiers clapped the former earl in manacles and leg irons and dragged him away, ignoring his angry protests of innocence. Derek glared after him, but Gladwin hurried them along, flitting ahead into the marvelous royal home of Queen Victoria. Jake and Danny were told to wait in a magnificent reception room, while Derek and Gladwin went into Her Majesty's private office to make their reports. The two of them sat fidgeting in gilded chairs, nervously awaiting their turn. Then Danny glanced at Jake and said, "'Criminy! You can't go in to see the Queen of England looking like that!' "'What?' he whispered back. She pointed him impatiently to one of the grand mirrors on the wall, and Jake saw what she meant. He hurried to fix himself up a bit, but his hair was sticking out in all directions from flying around in the night sky. Though the nymphs had splashed them, his clothes had nearly dried, but his tuxedo was tattered and dirty from his being thrown into a dungeon cell and nearly eaten by a kraken. Excuses, excuses, he thought wryly. Then the door opened, and Derek poked his head out, beckoning to Jake. The carrot head started to come too, following him as always, but Derek waved her back to his seat. You wait here, Danny, this won't take long. A strange look passed across her freckled face as she sank back obediently into her chair, but Jake barely noticed it. His heart was pounding at the prospect of a royal audience. As he walked toward the door, he remembered joking around with Derek one afternoon in between their training sessions back at Bradford Park. "'Come on, everyone's afraid of something,' he had goaded the warrior. "'I know you can beat anyone in a fight and slay dragons in single combat.' "'I would never harm a dragon. Isn't there anything you're afraid of? Tell me.' Derek had harumphed, though his eyes were smiling. "'Well, one thing,' he had finally admitted. "'What?' Queen Victoria, he had whispered. Jake had burst out in laughter. A little old lady? Derek had shaken his head. You wait, you'll see. He wished he could convince himself that the Guardian was only jesting that day, but as Jake walked toward Derek, he noted his fierce friend's cautious attitude and realized the warrior never said anything he didn't mean. Don't forget to bow, Derek whispered as he opened the door wider. Jake gave him a look. I'm not stupid. Uncle Waldrick had taught him that much. But when he stepped into the royal office and saw Her Majesty seated ahead, he understood what Derek meant. At first glance, she wasn't so impressive. A stout lady in her fifties, barely five feet tall, she was dressed from head to toe in black, a widow's mourning clothes. She had lost her husband many years ago and, famously, had mourned him ever since and this caused rather a problem for Jake the moment he stepped into the room. Oh, not now. He saw the royal ghost from the corner of his eye. Blazes, after everything else tonight, he did not need the distraction of a spirit when those shrewd eyes engraved on every farthing were fixed on him proud and firm. Queen Victoria's mouth was a straight, unsmiling line. Her dark hair, mixed with grey, was very smooth, slicked down on both sides of a rigid centre part, and gathered in a bun. Instead of a crown, a black lace housecap was pinned to the back of her head. "'Is this our godson?' she clipped out. "'Yes, ma'am,' Derek answered. "'Come forward, Lord Griffin.' "'Oh, she's talking to me,' he realised with a jolt. "'Lord Griffin. Right. He'd never get used to that.' In his mind, he'd always be just Jake. He executed a bow just like Uncle Waldrick had showed him, then stood up straight. With a slight gulp, he began marching toward Her Majesty in as stately a fashion as he could remember from his training with Henry and Helena. The Queen inspected him as he approached. For his part, Jake was shocked to find himself in awe of her. He had never been the most respectful lad, but Derek was right. The old lady had a very commanding presence. No wonder. She had become queen when she was just nineteen. In all the years since then, she had wrangled Parliament, overseen various wars on far-flung continents, survived assassination attempts, commanded the largest navy in the world, and ruled an empire on which, as they said, the sun never set. 
In her private life, she was no less formidable, having raised her nine children as a mother alone after her husband's death. From her stiff upper lip to her steely spine, the little old Queen of England was not to be trifled with. Jake halted before her, thankful for once that children were not to speak until they were spoken to. He kept his mouth shut and waited, and tried to ignore the ghost of her husband leaning by the wall. "'You certainly look like your father,' the Queen declared. "'And you have inherited his powers?' Jake stared blankly. Derek elbowed him. "'Oh, yes, your majesty. Show us.' Derek gestured to a nearby side table with a lamp and various knick-knacks on it, including a photograph of the dead German prince with bushy sideburns who was in the room with them, unbeknownst to the others. Prince Albert, beloved husband, was engraved on a silver plaque on the lower part of the frame. Jake felt sad to realize how much the tough-as-nails old queen missed her soulmate, but Derek gave him a nod, urging him to begin his demonstration of his telekinesis. While Her Majesty looked on, Jake took a deep breath. His head still hurt from overusing his powers tonight. He ignored the pain, however, not about to ignore a royal command, especially from the honorary head of the Order of the Yew-Tree. Determined to impress her, he began levitating various objects off the table, including the picture frame, a small vase, and the paperweight that Gladwin was sitting on. Gladwin giggled as her paperweight began to rise and float. Hands free, Jake made the objects circle gently in the air before setting them down on the lace-draped table. He glanced at Derek in question. Derek nodded to him in approval. Very impressive, the Queen conceded. Thank you, Your Majesty. Guardian Stone tells me you also possess your mother's powers. She eyed him keenly. You can see ghosts? This instantly got the dead prince's attention. The ghost was inches in front of him in a whoosh. Jake leaned a little to the side, distracted at having to look through his whitish-blue spirit body. Yes, ma'am. Boy, you there. You can see me? Prince Albert exclaimed. He still had his German accent. Jake discreetly sent His Serene Highness a brief scowl, not wishing to look like a loony in front of the Queen, talking to invisible people. "'Tell her that I am here,' the royal German ghost demanded. "'What is it, Jacob?' the Queen prompted. "'Jake, ma'am,' he corrected her in his distraction. Her eyebrows shot up high into her wrinkled brow. He realized what he had just done. "'Sorry, Your Majesty. Call me whatever you like.' "'Well, thank you, Jake.' She answered in mild amusement. You seem distracted. Oh, yes, ma'am. He cringed at having to tell the Queen of England that she was being haunted. What's the matter? Derek whispered. Jake was trying to ignore the ghost of Prince Albert, who was now studying him up close through his monocle. He turned and mumbled to Derek. There's one here now. The warrior gave him a quick, startled stare. What does he say? The Queen demanded. Oh, your Majesty, he, uh, seeing Derek flounder made Jake even more nervous. Hmm? Her Majesty demanded. He's here, Jake blurted out. Come again, she said. He's here. Ruefully, Jake pointed to the picture he had levitated. M. Ah, good lad. The prince tried to clap him on the back, but his hand went right through Jake's shoulder. The queen had the opposite reaction. She pinned a frozen glare on Jake that seemed to say, How dare you? He blanched. I'm telling the truth, Your Majesty. B Prince Albert's here right now. She eyed him in suspicion. Can you prove this claim? Jake glanced at the ghost in question. Prince Albert stroked his bushy sideburns in thought, trying to come up with something only his wife would know. Nearly everything about her life was reported in the newspapers, so he had to come up with something private, or she wouldn't believe that he was really there. Then the apparition smiled. Say this, Ich bin immer mit einen meiner kleinen Frauchen. What's that mean? Jake whispered, while the others stared at him. She'll know, he said. Well, the queen demanded. Jake swallowed hard. He told me to say... The ghost had to repeat the message in German bit by bit so Jake could spit it out. 
Then he shook his head. I'm sorry, Your Majesty. I have no idea what that means. Queen Victoria had gone pale and now turned away. Prince Albert floated over to his wife and bent down to comfort her, his hand resting on her shoulder. I am always with you, my little wife, the ghost breathed, as the queen also whispered the words at the same time. Meine kleine Frauchen. That's what he always called me, she admitted a moment later. Derek looked at Jake. He shrugged slightly while the queen stared poignantly into space, trying to see the ghost of her husband right in front of her. As one who knew grief all too well, Jake felt awful for her. Oh, Albert, the queen whispered. But after a moment, she pushed aside emotion and quickly gathered herself, returning to her usual stern manner. Guardian Stone, she said firmly, this boy is of untold value to the realm. See that he is educated in a manner befitting his station and appropriate to his rare talents. Spare no expense. We have need of you, Jacob. Uh, Jake, she corrected herself with a hint of a smile. You have a great destiny ahead. Your parents were leaders in the Order of the Yew Tree, and we are very sure that one day you will follow in their footsteps, if you work very hard for your teachers and resolve to prepare yourself well for your future service. I will, Your Majesty, Jake vowed, elated by her belief in him. Good. You can do things hardly anyone on earth can do, and we are certain you will use your gifts in service to the good of the realm. This is your duty. One that perhaps you never asked for, but one you are well suited to all the same. The gleam in those blue eyes would suggest you are a true adventurer. Guardian Stone says you enjoyed helping thwart those villains tonight. Is this true? Yes, your majesty, he said, blushing slightly. Do future missions interest you? Writing wrongs, solving mysteries, aiding those in distress among the magical folk of our empire? Well, young man, speak up. Jake drew himself up tall and lifted his chin. Your Majesty, he declared, it would be an honor. Derek looked at him in astonishment as Jake gave Queen Victoria a very noble bow. Excellent. Her Majesty fought back a smile and nodded as though she'd known Jake's answer even before he did. Thank you, Lord Griffin. That will do for now. You are dismissed. Gladwin, Guardian Stone, you may go. They bowed out, leaving the queen almost smiling, while her devoted Albert floated nearby, keeping watch over her from beyond the grave, just as he had apparently been doing for the past fourteen years. Gladwin zipped ahead into the reception room. Jake breathed a sigh of relief as soon as Derek shut the door. The guardian tousled his hair. You did well in there. You look a mess, but I think she liked you. Jake grinned. He glanced around the reception room, bursting to brag to the carrot head about how he was going to do heroic things and be sent off on missions. She wasn't where he'd left her, but he was distracted by a sudden thought. Surely the queen didn't intend to make him wait till he was grown up before he could start. Where's Danny? Derek asked, glancing around. Maybe one of the servants took her on a tour of the palace. I'll go find her, Gladwin offered. As she buzzed away to find the girl, who should arrive just then but his cousins, Aunt Ramona and the twins? Jake! Archie came running toward him ahead of the others. Isabel walked farther behind with Aunt Ramona. Jake was surprised to see his girl cousin, considering how difficult it was for her to bear the London crowds. But Danny was certainly going to be happy to see her dog. Isabel was carrying Teddy. Archie grabbed Jake by the shoulders. We were so worried about you. Are you all right? He nodded. I just met the queen. Good heavens, Jacob, Aunt Ramona exclaimed, striding over to him. You gave us such a fright. I didn't run off on purpose, I swear. I was under a spell. Jake quickly told the others as they gathered around. Then Gladwin suddenly zoomed back into the reception room. I can't find Miss Odell. That's odd, Derek said. I will pay my respects to the Queen while you look for her, her ladyship said in distraction, turning to the white-gloved Chamberlain, who then showed her in to see her royal friend. Isabel glanced around while Teddy wriggled in her arms, his nose twitching at top speed, his stump tail wagging. Where is she, Teddy? Isabel asked the dog. He says he can smell her. 
Jake shrugged, glancing around, at a loss. I don't know. She was here a minute ago. Why don't you put him down and let him track her? Archie suggested, but his sister's eyes widened. I don't dare, she whispered. If he pees on the Queen's furniture, we'll all be thrown in the tower. Jake grinned at her unladylike jest. Where a bad influence on you is. Meanwhile, Derek went over to the Chamberlain, who had just shut the Queen's office door behind Lady Bradford. Excuse me, have you seen the little girl who was sitting out here? Yes, sir. The Lord Chamberlain presented a silver tray on which lay a folded letter. The young lady left a note for Lord Griffin. Miss O'Dell sends her apologies and asked me to tell you all that she has gone home. What? Jake snatched her letter off the tray, unfolding it. As he read, his heart sank. What did she write? Isabel cried. Jake blindly handed her the letter. She said you should keep Teddy, he murmured, so stunned that he felt numb. She thinks he'll be better off with you at Bradford Park. Speechless, Isabel looked at him in pain. She took the short letter and quickly read it. Let me see that, Derek growled, snatching it out of her hand as soon as she was through. Archie read it over his arm. Well, that's just daft, the boy genius said, folding his arms across his chest. The twins exchanged a worried glance. At that moment, great-great-aunt Ramona stepped out of the Queen's office. Well, it seems I have my work cut out for me tonight, making those party guests forget the things they saw. She stopped abruptly, looking around at all of them in surprise. Goodness, what's happened? Why all the long faces? Isabel glanced at her with tears in her eyes. The dog whined in concern. Isabel, what is it? Derek handed Lady Bradford the letter with a stricken look. Poor little mite. She says she's got to go home and take care of her father and brothers. Aunt Ramona looked at him in confusion. Then she read the letter while Jake stood there reeling. Blimey, he hadn't realized how much he had simply assumed the carrot head would always be there, always following him, bothering him. But maybe he was wrong. I'll never forget you, Jake, she had written. I know you will go on to do great things, but I don't belong in your world anymore. So... I guess this is goodbye. Jake looked at his great-great-aunt at a loss. He saw the prim pursing of her thin lips as the old dragon lady read the note. She went very still for a moment. Jake hoped the dowager baroness was remembering how coldly she had treated Danny. If she had been a little nicer to her, he thought in reproach, maybe she would have stayed. Without warning, Lady Bradford lifted her chin and was suddenly all business as she refolded the letter. Foolishness! What utter nonsense! I've never heard of anything so preposterous! A child taking care of a grown man? This will not do at all! Come, children! She pivoted on her heel. Twins, guardian stone, if you please, we could use your protection as well where we're going. Where are we going, my lady? Miss Helena asked, hurrying after her. Lady Bradford held her chin high, marching down the gilded corridor. To the rookery, of course. Chapter 42 Home Again Goodbyes had been hard for Danny ever since she lost her mother. There was no use wallowing in it. She saw, as they say, the writing on the wall. It was easier just to get it over with, so she had written her letter and had given it to that white-gloved fellow at the Queen's house. Walking out quickly, she had hopped on a passing omnibus to Covent Garden. Then she trudged the rest of the way home through the dodgy streets of the rookery. She had cried a little, walking home through the dark, but at least she would always have the memory of their ride through the sky on the Griffin tonight. Then, drying her eyes, she put Jake and all the rest of them out of her mind as she grasped the doorknob of the Odell family apartment inside the tenement house. Time to go back to reality. She braced herself and opened it, then let out a sigh as she realized nothing had changed. The front room stank of dirty socks. Dirt covered every surface. A narrow footpath led through piles of clutter. Her heart sank into the abyss. There were a few grunted questions from Da and her brothers about where she'd been, but they soon lost interest. 
She had held a fairy in her hands tonight, had ridden a griffin, and had sat in the next room away from the queen. But she wasn't telling them anything. They'd never believe her. They'd only make fun of her. So she didn't waste her breath, and just like that, life went back to dismal normality. Oi, Daniel, why don't you fix us something to eat? Luke called, lounging with the others, sprawled out in the squalor. Oi, up to it. I'm starved, Mark agreed. Why don't you fix it yourself, she said under her breath. She did not even look at them. All she could think of was the sunny, spacious halls of Bradford Park and the smiling face of Isabel, who had been so kind to her and treated her like a little sister ought to be treated, even though Lady Bradford disapproved of her. She could not understand why that old bird disliked her so much it wasn't fair. Her chin began to tremble, but she dared not cry. Her brother's teasing was always most savage when they spotted tears. Now she didn't even have Teddy any more to make her life here bearable. But he was better off out in the country, where he could run and play without fear of getting hit by a carriage or running out of food. Oi, Danny! Wake up, lass! Don't you hear that? What? She snarled back in rookery fashion. He didn't even notice she was being rude. This was normal talk. Get the door! Matthew ordered, pointing at it and glaring at her. Only then did she notice the firm knock rapping on the front door. She didn't bother refusing her brother's command. With any luck, maybe it was the bailiffs coming to take the lazy louts away to debtor's prison. But when she picked her way through the mounds of junk and opened the door, her eyes widened to find Lady Bradford towering over her. The tall, proud, aristocratic old witch looked down her pointy nose at her. "'Oh, your ladyship!' Danny breathed. She was instantly flooded with shame and no small amount of confusion to find Jake's terrifying great-great-aunt standing at the door of her family hovel. "'Miss Odell!' Her ladyship looked past Danny, scanning the apartment with a frosty stare that stunned the rowdy Odell boys into silence. I am here to see your father. Danny gulped. Am I in trouble? What did I do now? Obediently, however, she opened the front door wider and saw the others standing in the hallway. Isabel! Teddy! While Lady Bradford stepped gingerly into the cramped, filthy apartment to have a word with Mr. Odell, Danny hugged Isabel and Teddy at the same time in the open doorway. A moment later, Jake grasped Danny's shoulder. He turned her to face him and gave her a scowl. "'What do you mean by running off like that, you carrot head? his lordship demanded. As soon as she saw him, she felt stupid about the letter, but her brother's rudeness saved her from having to answer. They burst out laughing, pointing at Jake's tuxedo. "'Look, lads, it's a penguin! Where'd you steal them threads, Jakey? What you think you are, boy, all dressed up like some highfalutin twig?' Matthew said in a withering tone, trying, as always, to put him in his place. But when Derek Stone stepped into view behind Jake, her brothers suddenly stopped laughing. The warrior's cold stare shut them up. Danny turned with a gloating smile from ear to ear. Meanwhile, Isabel and Archie exchanged a baffled look at her brother's incomprehensibly bad manners. Mr. Odell! Lady Bradford was saying, meanwhile, on the other side of the room. I am here because I wish to hire your daughter as a lady's companion for my niece. Danny gasped and turned to Isabel in amazement. She nodded at her, smiling. What? Like a servant? Da asked, skeptically, folding his arms across his chest. A lady's companion is different from a servant, Mr. Odell. It is a respectable position among households of the quality. This is a very rare opportunity for your daughter. He stared blankly at her. The position is more of a hired friend who lives with the employer's family and assists a genteel young lady in various ways, she explained. The two girls have already become friends, and I have come to see— the dowager said slowly, glancing at Danny in grudging respect, that your Daniela is a very good influence on my Isabel. Lady Bradford looked away. Danny was in shock. I thought she hated me. She sees herself in you, Danny, Isabel whispered, sensing her shock. You know, when she was ten. The girl is very brave and very loyal, 
A sensible child, her ladyship clipped out in a business-like tone. The two are just a few years apart, and each seems to have strengths where the other has weaknesses. They balance each other well. My granddaughter is a shy, delicate girl, you see. Your Daniela is tenacious, loyal, and quite without fear. It's true, sir, Isabel spoke up softly. I'm usually too timid to leave our country house for town, but when I thought of Danny's strength, it helped me find my own. Danny hugged her. Lady Bradford nodded. You see, they are very well suited. Where your daughter lacks opportunity, Isabel and her governess will help her to become a proper young lady. Provided, of course, that Miss O'Dell herself agrees to this arrangement. Oh, yes, thank you, ma'am, thank you. Danny said breathlessly, nodding so hard her head could have fallen off. The dowager turned to him again, pleased. In her new position, your daughter will receive an excellent education and a chance to better herself and improve her station in life. And uh, we'll also take the dog. What say you, sir? Dar's expression had changed from one of awe and suspicion to cunning. Hire the lass, eh? A gleam of greed sparked in his eyes. Well, maybe. If you send the money to me, how much? Oh, Lady Bradford looked taken aback by the blunt question. As you can see, we ain't wealthy. If you take her, I'll need the money to hire another maid. Danny winced. Isabel glared at him, and Jake rolled his eyes. Gentlemanly Archie stared as if he couldn't believe his ears. I say! Lady Bradford's nostrils flared. She looked beyond disgusted, but lowered herself to haggle with him for Danny's freedom. Isabel put her arm around her shoulders protectively. At last, they came to terms. Double it, Da grunted. Eight bob a month, and she's yours. And one extra for the dog. Mr. O'Dell, honestly, fine. Anything else? The dowager asked in crisp sarcasm, but Da chose to take her question at face value. I could use a few quid to fill my pantry with food for my boys. Da! Danny cried, aghast. What? She can afford it, he retorted. They eat like hound dogs, ma'am. Can't have them starve, considering the lass is the one that cooks for us. The Odell boys sensed their opportunity as well. They all began clamoring for their various needs and expenses to be paid before Danny would be allowed to go. I need new boots. These ones got holes in them. What about me gambling debts? The pub won't serve me until me tab is settled. Jake couldn't take it any more. He had learned to tolerate the Odells, but what they were doing to Danny right now was beyond the pale. He noticed Derek tensing like he wanted to start throwing people through walls. But before the warrior gave in to this impulse, Jake gave him a look that said, Wait. Then he took matters into his own hands, literally. He knew their clan's greatest weakness. With a discreet flick of his fingers, he made the picture of their ma, the late Mrs. O'Dell, levitate off the mantle and float over to her husband. Hiding the wave of his fingers, Jake made the small oval portrait hover before Mr. O'Dell's eyes. Frozen in shock, Danny's father stared at the picture of his dead wife and turned as white as a sheet. Gaw! Jesus, da! Matthew breathed, while Mark and Luke blessed themselves. Only Danny sent Jake a skeptical glance. It's Ma, John whispered, not looking so cocky anymore. Mr. O'Dell glanced all around him like a haunted man. Rosemary, are you there, lass? The room was perfectly silent. Stifling laughter, Jake let Mr. O'Dell stare a moment longer at his wife's grainy black-and-white photograph before making it float over to Danny, who plucked it gently out of the air. Mr. O'Dell, I would say the girl's mother has made her wishes clear, Lady Bradford opined, with an arch glance at Jake from the corner of her eye. I take her, the Irishman croaked. The lass has my permission to go. Four shillings a week is more than generous of you, ma'am. It'll do just fine. Danny's eyes filled with tears. Thank you, da. She went and hugged her father around the waist and gave him back her mother's picture. Lady Bradford took a small notepad and pencil out of her handbag and scribbled something. 
This is our address if you should need to reach us. I am also leaving you the name of a mill outside of town in which my family owns a share. If any of your boys are interested in an honest day's work, Mr. Odell, send them there. You may use my name. The mill is always looking for capable workers. The Odell boys looked startled at this suggestion, but their father took the paper with a grateful, Aye, ma'am and when he turned to eye his sons, it was with a wicked warning glare that told them it was time for all of them to get off their duffs and start making an honest living. Lady Bradford lifted her chin, picked up her skirts, and sailed out. Come along, children. Danny turned to her sire. All right to you, da. You do that, Danny, lass. Make good of yourself now, you hear? Become a lady and make your ma proud. You never did belong here. The rookery's no place for you. Danny hugged him again. He gave her a kiss on the head. Then she ran to get a few of her things. When she came back, Isabel took Danny's satchel for her in exchange for Teddy, then tugged her outside toward the carriage. Let's get you out of here before he changes his mind, she whispered. Jake pushed Archie out of the apartment ahead of him, not trusting Danny's brothers not to pick on his short, gentlemanly cousin. Then he too went out to the carriage. The twins and Gladwin had been guarding it so it would not be stolen. Last came Derek Stone, holding the Odell brothers at bay with a warning glower. At last, they drove off. Well, Lady Bradford announced, I dare say everything's as it should be now. Thank you, Aunt Ramona, Isabel said, giving the stern old woman a kiss on the cheek. Danny turned to Jake. Was my mother's ghost really there, or was that just you? Um... She punched him fondly in the arm. Well, what did you expect me to do the way they were acting? He retorted. So what if I inherit a castle and a title and what not? What fun would it be without having you around to pick on? Hmph, <laughs> said Danny, but Gladwin got him back for her, flitting up to pull his hair. Ow! The children laughed, the adult smiled, and the griffin went whooshing above them, his wingspan nearly as wide as the narrow alley. Bye, Red! Jake called, waving to his huge new pet. We'll see you soon. Where is he going? Danny exclaimed as they drove out of the rookery. Home, Jake murmured with a smile. And indeed, the griffin did just that. With a shift in the angle of his wings, he pumped the air beneath him, lifting high over London. He began soaring through the patchy clouds at top speed. Leaving London far behind, he flew out over the countryside, following the river's winding path. He glided over endless fields and trees. Then his eagle eyes spotted the familiar outline of towers and turrets ahead. Eagerness filled him after so many years away, so many years of captivity. He swooped down over the tree-lined drive below, then rose up on a final whooshing wingbeat to take his place on the center pedestal of the roof of Griffin Castle. It had been built just for him long ago, a place of honor for the guardian beast of the Everton clan. The griffin landed there, surveyed his lands with a sweeping glance, then flexed his wings, threw back his head, and let out a long, reverberating roar of victory to be home at last, back where he belonged. Epilogue Fairy Dust a few days later, after the dust, as they say, began to settle, a royal garden fairy called Rosebud arrived at Bradford Park and delivered a tiny scrolled message to Aunt Ramona. The children were abuzz when they heard they had all been summoned to Queen Victoria's chief residence of Windsor Castle, even the griffin. Aunt Ramona did not say why, if she knew. When the queen summoned you, you went. So, the next evening, having dutifully arrived at the magnificent royal castle, dressed in their best clothes, they were escorted by another white-gloved footman to a pleasant terrace overlooking a wide, sweeping lawn and a wooded park. Here they were told to wait. "'I wonder what's going on?' Archie sat on the stone railing, dangling his legs off the side. Isabel shook her head. "'I can't sense anything clearly enough to say. Too many people here.' I'm sure we'll find out soon, her ladyship said in a slightly mysterious tone. The twins exchanged a knowing smile. The elders of the order are here, aren't they? 
Derek rumbled in suspicion. Maybe they want a more detailed explanation of what happened. Well, if they do, we'll simply give it to them. As the bard says, all's well that ends well, Henry remarked. Waldrick's been jailed, and Finula will spend the rest of her days in a cell at the bottom of the ocean. Jake nodded, but was still irked that the Order had handed the Sea Witch over to the mermaids before he'd had a chance to question her. The hints she had dropped about his parents still gnawed at him, but of course she would have said anything to get away that night. All of a sudden, quite without warning, Archie shot up out of his chair and yelped, Eureka! Huh? Danny muttered. Idea! Paper! Pencil! If you'll pardon! He went tearing off into the castle, apparently to ask a servant for paper and pencil, while the others laughed. If he's so smart, why can't he remember to carry a little pad and pencil with him? Danny exclaimed. Aunt Ramona shook her head fondly. Because that would require common sense, my dear, a trait our dear genius sadly lacks. He's his grandfather all over again. Henry chuckled. Never mind, Master Archie, he explained with an apologetic smile. He's been working all day and night on the aerodynamics paper he'll be presenting at the scientific conference in Norway next month. Aero... die... what? Jake echoed. His glider, Danny said. Henry nodded. He doesn't usually get nervous about these things, but the scientific luminaries of our day are going to be there, including Archie's idol. Who's that? Jake inquired. Uh, Mr. Alexander Graham Bell, coming all the way from America. I hear he's traveling in Europe on his honeymoon, so he'll be there to make an appearance. The whole scientific world is already buzzing with the talk of his new invention, uh, something called a telephone. What's that? Lady Bradford asked. Henry shrugged. No idea. Just then, Rosebud flew out onto the terrace, leaving a fairy trail of pink sparkles behind her in the twilight. It's time, ladies and gentlemen, if you would please follow me. How mysterious, Isabel said, as Henry offered Lady Bradford his arm. Derek did the same to Helena. The smiling governess slipped her hand through the crook of the warrior's elbow. But Jake didn't bother following. I'll wait for Archie. Through the mullioned windows, he could see his ingenious cousin feverishly scribbling down his thoughts. You go along with them, Red, he told the griffin. Archie and I will be right behind you all. Come along, ladies, Aunt Ramona said to the girls. Red crouched down for Danny and Isabel to sit on his back, but he walked rather than flew, carrying them. This way, please. Rosebud flew ahead of the group, but to Jake's surprise, the fairy did not bring them into the castle to see the queen. Instead, Rosebud led them across the lawn and down a path into the woods. Jake furrowed his brow as he sat on the stone railing, gazing after them. He took note of the opening in the trees where they went into the forest. I wonder what's going on. He hoped Archie didn't take much longer. Curiosity was killing him. But while he waited, gazing up at the full moon, who should appear but a familiar apparition? Well, I see you've come a long way since Newgate Prison, Jacob. Sir George! Jake's eyes widened, though at first he only saw a bluish-white orb. It turned into the baronet's head, smiling at him. The rest of his body had yet to appear. The smiling head floated a foot or so in front of Jake. "'Thanks for showing me to Waldrick's lair,' Jake said at once. "'You'll be happy to hear he's in jail.' "'Most excellent news!' The rest of Sir George shimmered into view. He was still transparent, but he seemed a brighter shade of white. "'You look different,' Jake remarked. "'I'll be crossing over shortly,' he replied as he hovered above the terrace. I came to say goodbye, dear boy. I couldn't go to heaven without stopping first to thank you for clearing my name and helping me to uh, uh, sort things out. I was very confused. Jake smiled. So was I. You're very welcome. You helped me too, Sir George. I'm sorry for what my uncle did to you. Ah, well, at least now justice has been served. I'm glad I was able to help. So you're going to heaven? The ghost nodded eagerly glancing at the sky. Terribly exciting, isn't it? The big day. Sir George, I wonder if I could ask you a favour. Certainly, Jacob. I owe you. What is it? If you see my parents there, could you come back and let me know? I'd be glad to, he started. But at that moment, Dr. Celestis appeared in a flash of light. 
his wings outstretched in full angel regalia instead of his doctor's disguise. It is not possible, Jake, he said, adjusting the tilt of his halo. Well, hello to you too, Jake retorted. I had a feeling eavesdropping was a regular part of your job. Why can't he come back and tell me if he sees my parents up there? The angel's sandaled feet touched down on the railing. Once a soul goes to heaven, it becomes so lost in the bliss it experiences there that it forgets all former cares and worries. A faint, mysterious smile touched the corners of the heavenly traveler's mouth. It forgets everything except for joy and light. Sir George clasped his hands eagerly. Oh, that sounds lovely. Run along, Jacob. It's time for us to go. Dr. Celestus grasped the baronet's wrist, turning to him. Sir George, are you ready? Jake was startled that the angel was able to make contact with the ghost. Every time he had tried to punch or wrestle Sir George during their confrontation in Waldrick's house, his hands had passed right through him like a mist. I see a light. The baronet's face beamed more brightly as he stared skyward with a rapt look. It's singing. Jake didn't see anything, let alone hear any singing. The ghost glowed stronger as it gazed at him. Goodbye, Jacob. Goodbye, Sir George. Happy travels. Take hold of my robe, Dr. Celestus instructed his chubby charge. The baronet clutched the end of the angel's draping white sleeve. Dr. Celestus raised his other arm, and a tube of light appeared right where they stood. Jake leaned over the railing, trying to see up into the pale, swirling colors of the tunnel that apparently led up to heaven. Maybe, just maybe, he could catch a glimpse of his parents up there. But the swirling rainbow tunnel and the angel and Sir George all disappeared in a flash of light. The skies closed again in the blink of an eye. Archie came out to the terrace just as Jake's eyes were readjusting to the twilight. Whew! Glad I got that written down before I lost it. You've already lost it, he said under his breath. Pardon? Come on, they went that way, into the woods. Really? Into the woods? Archie echoed. I wonder why. Let's go find out. The boys jumped off the terrace and ran across the sprawling moonlit lawn. Slowing their pace only a bit, they stepped into the tunnel of the trees. Then they began jogging down the mossy path, avoiding big, gnarled tree roots here and there. The woods grew so thick in the breezy night that soon the dark trees blotted out the moon. Jake felt a pulse of instinctual fear. He couldn't see in the inky blackness and did not know what lay ahead. But the darkness did not last long. Suddenly, the boys spotted twinkling among the trees ahead. They heard strange music, and when they stepped out into the clearing a little farther on, they stopped in their tracks, staring in amazement. The royal garden fairies swarmed around a huge ancient tree with jasmine vines growing up its trunk, wafting summery perfume into the air. Colored lanterns were strung up all around the crowded clearing, where the queen and her court, the elders of the order, and all their totem animals had gathered. Even Stanley the Satyr and Charlie the Cherub had been invited, having shared in Gladwin's captivity. The sarcastic flying baby was eyeing Derek and Helena with one of his arrows, but seemed to conclude the match was already made. Red greeted Jake with a low purr, pushing his feathered head against him, but for his part, Jake could not tear his eyes off the magical scene before him. Tiny, winged musicians were playing Celtic-sounding music as loud as they could from a hollow high up on the tree trunk. Piccolos, pipes, and drums made of acorns. Some beat on tiny bow runs, keeping the rhythm. Others played miniature harps and fiddles, while a trio of highland fairies in tartan kilts blew on tiny bagpipes. Four fairies flew down over the refreshment table, unfurling a sign that had Welcome Back Gladwin written in glowworms. The insects were doing their best to hold still until everyone had arrived. But fairies were an impatient folk and had already begun the dancing. Jake watched in amazement as the next reel began. He saw Gladwin right at the center. The guest of honor, she was wearing a golden gown that matched her new gold-speckled wings, courtesy of the griffin. 
The drums beat louder, and Jake and all his friends stared in wonder at the fairies dancing in rings, leaving their colorful trails of sparkling dust behind them like a brilliant fireworks show against the forest shadows. They zoomed and twirled this way and that. Some soared up while others plunged down. Some went right while others went left in swirls and figure eights, showing off and enjoying themselves to the full, as was their way. Danny came running over to him, her green eyes shining. Do you believe it, Jake? The royal fairies? He shook his head. He couldn't even speak. Everyone he cared about was there, and in this moment, everything was perfect. Then Gladwin saw him, and when she came zooming over to him, the whole troop of glistening, winged dancers followed her in formation. None of this would have been possible without you, Lord Griffin, she cried, and she landed on his head, where she proceeded to dance a jig. Archie and Danny laughed, watching while Jake was surrounded by fairies. Their light shone on him, and when they flew off to go to dance on someone else, they left him laughing, silly from their dust, and striped in several glimmering colors of it. It was in his hair, on his face, on his fine formal jacket, like powdered confetti, and perhaps this was not a very dignified start for any earl. But Jake could not have been happier. Reach! Reach! Meanwhile, far away, Waldrick Everton stretched his arm through the bars of his cell, sweat beading on his brow. His shoulder strained as he went on trying to grasp the keys that hung on a peg on the opposite wall. But it was no use. He leaned his head against the cold, rusty bar in despair. He had no magical powers to assist him, and no hope of rescue. Sentenced to life in this lonely tower atop a Romanian mountain top, deep in dragon country. Indeed, when one of the winged beast's piercing cries echoed in the distance, he cowered. But there was safety in this cage. He could not get out, but at least the dragons could not get in and eat him. Still, he could not believe that after having had the world in the palm of his hand, he was reduced to this. Instead of famous poets, politicians, and stars of the London stage calling on him, he was pitifully glad of the brief visits from the brutish warden who came once a week to replenish his supply of disgusting gruel and water. Waldrick let out a sigh of bitter self-pity. Even Finula's moody company would have been welcome at a time like this, but he heard his co-conspirator had been locked up in a similar cell, only hers was at the bottom of the sea. That dreaded boy had ruined both their lives. Cursing Jake for the umpteenth time, Waldrick dragged himself up to a standing position and started to turn around to shuffle back to his stone cot, when, suddenly, a flicker of motion in the doorway caught his eye. He whirled around and gasped at what he saw. Malwart! He rushed to the bars of his cell, grasping them until his knuckles turned white. Tears of joy pricked his eyes. He had never seen any more welcome sight than that of the large, disheveled, wind-blown spider standing in the open stone doorway. Bless you, dearest Malwart! Come in quickly! However did you find me? Malwart was still shaking from the endless journey he had undertaken to find Master. Crossing dragon country was not a task to be undertaken lightly, even for an especially hardy spider. Climbing that mountain had just about worn out all eight of his legs. As soon as he had scuttled into the shelter of the tower room, he collapsed onto his belly to rest. Ah, <sighs> he said. Waldrick stared at him in wonder, still barely able to believe his faithful little friend had come all this way to rescue him. Malwart, he rasped, reaching through the bars once more, those keys hanging on the wall there, you see them? There's a handsome, clever, marvelous spider, the bravest, cleverest spider in all the world. Oh, dear Malwart, princely Malwart, fetch those shiny keys for master. You can do this for me, yes? Bring them to me, Malwart, dear. Malwart looked up wearily at him with all ten of his eyes. Can I at least have a break? In truth, Malwart was rather peeved that this was his greeting. 
He'd come all this way to find him, riding on the bottoms of carriages and the tops of trains and even in the cargo hold of a ship across the channel. He'd almost gotten squashed by the dreaded broom when he had taken shelter from the rain at a hotel in France and had just now finished climbing a mountain guarded by dragons. All that and Master could not even manage a simple thank you? All he ever wanted was more, more, more. Of course Malwart could easily do what he asked, get those keys, just like he had gotten the hair of the jake for him that one time. But he was so indignant at Master's lack of gratitude, he had half a mind to turn around and march right back down the mountain. Come, Malwart, I know you must be altogether exhausted after your journey, but just bring me those keys, my noble little friend, and we'll be on our way. Malwart frowned. When you had ten eyes, you saw a lot that others missed. He'd always had a clearer view of Master than others did, the good and the bad in him. If he freed him, he would surely go right back to his old ways, hurting other creatures. And Malwart was a spider with a conscience, after all. Meanwhile, the former Earl went on wheedling him. Dear, precious Malwart, do please drag those keys here to me. I will give you horseflies dipped in honey every day for the rest of your life if you get me out of here, cleverest of spiders. His words were as charming as a new-made web on a dewy morning. But still, Malwart wasn't sure. After all, if he set Master free, then he'd have to share his attention with others again. Here he could have Master all to himself. Harry Malwart, why are you just standing there? In the distance, another dragon roared. Malwart's ten eyes blinked as he lingered in the doorway. Undecided. The End <laughs> This has been The Lost Heir, The Griffin Chronicles, Book One. Written by E.G. Foley. Narrated and produced by Jamie DuPont McKenzie. Copyright 2012 by E.G. Foley. Production copyright 2013 by E.G. Foley.